Section 1 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Brabin. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre-Joseph Poudon, translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Section 1. P.J. Proudhon, His Life and His Works. Part 1. Footnote. In the French edition of Proudhon's works, the following sketch of his life is prefixed to the first volume of his correspondence. But the translator refers to insert it here as the best method of introducing the author to the American public. He would, however, caution readers against accepting the biographer's interpretation of the author's views as in any sense authoritative, advising them rather to await the publication of the remainder of Proudhon's writings that they may form an opinion for themselves. Translator End footnote The correspondence of P.J. Proudhon, the first volumes of which we publish today, has been collected since his death by the faithful and intelligent labours of his daughter, aided by a few friends. It was incomplete when submitted to saint beuve but the portion with which the illustrious academician became acquainted was sufficient to allow him to estimate it as a whole with that soundness of judgment that characterised him as a literary critic. In an important work, which his habitual readers certainly have not forgotten, although death did not allow him to finish it, saint beuve thus judges the correspondence of the great publicist. The letters of Proudhon, even outside the circle of his particular friends, will always be of value. We can always learn something from them. And here is the proper place to determine the general character of his correspondence. It has always been large, especially since he became so celebrated. And to tell the truth, I am persuaded that in the future the correspondence of Proudhon will be his principal, vital work, and that most of his books will be only accessory to and corroborative of this. At any rate, his books can be well understood only by the aid of his letters and the continual explanations which he makes to those who consult him in their doubt and request him to define more clearly his position. There are among celebrated people many methods of correspondence. There are those to whom letter-writing is a bore, and who, assailed with questions and compliments, reply in the greatest haste, solely that the job may be over with, and who return politeness for politeness, mingling it with more or less wit. This kind of correspondence, though coming from celebrated people, is insignificant, and unworthy of collection and classification. After those who write letters in performance of a disagreeable duty, and almost side by side with them in point of insignificance, I should put those who write in a manner wholly external, wholly superficial, devoted only to flattery, lavishing praise like gold without counting it, and those also who weigh every word, who reply formally and pompously with a view to fine phrases and effects. They exchange words only, and choose them solely for their brilliancy and show. You think it is you, individually, to whom they speak, but they are addressing themselves in your person to the four corners of Europe. Such letters are empty, and teach us nothing but theatrical execution, and the favourite pose of their writers. I will not class among the latter the more prudent and sagacious authors who, when writing to individuals, keep one eye on posterity. We know that many who pursue this method have written long, finished, Charming, flattering, and tolerably natural letters. Béranger furnishes us with the best example of this class. Proudhon, however, is a man of entirely different nature and habits. In writing, he thinks of nothing but his idea and the person whom he addresses, ad rem et ad hominem. A man of conviction and doctrine, to write does not weary him, to be questioned does not annoy him. When approached, He cares only to know that your motive is not one of futile curiosity, but the love of truth. He assumes you to be serious. He replies. He examines your objections. Sometimes verbally, sometimes in writing. For, as he remarks, if there be some points which correspondence can never settle, but which can be made clear by conversation in two minutes, at other times just the opposite is the case. An objection clearly stated in writing, a doubt well expressed, which elicits a direct and positive reply, helps things along more than ten hours of oral intercourse. 
In writing to you, he does not hesitate to treat the subject anew. He unfolds to you the foundation and superstructure of his thought. Rarely does he confess himself defeated. It is not his way. He holds to his position. But admits the breaks, the variations, in short, the evolution of his mind. The history of his mind is in his letters. There it must be sought. Poudon, whoever addresses him, is always ready. He quits the page of the book on which he is at work to answer you with the same pen, and that without losing patience, without getting confused, without sparing or complaining of his ink. He is a public man, devoted to the propagation of his idea by all methods, and the best method, with him, is always the present one, the latest one. His very handwriting, bold, uniform, legible even in the most tiresome passages, betrays no haste, no hurry to finish. Each line is accurate. Nothing is left to chance. The punctuation, very correct and a little emphatic and decided, indicates with precision and delicate distinction all the links in the chain of his argument. He is devoted entirely to you, to his business and yours, while writing to you, and never to anything else. All the letters of his which I have seen are serious, not one is commonplace. But at the same time he is not at all artistic or affected. He does not construct his letters. He does not revise them. He spends no time in reading them over. We have a first draft, excellent and clear, a jet from the fountainhead, but that is all. The new arguments which he discovers in support of his ideas and which opposition suggests to him are an agreeable surprise and shed a light which we should vainly search for even in his works. His correspondence differs essentially from his books in that it gives you no uneasiness. It places you in the very heart of the man, explains him to you, and leaves you with an impression of moral esteem and almost of intellectual security. We feel his sincerity. I know of no one to whom he can be more fitly compared in this respect than Georges Sand whose correspondence is large and at the same time full of sincerity. His role and his nature correspond. If he is writing to a young man who unbosoms himself to him in sceptical anxiety, to a young woman who asks him to decide delicate questions of conduct for her, his letter takes the form of a short moral essay of a father confessor's advice. Has he perchance attended a theatre, a rare thing for him, to witness one of Ponsard's comedies, or a drama of Charles Edmond's, he feels bound to give an account of his impressions to the friend to whom he is indebted for this pleasure. And his letter becomes a literary and philosophical criticism, full of sense and like no other. His familiarity is suited to his correspondent. He affects no rudeness. The terms of civility or affection which he employs towards his correspondents are sober, measured, appropriate to each, and honest in their simplicity and cordiality. When he speaks of morals in the family, he seems at times like the patriarchs of the Bible. His command of language is complete, and he never fails to avail himself of it. Now and then a coarse word, a few personalities too bitter and quite unjust or injurious, will have to be suppressed in printing. Time, however, as it passes away, permits many things— and renders them inoffensive. Am I right in saying that Proudhon's correspondence, always substantial, will one day be the most accessible and attractive portion of his works? Almost the whole of Proudhon's real biography is included in his correspondence. Up to 1837, the date of the first letter which we have been able to collect, his life, narrated by saint beuve from whom we make numerous extracts, may be summed up in a few pages. Pierre-Joseph Proudhon was born on the 15th of January, 1809, in a suburb of Besançon called Mouillère. His father and mother were employed in the great brewery belonging to Monsieur Renaud. His father, though a cousin of the jurist Proudhon, the celebrated professor in the faculty of Dijon, was a journeyman brewer. His mother, a genuine peasant, was a common servant. She was an orderly person of great good sense, and, as they who knew her say, a superior woman of heroic character, to use the expression of the venerable Monsieur Weiss, the librarian at Besançon. 
She it was, especially, whom Proudhon resembled. She and his grandfather, Tournesy, the soldier peasant of whom his mother told him, and whose courageous deeds he has described in his work on justice. Proudhon, who always felt a great veneration for his mother, Catherine, gave her name to the elder of his daughters. In 1814, when Besançon was blockaded, Mouillère, which stood in front of the walls of the town, was destroyed in the defence of the place, and Proudhon's father established a cooper's shop in a suburb of Baton called Vigneron. Very honest, but simple-minded and short-sighted, this cooper, the father of five children of whom Pierre-Joseph was the oldest, passed his life in poverty. At eight years of age, Proudhon either made himself useful in the house or tended the cattle out of doors. No one should fail to read that beautiful and precious page of his work on justice, in which he describes the rural sports which he enjoyed when a neat had. At the age of twelve, he was a cellar boy in an inn. This, however, did not prevent him from studying. His mother was greatly aided by Monsieur Renaud, the former owner of the brewery, who had at that time retired from business and was engaged in the education of his children. Proudhon entered school as a day scholar in the sixth class. He was necessarily irregular in his attendance, domestic cares and restraints sometimes kept him from his classes. He succeeded, nevertheless, in his studies. He showed great perseverance. His family was so poor that they could not afford to furnish him with books. He was obliged to borrow them from his comrades and copy the text of his lessons. He has himself told us that he was obliged to leave his wooden shoes outside the door, that he might not disturb the classes with his noise, and that having no hat, he went to school bareheaded. One day, towards the close of his studies, on returning from the distribution of the prizes loaded with crowns, he found nothing to eat in the house. In his eagerness for labour and his thirst for knowledge, Proudhon, says Saint-Beuve, was not content with the instruction of his teachers. From his twelfth to his fourteenth year, he was a constant frequenter of the town library. One curiosity led to another, and he called for book after book, sometimes eight or ten at one sitting. The learned librarian... The friend, and almost the brother of Charles Naudier, Monsieur Weiss, approached him one day, and said, smiling, "'But, my little friend, what do you wish to do with all these books?' The child raised his head, eyed his questioner, and replied, "'What's that to you?' And the good Monsieur Weiss remembers it to this day. Forced to earn his living, Proudhon could not continue his studies. He entered a printing office in Besançon as a proofreader. Becoming soon after a compositor, he made a tour of France in this capacity. At Toulon, where he found himself without money and without work, he had a scene with the mayor, which he describes in his work on justice. saint beuve tells us that, after his tour of France, his service book being filled with good certificates, Proudhon was promoted to the position of foreman. But he does not tell us, for the reason that he had no knowledge of a letter written by Fallot of which we never heard until six months since, that the printer at that time contemplated quitting his trade in order to become a teacher. Towards 1829, Fallot, who was a little older than Proudhon, and who, after having obtained the Suard pension in 1832, died in his twenty-ninth year, while filling the position of assistant librarian at the Institute, was charged, Protestant though he was, with the revisal of A Life of the Saints, which was published at Besançon. The book was in Latin, and Fallot added some notes which were also in Latin. But, says saint Beuve, it happened that some areas escaped his attention, which Proudhon, then proofreader in the printing office, did not fail to point out to him. Surprised at finding so good a Latin scholar in a workshop, he desired to make his acquaintance, and soon there sprang up between them a most earnest and intimate friendship, a friendship of the intellect and of the heart. Addressed to a printer between twenty-two and twenty-three years of age, and predicting in formal terms his future fame, Fallow's letter seems to us so interesting that we do not hesitate to reproduce it entire. Paris, December the 5th, 1831 My dear Proudhon, you have a right to be surprised at, and even dissatisfied with, my long delay in replying to your kind letter. I will tell you the cause of it. It became necessary to forward an account of your ideas to Monsieur J. de Grey, to hear his objections, to reply to them, and to await his definitive response, which reached me but a short time ago. For Monsieur J. is a sort of financial king, 
who takes no pains to be punctual in dealing with poor devils like ourselves. I too am careless in matters of business. I sometimes push my negligence even to disorder, and the metaphysical musings which continually occupy my mind, added to the amusements of Paris, render me the most incapable man in the world for conducting a negotiation with dispatch. I have Monsieur Joubert's decision. Here it is. In his judgment you are too learned and clever for his children. He fears that you could not accommodate your mind and character to the childish notions common to their age and station. In short, he is what the world calls a good father. That is, he wants to spoil his children. And in order to do this easily, he thinks fit to retain his present instructor, who is not very learned, but who takes part in their games and joyous sports with wonderful facility, who points out the letters of the alphabet to the little girl, who takes the little boys to mass, and who, no less obliging than the worthy Abbe P. of our acquaintance, would readily dance for Madame's amusement. Such a profession would not suit you, you who have a free, proud, and manly soul. You are refused. Let us dismiss the matter from our minds. Perhaps another time my solicitude will be less unfortunate. I can only ask your pardon for having thought of thus disposing of you, almost without consulting you. I find my excuse in the motives which guided me. I had in view your well-being and advancement in the ways of this world. I see in your letter, my comrade, through its brilliant witticisms, and beneath the frank and artless gaiety with which you have sprinkled it, a tinge of sadness and despondency which pains me. You are unhappy, my friend. Your present situation does not suit you. You cannot remain in it. It was not made for you. It is beneath you. You ought by all means to leave it, before its injurious influence begins to affect your faculties, and before you become settled, as they say, in the ways of your profession. Were it possible that such a thing could ever happen, which I flatly deny. You are unhappy. You have not yet entered upon the path which nature has marked out for you. But, faint-hearted soul, is that a cause for despondency? Ought you to feel discouraged? Struggle, Morbleu, struggle persistently, and you will triumph. J. J. Rousseau groped about for forty years before his genius was revealed to him. You are not J. J. Rousseau, but listen. I know not whether I should have divined the author of Emile when he was twenty years of age, supposing that I had been his contemporary and had enjoyed the honour of his acquaintance. But I have known you, I have loved you, I have divined your future, if I may venture to say so. For the first time in my life I am going to risk a prophecy. Keep this letter. Read it again, fifteen or twenty years hence, perhaps twenty-five. And if at that time the prediction which I am about to make has not been fulfilled, burn it as a piece of folly, out of charity and respect for my memory. This is my prediction. You will be, Prudent, in spite of yourself, inevitably, by the fact of your destiny, a writer, an author. You will be a philosopher. You will be one of the lights of the century, and your name will occupy a place in the annals of the 19th century, like those of Gassendi, Descartes, Malebranche, and Bacon in the 17th, and those of Diderot, Montesquieu, Helvetius, Locke, Hume, and Olbach in the 18th. Such will be your lot. Do now what you will. Set type in a printing office, bring up children, bury yourself in deep seclusion. Seek obscure and lonely villages. It is all one to me. You cannot escape your destiny. You cannot divest yourself of your noblest feature, that active, strong, and inquiring mind with which you are endowed. Your place in the world has been appointed, and it cannot remain empty. Go where you please, I expect you, in Paris, talking philosophy and the doctrines of Plato. You will have to come, whether you want to or not. I, who say this to you, must feel very sure of it in order to be willing to put it upon paper, since without reward for my prophetic skill, to which I assure you I make not the slightest claim, I run the risk of passing for a hare-brained fellow in case I prove to be mistaken. He plays a bold game who risks his good sense upon his cards, in return for the very trifling and insignificant merit of having divined a young man's future. When I say that I expect you in Paris, I use only a proverbial phrase, which you must not allow to mislead you as to my projects and plans. To reside in Paris is disagreeable to me, very much so. And when this fine art fever which possesses me has left me, I shall abandon the place without regret to seek a more peaceful residence in a provincial town, 
provided always the town shall afford me the means of living, bread, a bed, books, rest, and solitude. How I miss, my good Poudon, that dark, obscure, smoky chamber in which I dwelt in Besançon, and where we spent so many pleasant hours in the discussion of philosophy. Do you remember it? But that is now far away. Will that happy time ever return? Shall we one day meet again? Here my life is restless, uncertain, precarious, and what is worse, indolent, illiterate, and vagrant. I do no work, I live in idleness, I ramble about. I do not read, I no longer study, my books are forsaken. Now and then I glance over a few metaphysical works, and after a day's walk through dirty, filthy, crowded streets, I lie down with empty head and tired body to repeat the performance on the following day. What is the object of these walks, you will ask? I make visits, my friend, I hold interviews with stupid people. Then a fit of curiosity seizes me, the least inquisitive of beings. There are museums, libraries, assemblies, churches, palaces, gardens and theatres to visit. I am fond of pictures, fond of music, fond of sculpture. All these are beautiful and good, but they cannot appease hunger, nor take the place of my pleasant readings of Bailly, Hume and Tenemann, which I used to enjoy by my fireside when I was able to read. But enough of complaints. Do not allow this letter to affect you too much, and do not think that I give way to dejection or despondency. No, I am a fatalist, and I believe in my star. I do not yet know what my calling is, nor for what branch of polite literature I am best fitted. I do not even know whether I am or ever shall be fitted for any. But what matters it? I suffer, I labour, I dream, I enjoy, I think. And, in a word, when my last hour strikes, I shall have lived. Poudon, I love you, I esteem you, and believe me, these are not mere phrases. What interest could I have in flattering and praising a poor printer? Are you rich that you may pay for courtiers? Have you a sumptuous table, a dashing wife, and gold to scatter, in order to attract them to your suite? Have you the glory, honours, credit, which would render your acquaintance pleasing to their vanity and pride. No, you are poor, obscure, abandoned. But poor, obscure, and abandoned, you have a friend. And a friend who knows all the obligations which that word imposes upon honourable people when they venture to assume it. That friend is myself. Put me to the test. Gustave Fallot it appears from this letter that if at this period Proudhon had already exhibited to the eyes of a clairvoyant friend his genius for research and investigation, it was in the direction of philosophical rather than of economical and social questions. Having become foreman at the house of Gautier and Co., who carried on a large printing establishment at Besançon, he corrected the proofs of ecclesiastical writers, the fathers of the church, as they were printing a Bible, a Vulgate, he was led to compare the Latin with the original Hebrew. In this way, says saint Beuve, he learned Hebrew by himself, and as everything was connected in his mind, he was led to the study of comparative philology. As the House of Gautier published many works on church history and theology, he came also to acquire, through this desire of his to investigate everything, an extensive knowledge of theology, which afterwards caused misinformed persons to think that he had been in an ecclesiastical seminary. Towards 1836, Proudhon left the house of Gautier and, in company with an associate, established a small printing office in Besançon. His contribution to the partnership consisted not so much in capital as in his knowledge of the trade. His partner committing suicide in 1838, Proudhon was obliged to wind up the business an operation which he did not accomplish as quickly and as easily as he hoped. He was then urged by his friends to enter the ranks of the competitors for the Suar pension. This pension consisted of an income of 1,500 francs, bequeathed to the Academy of Besançon by Madame Suar, the widow of the academician, to be given once in three years to the young man residing in the department of Doux, a bachelor of letters or of science and not possessing a fortune, whom the Academy of Besançon should deem best fitted for a literary or scientific career, 
or for the study of law or of medicine. The first to win the Tsua pension was Gustave Fallot. Mauvais, who was a distinguished astronomer in the Academy of Sciences, was the second. Proudhon aspired to be the third. To qualify himself, he had to be received as a Bachelor of Letters, and was obliged to write a letter to the Academy of Besançon. In a phrase of this letter, the terms of which he had to modify, though he absolutely refused to change its spirit, Proudhon expressed his firm resolve to labour for the amelioration of the condition of his brothers, the working men. The only thing which he had then published was an essay on general grammar, which appeared without the author's signature. While reprinting at Besançon the primitive elements of languages discovered by the comparison of Hebrew roots with those of the Latin and French by the Abbe Bergier, Poudon had enlarged the edition of his essay on general grammar. The date of the edition, 1837, proves that he did not at that time think of competing for the Suar pension. In this work, which continued and completed that of the Abbe Bergier, Poudon adopted the same point of view, that of Moses and of biblical tradition. Two years later, in February 1839, being already in possession of the Suar pension, he addressed to the Institute as a competitor for the Volney Prize a memoir entitled Studies in Grammatical Classification and the Derivation of Some French Words. It was his first work revised and presented in another form. Four memoirs only were sent to the Institute, none of which gained the prize. Two honourable mentions were granted, one of them to memoir number four, that is, to P. J. Poudon, printer at Besançon. The judges were Messieurs Ahmed Joubert, Renaud and Barnouf. The committee, said the report presented at the annual meeting of the five academies on Thursday, May the 2nd, 1839, has paid especial attention to manuscripts number one and number four. Still, it does not feel able to grant the prize to either of these works because they do not appear to be sufficiently elaborated. The committee, which finds in number four some ingenious analyses, particularly in regard to the mechanism of the Hebrew language, regrets that the author has resorted to hazardous conjectures, and has sometimes forgotten the special recommendation of the committee to pursue the experimental and comparative method. Proudhon remembered this. He attended the lectures of Eugène Banouf, and as soon as he became acquainted with the labours and discoveries of Bopp and his successors, he definitively abandoned an hypothesis which had been condemned by the Academy of Inscriptions and Belles Lettres. He then sold, for the value of the paper, the remaining copies of the essay published by him in 1837. In 1850 they were still lying in a grocer's back shop. A neighbouring publisher then placed the edition on the market, with the attractive name of Proudhon upon it. A lawsuit ensued, in which the author was beaten. His enemies, and at that time there were many of them, would have been glad to have proved him a renegade and a recanter. Proudhon, in his work on justice, gives some interesting details of this lawsuit. In possession of the Suar pension, Proudhon took part in the contest proposed by the Academy of Besançon on the question of the utility of the celebration of Sunday. His memoir obtained honourable mention, together with a medal which was awarded him, in open session, on the 24th of August, 1839. The reporter of the committee, the Abbe Doni, since made Bishop of Montauban, called attention to the unquestionable superiority of his talent. But, says Sainte-Beuve, he reproached him with having adopted dangerous theories, and with having touched upon questions of practical politics and social organisation, where upright intentions and zeal for the public welfare cannot justify rash solutions. Was it policy, we mean prudence, which induced Proudhon to screen his ideas of equality behind the Mosaic law? Sainte-Beuve, like many others, seems to think so. But we remember perfectly well that, having asked Proudhon in August 1848, if he did not consider himself indebted in some respects to his fellow countryman Charles Fourier, we received from him the following reply. I have certainly read Fourier, and have spoken of him more than once in my works. But upon the whole I do not think that I owe anything to him. My real masters, those who have caused fertile ideas to spring up in my mind, are three in number. First the Bible, next Adam Smith, and last Hegel. 
freely confessed in the celebration of Sunday, the influence of the Bible on Proudhon is no less manifest in his first memoir on property. Proudhon undoubtedly brought to this work many ideas of his own. But is not the very foundation of ancient Jewish law to be found in its condemnation of usurious interest and its denial of the right of personal appropriation of land? The first memoir on property appeared in 1840, under the title What is Property? or An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government. Proudhon dedicated it, in a letter which served as the preface, to the Academy of Besançon. The latter, finding itself brought to trial by its pensioner, took the affair to heart, and evoked it, says Sainte-Beuve, with all possible haste. The pension narrowly escaped being immediately withdrawn from the bold defender of the principle of equality of conditions. Monsieur Vivien, then Minister of Justice, who was earnestly solicited to prosecute the author, wished first to obtain the opinion of the economist Blanqui, a member of the Academy of Moral and Political Sciences. Proudhon having presented to this academy a copy of his book, Monsieur Blanqui was appointed to review it. This review, though it opposed Proudhon's views, shielded him. Treated as a savant by Monsieur Blanqui, the author was not prosecuted. He was always grateful to Monsieur Blanqui and Vivien for their handsome conduct in the matter. Monsieur Blanqui's review, which was partially reproduced by Le Moniteur on the 7th of September 1840, naturally led Proudhon to address to him, in the form of a letter, his second memoir on property, which appeared in April 1841. Proudhon had endeavoured, in his first memoir, to demonstrate that the pursuit of equality of conditions is the true principle of right and of government. In the letter to Monsieur Blanqui, he passes in review the numerous and varied methods by which this principle gradually becomes realised in all societies, especially in modern society. In 1842, a third memoir appeared, entitled A Notice to Proprietors, or a letter to Monsieur Victor Considerant, editor of La Falange, in reply to a defence of property. Here the influence of Adam Smith manifested itself, and was frankly admitted. Did not Adam Smith find, in the principle of equality, the first of all the laws which govern wages? There are other laws, undoubtedly, but Proudhon considers them all as springing from the principle of property, as he defined it in his first memoir. Thus, in humanity there are two principles, one which leads us to equality, another which separates us from it. By the former we treat each other as associates, by the latter as strangers, not to say enemies. This distinction, which is constantly met with throughout the three memoirs, contained already, in germ, the idea which gave birth to the system of economical contradictions, which appeared in 1846, the idea of antinomy or contre loi. The notice to proprietors was seized by the magistrates of Besançon, and Proudhon was summoned to appear before the assizes of Doux within a week. He read his written defence to the jurors in person and was acquitted. The jury, like Monsieur Blanqui, viewed him only as a philosopher, an inquirer, a savant. In 1843, Proudhon published The Creation of Order in Humanity, a large volume which does not deal exclusively with questions of social economy. Religion, philosophy, method, certainty, logic and dialectics are treated at considerable length. Released from his printing office on the 1st of March of the same year, Proudhon had to look for a chance to earn his living. Messieurs Gautier brothers, carriers by water between Mulhouse and Lyon, the eldest of whom was Proudhon's companion in childhood, conceived the happy thought of employing him, of utilising his ability in their business, and in settling the numerous points of difficulty which daily arose. Besides the large number of accounts which his new duties required him to make out, and which retarded the publication of the System of Economical Contradictions until October 1846, we ought to mention a work which, before it appeared in pamphlet form, was published in the Ravou des Economistes, Competition Between Railroads and Navigable Ways. End of section 1 Section 2 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. P. J. Proudhon. His Life and Works, Part Two. Le Miserere, or the Repentance of a King, which he published in March 1845 in the Revue Indépendante during that Lenten season when Lacordaire was preaching in Lyon, proves that, though devoting himself with ardour to the study of economical problems, Proudhon had not lost his interest in questions of religious history. Among his writings on these questions, which he was unfortunately obliged to leave unfinished, we may mention a nearly completed history of the early Christian heresies, and of the struggle of Christianity against Caesarism. We have said that, in 1848, Proudhon recognized three masters. Having no knowledge of the German language, he could not have read the works of Hegel, which at that time had not been translated into French. It was Charles Grun, a German, who had come to France to study the various philosophical and socialistic systems, who gave him the substance of the Hegelian ideas. During the winter of 1844-45, Charles Grun had some long conversations with Proudhon, which determined very decisively not the ideas, which belonged exclusively to the Bicentin thinker, but the form of the important work on which he laboured after 1843, and which was published in 1846 by Grillomer. Hegel's great idea, which Proudhon appropriated, and which he demonstrates with wonderful ability in the system of economical contradictions, is as follows. Antinomy, that is, the existence of two laws or tendencies which are opposed to each other, is possible, not only with two different things, but with one and the same thing. Considered in their thesis, that is, in the law or tendency which created them, all the economical categories are rational. Competition, monopoly, the balance of trade and property, as well as the division of labour, machinery, taxation and credit. But, like communism and population, all these categories are antinomical. All are opposed not only to each other, but to themselves. All is opposition, and disorder is born of this system of opposition. Hence the subtitle of the work, Philosophy of Misery. No category can be suppressed. The opposition, antinomy, or contratendance, which exists in each of them, cannot be suppressed. Where, then, lies the solution of the social problem? Influenced by the Hegelian ideas, Proudhon began to look for it in a superior synthesis, which should reconcile the thesis and antithesis. Afterwards, while at work upon his book on justice, he saw that the antinomical terms do not cancel each other, any more than the opposite poles of an electric pile destroy each other, that they are procreative cause of motion, life, and progress, that the problem is to discover not their fusion, which would be death, but their equilibrium, an equilibrium forever unstable, varying with the development of society. On the cover of the system of economical contradictions, Proudhon announced, as soon to appear, his solution of the social problem. His work, upon which he was engaged when the revolution of 1848 broke out, had to be cut up into pamphlets and newspaper articles. The two pamphlets which he published in March 1848, before he became editor of le représentant du peuple bear the same title solution of the social problem the first which is mainly a criticism of the early acts of the provisional government is notable for the fact that in it proudhon in advance of all others energetically opposed the establishment of national workshops the second organization of credit and circulation sums up in a few pages his idea of economical progress a gradual reduction of interest, profit, rent, taxes, and wages. All progress hitherto has been made in this manner. In this manner it must continue to be made. Those working men 
who favour a nominal increase of wages are, unconsciously, following a backtrack, opposed to all their interests. After having published in Le Représentant du Peuple the statutes of the Bank of Exchange, a bank which was to make no profits, since it was to have no stockholders, and which, consequently, was to discount commercial paper without interest, charging only a commission sufficient to defray its running expenses. Proudhon endeavoured, in a number of articles, to explain its mechanism and necessity. These articles have been collected in one volume, under the double title, Résumé of the Social Question, Bank of Exchange. His other articles, those which up to December 1848 were inspired by the progress of events, have been collected in another volume, Revolutionary Ideas. Revolutionary Ideas almost unknown in March 1848, and struck off in April from the list of candidates for the Constituent Assembly by the delegation of working men which sat at the Luxembourg. Proudhon had but a very small number of votes at the general elections of April. At the complimentary elections which were held in the early days of June, he was elected in Paris by 77,000 votes. After the fatal days of June, he published an article on Le Terme, which caused the first suspension of Le Représentant du Peuple. It was at that time that he introduced a bill into the Assembly, which, being referred to the Committee of the Finances, drew forth first the report of M. Thiers, and then the speech which Proudhon delivered on the 31st of July, in reply to this report. Le Représentant du Peuple reappearing a few days later, he wrote, apropos of the new law, requiring journals to give bonds, his famous article on the Malthusians, August tenth, 1848. Ten days afterwards, Le Représentant du Peuple, again suspended, definitely ceased to appear. Le Peuple, of which he was the editor-in-chief, and the first number of which was issued in the early part of September, appeared weekly at first, for want of sufficient bonds. It afterwards appeared daily, with a double number, once a week. Before Le Peuple had obtained its first bond, Proudhon published a remarkable pamphlet on the right to labour, a right which he denied in the form in which it was then affirmed. It was during the same period that he proposed, at the Poissonnier banquet, his toast to the revolution. Proudhon, who had been asked to preside at the banquet, refused, and proposed in his stead, first, Le Drurola, and then, in view of the reluctance of the organisers of the banquet, the illustrious president of the party of the mountain, Lamennais. It was evidently his intention to induce the representatives of the extreme left to proclaim at last with him the democratic and social republic. Lamennais being accepted by the organisers, the mountain promised to be present at the banquet. The night before, all seemed right. When General Cavagnac, replaced Minister Senat by Minister Dauphord Vivien. The Mountain, questioning the government, proposed a vote of confidence in the old minister, and, tacitly, of want of confidence in the new. Proudhon abstained from voting on this proposition. The Mountain declared that it would not attend the banquet if Proudhon was to be present. Five Montagnards, Mathieu of Drome at their head, went to the temporary office of Le Peuple to notify him of this. Citizen Proudhon, said they to the organisers in his presence, in abstaining from voting today on the proposition of the mountain, has betrayed the Republican cause. Proudhon, vehemently questioned, began his defence by recalling, on the one hand, the treatment which he had received from the dismissed minister, and on the other, the impartial conduct displayed towards him in 1840, by Monsieur Vivien, the new minister. He then attacked the mountain by telling its delegates that it sought only a pretext, and that really, in spite of its professions of socialism in private conversation, whether with him or with the organisers of the banquet, it had not the courage to publicly declare itself socialist. On the following day, in his toast to the revolution, a toast which was filled with allusions to the exciting scene of the night before, Proudhon commenced his struggle against the mountain. His duel with Félix Payat was one of the episodes of this struggle, 
which became less bitter on Proudhon's side after the mountain finally decided to publicly proclaim the Democratic and Social Republic. The campaign for the election of a president of the Republic had just begun. Proudhon made a very sharp attack on the candidacy of Louis Bonaparte in a pamphlet which is regarded as one of his literary chef d'oeuvre, the pamphlet of the presidency. An opponent of this institution, against which he had voted in the Constituent Assembly, he at first decided to take no part in the campaign, but soon seeing that he was thus increasing the chances of Louis Bonaparte, and that if, as was not at all possible, the latter should not obtain an absolute majority of the votes, the Assembly would not fail to elect General Cavagnac, he espoused, for the sake of form, the candidacy of Raspel, who was supported by his friends in the Socialist Committee. Charles de Lescluze, the editor-in-chief of La Révolution Démocratique et Sociale, who could not forgive him for having preferred Raspail to Ledru Rollin, the candidate of the mountain, attacked him on the day after the election with a violence which overstepped all bounds. At first, Proudhon had the wisdom to refrain from answering him. At length, driven to an extremity, he became aggressive himself and Delescluze sent him his seconds. This time, Proudhon positively refused to fight. He would not have fought with Félix Payat, had not his courage been called in question. On the 25th of January, 1849, Proudhon, rising from a sickbed, saw that the existence of the Constituent Assembly was endangered by the coalition of the monarchical parties with Louis Bonaparte, who was already planning his coup d'état, he did not hesitate to openly attack the man who had just received five millions of votes. He wanted to break the idol. He succeeded only in getting prosecuted and condemned himself. The prosecution demanded against him was authorization of a majority of the Constituent Assembly, in spite of the speech which he delivered on that occasion. Declared guilty by the jury, he was sentenced in March 1849 to three years' imprisonment and the payment of a fine of ten thousand francs. Proudhon had not abandoned for a single moment his project of a bank of exchange, which was to operate without capital, with a sufficient number of merchants and manufacturers for adherents. This bank, which he then called the Bank of the People, and around which he wished to gather the numerous working people's associations, which had been formed since the 24th of February, 1848, had already obtained a certain number of subscribers and adherents, the latter of the number of 37,000. It was about to commence operations, when Proudhon's sentence forced him to choose between imprisonment and exile. He did not hesitate to abandon his project and return the money to the subscribers. He explained the motives which led him to this decision in an article in Le Peuple. Having fled to Belgium, he remained there but a few days, going thence to Paris, under an assumed name, to conceal himself in a house in the Rue de Chabral. From his hiding place he sent articles almost every day, signed and unsigned, to Le Peuple. In the evening, dressed in a blouse, he went to some secluded spot to take the air. Soon, emboldened by habit, he risked an evening promenade upon the boulevards, and afterwards carried his imprudence so far as to take a stroll by daylight in the neighbourhood of the Gare du Nord. It was not long before he was recognised by the police, who arrested him on the 6th of June, 1849, in the Rue du Faubourg Poissonniere. Taken to the office of the Prefect of Police, then to Sainte Pelagie, he was in the Conciergerie on the day of 13th of June, 1849, which ended with the violent suppression of Le Peuple. He then began to write The Confessions of a Revolutionist, published towards the end of the year. He had been again transferred to Saint-Pelagie, when he married, in December 1849, Mademoiselle Euphrasie Piegard, a young working girl whose hand he had requested in 1847. Madame Proudhon bore him four daughters, of whom but two, Catherine and Stephanie survived their father. Stephanie died in 1873. In October 1849, Le Peuple was replaced by a new journal, La Voix du Peuple, which Proudhon edited from his prison cell. 
In it were published his discussions with Pierre Leroux and Bastia. The political articles which he sent to La Voix du Peuple so displeased the government finally that it transferred him to Doulon, where he was secretly confined for some time. Afterwards, taken back to Paris to appear before the assizes of the Seine in reference to an article in La Voix du Peuple, he was defended by Monsieur Cremieux and acquitted. From the conciergerie he went again to saint pelagie where he ended his three years in prison on 6th of June, 1852. La Voix du Peuple, suppressed before the promulgation of the law of the 31st of May, had been replaced by a weekly sheet, Le Peuple, of 1850. Established by the aid of the principal members of the mountain, this journal soon met with the fate of its predecessors. In 1851, several months before the coup d'etat, Proudhon published the general idea of the revolution of the 19th century, in which, after having shown the logical series of unitary governments, from monarchy, which is the first term, to the direct government of the people, which is the last, he opposes the ideal of anarchy or self-government to the communistic or governmental ideal. At this period, the Socialist Party, discouraged by the elections of 1849, which resulted in a greater conservative triumph than those of 1848, and justly angry with the national representative body, which had just passed the law of the 31st of May, 1850, demanded direct legislation and direct government. Proudhon, who did not want, at any price, the plebiscitary system which he had good reason to regard as destructive of liberty, did not hesitate to point out, to those of his friends who expected everything from direct legislation, one of the antinomies of universal suffrage, in so far as it is an institution intended to achieve for the benefits of the greatest number, the social reforms to which landed suffrage is opposed. Universal suffrage is powerless, especially if it pretends to legislate or govern directly. For until the social reforms are accomplished, the greatest number is, of necessity, the least enlightened, and consequently the least capable of understanding and effecting reforms. In regard to the antinomy, pointed out by him, of liberty and government, whether the latter be monarchic, aristocratic, or democratic in form, Proudhon, whose chief desire was to preserve liberty, naturally sought the solution in the free contract. But though the free contract may be a practical solution of purely economical questions, it cannot be made use of in politics. Proudhon recognized this ten years later, when his beautiful study on war and peace led him to find in the federative principle the exact equilibrium of liberty and government. The social revolution demonstrated by the coup d'etat appeared in 1852, a few months after his release from prison. At that time, terror prevailed to such an extent that no one was willing to publish his book without express permission from the government. He succeeded in obtaining this permission by writing to Louis Bonaparte a letter which he published at the same time with the work. The letter being offered for sale, Proudhon was warned that he would not be allowed to publish any more books of the same character. At that time, he entertained the idea of writing a universal history entitled Kronos. This project was never fulfilled. Already the father of two children, and about to be presented with a third, Proudhon was obliged to devise some immediate means of gaining a living. He resumed his labours and published, at first anonymously, the manual of a speculator in the stock exchange. Later, in 1857, after having completed the work, he did not hesitate to sign it, acknowledging in the preface his indebtedness to his collaborator, G. Duchesne. Meantime, he vainly sought permission to establish a journal or review. This permission was steadily refused him. The imperial government always suspected him after the publication of the social revolution demonstrated by the coup d'etat. Towards the end of 1853, Proudhon issued in Belgium a pamphlet entitled the philosophy of progress entirely inoffensive as it was this pamphlet which he endeavoured to send into france was seized on the frontier proudhon's complaints were of no avail the empire gave grants after grants to large companies 
a financial society having asked for the grant of a railroad in the east of france employed proudhon to write several memoirs in support of this demand the grant was given to another company the author was offered an indemnity as compensation to be paid as was customary in such cases by the company which received the grant it is needless to say that proudhon would accept nothing then wishing to explain to the public as well as to the government the end which he had in view he published the work entitled reforms to be effected in the management of railroads towards the end of eighteen fifty four proudhon had already begun his book on justice when he had a violent attack of cholera from which he recovered with great difficulty ever afterwards his health was delicate at last on the twenty second of april eighteen fifty eight he published in three large volumes the important work upon which he had laboured since eighteen fifty four this work had two titles the first justice in the revolution and in the church the second new principles of practical philosophy addressed to his highness monsieur mathieu cardinal archbishop of besancon on the twenty seventh of april when there had scarcely been time to read the work an order was issued by the magistrate for its seizure on the twenty eighth the seizure was effected to this first act of the magistracy the author of the incriminated book replied on the eleventh of may in a strongly motivated petition demanding a revision of the concordat of eighteen o two or in other words a new adjustment of the relations between church and state at bottom this petition was but the logical consequence of the work itself an edition of a thousand copies being published on the seventeenth of may the petition to the senate was regarded by the public prosecutor as an aggravation of the offence or offences discovered in the body of the work to which it was an appendix and was seized in its turn on the twenty-third on the first of june the author appealed to the senate in a second petition which was deposited with the first in the office of the secretary of the assembly the guardian and guarantee according to the constitution of eighteen fifty two of the principles of eighty nine on the second of june the two processes being united proudhon appeared at the bar with his publisher the printer of the book and the printer of the petition to receive the sentence of the police magistrate which condemned him to three years imprisonment a fine of four thousand francs and the suppression of his work it is needless to say that the publisher and printers were also condemned by the sixth chamber proudhon lodged an appeal he wrote a memoir which the law of eighteen nineteen in the absence of which he would have been liable to a new prosecution gave him the power to publish previous to the hearing having decided to make use of the means which the law permitted he urged in vain the printers who were prosecuted with him to lend him their aid he then demanded of attorney general chez d'estange a statement to the effect that the twenty-third article of the law of the seventeenth of may eighteen nineteen allows a written defence and that a printer runs no risk in printing it the attorney general flatly refused proudhon then started for belgium where he printed his defence which could not of course cross the french frontier this memoir is entitled to rank with the best of beaumarchais it is entitled justice prosecuted by the church an appeal from the sentence passed upon p j proudhon by the police magistrate of the seine on the second of june eighteen fifty eight a very close discussion of the grounds of the judgment of the sixth chamber it was at the same time an excellent resume of his great work once in belgium proudhon did not fail to remain there in eighteen fifty nine after the general amnesty which followed the italian war he at first thought himself included in it but the imperial government consulted by his friends notified him that in its opinion and in spite of the contrary advice of m faustin elie his condemnation was not of a political character proudhon thus classed by the government with the authors of immoral works thought it beneath his dignity to protest and waited patiently for the advent of eighteen sixty three to allow him to return to france in belgium where he was not slow in forming new friendships he published in eighteen fifty nine to sixty in separate parts a new edition of his great work on justice 
Each number contained, in addition to the original text carefully reviewed and corrected, numerous explanatory notes and some tidings of the revolution. In these tidings, which form a sort of review of the progress of ideas in Europe, Proudhon sorrowfully asserts that, after having for a long time marched at the head of the progressive nations, France has become, without appearing to suspect it, the most retrogressive of nations, and he considers her more than once as seriously threatened with moral death. The Italian war led him to write a new work, which he published in 1861, entitled War and Peace. This work, in which, running counter to a multitude of ideas accepted until then without examination, he pronounced for the first time against the restoration of an aristocracy and priestly Poland, and against the establishment of a unitary government in Italy, created for him a multitude of enemies. Most of his friends, disconcerted by his categorical affirmation of a right of force, notified him that they decidedly disapproved of his new publication. You see, triumphantly cried those with whom he had always combated, this man is only a sophist. Led by his previous studies to test everything by the question of right, Proudhon asks in his War and Peace whether there is a real right of which war is the vindication and victory the demonstration. This right, which he roughly calls the right of the strongest or the right of force, and which is, after all, only the right of the most worthy to the preference in certain definite cases, exists, says Proudhon, independently of war. It cannot be legitimately vindicated, except where necessity clearly demands the subordination of one will to another, and within the limits in which it exists, that is, without ever involving the enslavement of one by the other. Among nations, the right of the majority which is only a corollary to the right of force, is as unacceptable as universal monarchy. Hence, until equilibrium is established and recognized between states or national forces, there must be war. War, says Proudhon, is not always necessary to determine which side is the strongest, and he has no trouble in proving this by examples drawn from the family, the workshop, and elsewhere. Passing then to the study of war, he proves that it by no means corresponds in practice to that which it ought to be according to his theory of the right of force. The systematic horrors of war naturally lead him to seek a cause for it other than the vindication of this right, and then only does the economist take it upon himself to denounce this cause to those who, like himself, want peace. The necessity of finding abroad a compensation for the misery resulting in every nation from the absence of economical equilibrium is, according to Proudhon, the ever real, though ever concealed, cause of war. The pages devoted to this demonstration and to his theory of poverty, which he clearly distinguishes from misery and pauperism, shed entirely new light upon the philosophy of history. As for the author's conclusion, it is a very simple one. Since the Treaty of Westphalia, and especially since the Treaties of 1815, equilibrium has been the international law of Europe. It remains now not to destroy it, but while maintaining it to labour peacefully, in every nation protected by it, for the equilibrium of economical forces. The last line of the book, evidently written to check imperial ambition, is, Humanity wants no more war. In 1861, after Garibaldi's expedition and the battle of Castelfidaro, Proudhon immediately saw that the establishment of Italian unity would be a severe blow to European equilibrium. It was chiefly in order to maintain this equilibrium that he pronounced so energetically in favour of Italian federation, even though it should be at first only a federation of monarchs. In vain was it objected that, in being established by France, Italian unity would break European equilibrium in our favour. Proudhon, appealing to history, showed that every state which breaks the equilibrium in its own favour only causes the other states to combine against it, and thereby diminishes its influence and power. He added that, nations being essentially selfish, Italy would not fail, when opportunity offered, to place her interest above her gratitude.
to maintain european equilibrium by diminishing great states and multiplying small ones to unite the latter in organized federations not for attack but for defense and with these federations which if they were not republican already would quickly become so to hold in check the great military monarchies such in the beginning of eighteen sixty one was the political program of proudhon the object of the federations he said will be to guarantee as far as possible the beneficent reign of peace and they will have the further effect of securing in every nation the triumph of liberty over despotism where the largest unitary state is their liberty is in the greatest danger further if this state be democratic despotism without the counterpoise of majorities is to be feared with the federation it is not so the universal suffrage of the federal state is checked by the universal suffrage of the federated states and the latter is offset in its turn by property the stronghold of liberty which it tends not to destroy but to balance with the institutions of mutualism all these ideas and many others which were only hinted at in his work on war and peace were developed by proudhon in his subsequent publications one of which has for its motto reforms always utopias never the thinker had evidently finished his evolution the council of state of the canton of vaux having offered prizes for essays on the question of taxation previously discussed at a congress held at lausanne proudhon entered the ranks and carried off the first prize his memoir was published in eighteen sixty one under the title of the theory of taxation about the same time he wrote at brussels in l'office de publicite some remarkable articles on the question of literary property which was discussed at a congress held in belgium these articles must not be confounded with literary majora a more complete work on the same subject which was published in eighteen sixty three soon after his return to france arbitrarily accepted from the amnesty in eighteen fifty nine Proudhon was pardoned two years later by a special act. He did not wish to take advantage of this favour, and seemed resolved to remain in Belgium until the 2nd of June, 1863, the time when he was to acquire the privilege of prescription, when an absurd and ridiculous riot, excited in Brussels by an article published by him on federation and unity in Italy, induced him to hasten his return to France. Stones were thrown against the house in which he lived, in the Faubourg d'Excel, after having placed his wife and daughters in safety among his friends at Brussels, he arrived in Paris in September 1862 and published there Federation and Italian Unity, a pamphlet which naturally commences with the article, which served as a pretext for the rioters in Brussels. Among the works begun by Proudhon while in Belgium, which death did not allow him to finish, we ought to mention a history of Poland which will be published later, and The Theory of Property, which appeared in 1865, before Gospels Annotated, and after the volume entitled The Principle of Art and Its Social Destiny. The publications of Proudhon in 1863 were, 1. Literary Majora, an examination of a bill having for its object the creation of a perpetual monopoly for the benefit of authors, inventors, and artists. 2. The federative principle and the necessity of re establishing at the revolutionary party. 3. The sworn democrats and the refractories. 4. Whether the treaties of 1815 have ceased to exist. Acts of the future Congress. The disease which was destined to kill him grew worse and worse, but Proudhon laboured constantly. A series of articles published in 1864 in le messager de paris have been collected in a pamphlet under the title of new observations on italian unity he hoped to publish during the same year his work on the political capacity of the working classes but was unable to write the last chapter he grew weaker continually his doctor prescribed rest in the month of august he went to franche comte where he spent a month having returned to paris he resumed his labor with difficulty from the month of December onwards, the heart disease made rapid progress. The oppression became insupportable. 
His legs were swollen, and he could not sleep. On the 19th of January, 1865, he died, towards two o'clock in the morning, in the arms of his wife, his sister-in-law, and the friend who writes these lines. The publication of his correspondence, to which his daughter Catherine is faithfully devoted, will tend, no doubt, to increase his reputation as a thinker, as a writer, and as an honest man. J. A. Longrois End of Section 2 P. J. Proudhon, His Life and Works, Part 2 Recording by Lynn Thompson Section 3 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker Preface The following letter served as a preface to the first edition of this memoir. To the members of the Academy of Besançon, Paris, June 30, 1840. Gentlemen, in the course of your debate of the 9th of May, 1833, in regard to the triennial pension established by Madame Souard, you expressed the following wish. The Academy requests the titulary to present it annually during the first fortnight in July with a succinct and logical statement of the various studies which he has pursued during the year which has just expired. I now propose, gentlemen, to discharge this duty. When I solicited your votes, I boldly avowed my intention to bend my efforts to the discovery of some means of ameliorating the physical, moral and intellectual condition of the mere numerous and poorer classes. This idea, foreign as it may have seemed to the object of my candidacy, you received favorably and, by the precious distinction with which it has been your pleasure to honour me, you changed this formal offer into an inviolable and sacred obligation. Thenceforth I understood with how worthy and honourable a society I had to deal. My regard for its enlightenment, my recognition of its benefits, my enthusiasm for its glory were unbounded. Convinced at once that, in order to break loose from the beaten paths of opinions and systems, it was necessary to proceed in my study of man and society by scientific methods, and in a rigorous manner, I devoted one year to philology and grammar, linguistics, or the natural history of speech being, of all the sciences, that which was best suited for the character of my mind, seemed to bear the closest relation to the researches which I was about to commence. A treatise, written at this period upon one of the most interesting questions of comparative grammar, footnote, an inquiry into grammatical classifications by P.G. Proudhon, a treatise which received honorable mention from the Academy of Inscriptions, May 4, 1839, out of print, end of footnote. If it did not reveal the astonishing success, at least bore witness to the thoroughness of my labors. Since that time, metaphysics and moral science have been my only studies. My perception of the fact that these sciences, though badly defined as to their object and not confined to their sphere, are, like the natural sciences, susceptible of demonstration and certainty, has already rewarded my efforts. But, gentlemen, of all the masters whom I have followed, to none do I owe so much as to you. Your cooperation, your programs, your instructions, in agreement with my secret wishes and most cherished hopes, have at no time failed to enlighten me and to point out my road. This memoir on property is the child of your thought. In 1838, the Academy of Besançon proposed the following question. 
To what causes must we attribute the continually increasing number of suicides and what are the proper means for arresting the effects of this moral contagion? Thereby it asked, in less general terms, what was the cause of the social evil and what was its remedy? You admitted that yourselves, gentlemen, when your committee reported that the competitors had enumerated with exactness the immediate and particular causes of suicide, as well as the means of preventing each of them, but that from this enumeration, chronicled with more or less skill, no positive information had been gained either as to the primary cause of the evil or as to its remedy. In 1839, your program, always original and varied in its academical expression, became more exact. The investigations of 1838 had pointed out, as the causes or rather as the symptoms of the social malady, the neglect of the principles of religion and morality, the desire for wealth, the passion for enjoyment and political disturbances. All these data were embodied by you in a single proposition, the utility of the celebration of Sunday as regards hygiene, morality and social and political relation. In a Christian tongue, you asked, gentlemen, what was the true system of society? A competitor Footnote, the utility of the celebration of Sunday by P. G. Proudhon, Besançon, 1839, 12 mo, second edition, Paris, 1841, 18 mo, end of footnote, dared to maintain and believed that he had proved that the institution of a day of rest at weekly intervals is inseparably bound up with a political system based on the equality of conditions that without equality this institution is an anomaly and an impossibility, that equality alone can revive this ancient and mysterious keeping of the seventh day. This argument did not meet with your approbation, since, without denying the relation pointed out by the competitor, you judged, and rightly, gentlemen, that the principle of equality of conditions not being demonstrated, the ideas of the author were nothing more than hypotheses. Finally, gentlemen, this fundamental principle of equality you presented for competition in the following terms. The economical and moral consequences in France up to the present time and those which seem likely to appear in future of the law concerning the equal division of hereditary property between the children. Instead of confining one to commonplaces without breadth or significance, it seems to me that your question should be developed as follows. If the law has been able to render the right of heredity common to all the children of one father, can it not render it equal for all his grandchildren and great-grandchildren? If the law no longer heeds the age of any member of the family, can it not, by the right of heredity, cease to heed it in the race, in the tribe, in the nation? Can equality, by the right of succession, be preserved between citizens as well as between cousins and brothers? In a word, can the principle of succession become a principle of equality? To sum up all these ideas in one inclusive question, what is the principle of heredity? What are the foundations of inequality? What is property? Such, gentlemen, is the object of the memoir that I offer you today. If I have rightly grasped the object of your thought, 
If I succeed in bringing to light a truth which is indisputable, but from causes which I am bold enough to claim to have explained, has always been misunderstood, if, by an infallible method of investigation, I establish the dogma of equality of conditions, if I determine the principle of civil law, the essence of justice, and the form of society, if I annihilate property forever, to you, gentlemen, will redound all the glory, for it is to your aid and your inspiration that I owe it. My purpose in this work is the application of method to the problems of philosophy. Every other intention is foreign to, and even abusive of it. I have spoken lightly of jurisprudence. I had the right, but I should be unjust did I not distinguish between this pretended science and the men who practice it devoted to studies both laborious and severe, entitled in all respects to the esteem of their fellow citizens by their knowledge and eloquence, our legists deserve but one reproach, that of an excessive deference to arbitrary laws. I have been pitiless in my criticism of the economists. For them I confess that, in general, I have no liking. The arrogance and the emptiness of their writings, their impertinent pride and their unwarranted blunders have disgusted me. Whoever, knowing them, pardons them, may read them. I have severely blamed the learned Christian Church. It was my duty. This blame results from the facts which I call attention to. Why has the Church decreed concerning things which it does not understand? The Church has erred in dogma and in morals. Physics and mathematics testify against her. It may be wrong for me to say it, but surely it is unfortunate for Christianity that it is true. To restore religion, gentlemen, it is necessary to condemn the Church. Perhaps you will regret, gentlemen, that in giving all my attention to method and evidence I have too much neglected form and style. In vain should I have tried to do better. Literary hope and faith I have none. The nineteenth century is, in my eyes, a genesic era in which new principles are elaborated, but in which nothing that is written shall endure. That is the reason, in my opinion, why among so many men of talent, France today counts not one great writer. In a society like ours, to seek for literary glory seems to me an anachronism. Of what use is it to invoke an ancient sibyl when a muse is on the eve of birth? Pitiable actors in a tragedy nearing its end that which it behooves us to do is to precipitate the catastrophe. The most deserving among us is he who plays best this part. Well, I no longer aspire to this sad success. Why should I not confess it, gentlemen? I have aspired to your suffrages and sought the title of your pensioner, hating all which exists and full of projects for its destruction. I shall finish this investigation in a spirit of calm and philosophical resignation. I have derived more peace from the knowledge of the truth than anger from the feeling of oppression, and the most precious fruit that I could wish to gather from this memoir would be the inspiration of my readers with that tranquility of soul which arises from the clear perception of evil and its cause, and which is much more powerful than passion and enthusiasm. My hatred of privilege and human authority was unbounded. Perhaps at times I have been guilty in my indignation of confounding persons and things. At present I can only despise and complain. To cease to hate I only needed to know. It is for you now, gentlemen, whose mission and character are the proclamation of the truth. 
It is for you to instruct the people and to tell them for what they ought to hope and what they ought to fear. The people, incapable as yet of sound judgment as to what is best for them, applaud indiscriminately the most opposite ideas, provided that in them they get a taste of flattery. To them the laws of thought are like the confines of the possible. Today they can no more distinguish between a savant and a sophist than formerly they could tell a physician from a sorcerer. Inconsiderately accepting, gathering together and accumulating everything that is new, regarding all reports as true and indubitable at the breath of a ring of novelty, they assemble like bees at the sound of a basin. Footnote, Charon, on Wisdom, Chapter 18 End of footnote. May you, gentlemen, desire equality as I myself desire it. May you, for the eternal happiness of our country, become its propagators and its heralds. May I be the last of your pensioners. Of all the wishes that I can frame, that, gentlemen, is the most worthy of you and the most honorable for me. I am, with the profoundest respect and most earnest gratitude, your pensioner, P.G. Proudhon. Two months after the receipt of this letter, the Academy, in its debate of August 24th, replied to the address of its pensioner by a note, the text of which I give below. A member calls the attention of the Academy to a pamphlet published last June by the titulary of the Soir pension, entitled What is Property? and dedicated by the author to the Academy. He is of the opinion that the society owes it to justice, to example and to its own dignity to publicly disavow all responsibility for the anti-social doctrines contained in this publication. In consequence, he demands... First, that the Academy disavow and condemn in the most formal manner the work of the Sua pensioner as having been published without its assent and as attributing to it opinions diametrically opposed to the principles of each of its members. Second, that the pensioner be charged, in case he should publish a second edition of his book, to omit the dedication. Third, that this judgment of the Academy be placed upon the records. These three propositions, put to vote, are adopted. After this ludicrous decree, which its authors thought to render powerful by giving it the form of a contradiction, I can only beg the reader not to measure the intelligence of my compatriots by that of our Academy. While my patrons in the social and political sciences were fulminating anathemas against my brochure, a man who was a stranger to Franche Conti, who did not know me, who might even have regarded himself as personally attacked by the too sharp judgment which I had passed upon the economists, a publicist as learned as he was modest, loved by the people whose sorrows he felt, honored by the power which he sought to enlighten without flattering or disgracing it, Monsieur Blanqui, member of the Institute, professor of political economy, defender of property, took up my defense before his associates and before the ministry and saved me from the blows of a justice which is always blind because it is always ignorant. It seems to me that the reader will peruse with pleasure the letter which Monsieur Blanqui did me the honor to write to me upon the publication of my second memoir, a letter as honorable to its author as it is flattering to him to whom it is addressed. Paris, May 1st, 1841. Monsieur I hasten to thank you for forwarding to me your second memoir upon property. I have read it with all the interest that an acquaintance with the first would naturally inspire. 
I am very glad that you have modified somewhat the rudeness of form which gave to a work of such gravity the manner and appearance of a pamphlet. For you quite frightened me, sir, and your talent was needed to reassure me in regard to your intentions. One does not expend so much real knowledge with the purpose of inflaming his country. This proposition, now coming into notice, property is robbery, was of a nature to repel from your book even those serious minds who do not judge by appearances had you persisted in maintaining it in its rude simplicity. But if you have softened the form, you are nonetheless faithful to the groundwork of your doctrines. And although you have done me the honor to give me a share in this perilous teaching, I cannot accept the partnership which, as far as talent goes, would surely be a credit to me, but which would compromise me in all other respects. I agree with you in one thing only, namely that all kinds of property get too frequently abused in this world. But I do not reason from the abuse to the abolition, an heroic remedy too much like death, which cures all evils. I will go farther. I will confess that, of all abuses, the most hateful to me are those of property. But, once more, there is a remedy for this evil without violating it, all the more without destroying it. If the present laws allow abuse, we can reconstruct them. Our civil code is not the Quran. It is not wrong to examine it. Change, then, the laws which govern the use of property, but be sparing of anathemas. For, logically, where is the honest man whose hands are entirely clean? Do you think that one can be a robber without knowing it, without wishing it, without suspecting it? Do you not admit that society in its present state, like every man, has in its constitution all kinds of virtues and vices inherited from our ancestors? Is property, then, in your eyes a thing so simple and so abstract that you can re-need and equalize it, if I may so speak, in your metaphysical mill? one who has said as many excellent and practical things as occur in these two beautiful and paradoxical improvisations of yours, cannot be a pure and unwavering utopist. You are too well acquainted with the economical and academical phraseology to play with the hard words of revolutions. I believe, then, that you have handled property as Rousseau, eighty years ago, handled letters with a magnificent and poetical display of wit and knowledge. Such, at least, is my opinion. That is what I said to the Institute at the time when I presented my report on your book. I knew that they wished to proceed against you in the courts. You perhaps do not know by how narrow a chance I succeeded in preventing them. Footnote. Monsieur Vivien Minister of Justice, before commencing proceedings against the memoir upon property, asked the opinion of Monsieur Blanqui, and it was on the strength of the observations of this honorable academician that he spared a book which had already excited the indignation of the magistrates. Monsieur Vivien is not the only official to whom I have been indebted since my first publication for assistance and protection. But such generosity in the political arena is so rare that one may acknowledge it graciously and freely. I have always thought, for my part, that bad institutions made bad magistrates. Just as the cowardice and hypocrisy of certain bodies result solely from the spirit which governs them. Why, for instance, in spite of the virtues and talents for which they are so noted, are the academies generally centers of intellectual repression, stupidity and base intrigue? That question ought to be proposed by an academy. There would be no lack of competitors. End of footnote. What chagrin I should always have felt 
If the king's counsel, that is to say, the intellectual executioner, had followed in my very tracks to attack your book and annoy your person, I actually passed two terrible nights, and I succeeded in restraining the secular arm only by showing that your book was an academical dissertation and not the manifesto of an incendiary. Your style is too lofty ever to be of service to the madman who, in discussing the gravest questions of our social order, use paving stones as their weapons. But see to it, sir, that ere long they do not come, in spite of you, to seek for ammunition in this formidable arsenal, and that your vigorous metaphysics falls not into the hands of some sophists of the marketplace, who might discuss the question in the presence of a starving audience. We should have pillage for conclusion and peroration. I feel as deeply as you, sir, the abuses which you point out. But I have so great an affection for order, not that common and straight-laced order with which the police are satisfied, but the majestic and imposing order of human societies, that I sometimes find myself embarrassed in attacking certain abuses. I like to rebuild with one hand when I am compelled to destroy with the other. In pruning an old tree, we guard against destruction of the buds and fruit. You know that as well as anyone. You are a wise and learned man. You have a thoughtful mind. The terms by which you characterize the fanatics of our day are strong enough to reassure the most suspicious imaginations as to your intentions. But you conclude in favor of the abolition of property. You wish to abolish the most powerful motor of the human mind. You attack the paternal sentiment in its sweetest illusions. With one word, you arrest the formation of capital, and we build henceforth upon the sand instead of on a rock. That I cannot agree to. And for that reason I have criticized your book so full of beautiful pages, so brilliant with knowledge and fervor. I wish, sir, that my impaired health would permit me to examine with you, page by page, the memoir which you have done me the honor to address to me, publicly and personally. I think I could offer some important criticisms. For the moment, I must content myself with thanking you for the kind words in which you have seen fit to speak of me. We each possess the merit of sincerity. I desire also the merit of prudence. You know how deep-seated is the disease under which the working people are suffering. I know how many noble hearts beat under those rude garments, and I feel an irresistible and fraternal sympathy for the thousands of brave people who rise early in the morning to labor, to pay their taxes, and to make our country strong. I try to serve and enlighten them, whereas some endeavor to mislead them. You have not written directly for them. You have issued two magnificent manifestos, the second more guarded than the first. Issue a third more guarded than the second, and you will take high rank in science, whose first precept is calmness and impartiality. Farewell, sir. No man's esteem for another can exceed mine for you. Blanqui. I should certainly take some exceptions to this noble and eloquent letter, but I confess that I am more inclined to realize the prediction with which it terminates than to augment needlessly the number of my antagonists. So much controversy fatigues and wearies me. The intelligence expended in the warfare of words is like that employed in battle. It is intelligence wasted. Monsieur Blanqui acknowledges that property is abused in many harmful ways. I call property the sum of these abuses exclusively. To each of us, property seems a polygon whose angles need knocking off. But the operation performed, Monsieur Blanqui maintains that the figure will still be a polygon, 
an hypothesis admitted in mathematics, although not proven, while I consider that this figure will be a circle. Honest people can at least understand one another. For the rest, I allow that, in the present state of the question, the mind may legitimately hesitate before deciding in favor of the abolition of property. To gain the victory for one's cause, it does not suffice simply to overthrow a principle generally recognized, which has the indisputable merit of systematically recapitulating our political theories. It is also necessary to establish the opposite principle and to formulate the system which must proceed from it. Still further, it is necessary to show the method by which the new system will satisfy all the moral and political needs which induced the establishment of the first. On the following conditions, then, of subsequent evidence, depends the correctness of my preceding arguments. The discovery of a system of absolute equality, in which all existing institutions, save property or the sum of the abuses of property, not only may find a place, but may themselves serve as instruments of equality. Individual liberty, the division of power, the public ministry, the jury system, administrative and judicial organization, the unity and completeness of instruction, marriage, the family, heredity in direct and collateral succession, the right of sale and exchange, the right to make a will and even birthright, a system which, better than property, guarantees the formation of capital and keeps up the courage of all, which, from a superior point of view, explains, corrects and completes the theories of association hitherto proposed from Plato and Pythagoras to Babeuf, Saint-Simon and Fourier. A system, finally, which, serving as a means of transition, is immediately applicable. A work so vast requires, I am aware, the united efforts of twenty Montesquieu's. Nevertheless, if it is not given to a single man to finish, a single one can commence the enterprise. The road that he shall traverse will suffice to show the end and assure the result. End of section 3 Preface. Section 4 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Nelson. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Chapter 1 First Memoir. Method Pursued in This Work The Idea of a Revolution Part 1 If I were asked to answer the following question, What is slavery? And I should answer in one word, It is murder. My meaning would be understood at once. No extended argument would be required to show that the power to take from a man his thought, his will, his personality, is a power of life and death and that to enslave a man is to kill him. Why, then, to this other question, what is property, may I not likewise answer, it is robbery, without the certainty of being misunderstood, the second proposition being no other than a transformation of the first? I undertake to discuss the vital principle of our government and our institutions, property. I am in my right. I may be mistaken in the conclusion which shall result from my investigations. I am in my right. I think best to place the last thought of my book first. Still am I in my right. Such an author teaches that property is a civil right, born of occupation and sanctioned by law. Another maintains that it is a natural right, originating in labor. And both of these doctrines totally opposed as they may seem, are encouraged and applauded. I contend that neither labor, nor occupation, nor law can create property. 
that it is an effect without a cause. Am I censurable? But murmurs arise. Property is robbery. That is the war cry of 93. That is the signal of revolutions. Reader, calm yourself. I am no agent of discord, no firebrand of sedition. I anticipate history by a few days. I disclose a truth whose development we may try in vain to arrest. I write the preamble of our future constitution. This proposition, which seems to you blasphemous, property is robbery, would, if our prejudice allowed us to consider it, be recognized as the lightning rod to shield us from the coming thunderbolt. But too many interests stand in the way. Alas, philosophy will not change the course of events. Destiny will fulfill itself regardless of prophecy. Besides, must not justice be done and our education be finished? Property is robbery. What a revolution in human ideas. Proprietor and robber have been at all times expressions as contradictory as the beings whom they designate are hostile. All languages have perpetuated this opposition. On what authority, then, do you venture to attack universal consent and give the lie to the human race? Who are you that you should question the judgment of the nations and the ages? Of what consequence to you, reader, is my obscure individuality? I live, like you, in a century in which reason submits only to fact and to evidence. My name, like yours, is Truth Seeker. My mission is written in these words of law. Speak without hatred and without fear. Tell that which thou knowest. The work of our race is to build the temple of science, and this science includes man and nature. Now truth reveals itself to all, today to Newton and Pascal, tomorrow to the herdsman in the valley and the journeyman in the shop. Each one contributes his stone to the edifice, and his task accomplished disappears. Eternity precedes us, eternity follows us. Between two infinities, of what account is one poor mortal that the century should inquire about him? Disregard, then, reader, my title and my character, and attend only to my arguments. It is in accordance with universal consent that I undertake to correct universal error. From the opinion of the human race, I appeal to its faith. Have the courage to follow me, and if your will is untrammeled, if your conscience is free, if your mind can unite two propositions and deduce a third therefrom, my ideas will inevitably become yours. In beginning by giving you my last word, it was my purpose to warn you, not to defy you, for I am certain that if you read me, you will be compelled to assent. The things of which I am to speak are so simple and clear that you will be astonished at not having perceived them before and you will say, I have neglected to think. Others offer you the spectacle of genius, wresting nature's secrets from her, and unfolding before you her sublime messages. You will find here only a series of experiments upon justice and right, a sort of verification of the weights and measures of your conscience. The operations shall be conducted under your very eyes, and you shall weigh the result. Nevertheless, I build no system. I ask an end to privilege, the abolition of slavery, equality of rights, and the reign of law. Justice, nothing else, that is the alpha and omega of my argument. To others I leave the business of governing the world. One day I asked myself, Why is there so much sorrow and misery in society? Must man always be wretched? and not satisfied with explanations given by the reformers, these attributing the general distress to governmental cowardice and incapacity, those to conspirators 
and emutes, still others to ignorance and general corruption, and weary of the interminable quarrels of the tribune and the press, I sought to fathom the matter myself. I have consulted the masters of science, I have read a hundred volumes of philosophy, law, political economy, and history. Would to God that I had lived in a century in which so much reading had been useless. I have made every effort to obtain exact information, comparing doctrines, replying to objections, continually constructing equations and reductions from arguments, and weighing thousands of syllogisms in the scales of the most rigorous logic. In this laborious work, I have collected many interesting facts which I shall share with my friends and the public as soon as I have leisure. But I must say that I recognized at once that we had never understood the meaning of these words, so common and yet so sacred, justice, equality, liberty, that concerning each of these principles our ideas have been utterly obscure, and in fact that this ignorance was the sole cause both of poverty that devours us and of all the calamities that have ever afflicted the human race. My mind was frightened by this strange result. I doubted my reason. What, said I, that which I has not seen, nor I heard, nor insight penetrated, you have discovered? Wretch, mistake not the visions of your diseased brain for the truths of science. Do you not know? Great philosophers have said so, that in points of practical morality universal error is a contradiction. I resolved then to test my arguments, and in entering upon this new labor I sought an answer to the following questions. Is it possible that humanity can have been so long and so universally mistaken in the application of moral principles? How and why could it be mistaken? How can its error, being universal, be capable of correction? These questions, on the solution of which depended the certainty of my conclusions, offered no lengthy resistance to analysis. It will be seen, in chapter 5 of this work, that in morals, as in all other branches of knowledge, the gravest errors are the dogmas of science, that, even in the works of justice, to be mistaken is a privilege which ennobles man, and that whatever philosophical merit may attach to me is infinitely small. To name a thing is easy. The difficulty is to discern it before its appearance. In giving expression to the last stage of an idea, an idea which permeates all minds, which tomorrow will be proclaimed by another if I fail to announce it today. I can claim no merit save that of priority of utterance. Do we eulogize the man who first perceives the dawn? Yes. All men believe and repeat that equality of conditions is identical with equality of rights, that property and robbery are synonymous terms, that every social advantage accorded, or rather usurped, in the name of superior talent or service, is iniquity and extortion. All men in their hearts, I say, bear witness to these truths. They need only to be made to understand it. Before entering directly upon the question before me, I must say a word of the road that I shall traverse. When Pascal approached a geometrical problem, he invented a method of solution. To solve a problem in philosophy, a method is equally necessary. Well, by how much do the problems of which philosophy treats surpass in the gravity of their results those discussed by geometry? How much more imperatively, then, do they demand for their solution a profound and rigorous analysis? It is a fact placed forever beyond doubt, say the modern psychologists, that every perception received by the mind is determined by certain general laws which govern the mind, is molded, so to speak, in certain types pre-existing in our understanding and which constitutes its original condition. Hence, say they, if the mind has no innate ideas, it has at least innate forms. Thus, for example, 
Every phenomenon is of necessity conceived by us as happening in time and space. That compels us to infer a cause of its occurrence. Everything which exists implies the ideas of substance, mode, relation, number, etc. In a word, we form no idea which is not related to some one of the general principles of reason, independent of which nothing exists. These axioms of the understanding, add the psychologists, these fundamental types by which all our judgments and ideas are inevitably shaped, and which our sensations serve only to illuminate, are known in the schools as categories. Their primordial existence in the mind is today demonstrated. They need only to be systematized and catalogued. Aristotle recognized ten. Kant increased the number to fifteen. Monsieur Cousin has reduced it to three, to two, to one, and the indisputable glory of this professor will be due to the fact that, if he has not discovered the true theory of categories, he has, at least, seen more clearly than anyone else the vast importance of this question, the greatest and perhaps the only one with which metaphysics has to deal. I confess that I disbelieve in the innateness, not only of ideas, but also of forms or laws of our understanding, and I hold the metaphysics of Reed and Kant to be still farther removed from the truth than that of Aristotle. However, as I do not wish to enter here into a discussion of the mind, a task which would demand much labor and be of no interest to the public, I shall admit the hypothesis that our most general and most necessary ideas, such as time, space, substance, and cause, exist originally in the mind, or, at least, are derived immediately from its constitution. But it is a psychological fact nonetheless true, and one to which the philosophers have paid too little attention, that habit, like a second nature, has the power of fixing in the mind new categorical forms derived from the appearances which impress us, and by them usually stripped of objective reality but whose influence over our judgments is no less predetermined than that of the original categories. Hence, we reason by the eternal and absolute laws of our mind, and at the same time by the secondary rules, ordinarily faulty, which are suggested to us by imperfect observation. This is the most fecund source of false prejudices, and the permanent and often invincible cause of a multitude of errors. The bias resulting from these prejudices are so strong that often, even when we are fighting against a principle which our mind thinks false, which is repugnant to our reason, and which our conscience disapproves, we defend it without knowing it, we reason in accordance with it, and we obey it while attacking it. Enclosed within a circle, our mind revolves about itself, until a new observation, creating within us new ideas, brings to view an external principle which delivers us from the phantom by which our imagination is possessed. Thus we know today that, by the laws of a universal magnetism whose cause is still unknown, two bodies, no obstacle intervening, tend to unite by an accelerated impelling force which we call gravitation. It is gravitation which causes unsupported bodies to fall to the ground, which gives them weight and which fastens us to the earth on which we live. Ignorance of this cause was the sole obstacle which prevented the ancients from believing in the antipodes. Can you not see, said St. Augustine, after Lactantius, that if there were men under our feet, their heads would point downward, and that they would fall into the sky? The bishops of Hippo, who thought the earth was flat because it appeared so to the eye, supposed in the consequence that, 
if we should connect by straight lines the zenith with the nadir in different places, these lines would be parallel with each other. And in the direction of these lines, he traced every movement from above to below. Thence he naturally concluded that the stars were rolling torches set in the vault of the sky, that if left to themselves, they would fall to the earth in a shower of fire, that the earth was on one vast plain, forming the lower portion of the world, etc. If he had been asked by what the world itself was sustained, he would have answered that he did not know, but that to God nothing is impossible. Such were the ideas of St. Augustine in regard to space and movement, ideas fixed within him by a prejudice derived from an appearance, and which had become with him a general and categorical rule of judgment. Of the reason why bodies fall, his mind knew nothing. He could only say that a body falls because it falls. With us, the idea of a fall is more complex. To the general ideas of space and movement which it implies, we add that of an attraction or direction towards a center, which gives us the higher idea of cause. But if physics has fully corrected our judgment in this respect, we still make use of the prejudice of St. Augustine, and when we say that a thing has fallen, we do not mean simply, and in general, that there has been an effect of gravitation but specially, and in particular, that it is towards the earth, and from above to below, that this movement has taken place. Our mind is enlightened in vain, the imagination prevails, and our language remains forever incorrigible. To descend from heaven is as incorrect an expression as to mount to heaven, and yet this expression will live as long as men use language. All these phrases, from above to below, to descend from heaven, to fall from the clouds, etc., are henceforth harmless, because we know how to rectify them in practice. But let us deign to consider for a moment how much they have retarded the progress of science. If indeed it be a matter of little importance to statistics, mechanics, hydrodynamics, and ballistics, that the true cause of the fall of bodies should be known, and that our ideas of the general movements in space should be exact. It is quite otherwise when we undertake to explain the system of the universe, the cause of tides, the shape of the earth, and its position in the heavens. To understand these things we must leave the circle of appearances. In all ages there have been ingenious mechanicians, excellent architects, skillful artillerymen, any error into which it was possible for them to fall in regard to the rotundity of the earth and gravitation, in no wise retarded the development of their art. The solidity of their buildings and accuracy of their aim was not affected by it. But sooner or later they were forced to grapple with phenomena, which the supposed parallelism of all perpendiculars erected from the earth's surface rendered inexplicable, then also commenced a struggle between the prejudices, which for centuries had sufficed in daily practice, and the unprecedented opinions which the testimony of the eyes seemed to contradict. Thus, on one hand, the falsest judgments, whether based on isolated facts or only on appearances, always embrace some truths whose sphere, whether large or small, affords room for a certain number of inferences beyond which we fall into absurdity. The ideas of St. Augustine, for example, contain the following truths, that bodies fall towards the earth, that they fall in a straight line, that either the sun or the earth moves, that either the sky or the earth turns, etc., these general facts always have been true. Our science has added nothing to them. But, on the other hand, it being necessary to account for everything, we are obliged to seek for principles more and more comprehensive. That is why we have had to abandon successively first the opinion that the world was flat, 
than the theory which regards it as stationary center of the universe, etc. If we pass now from physical nature to the moral world, we still find ourselves subject to the same deceptions of appearance, to the same influences of spontaneity and habit. But the distinguished feature of this second division of our knowledge is, on the one hand, the good or the evil which we derive from our opinions, and, on the other, the obstinacy with which we defend the prejudice which is tormenting and killing us. Whatever theory we embrace in regard to the shape of the earth and the cause of its weight, the physics of the globe does not suffer, and, as for us, our social economy can derive therefrom neither profit nor damage. But it is in us and through us that the laws of our moral nature work. Now, these laws cannot be executed without our deliberate aid, and consequently, unless we know them. If, then, our science of moral laws is false, it is evident that, while desiring our own good, we are accomplishing our own evil. If it is only incomplete, it may suffice for a time for our social progress, but in the long run it will lead us into a wrong road, and will finally precipitate us into an abyss of calamities. Then it is that we need to exercise our highest judgments, and, be it said to our glory, they are never found wanting. But then also commences a furious struggle between old prejudices and new ideas. Days of conflagration and anguish. We are told of the time when, with the same beliefs, with the same institutions, all the world seemed happy. Why complain of these beliefs? Why banish these institutions? We are slow to admit that that happy age served the precise purpose of developing the principle of evil which lay dormant in society. We accuse men and gods, the powers of earth and the forces of nature. Instead of seeking the cause of the evil in his mind and heart, man blames his masters, his rivals, his neighbors, and himself. Nations arm themselves and slay and exterminate each other until equilibrium is restored by the vast depopulation and peace again rises from the ashes of the combatants. So loath is humanity to touch the customs of its ancestors, and to change the laws framed by the founders of communities, and confirmed by the faithful observance of the ages. Nihil motum ex antiquo probabili est. Distrust all innovations, wrote Titus Livius. Undoubtedly it would be better were man not compelled to change. But what? Because he is born ignorant, because he exists only on condition of gradual self-instruction, must he abjure the light, abdicate his reason, and abandon himself to fortune? Perfect health is better than convalescence. Should the sick man, therefore, refuse to be cured? Reform! Reform! cried ages since. John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. Reform! Reform! cried our fathers. Fifty years ago, and for a long time to come, we shall shout, Reform, reform. Seeing the misery of my age, I said to myself, Among the principles that support society, there is one which it does not understand, which its ignorance has vitiated, and which causes all the evil that exists. This principle is the most ancient of all for it is a characteristic of revolutions to tear down the most modern principles and to respect those of long standing. Now the evil by which we suffer is anterior to all revolutions. This principle, impaired by our ignorance, is honored and cherished, for if it were not cherished it would harm nobody. It would be without influence. But this principle, right in its purpose, but misunderstood. This principle, as old as humanity, what is it? Can it be religion? All men believe in God. This dogma belongs at once to their conscience and their mind. 
To humanity, God is a fact as primitive, an idea as inevitable, a principle as necessary as are the categorical ideas of cause, substance, time, and space to our understanding. God is proven to us by the conscience prior to any inference of the mind, just as the sun is proven to us by the testimony of the senses prior to all the arguments of physics. We discover phenomena and laws by observation and experience. Only this deeper sense reveals to us existence. Humanity believes that God is, but in believing in God, what does it believe? In a word, what is God? The nature of this notion of divinity, this primitive, universal notion born in the race, the human mind has not yet fathomed. At each step that we take in our investigation of nature and of causes, the idea of God is extended and exalted. The farther science advances, the more God seems to grow and broaden. Anthropomorphism and idolatry constituted of necessity the faith of the mind in its youth. The theology of infancy and poesy. A harmless error, if they had not endeavored to make it a rule of conduct, and if they had been wise enough to respect the liberty of thought. But having made God in his own image, man wished to appropriate him still farther. Not satisfied with disfiguring the Almighty, he treated him as his patrimony, his goods, his possessions. God, pictured in monstrous forms, became throughout the world the property of man and of the state. Such was the origin of the corruption of morals by religion, and the source of pious feuds and holy wars. Thank heaven! We have learned to allow every one his own beliefs. We seek for moral laws outside the pale of religion. Instead of legislating as to the nature and attributes of God, the dogmas of theology, and the destiny of our souls, we wisely wait for science to tell us what to reject and what to accept. God, soul, religion, eternal objects of our unwearied thought and of our most fatal aberrations, terrible problems whose solution, forever attempted, forever remains unaccomplished. Concerning all these questions, we may still be mistaken, but at least our error is harmless. With liberty in religion, and the separation of the spiritual from the temporal power, the influence of religious ideas upon the progress of society is purely negative, no law, no political or civil institution being founded on religion. Neglect of duties imposed by religion may increase the general corruption, but it is not the primary cause, it is only an auxiliary or result. It is universally admitted and especially in the manner which now engages our attention, that the cause of the inequality of conditions among men, of pauperism, of universal misery, and of governmental embarrassments, can no longer be traced to religion. We must go farther back and dig still deeper. But what is there in man older and deeper than the religious sentiment? There is man himself, that is, volition and conscience, free will and law, eternally antagonistic. Man is at war with himself. Why? Man, say the theologians, transgressed in the beginning. Our race is guilty of an ancient offense. For this transgression, humanity has fallen. Error and ignorance have become its sustenance. Read history you will find universal proof of this necessity for evil in the permanent misery of nations. Man suffers and always will suffer. His disease is hereditary and constitutional. Use palliatives, employ emollients, there is no remedy. Nor is this argument peculiar to the theologians. We find it expressed in equivalent language in the philosophical writings of the materialists believer in infinite perfectibility. Destit de Tracy teaches formally that poverty, crime, and war are the inevitable conditions of our social state, necessary evils against which it would be folly to revolt. 
so call it necessity of evil or original depravity. It is at the bottom of the same philosophy. The first man transgressed. If the votaries of the Bible interpreted it faithfully, they would say, man originally transgressed, that is, made a mistake. For to transgress, to fail, to make a mistake, all mean the same thing. The consequences of Adam's transgression are inherited by the race, the first ignorance. Truly the race, like the individual, is born ignorant, but in regard to a multitude of questions, even in the moral and political spheres, this ignorance of the race has been dispelled. Who says that it will not depart altogether? Mankind makes continual progress toward truth, and light ever triumphs over darkness. Our disease is not, then, absolutely incurable, and the theory of the theologians is worse than inadequate. It is ridiculous, since it is reducible to this tautology. Man errs because he errs. While the true statement is this, man errs because he learns. Now, if man arrives at a knowledge of all that he needs to know, it is reasonable to believe that, ceasing to err, he will cease to suffer. But if we question the doctors as to this law, said to be engraved upon the heart of man, we shall immediately see that they dispute about a matter which they know nothing, that concerning the most important questions they are almost as many opinions as authors, that we find no two agreeing as to the best form of government, the principle of authority, and the nature of right, that all sail haphazard upon a shoreless and bottomless sea, abandoned to the guidance of their private opinions which they modestly take to be right reason. And, in view of this medley of contradictory opinions, we say, the object of our investigations is the law, the determination of the social principle. Now the politicians, that is the social scientists, do not understand each other. Then the error lies in themselves, and, as every error has a reality for its object, we must look in their books to find the truth which they have unconsciously deposited there. Now, of what do the lawyers and the publicists treat? Of justice, equity, liberty, natural law, civil law, etc. But what is justice? What is its principle, its character, its formula? To this question, our doctors evidently have no reply. For otherwise their science, starting with a principle clear and well-defined, would quit the region of probabilities, and all disputes would end. What is justice? The theologians answer. All justice comes from God. That is true, but we know no more than before. The philosophers ought to be better informed. They have argued so much about justice and injustice. Unhappily, an examination proves that their knowledge amounts to nothing, and that with them, as with the savages whose every prayer to the sun is simply, Oh! Oh! It is a cry of admiration, love, and enthusiasm. But who does not know that the sun attaches little meaning to the interjection, Oh! That is exactly our position towards the philosophers in regard to justice. Justice, they say, is a daughter of heaven, a light which illuminates every man that comes into the world, the most beautiful prerogative of our nature, that which distinguishes us from the beasts and likens us to God, and a thousand other similar things. What I ask does this pious litany amount to? to the prayer of the savages, Oh! All the most reasonable teachings of human wisdom concerning justice are summed up in that famous adage, Do unto others that which you would that others should do unto you. Do not unto others that which you would not that others should do unto you. But this rule of moral practice is unscientific. What have I a right to wish that others should do or not do to me? It is of no use to tell me that my duty is equal to my right, 
unless I am told at the same time what my right is. Let us try to arrive at something more precise and positive. Justice is the central star which governs societies, the pole around which the political world revolves, the principle and the regulator of all transactions. Nothing takes place between men save in the name of right, nothing without the invocation of justice. Justice is not the work of the law. On the contrary, the law is only a declaration and application of justice in all circumstances where men are liable to come in contact. If, then, the idea that we form of justice and right were ill-defined, if it were imperfect or even false, it is clear that all our legislative applications would be wrong, our institutions vicious, our politics erroneous. Consequently, there would be disorder and social chaos. This hypothesis of the perversion of justice in our minds and, as a necessary result, in our acts, becomes a demonstrated fact when it is shown that the opinions of men have not borne a constant relation to the notion of justice and its applications, that at different periods they have undergone modifications, in a word, that there has been progress in ideas. Now, that is what history proves by the most overwhelming testimony. End of chapter 1, part 1 Recording by Mike Nelson Section 5 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker Chapter 1. Method Pursued in This Work, The Idea of a Revolution Part 2 Eighteen hundred years ago, the world, under the rule of the Caesars, exhausted itself in slavery, superstition, and voluptuousness. The people, intoxicated and, as it were, stupefied by their long-continued orgies, had lost the very notion of right and duty. War and dissipation by turns swept them away. Usury and the labor of machines, that is, of slaves, by depriving them of the means of subsistence, hindered them from continuing the species. Barbarism sprang up again in a hideous form from this mass of corruption and spread like a devouring leprosy over the depopulated provinces the wise foresaw the downfall of the empire but could devise no remedy what could they think indeed to save this old society it would have been necessary to change the objects of public esteem and veneration and to abolish the rights affirmed by a justice purely secular they said rome has conquered through her politics and her gods any change in theology and public opinion would be folly and sacrilege rome merciful toward conquered nations though binding them in chains spared their lives slaves are the most fertile source of her wealth freedom of the nations would be the negation of her rights and the ruin of her finances rome in fact enveloped in the pleasures and gorged with the spoils of the universe is kept alive by victory and government her luxury and her pleasures are the price of her conquests she can neither abdicate nor dispossess herself thus rome had the facts and the law on her side her pretensions were justified by universal custom and the law of nations. Her institutions were based upon idolatry in religion, slavery in the state, and epicurism in private life. To touch those was to shake society to its foundations, and to use our modern expression, to open the abyss of revolutions. So the idea occurred to no one and yet humanity was dying in blood and luxury. 
all at once a man appeared calling himself the word of god it is not known to this day who he was whence he came nor what suggested to him his ideas he went about proclaiming everywhere that the end of the existing society was at hand that the world was about to experience a new birth that the priests were vipers the lawyers ignoramuses and the philosophers hypocrites and liars that master and slave were equals that usury and everything akin to it was robbery that proprietors and idlers would one day burn while the poor and pure in heart would find a haven of peace this man the word of god was denounced and arrested as a public enemy by the priests and the lawyers who well understood how to induce the people to demand his death but this judicial murder though it put the finishing stroke to their crimes did not destroy the doctrinal seeds which the word of god had sown after his death his original disciples traveled about in all directions preaching what they called the good news creating in their turn millions of missionaries and when their task seemed to be accomplished dying by the sword of roman justice this persistent agitation the war of executioners and martyrs lasted nearly three centuries ending in the conversion of the world idolatry was destroyed slavery abolished dissolution made room for a more austere morality and the contempt for wealth was sometimes pushed almost to privation society was saved by the negation of its own principles by a revolution in its religion and by violation of its most sacred rights in this revolution the idea of justice spread to an extent that had not before been dreamed of never to return to its original limits heretofore justice had existed only for the masters it then commenced to exist for the slaves footnote religion laws marriage were the privileges of free men and in the beginning of nobles only dia maiorum gentium gods of the patrician families jus gentium right of nations that is of families or nobles the slave and the plebeian had no families their children were treated as the offspring of animals beasts they were born beasts they must live End footnote nevertheless the new religion at that time had borne by no means all its fruits there was a perceptible improvement of the public morals and a partial release from oppression but other than that the seed sown by the son of man having fallen into idolatrous hearts had produced nothing save innumerable discords and a quasi poetical mythology instead of developing into their practical consequences the principles of morality and government taught by the word of god his followers busied themselves in speculations as to his birth his origin his person and his actions they discussed his parables and from the conflict of the most extravagant opinions upon unanswerable questions and text which no one understood was born theology which may be defined as the science of the infinitely absurd the truth of christianity did not survive the age of the apostles the gospel commented upon and symbolized by the greeks and latins loaded with pagan fables became literally a mass of contradictions and to this day the reign of the infallible church has been a long era of darkness it is said that the gates of hell will not always prevail that the word of god will return and that one day men will know truth and justice but that will be the death of greek and roman catholicism just as in the light of science disappeared the caprices of opinion the monsters which the successors of the apostles were bent on destroying frightened for a moment reappeared gradually thanks to the crazy fanaticism 
and sometimes the deliberate connivance of priests and theologians. The history of the enfranchisement of the French communes offers constantly the spectacle of the ideas of justice and liberty spreading among the people, in spite of the combined efforts of kings, nobles, and clergy. In the year 1789 of the Christian era, the French nation, divided by caste, poor and oppressed, struggled in the triple net of royal absolutism, the tyranny of nobles and parliaments, and priestly intolerance. There was the right of the king, and the right of the priest, the right of the patrician, and the right of the plebeian. There were the privileges of birth, province, communes, corporations, and trades, and at the bottom of all, violence, immorality, and misery. For some time they talked of reformation, those who apparently desired it most favoring it only for their own profit, and the people who were to be the gainers expecting little and saying nothing. For a long time these poor people, either from distrust, incredulity, or despair, hesitated to ask for their rights. It is said that the habit of serving had taken the courage away from those old communes, which in the Middle Ages were so bold. Finally, a book appeared, summing up the whole matter in these two propositions. What is the third estate? Nothing. What ought it to be? Everything. Someone added by way of comment, What is the king? The servant of the people. This was a sudden revelation. The veil was torn aside. A thick bandage fell from all eyes. The people commenced to reason thus. If the king is our servant, he ought to report to us. If he ought to report to us, he is subject to control. If he can be controlled, he is responsible. If he is responsible, he is punishable. If he is punishable, he ought to be punished according to his merits. If he ought to be punished according to his merits, he can be punished with death. Five years after the publication of the brochure of Sieyès, the third estate was everything. The king, the nobility, the clergy were no more. In 1793, the nation, without stopping at the constitutional fiction of the inviolability of the sovereign, conducted Louis XVI to the scaffold. In 1830, it accompanied Charles X to Cherbourg. In each case, it may have erred, in fact, in its judgment of the offense. But, in right, the logic which led to the action was irreproachable. The people, in punishing their sovereign, did precisely that which the government of July was so severely censured for failing to do when it refused to execute Louis Bonaparte after the affair of Strasbourg. They struck the true culprit. It was an application of the common law, a solemn decree of justice enforcing the penal laws. Footnote. If the chief of the executive power is responsible, so must the deputies be also. It is astonishing that this idea has never occurred to anyone. It might be made the subject of an interesting essay, but I declare that I would not, for all the world, maintain it. The people are yet much too logical for me to furnish them with arguments. End footnote. The spirit which gave rise to the movement of 89 was a spirit of negation. That of itself proves that the order of things which was substituted for the old system was not methodical or well considered. That, born of anger and hatred, it could not have the effect of a science based on observation and study. That its foundations, in a word, were not derived from a profound knowledge of the laws of nature and society. Thus, the people found that the Republic, among the so-called new institutions, was acting on the very principles against which they had fought, and was swayed by all the prejudices which they had intended to destroy. 
we congratulate ourselves with inconsiderate enthusiasm on the glorious french revolution the regeneration of seventeen eighty nine the great changes that have been effected and the reversion of institutions a delusion a delusion when our ideas on any subject material intellectual or social undergo a thorough change in consequence of new observations i call that movement of the mind revolution if the ideas are simply extended or modified there is only progress thus the system of ptolemy was a step in astronomical progress that of copernicus was a revolution so in seventeen eighty nine there was struggle and progress revolution there was none an examination of the reforms which were attempted proves this the nation so long a victim of monarchical selfishness thought to deliver itself forever by declaring that it alone was sovereign but what was monarchy the sovereignty of one man what is democracy the sovereignty of the nation or rather of the national majority but it is in both cases the sovereignty of man instead of the sovereignty of the law the sovereignty of the will instead of the sovereignty of the reason in one word the passions instead of justice undoubtedly when a nation passes from the monarchical to the democratic state there is progress because in multiplying the sovereigns we increase the opportunities of the reason to substitute itself for the will but in reality there is no revolution in the government since the principle remains the same now we have the proof today that with the most perfect democracy we cannot be free footnote c de tocqueville democracy in the united states and michel chevalier letters on north america plutarch tells us life of pericles that in athens honest people were obliged to conceal themselves while studying fearing they would be regarded as aspirants for office End footnote. nor is that all the nation king cannot exercise its sovereignty itself it is obliged to delegate it to agents this is constantly reiterated by those who seek to win its favor be these agents five ten one hundred or a thousand of what consequence is the number and what matters the name it is always the government of man the rule of will and caprice i ask what this pretended revolution has revolutionized we know too how this sovereignty was exercised first by the convention then by the directory afterwards confiscated by the consul as for the emperor the strong man so much adored and mourned by the nation he never wanted to be dependent on it but as if intending to set its sovereignty at defiance he dared to demand its suffrage that is its abdication the abdication of this inalienable sovereignty and he obtained it but what is sovereignty it is they say the power to make law footnote sovereignty according to tullier is human omnipotence a materialistic definition if sovereignty is anything it is a right not a force or a faculty and what is human omnipotence End footnote. another absurdity a relic of despotism the nation had long seen kings issuing their commands in this form for such is our pleasure it wished to taste in its turn the pleasure of making laws for fifty years it has brought them forth by myriads always be it understood through the agency of representatives the play is far from ended the definition of sovereignty was derived from the definition of the law the law they said is the expression of the will of the sovereign 
then under a monarchy the law is the expression of the will of the king in a republic the law is the expression of the will of the people aside from the difference in the number of wills the two systems are exactly identical both share the same error namely that the law is the expression of a will it ought to be the expression of a fact moreover they followed good leaders they took the citizen of geneva for their prophet and the contrat social for their koran bias and prejudice are apparent in all the phrases of the new legislators the nation had suffered from a multitude of exclusions and privileges its representatives issued the following declaration all men are equal by nature and before the law an ambiguous and redundant declaration men are equal by nature does that mean that they are equal in size beauty talents and virtue no they meant then political and civil equality then it would have been sufficient to have said all men are equal before the law but what is equality before the law neither the constitution of seventeen ninety nor that of ninety three nor the granted charter nor the accepted charter have defined it accurately all imply an inequality in fortune and station incompatible with even a shadow of equality in rights in this respect it may be said that all our constitutions have been faithful expressions of the popular will i am going to prove it formerly the people were excluded from civil and military offices it was considered a wonder when the following high-sounding article was inserted in the declaration of rights Quote, all citizens are equally eligible to office free nations know no qualifications in their choice of officers save virtues and talents End quote. they certainly ought to have admired so beautiful an idea they admired a piece of nonsense why the sovereign people legislators and reformers see in public offices to speak plainly only opportunities for pecuniary advancement and because it regards them as a source of profit it decrees the eligibility of citizens for of what use would this precaution be if there were nothing to gain by it no one would think of ordaining that none but astronomers and geographers should be pilots nor of prohibiting stutterers from acting at the theatre and the opera the nation was still aping the kings like them it wished to award the lucrative positions to its friends and flatterers unfortunately and this last feature completes the resemblance the nation did not control the list of livings that was in the hands of its agents and representatives they on the other hand took care not to thwart the will of their gracious sovereign this edifying article of the declaration of rights retained in the charters of eighteen fourteen and eighteen thirty implies several kinds of civil inequality that is of inequality before the law inequality of station since the public functions are sought only for the consideration and emoluments which they bring inequality of wealth since if it had been desired to equalize fortunes public service would have been regarded as a duty not as a reward inequality of privilege the law not stating what it means by talents and virtues under the empire virtue and talent consisted simply in military bravery and devotion to the emperor that was shown when napoleon created his nobility and attempted to connect it with the ancients today the man who pays taxes to the amount of two hundred francs is virtuous the talented man is the honest pickpocket such truths as these are accounted trivial the people finally legalized property god forgive them for they knew not what they did for fifty years they have suffered for their miserable folly 
But how came the people, whose voice, they tell us, is the voice of God, and whose conscience is infallible, how came the people to err? How happens it that, when seeking liberty and equality, they fell back into privilege and slavery? Always through copying the ancient regime. Formerly, the nobility and the clergy contributed towards the expenses of the state only by voluntary aid and gratuitous gift. Their property could not be seized even for debt, while the plebeian, overwhelmed by taxes and statute labor, was continually tormented, now by the king's tax-gatherers, now by those of the nobles and clergy. He whose possessions were subject to mortmain could neither bequeath nor inherit property. He was treated like the animals, whose services and offspring belonged to their master by right of accession. The people wanted the conditions of ownership to be alike for all. They thought that everyone should enjoy and freely dispose of his possessions, his income, and the fruit of his labor and industry. The people did not invent property but as they had not the same privileges in regard to it which the nobles and clergy possessed, they decreed that the right should be exercised by all under the same conditions. The more obnoxious forms of property, statute labor, mort main, matries, and exclusion from public office have disappeared. The conditions of its enjoyment have been modified. The principle still remains the same. There has been progress in the regulation of the right. There has been no revolution. These, then, are the three fundamental principles of modern society, established one after another by the movements of 1789 and 1830. 1. Sovereignty of the human will. In short, despotism. 2. Inequality of wealth and rank. 3. Property. Above justice. Always invoked as the guardian angel of sovereigns, nobles, and proprietors. Justice. The general, primitive, categorical law of all society. We must ascertain whether the ideas of despotism, civil inequality, and property are in harmony with the primitive notion of justice, and necessarily follow from it, assuming various forms according to the condition, position, and relation of persons, or whether they are not rather the illegitimate result of a confusion of different things, a fatal association of ideas. And since justice deals especially with the questions of government, the condition of persons, and the possession of things, we must ascertain under what conditions, judging by the universal opinion and the progress of the human mind, government is just, the condition of citizens is just, and the possession of things is just. Then, striking out everything which fails to meet these conditions, the result will at once tell us what legitimate government is, what the legitimate condition of citizens is, and what the legitimate possession of things is, and, finally, as the last result of the analysis, what justice is. Is the authority of man over man just? Everybody answers, no. The authority of man is only the authority of the law, which ought to be justice and truth. The private will counts for nothing in government, which consists, first, in discovering truth and justice in order to make the law, and second, in superintending the execution of this law. I do not now inquire whether our constitutional form of government satisfies these conditions, whether, for example, the will of the ministry never influences the declaration and interpretation of the law, or whether our deputies in their debates are more intent on conquering by argument than by force of numbers. It is enough for me that my definition of a good government is allowed to be correct. This idea is exact. 
yet we see that nothing seems more just to the oriental nations than the despotism of their sovereigns that with the ancients and in the opinion of the philosophers themselves slavery was just that in the middle ages the nobles the priests and the bishops felt justified in holding slaves that louis the fourteenth thought he was right when he said the state i am the state and that napoleon deemed it a crime for the state to oppose his will the idea of justice then applied to sovereignty and government has not always been what it is today it has gone on developing and shaping itself by degrees until it has arrived at its present state but has it reached its last phase i think not only as the last obstacle to be overcome arises from the institution of property which we have kept intact in order to finish the reform in government and consummate the revolution this very institution we must attack is political and civil inequality just some say yes others no to the first i would reply that when the people abolished all privileges of birth and caste they did it in all probability because it was for their advantage why then do they favor the privileges of fortune more than those of rank and race because say they political inequality is a result of property and without property society is impossible thus the question just raised becomes a question of property to the second i content myself with this remark if you wish to enjoy political equality abolish property otherwise why do you complain is property just everybody answers without hesitation yes property is just i say everybody for up to the present time no one who thoroughly understood the meaning of his words has answered no for it is no easy thing to reply understandingly to such a question only time and experience can furnish an answer now this answer is given it is for us to understand it i undertake to prove it we are to proceed with the demonstration in the following order one we dispute not at all we refute nobody we deny nothing we accept as sound all the arguments alleged in favor of property and confine ourselves to a search for its principle in order that we may then ascertain whether this principle is faithfully expressed by property in fact property being defensible on no ground save that of justice the idea or at least the intention of justice must of necessity underlie all the arguments that have been made in defense of property and as on the other hand the right of property is only exercised over those things which can be appreciated by the senses justice secretly objectifying itself so to speak must take the shape of an algebraic formula by this method of investigation we soon see that every argument which has been invented in behalf of property whatever it may be always and of necessity leads to equality that is to the negation of property the first part covers two chapters one treating of occupation the foundation of our right the other of labor and talent considered as causes of property and social inequality the first of these chapters will prove that the right of occupation obstructs property the second that the right of labor destroys it two property then being of necessity conceived as existing only in connection with equality it remains to find out why in spite of this necessity of logic equality does not exist this new investigation also covers two chapters in the first considering the fact of property in itself we inquire whether this fact is real whether it exists whether it is possible 
for it would imply a contradiction were these two opposite forms of society equality and inequality both possible then we discover singularly enough that property may indeed manifest itself accidentally but that as an institution and principle it is mathematically impossible so that the axiom of the school ab actu ad posse valet consecutio from the actual to the possible the inference is good is given the lie as far as property is concerned finally in the last chapter calling psychology to our aid and probing man's nature to the bottom we shall disclose the principle of justice its formula and character we shall state with precision the organic law of society we shall explain the origin of property the causes of its establishment its long life and its approaching death we shall definitely establish its identity with robbery and after having shown that these three prejudices the sovereignty of man the inequality of conditions and property are one and the same that they may be taken for each other and are reciprocally convertible we shall have no trouble in inferring therefrom by the principle of contradiction the basis of government and right there our investigations will end reserving the right to continue them in future works the importance of the subject which engages our attention is recognized by all minds Quote, property says m hennequin is the creative and conservative principle of civil society property is one of those basic institutions new theories concerning which cannot be presented too soon for it must not be forgotten and the publicist and statesman must know that on the answer to the question whether property is the principle or the result of social order whether it is to be considered as a cause or an effect depends all morality and consequently all the authority of human institutions End quote. these words are a challenge to all men of hope and faith but although the cause of equality is a noble one no one has yet picked up the gauntlet thrown down by the advocates of property no one has been courageous enough to enter upon the struggle the spurious learning of haughty jurisprudence and the absurd aphorisms of a political economy controlled by property have puzzled the most generous minds it is a sort of password among the most influential friends of liberty and the interests of the people that equality is a chimera so many false theories and meaningless analogies influence minds otherwise keen but which are unconsciously controlled by popular prejudice equality advances every day feet equalitas soldiers of liberty shall we desert our flag in the hour of triumph a defender of equality i shall speak without bitterness and without anger with the independence becoming a philosopher with the courage and firmness of a free man may i in this momentous struggle carry into all hearts the light with which i am filled and show by the success of my argument that equality failed to conquer by the sword only that it might conquer by the pen End of chapter one part two recording by lucretia b Section 6 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Section 6. Chapter 2. Property as a Natural Right. The Roman law defined property as the right to use and abuse one's own within the limits of the law. Ius utendi et abutendi resua, guatinus juris ratio patitur. A justification of the word abuse has been attempted, 
on the ground that it signifies not senseless and immoral abuse, but only absolute domain. Vain distinction, invented as an excuse for property, and powerless against the frenzy of possession, which it neither prevents nor oppresses. The proprietor may, if he chooses, allow his crops to rot underfoot, sow his field with salt, milk his cows on the sand, change his vineyard into a desert, and use his vegetable garden as a park. Do these things constitute abuse or not? In the matter of property, use and abuse are necessarily indistinguishable. According to the Declaration of Rights, published as a preface to the Constitution of 93, property is, quote, the right to enjoy and dispose at will of one's goods, one's income, and the fruit of one's labor and industry, end quote. Code Napoleon, Article 544, quote, Property is the right to enjoy and dispose of things in the most absolute manner, provided we do not overstep the limits prescribed by the laws and regulations. End quote. These two definitions do not differ from that of the Roman law. All give the proprietor an absolute right over a thing, and as for the restriction imposed by the code, provided we do not overstep the limits prescribed by the laws and regulations, its object is not to limit property, but to prevent the domain of one proprietor from interfering with that of another. That is a confirmation of the principle, not a limitation of it. There are different kinds of property. 1. Property pure and simple, the dominant and seigneurial power over a thing, or, as they term it, naked property. 2. Possession. Possession, says Duranton, is a matter of fact, not of right. Toulier. Property is a right, a legal power. Possession is a fact. The tenant, the farmer, the commandite, the usufructuary, are possessors. The owner who lets and lends for use, the heir who is to come into possession on the death of a usufructuary, are proprietors. If I may venture the comparison, a lover is a possessor, a husband is a proprietor. This double definition of property, domain and possession, is of the highest importance, and it must be clearly understood in order to comprehend what is to follow. From the distinction between possession and property arise two sorts of rights, the jus in re, the right in a thing, the right by which I may reclaim the property which I have acquired in whatever hands I find it, and the jus ad rem, the right to a thing, which gives me a claim to become a proprietor. Thus, the right of the partners to a marriage over each other's person is the jus in re. That of two who are betrothed is only the jus ad rem. In the first, possession and property are united. The second includes only naked property. With me, who, as a laborer, have a right to the possession of the products of nature and my own industry, and who, as a proletaire, enjoy none of them, it is by virtue of the jus ad rem that I demand admittance to the jus in re. This distinction between the jus in re and the jus ad rem is the basis of the famous distinction between possessoir and petitoir, actual categories of jurisprudence, the whole of which is included within their vast boundaries. Petitoir refers to everything relating to property, possessoir to that relating to possession. In writing this memoir against property, I bring against universal society an action petitoire. I prove that those who do not possess today are proprietors by the same title as those who do possess. But instead of inferring therefrom that property should be shared by all, I demand, in the name of general security, its entire abolition. If I fail to win my case, there is nothing left for us, the proletarian class and myself, but to cut our throats. We can ask nothing more from the justice of nations, for, as the Code of Procedure, Article 26, tells us in its energetic style, the plaintiff who has been non-suited in an action petitoire is debarred thereby from bringing an action possessoire. If, on the contrary, I gain the case, we must then commence an action possessoire, 
that we may be reinstated in the enjoyment of the wealth of which we are deprived by property. I hope that we shall not be forced to that extremity, but these two actions cannot be prosecuted at once, such a course being prohibited by the same code of procedure. Before going to the heart of the question, it will not be useless to offer a few preliminary remarks. Section 1. Property as a Natural Right The Declaration of Rights has placed property in its list of the natural and inalienable rights of man, for and all, liberty, equality, property, security. What rule did the legislators of 93 follow in compiling this list? None. They laid down principles just as they discussed sovereignty and the laws, from a general point of view and according to their own opinion. They did everything in their own blind way. If we can believe Toulier, the absolute rights can be reduced to three, security, liberty, property. Equality is eliminated by the Rennes professor. Why? Is it because liberty implies it, or because property prohibits it? On this point, the author of Droit Civil Explique is silent. It has not even occurred to him that the matter is under discussion. Nevertheless, if we compare these three or four rights with each other, we find that property bears no resemblance whatever to the others. That, for the majority of citizens, it exists only potentially, and as a dormant faculty without exercise. As for the others who do enjoy it, it is susceptible of certain transactions and modifications which do not harmonize with the idea of a natural right, that, in practice, governments, tribunals, and laws do not respect it, and finally, that everybody, spontaneously and with one voice, regards it as chimerical. Liberty is inviolable. I can neither sell nor alienate my liberty. Every contract, every condition of a contract, which has in view the alienation or suspension of liberty, is null. The slave, when he plants his foot upon the soil of liberty, at that moment becomes a free man. When society seizes a malefactor and deprives him of his liberty, it is a case of legitimate defence. Whoever violates the social compact by the commission of a crime declares himself a public enemy. In attacking the liberty of others, he compels them to take away his own. Liberty is the original condition of man. To renounce liberty is to renounce the nature of man. After that, how could we perform the acts of man? Likewise, equality before the law suffers neither restriction nor exception. All Frenchmen are equally eligible to office. Consequently, in the presence of this equality, condition and family have, in many cases, no influence upon choice. The poorest citizen can obtain judgment in the courts against one occupying the most exalted station. Let the millionaire, Ahab, build a chateau upon the vineyard of Naboth. The court will have the power, according to the circumstances, to order the destruction of the chateau, though it has cost millions, and to force the trespasser to restore the vineyard to its original state and pay the damages. The law wishes all property that has been legitimately acquired to be kept inviolate without regard to value and without respect for persons. The Charter demands, it is true, for the exercise of certain political rights, certain conditions of fortune and capacity, but all publicists know that the legislator's intention was not to establish a privilege, but to take security. Provided the conditions fixed by law are complied with, every citizen may be an elector, and every elector eligible. The right, once acquired, is the same for all. The law compares neither persons nor votes. I do not ask now whether this system is the best. It is enough that, in the opinion of the Charter and in the eyes of everyone, equality before the law is absolute, and, like liberty, admits of no compromise. It is the same with the right of security. Society promises its members no halfway protection, no sham defence, it binds itself to them as they bind themselves to it. It does not say to them, I will shield you, provided it costs me nothing. I will protect you if I run no risks thereby. It says, I will defend you against everybody. I will save and avenge you or perish myself. The whole strength of the state is at the service of each citizen. The obligation which binds them together is absolute. How different with property! 
worshipped by all, it is acknowledged by none. Laws, morals, customs, public and private conscience, all plot its death and ruin. To meet the expenses of government, which has armies to support, tasks to perform, and officers to pay, taxes are needed. Let all contribute to these expenses, nothing more just. But why should the rich pay more than the poor? That is just, they say, because they possess more. I confess that such justice is beyond my comprehension. Why are taxes paid? To protect all in the exercise of their natural rights, liberty, equality, security, and property, to maintain order in the state, to furnish the public with useful and pleasant conveniences. Now, does it cost more to defend the rich man's life and liberty than the poor man's? Who, in time of invasion, famine, or plague, causes more trouble, the large proprietor who escapes the evil without the assistance of the state, or the laborer who sits in his cottage unprotected from danger? Is public order endangered more by the worthy citizen or by the artisan and journeyman? Why, the police have more to fear from a few hundred laborers out of work than from two hundred thousand electors. Does the man of large income appreciate more keenly than the poor man national festivities, clean streets, and beautiful monuments? Why, he prefers his country seat to all the popular pleasures, and when he wants to enjoy himself, he does not wait for the greased pole. One of two things is true. Either the proportional tax affords greater security to the larger taxpayers, or else it is a wrong. Because if property is a natural right, as the Declaration of 93 declares, all that belongs to me by virtue of this right is as sacred as my person. It is my blood, my life, myself. Whoever touches it offends the apple of my eye. My income of 100,000 francs is as inviolable as the grisette's daily wage of 75 centimes. Her attic is no more sacred than my suite of apartments. The tax is not levied in proportion to strength, size, or skill. No more should it be levied in proportion to property. If, then, the state takes more from me, let it give me more in return, or cease to talk of equality of rights. For otherwise, society is established not to defend property, but to destroy it. The state, through the proportional tax, becomes the chief of robbers. The state sets the example of systematic pillage. The state should be brought to the bar of justice at the head of those hideous brigands, that execrable mob which it now kills from motives of professional jealousy. But, they say, the courts and the police force are established to restrain this mob. Government is a company not exactly for insurance, for it does not insure, but for vengeance and repression. The premium which this company exacts, the tax, is divided in proportion to property, that is, in proportion to the trouble which each piece of property occasions the avengers and the repressors paid by the government. This is anything but the absolute and inalienable right of property. Under this system, the poor and the rich distrust and make war upon each other. But what is the object of the war? Property so that property is necessarily accompanied by war upon property. The liberty and security of the rich do not suffer from the liberty and security of the poor. Far from that, they mutually strengthen and sustain each other. The rich man's right of property, on the contrary, has to be continually defended against the poor man's desire for property. What a contradiction! In England, they have a poor rate. They wish me to pay this tax. But what relation exists between my natural and inalienable right of property and the hunger from which ten million wretched people are suffering? When religion commands us to assist our fellows, it speaks in the name of charity, not in the name of law. The obligation of benevolence imposed upon me by Christian morality cannot be opposed upon me as a political tax for the benefit of any person or poorhouse. I will give alms when I see fit to do so, when the sufferings of others excite in me that sympathy of which philosophers talk and in which I do not believe. I will not be forced to bestow them. No one is obliged to do more than comply with this injunction. In the exercise of your own rights do not encroach upon the rights of another. 
an injunction which is the exact definition of liberty. Now, my possessions are my own. No one has a claim upon them. I object to the placing of the third theological virtue in the order of the day. Everybody in France demands the conversion of the five percent bonds. They demand thereby the complete sacrifice of one species of property. They have the right to do it if public necessity requires it. But where is the just indemnity promised by the Charter? Not only does none exist, but this indemnity is not even possible. For if the indemnity were equal to the property sacrificed, the conversion would be useless. The State occupies the same position today toward the bondholders that the city of Calais did when besieged by Edward III toward its notables. The English conqueror consented to spare its inhabitants, provided it would surrender to him its most distinguished citizens to do with as he pleased. Eustache and several others offered themselves. It was noble in them, and our ministers should recommend their example to the bondholders. But had the city the right to surrender them? Assuredly not. The right to security is absolute. The country can require no one to sacrifice himself. The soldier standing guard within the enemy's range is no exception to this rule. Wherever a citizen stands guard, the country stands guard with him. Today is the turn of the one, tomorrow of the other. When danger and devotion are common, flight is parasite. No one has the right to flee from danger. No one can serve as a scapegoat. The maxim of Caiaphas, it is right that a man should die for his nation, is that of the populace and of tyrants, the two extremes of social degradation. It is said that all perpetual annuities are essentially redeemable. This maxim of civil law, applied to the state, is good for those who wish to return to the natural equality of labour and wealth. But, from the point of view of the proprietor, and in the mouth of conversionists, it is the language of bankrupts. The state is not only a borrower, it is an insurer and guardian of property. Granting the best of security, it assures the most inviolable possession. How, then, can it force open the hands of its creditors, who have confidence in it, and then talk to them of public order and security of property? The state, in such an operation, is not a debtor who discharges his debt. It is a stock company which allures its stockholders into a trap, and there, contrary to its authentic promise, exacts from them twenty, thirty, or forty per cent of the interest on their capital. That is not all. The state is a university of citizens joined together under a common law by an act of society. This act secures all in the possession of their property, guarantees to one his field, to another his vineyard, to a third his rents, and to the bondholder, who might have bought real estate, but who preferred to come to the assistance of the treasury, his bonds. The state cannot demand, without offering an equivalent, the sacrifice of an acre of the field, or a corner of the vineyard. Still less can it lower rents. Why should it have the right to diminish the interest on bonds? This right could not justly exist, unless the bondholder could invest his funds elsewhere to equal advantage. But being confined to the state, where can he find a place to invest them, since the cause of conversion, that is, the power to borrow to better advantage, lies in the state? That is why a government, based on the principle of property, cannot redeem its annuities without the consent of their holders. The money deposited with the Republic is property which it has no right to touch while other kinds of property are respected. To force their redemption is to violate the social contract and outlaw the bondholders. The whole controversy as to the conversion of bonds finally reduces itself to this. Question. Is it just to reduce to misery 45,000 families who derive an income from their bonds of 100 francs or less? Answer. Is it just to compel seven or eight millions of taxpayers to pay a tax of five francs when they should pay only three? It is clear in the first place that the reply is in reality no reply. But to make the wrong more apparent, let us change it thus. Is it just to endanger the lives of one hundred thousand men when we can save them by surrendering one hundred heads to the enemy? Reader, decide. All this is clearly understood by the defenders of the present system, yet, nevertheless, sooner or later, the conversion will be effected and property be violated, because no other cause is possible. 
because property, regarded as a right, and not being a right, must of right perish, because the force of events, the laws of conscience, and physical and mathematical necessity must, in the end, destroy this illusion of our minds. To sum up, liberty is an absolute right, because it is to man what impenetrability is to matter, a sine qua non of existence. Equality is an absolute right, because without equality there is no society. Security is an absolute right, because in the eyes of every man his own liberty and life are as precious as another's. These three rights are absolute, that is, susceptible of neither increase nor diminution, because in society each associate receives as much as he gives, liberty for liberty, equality for equality, security for security, body for body, soul for soul, in life and in death. But property, in its derivative sense, and by the definitions of law, is a right outside of society. For it is clear that, if the wealth of each was social wealth, the conditions would be equal for all, and it would be a contradiction to say, property is a man's right to dispose at will of social property. Then, if we are associated for the sake of liberty, equality, and security, we are not associated for the sake of property. Then, if property is a natural right, this natural right is not social, but antisocial. Property and society are utterly irreconcilable institutions. It is as impossible to associate two proprietors as to join two magnets by their opposite poles. Either society must perish, or it must destroy property. If property is a natural, absolute, imprescriptible, and inalienable right, why in all ages has there been so much speculation as to its origin? For this is one of its distinguishing characteristics. The origin of a natural right. Good God! Who ever inquired into the origin of the rights of liberty, security, or equality? They exist by the same right that we exist. They are born with us. They live and die with us. With property it is very different, indeed. By law, property can exist without a proprietor, like a quality without a subject. It exists for the human being who as yet is not, and for the octogenarian who is no more, and yet, in spite of these wonderful prerogatives, which savour of the eternal and the infinite, they have never found the origin of property. The doctors still disagree. On one point only are they in harmony, namely, that the validity of the right of property depends upon the authenticity of its origin. But this harmony is their condemnation, why have they acknowledged the right before settling the question of origin? Certain classes do not relish investigation into the pretended titles to property and its fabulous and perhaps scandalous history. They wish to hold to this proposition, that property is a fact, that it always has been and always will be. With that proposition the savant Proudhon commenced his Treatise on the Right of Usufruct regarding the origin of property as a useless question. Perhaps I would subscribe to this doctrine, believing it inspired by a commendable love of peace, were all my fellow citizens in comfortable circumstances. But no, I will not subscribe to it. The titles on which they pretend to base the right of property are two in number, occupation and labor. I shall examine them successively, under all their aspects and in detail, and I remind the reader that, to whatever authority we appeal, I shall prove beyond a doubt that property, to be just and possible, must necessarily have equality for its condition. End of section 6. Section 7 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker Chapter 2, Section 2 Occupation as the Title to Property It is remarkable that, at those meetings of the State Council at which the Code was discussed, no controversy arose as to the origin and principle of property. All the articles of Volume 2, Book 2, concerning property and the right of accession, were passed without opposition or amendment. 
Bonaparte, who on other questions had given his legists so much trouble, had nothing to say about property. Be not surprised at it. In the eyes of that man, the most selfish and willful person that ever lived, property was the first of rights, just as submission to authority was the most holy of duties. The right of occupation, or of the first occupant, is that which results from the actual physical real possession of a thing. I occupy a piece of land. The presumption is that I am the proprietor, until the contrary is proved. We know that originally such a right cannot be legitimate unless it is reciprocal. The jurists say as much. Cicero compares the earth to a vast theatre. Quaemad modum theatrum cum commune sit, recte tamen dici potest eius esse em locum quem quisque occuparit. This passage is all that ancient philosophy has to say about the origin of property. The theatre, says Cicero, is common to all. Nevertheless, the place that each one occupies is called his own. That is, it is a place possessed, not a place appropriated. This comparison annihilates property. Moreover, it implies equality. Can I, in a theatre, occupy at the same time one place in the pit, another in the boxes, and a third in the gallery? Not unless I have three bodies, like Geryon, or can exist in different places at the same time, as is related of the magician Apollonius. According to Cicero, no one has a right to more than he needs. Such is the true interpretation of his famous axiom, suum quidque cuiusque sit, to each one that which belongs to him, an axiom that has been strangely applied. That which belongs to each is not that which each may possess, but that which each has a right to possess. Now, what have we a right to possess? That which is required for our labour and consumption. Cicero's comparison of the earth to a theatre proves it. According to that, each one may take what place he will, may beautify and adorn it, if he can. It is allowable but he must never allow himself to overstep the limit which separates him from another. The doctrine of Cicero leads directly to equality, for, occupation being pure toleration, if the toleration is mutual, and it cannot be otherwise, the possessions are equal. Grotius rushes into history. But what kind of reasoning is that which seeks the origin of a right, said to be natural, elsewhere than in nature? This is the method of the ancients. The fact exists, then it is necessary, then it is just, then its antecedents are just also. Nevertheless, let us look into it. Originally, all things were common and undivided. They were the property of all. Let us go no farther. Grotius tells us how this original communism came to an end through ambition and cupidity how the age of gold was followed by the age of iron, etc., so that property rested first on war and conquest, then on treaties and agreements. But either these treaties and agreements distributed wealth equally, as did the original communism, the only method of distribution with which the barbarians were acquainted, and the only form of justice of which they could conceive, and then the question of origin assumes this form, how did equality afterwards disappear? or else these treaties and agreements were forced by the strong upon the weak, and in that case they are null. The tacit consent of posterity does not make them valid, and we live in a permanent condition of iniquity and fraud. We never can conceive how the equality of conditions, having once existed, could afterwards have passed away. What was the cause of such degeneration? The instincts of the animals are unchangeable, as well as the differences of species. To suppose original equality in human society is to admit by implication that the present inequality is a degeneration from the nature of this society, a thing which the defenders of property cannot explain. But I infer therefrom that if Providence placed the first human beings in a condition of equality, it was an indication of its desires a model that it wished them to realize in other forms. 
just as the religious sentiment, which it planted in their hearts, has developed and manifested itself in various ways. Man has but one nature, constant and unalterable. He pursues it through instinct, he wanders from it through reflection, he returns to it through judgment. Who shall say that we are not returning now? According to Grotius, man has abandoned equality. According to me, he will yet return to it. How came he to abandon it? Why will he return to it? These are questions for future consideration. Reed writes as follows. The right of property is not innate, but acquired. It is not grounded upon the constitution of man, but upon his actions. Writers on jurisprudence have explained its origin in a manner that may satisfy every man of common understanding. The earth is given to men in common for the purposes of life, by the bounty of heaven. But to divide it, and appropriate one part of its produce to one, another part to another, must be the work of men who have power and understanding given them, by which every man may accommodate himself, without hurt to any other. This common right of every man to what the earth produces, before it be occupied and appropriated by others, was, by ancient moralists, very properly compared to the right which every citizen had to the public theatre, where every man that came might occupy an empty seat, and thereby acquire a right to it while the entertainment lasted, but no man had a right to dispossess another. The earth is a great theatre, furnished by the Almighty with perfect wisdom and goodness, for the entertainment and employment of all mankind. Here every man has a right to accommodate himself as a spectator, and to perform his part as an actor, but without hurt to others. Consequences of Reed's Doctrine 1. That the portion which each one appropriates may wrong no one, it must be equal to the quotient of the total amount of property to be shared, divided by the number of those who are to share it. 2. The number of places being of necessity equal at all times to that of the spectators, no spectator can occupy two places, nor can any actor play several parts. 3. Whenever a spectator comes in or goes out, the places of all contract or enlarge correspondingly. For, says Reed, the right of property is not innate, but acquired. Consequently, it is not absolute. Consequently, the occupancy on which it is based, being a conditional fact, cannot endow this right with a stability which it does not possess itself. This seems to have been the thought of the Edinburgh professor when he added, a right to life implies a right to the necessary means of life, and that justice which forbids the taking away the life of an innocent man forbids no less the taking from him the necessary means of life. He has the same right to defend the one as the other. To hinder another man's innocent labour, or to deprive him of the fruit of it, is an injustice of the same kind, and has the same effect as to put him in fetters or in prison, and is equally a just object of resentment. Thus the chief of the Scotch school, without considering at all the inequality of skill or labour, posits a priori the equality of the means of labour, abandoning thereafter to each labourer the care of his own person, after the eternal axiom, Whoso does well shall fare well. The philosopher Reed is lacking not in knowledge of the principle, but encouraged to pursue it to its ultimate. If the right of life is equal, the right of labour is equal, and so is the right of occupancy. Would it not be criminal, were some islanders to repulse, in the name of property, the unfortunate victims of a shipwreck struggling to reach the shore? The very idea of such cruelty sickens the imagination. The proprietor, like Robinson Crusoe on his island, wards off with pike and musket the proletaire washed overboard by the waves of civilization, and seeking to gain a foothold upon the rocks of property. Give me work, cries he with all his might to the proprietor. Don't drive me away. I will work for you at any price. I do not need your services, replies the proprietor, showing the end of his pike or the barrel of his gun. Lower my rent at least. I need my income to live upon. 
How can I pay you when I get no work? That is your business. Then the unfortunate proletaire abandons himself to the waves, or, if he attempts to land upon the shore of property, the proprietor takes aim and kills him. We have just listened to a spiritualist. We will now question a materialist, then an eclectic. And, having completed the circle of philosophy, we will turn next to law. According to Destut de Tracy, property is a necessity of our nature. That this necessity involves unpleasant consequences, it would be folly to deny. But these consequences are necessary evils which do not invalidate the principle so that it is as unreasonable to rebel against property on account of the abuses which it generates as to complain of life because it is sure to end in death. This brutal and pitiless philosophy promises at least frank and close reasoning. Let us see if it keeps its promise. We talk very gravely about the conditions of property as if it was our province to decide what constitutes property, it would seem to hear certain philosophies and legislators that at a certain moment, spontaneously and without cause, people began to use the words thine and mine, and that they might have, or ought to have, dispensed with them. But thine and mine were never invented. A philosopher yourself, you are too realistic. Thine and mine do not necessarily refer to self, as they do when I say your philosophy and my equality. For your philosophy is you philosophizing, and my equality is I professing equality. Thine and mine oftener indicate a relation. Your country, your parish, your tailor, your milkmaid, my chamber, my seat at the theatre, my company, and my battalion in the National Guard. In the former sense we may sometimes say my labour, my skill, my virtue, never my grandeur, nor my majesty. In the latter sense only, my field, my house, my vineyard, my capital, precisely as the banker's clerk says my cash-box. In short, thine and mine are signs and expressions of personal but equal rights. Applied to things outside of us, they indicate possession, function, use, not property. It does not seem possible, but nevertheless I shall prove by quotations that the whole theory of our author is based upon this paltry equivocation. Prior to all covenants men are not exactly, as Hobbes says, in a state of hostility, but of estrangement. In this state justice and injustice are unknown. The rights of one bear no relation to the rights of another. All have as many rights as needs, and all feel it their duty to satisfy those needs by any means at their command. Granted, whether true or false it matters not. Destut de Tracy cannot escape equality. On this theory, men, while in a state of estrangement, are under no obligations to each other. They all have the right to satisfy their needs without regard to the needs of others, and consequently the right to exercise their power over nature each according to his strength and ability. That involves the greatest inequality of wealth. Inequality of conditions, then, is the characteristic feature of estrangement or barbarism, the exact opposite of Rousseau's idea. But let us look farther. Restrictions of these rights and this duty commence at the time when covenants, either implied or expressed, are agreed upon then appears for the first time justice and injustice, that is, the balance between the rights of one and the rights of another, which up to that time were necessarily equal. Listen, rights were equal. That means that each individual had the right to satisfy his needs without reference to the needs of others. In other words, that all had the right to injure each other, that there was no right save force and cunning. They injured each other, not only by war and pillage, but also by usurpation and appropriation. Now, in order to abolish this equal right to use force and stratagem, this equal right to do evil, the sole source of the inequality of benefits and injuries, they commenced to make covenants either implied or expressed, and established a balance. Then these agreements and this balance were intended to secure to all equal comfort, then, by the law of contradictions, 
If isolation is the principle of inequality, society must produce equality. The social balance is the equalization of the strong and the weak. For, while they are not equals, they are strangers. They can form no associations, they live as enemies. Then, if inequality of conditions is a necessary evil, so is isolation, for society and inequality are incompatible with each other. Then, if society is the true condition of man's existence, so is equality also. This conclusion cannot be avoided. This being so, how is it that, ever since the establishment of this balance, inequality has been on the increase? How is it that justice and isolation always accompany each other? Destut de Tracy shall reply, Needs and means, rights and duties, are the products of the will. If man willed nothing, these would not exist. But to have needs and means, rights and duties, is to have, to possess something. They are so many kinds of property, using the word in its most general sense. They are things which belong to us. Shameful equivocation, not justified by the necessity for generalization. The word property has two meanings. 1. It designates the quality which makes a thing what it is, the attribute which is peculiar to it and especially distinguishes it. We use it in this sense when we say the properties of the triangle or of numbers, the property of the magnet, etc. 2. It expresses the right of absolute control over a thing by a free and intelligent being. It is used in this sense by writers on jurisprudence. Thus, in the phrase, iron acquires the property of a magnet, the word property does not convey the same idea that it does in this one. I have acquired this magnet as my property. To tell a poor man that he has property because he has arms and legs, that the hunger from which he suffers and his power to sleep in the open air are his property, is to play upon words and to add insult to injury. The sole basis of the idea of property is the idea of personality. As soon as property is born at all, it is born of necessity in all its fullness. As soon as an individual knows himself, his moral personality, his capacities of enjoyment, suffering and action, he necessarily sees also that this self is exclusive proprietor of the body in which it dwells, its organs, their powers, faculties, etc. Inasmuch as artificial and conventional property exists, there must be natural property also, for nothing can exist in art without its counterpart in nature. We ought to admire the honesty and judgment of philosophers. Man has properties, that is, in the first acceptation of the term, faculties. He has property, that is, in its second acceptation, the right of domain. He has, then, the property of the property of being proprietor. How ashamed I should be to notice such foolishness were I here considering only the authority of Destut de Tracy. But the entire human race, since the origination of society and language, when metaphysics and dialectics were first born, has been guilty of this puerile confusion of thought. All which man could call his own was identified in his mind with his person. He considered it as his property, his wealth, a part of himself, a member of his body, a faculty of his mind. The possession of things was likened to property in the powers of the body and mind, and on this false analogy was based the right of property. The imitation of nature by art, as Destut de Tracy so elegantly puts it. But why did not this ideologist perceive that man is not proprietor even of his own faculties? Man has powers, attributes, capacities. They are given him by nature that he may live, learn, and love. He does not own them, but has only the use of them, and he can make no use of them that does not harmonize with nature's laws. If he had absolute mastery over his faculties, he could avoid hunger and cold. He could eat unstintedly and walk through fire. He could move mountains, walk a hundred leagues in a minute, cure without medicines and by the sole force of his will, and could make himself immortal. 
he could say, I wish to produce, and his tasks would be finished with the words. He could say, I wish to know, and he would know. I love, and he would enjoy. What then? Man is not master of himself, but maybe of his surroundings. Let him use the wealth of nature, since he can live only by its use. But let him abandon his pretensions to the title of proprietor, and remember that he is called so only metaphorically. To sum up, Destut de Tracy classes together the external productions of nature and art, and the powers or faculties of man, making both of them species of property, and upon this equivocation he hopes to establish, so firmly that it can never be disturbed, the right of property. But of these different kinds of property, some are innate, as memory, imagination, strength, and beauty, while others are acquired, as land, water, and forests. In the state of nature or isolation, the strongest and most skilful, that is, those best provided with innate property, stand the best chance of obtaining acquired property. Now it is to prevent this encroachment, and the war which results therefrom, that a balance, justice, has been employed, and covenants implied or expressed agreed upon. It is to correct, as far as possible, inequality of innate property by equality of acquired property. As long as the division remains unequal, so long the partners remain enemies, and it is the purpose of the covenants to reform this state of things. Thus we have, on the one hand, isolation, inequality, enmity, war, robbery, murder. On the other, society, equality, fraternity, peace, and love. Choose between them. Monsieur Joseph Duton, a physician, engineer, and geometrician, but a very poor legist and no philosopher at all, is the author of A Philosophy of Political Economy, in which he felt it his duty to break lances in behalf of property. His reasoning seems to be borrowed from Destut de Tracy. He commences with this definition of property, worthy of Scanarel. Property is the right by which a thing is one's own. Literally translated, property is the right of property. After getting entangled a few times on the subjects of will, liberty, and personality, after having distinguished between immaterial natural property and material natural property, a distinction similar to Destut de Tracy's of innate and acquired property, M. Joseph Duton concludes with these two general propositions. 1. Property is a natural and inalienable right of every man. 2. Inequality of property is a necessary result of nature, which propositions are convertible into a simpler one. All men have an equal right of unequal property. He rebukes Monsieur de Sismondi for having taught that landed property has no other basis than law and conventionality, and he says himself, speaking of the respect which people feel for property, that their good sense reveals to them the nature of the original contract made between society and proprietors. He confounds property with possession, communism with equality, the just with the natural, and the natural with the possible. Now he takes these different ideas to be equivalents. Now he seems to distinguish between them so much so that it would be infinitely easier to refute him than to understand him. Attracted first by the title of the work, Philosophy of Political Economy, I have found among the author's obscurities only the most ordinary ideas. For that reason I will not speak of him. Monsieur Cousin, in his Moral Philosophy, page 15, teaches that all morality, all laws, all rights are given to man with this injunction. Free being, remain free. Bravo, master, I wish to remain free if I can. He continues, Our principle is true, it is good, it is social. Do not fear to push it to its ultimate. 1. If the human person is sacred, its whole nature is sacred, and particularly its interior actions, its feelings, its thoughts, its voluntary decisions. This accounts for the respect due to philosophy, religion, the arts, industry, commerce, and to all the results of liberty. I say respect, not simply toleration, for we do not tolerate a right, we respect it. 
I bow my head before this philosophy. 2. My liberty, which is sacred, needs for its object of action an instrument which we call the body. The body participates then in the sacredness of liberty. It is then inviolable. This is the basis of the principle of individual liberty. 3. My liberty needs for its object of action material to work upon. In other words, property or a thing. This thing or property naturally participates then in the inviolability of my person. For instance, I take possession of an object which has become necessary and useful in the outward manifestation of my liberty. I say, this object is mine since it belongs to no one else. Consequently, I possess it legitimately. So the legitimacy of possession rests on two conditions. First, I possess only as a free being. Suppress free activity, you destroy my power to labor. Now it is only by labor that I can use this property or thing, and it is only by using it that I possess it. Free activity is then the principle of the right of property. But that alone does not legitimate possession. All men are free. All can use property by labor. Does that mean that all men have a right to all property? Not at all. To possess legitimately, I must not only labor and produce in my capacity of a free being, but I must also be the first to occupy the property. In short, if labor and production are the principle of the right of property, the fact of first occupancy is its indispensable condition. 4. I possess legitimately. Then I have the right to use my property as I see fit. I have also the right to give it away. I have also the right to bequeath it. For if I decide to make a donation, my decision is as valid after my death as during my life. In fact, to become a proprietor, in M. Cousin's opinion, one must take possession by occupation and labor. I maintain that the element of time must be considered also. For if the first occupants have occupied everything, what are the newcomers to do? What will become of them, having an instrument with which to work, but no material to work upon? Must they devour each other? A terrible extremity, unforeseen by philosophical prudence, for the reason that great geniuses neglect little things. Notice also that M. Cousin says that neither occupation nor labor, taken separately, can legitimate the right of property, and that it is born only from the union of the two. This is one of M. Cousin's eclectic turns, which he, more than anyone else, should take pains to avoid. Instead of proceeding by the method of analysis, comparison, elimination, and reduction, the only means of discovering the truth amid the various forms of thought and whimsical opinions, he jumbles all systems together, and then, declaring each both right and wrong, exclaims, There you have the truth. But, adhering to my promise, I will not refute him. I will only prove, by all the arguments with which he justifies the right of property, the principle of equality which kills it. As I have already said, my sole intent is this, to show at the bottom of all these positions that inevitable major, equality, hoping hereafter to show that the principle of property vitiates the very elements of economical, moral, and governmental science, thus leading it in the wrong direction. Well, is it not true, from M. Cousin's point of view, that if the liberty of man is sacred, it is equally sacred in all individuals, that if it needs property for its object of action, that is, for its life, the appropriation of material is equally necessary for all. That, if I wish to be respected in my right of appropriation, I must respect others in theirs, and, consequently, that, though, in the sphere of the infinite, a person's power of appropriation is limited only by himself, in the sphere of the finite, this same power is limited by the mathematical relation between the number of persons and the space which they occupy. Does it not follow that if one individual cannot prevent another, his fellow man, from appropriating an amount of material equal to his own, no more can he prevent individuals yet to come? Because while individuality passes away, universality persists, and eternal laws cannot be determined by a partial view of their manifestations. 
Must we not conclude, therefore, that whenever a person is born, the others must crowd closer together, and, by reciprocity of obligation, that if the newcomer is afterwards to become an heir, the right of succession does not give him the right of accumulation, but only the right of choice? I have followed Monsieur Cousin so far as to imitate his style, and I am ashamed of it. Do we need such high-sounding terms, such sonorous phrases, to say such simple things? Man needs labor in order to live. Consequently, he needs tools to work with and materials to work upon. His need to produce constitutes his right to produce. Now this right is guaranteed him by his fellows, with whom he makes an agreement to that effect. One hundred thousand men settle in a large country like France with no inhabitants. Each man has a right to one one hundred thousandth of the land. If the number of possessors increases, each one's portion diminishes in consequence, so that if the number of inhabitants rises to thirty-four millions, each one will have a right to only one thirty-four millionth. Now so regulate the police system and the government, labor, exchange, inheritance, etc., that the means of labor shall be shared by all equally, and that each individual shall be free, and then society will be perfect. Of all the defenders of property, Monsieur Cousin has gone the farthest. He has maintained against the economists that labor does not establish the right of property unless preceded by occupation and against the jurists that the civil law can determine and apply a natural right, but cannot create it. In fact, it is not sufficient to say, the right of property is demonstrated by the existence of property, the function of the civil law is purely declaratory. To say that is to confess that there is no reply to those who question the legitimacy of the fact itself. Every right must be justifiable in itself, or by some antecedent right property is no exception. For this reason M. Cousin has sought to base it upon the sanctity of the human personality, and the act by which the will assimilates a thing. Once touched by man, says one of M. Cousin's disciples, things receive from him a character which transforms and humanizes them. I confess for my part that I have no faith in this magic, and that I know of nothing less holy than the will of man. But this theory, fragile as it seems to psychology as well as jurisprudence, is nevertheless more philosophical and profound than those theories which are based upon labor or the authority of the law. Now we have just seen to what this theory of which we are speaking leads, to the equality implied in the terms of its statement. But perhaps philosophy views things from too lofty a standpoint, and is not sufficiently practical. Perhaps from the exalted summit of speculation, men seem so small to the metaphysician that he cannot distinguish between them. Perhaps, indeed, the equality of conditions is one of those principles which are very true and sublime as generalities, but which it would be ridiculous and even dangerous to attempt to rigorously apply to the customs of life and to social transactions. Undoubtedly, this is a case which calls for the imitation of the wise reserve of moralists and jurists, who warn us against carrying things to extremes, and who advise us to suspect every definition. Because there is not one, they say, which cannot be utterly destroyed by developing its disastrous results. Omnis definitio in jure civili periculosa est, parum est enim ut non subverti possit. Equality of conditions a terrible dogma in the ears of the proprietor, a consoling truth at the poor man's sickbed, a frightful reality under the knife of the anatomist, a quality of conditions established in the political, civil, and industrial spheres is only an alluring impossibility, an inviting bait, a satanic delusion. It is never my intention to surprise my reader. I detest, as I do death, the man who employs subterfuge in his words and conduct. From the first page of this book I have expressed myself so plainly and decidedly that all can see the tendency of my thought and hopes, and they will do me the justice to say that it would be difficult to exhibit more frankness and more boldness at the same time. I do not hesitate to declare that the time is not far distant when this reserve, now so much admired in philosophers, 
this happy medium so strongly recommended by professors of moral and political science, will be regarded as the disgraceful feature of a science without principle, and as the seal of its reprobation. In legislation and morals, as well as in geometry, axioms are absolute, definitions are certain, and all the results of a principle are to be accepted, provided they are logically deduced. Deplorable pride. We know nothing of our nature, and we charge our blunders to it, and in a fit of unaffected ignorance cry out, The truth is in doubt, the best definition defines nothing. We shall know some time whether this distressing uncertainty of jurisprudence arises from the nature of its investigations, or from our prejudices. Whether, to explain social phenomena, it is not enough to change our hypothesis, as did Copernicus when he reversed the system of Ptolemy. But what will be said when I show, as I soon shall, that this same jurisprudence continually tries to base property upon equality? What reply can be made? End of chapter 2, section 2 Recording by Tim Macarios Section 8 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Nelson What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon, translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Chapter 2, Part 3, Civil Law as the Foundation and Sanction of Property. Pothier seems to think that property, like royalty, exists by divine right. He traces back its origin to God himself. Ab Jove Principium. He begins in this way. God is the absolute ruler of the universe and all that it contains. Domini est terra et plenitudo ejus orbis et universi qui habitant in io. For the human race, he has created the earth and all its creatures, and has given it a control over them subordinate only to his own. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, Thou hast put all things under his feet, says the psalmist. God accompanied this gift with these words, addressed to our first parents after the creation, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. After this magnificent introduction, who would refuse to believe the human race to be an immense family living in brotherly union and under the protection of of a venerable father. But heavens, are brothers enemies? Are fathers unnatural and children prodigal? God gave the earth to the human race. Why then have I received none? He has put all things under my feet, and I have not where to lay my head. Multiply, he tells us through his interpreter, Potier. Ah, oh, learned Potier! That is as easy to do as to say, but you must give moss to the bird for its nest. The human race, having multiplied, men divided among themselves the earth and most of the things upon it. That which fell to each, from that time exclusively belonged to him. That was the origin of the right of property. Say, rather, the right of possession. Men lived in a state of communism, whether positive or negative it matters little. Then there was no property, not even private possession. The genesis and growth of possession, gradually forcing people to labor for their support, they agreed either formally or tacitly, it makes no difference which, that the laborer should be sole proprietor of the fruit of his labor. That is, they simply declared the fact that thereafter none could live without working. It necessarily followed that, to obtain equality of products, there must be equality of labor, and that, to obtain equality of labor, there must be equality of facilities for labor. Whoever, without labor, got possession, by force or by strategy, of another's means of subsistence, destroyed equality. 
and placed himself above or outside of the law. Whoever monopolized the means of production on the ground of greater industry also destroyed equality. Equality being then the expression of right, whoever violated it was unjust. Thus, labor gives birth to private possession, the right in a thing, juice in re. But in what thing? Evidently in the product, not in the soil. So the Arabs have always understood it, and so, according to Caesar and Tacitus, the Germans formerly held. The Arabs, says Sismondi, who admit a man's property in the flocks which he has raised, do not refuse the crop to him who planted the seed, but they do not see why another, his equal, should not have a right to plant in his turn. The inequality which results from the pretended right of the first occupant seems to them to be based on no principle of justice, and when all the land falls into the hands of a certain number of inhabitants, there results a monopoly in their favor against the rest of the nation, to which they do not wish to submit. Well, they have shared the land. I admit that therefrom results a powerful organization of labor, and that this method of distribution, fixed and durable, is advantageous to production. But how could this division give to each a transferable right of property in a thing to which all had an inalienable right of possession. In terms of jurisprudence, this metamorphosis from possessor to proprietor is legally impossible. It implies in the jurisdiction of the courts the union of possessor and petitor, and the mutual concessions of those who share the land are nothing less than traffic in natural rights. The original cultivators of the land, who were also the original makers of the law, were not as learned as our legislators, I admit, and had they been, they could not have done worse. They did not foresee the consequences of the transformation of the right of private possession into the right of absolute property. But why have not those who in later times have established the distinction between jus in re and jus ad rem, applied it to the principle of property itself. Let me call the attention of the writers on jurisprudence to their own maxims. The right of property, provided it can have a cause, can have but one. Dominium non potest nisi ex una causa contendere. I can possess by several titles. I can become proprietor by only one. Non ut ex pluribus causis idem nobis deberi potest ita ex pluribus causis idem potest nostrum esse. The field which I have cleared, which I cultivate, on which I have built my house, which supports myself, my family, and my livestock, I can possess. First, as the original occupant, second, as a laborer, third, by virtue of the social contract which assigns it to me as my share. But none of these titles confer upon me the right of property, for if I attempt to base it upon occupancy, society can reply, I am the original occupant. If I appeal to my labor, it will say, it is only on that condition that you possess. If I speak of agreements, it will respond, these agreements establish only your right of use. Such, however, are the only titles which proprietors advance. They never have been able to discover any others. Indeed, every right, it is Pothier who says it, supposes a producing cause in the person who enjoys it, but in man who lives and dies, in this son of earth who passes away like a shadow, there exists, with respect to external things, only titles of possession, not one title of property. Why, then, 
has society recognized a right injurious to itself, where there is no producing cause? Why, in according possession, has it also conceded property? Why has the law sanctioned this abuse of power? The German Ancelon replies thus, Some philosophers pretend that man, in employing his forces upon a natural object, say a field or a tree, acquires a right only to the improvements which he makes, to the form which he gives to the object, not to the object itself. Useless distinction. If the form could be separated from the object, perhaps there would be room for question, but as this is almost always impossible, the application of man's strength to the different parts of the visible world is the foundation of the right of property, the primary origin of riches. Vain pretext. If the form cannot be separated from the object, nor property from possession, possession must be shared. In any case, society reserves the right to fix the conditions of property. Let us suppose that an appropriated farm yields a gross income of 10,000 francs, and, as very seldom happens, that this farm cannot be divided. Let us suppose, farther that, by economical calculation, the annual expenses of a family are 3,000 francs. The possessor of this farm should be obliged to guard his reputation as a good father of a family by paying to society 10,000 francs less the total costs of cultivation, and the 3,000 francs required for the maintenance of his family. This payment is not rent. It is an indemnity. What sort of justice is it, then, which makes such laws as this? Whereas, since labor so changes the form of a thing, that the form and substance cannot be separated without destroying the thing itself, Either society must be disinherited, or the laborer must lose the fruit of his labor. And, whereas in every other case, property in raw material would give a title to added improvements, minus their costs, and whereas, in this instance, property in improvements ought to give a title to the principal. Therefore, the right of appropriation by labor shall never be admitted against individuals, but only against society. In such a way do legislators always reason in regard to property. The law is intended to protect men's mutual rights, that is, the rights of each against each, and each against all, and, as if a proportion could exist with less than four terms, the lawmakers always disregard the latter. As long as man is opposed to man, property offsets property, and the two forces balance each other. As soon as man is isolated, that is, opposed to the society which he himself represents, jurisprudence is at fault. Themis has lost one scale of her balance. Listen to the professor of Rennes, the learned Tolier. How could this claim, made valid by occupation, become stable and permanent property, which might continue to stand and which might be reclaimed after the first occupant had relinquished possession? Agriculture was a natural consequence of the multiplication of the human race, and agriculture in its turn favors population and necessitates the establishment of permanent property. For who would take the trouble to plow and sow if he were not certain that he would reap? To satisfy the husbandman, it was sufficient to guarantee him possession of his crop, admit even that he should have been protected in his right of occupation of land as long as he remained its cultivator. That was all that he had a right to expect. That was all that the advance of civilization demanded. But property, property, the right of eschet over lands which one neither occupies nor cultivates, 
Who had the authority to grant it? Who pretended to have it? Agriculture alone was not sufficient to establish permanent property. Positive laws were needed, and magistrates to execute them. In a word, the civil state was needed. The multiplication of the human race had rendered agriculture necessary. The need of securing to the cultivator the fruit of his labor made permanent property necessary, and also laws for its protection. So we are indebted to property for the creation of the civil state. Yes, of our civil state, as you have made it, a state which at first was despotism, then monarchy, then aristocracy, today democracy, and always tyranny. Without the ties of property, it never would have been possible to subordinate men to the wholesome yoke of the law, and without permanent property, the earth would have remained a vast forest. Let us admit, then, with the most careful writers, that if transient property, or the right of preference resulting from occupation, existed prior to the establishment of civil society, permanent property, as we know it today, is the work of civil law. It is the civil law which holds that, when once acquired, property can be lost only by the action of the proprietor, and that it exists even after the proprietor had relinquished possession of the thing, and it has fallen into the hands of a third party. Thus property and possession, which originally were confounded, became through the civil law two distinct and independent things, two things which, in the language of the law, have nothing whatever in common. In this we see what a wonderful change has been effected in property, and to what an extent nature has been altered by the civil laws. Thus the law, in establishing property, has not been an expression of a psychological fact, the development of a natural law, the application of a moral principle. It has literally created a right outside of its own province. It has realized an abstraction, a metaphor, a fiction, that without deigning to look at the consequences, without considering the disadvantages, without inquiring whether it was right or wrong. It has sanctioned selfishness. It has endorsed monstrous pretensions. It has received with favor impious vows, as if it were able to fill up a bottomless pit, and to satiate hell. Blind law, the law of the ignorant man, a law which is not a law, the voice of discord, deceit, and blood. This it is which, continually revived, reinstated, rejuvenated, restored, reinforced, as the palladium of society, has troubled the consciences of the people, has obscured the minds of the masters, and has induced all the catastrophes which have befallen nations. This it is which Christianity has condemned, but which its ignorant ministers defy, who have as little desire to study nature and man as ability to read their scriptures. But indeed, what guide did the law follow in creating the domain of property? What principle directed it? What was its standard? Would you believe it? It was equality. Agriculture was the foundation of territorial possession and the original cause of property. It was of no use to secure the farmer the fruit of his labor unless the means of production were at the same time secured to him to fortify the weak against the invasion of the strong, to suppress spoliation and fraud. The necessity was felt of establishing between possessors permanent lines of division, insuperable obstacles. Every year we saw the people multiply and the cupidity of the husbandman increase. It was thought best to put a bridle on ambition by setting boundaries which ambition would in vain attempt to overstep. Thus the soil came to be appropriated through need of the equality which is essential to public security and peaceable possession. Undoubtedly, the division was never geographically equal. A multitude of rights, 
some founded in nature, but wrongly interpreted and still more wrongly applied, inheritance, gift, and exchange, others, like the privileges of birth and position, the illegitimate creations of ignorance and brute force, all operated to prevent absolute equality. But, nevertheless, the principle remained the same. Equality had sanctioned possession, equality sanctioned property. The husbandmen needed each year a field to sow. Now what more convenient and simple arrangement for the barbarians? Instead of indulging in annual quarrels and fights, instead of continually moving their houses, furniture, and families from spot to spot, than to assign to each individual a fixed and inalienable estate. It was not right that the soldier on returning from an expedition should find himself dispossessed on account of the services which he had just rendered to his country. His estate ought to be restored to him. It became, therefore, customary to retain property by intent alone, nudo animo, it could be sacrificed only with the consent and by the action of the proprietor. It was necessary that the equality in the division should be kept up from one generation to another, without a new distribution of the land upon the death of each family. It appeared, therefore, natural and just that children and parents, according to the degree of relationship which they bore to the deceased, should be the heirs of their ancestors. Thence came in the first place, the feudal and patriarchal custom of recognizing only one heir, then, by a quite contrary application of the principle of equality, the admission of all the children to a share in their father's estate, and very recently also among us, the definitive abolition of the right of primogeniture. But what is there in common between these rude outlines of instinctive organization and the true social science. How could these men, who never had the faintest idea of statistics, valuation, or political economy, furnish us with principles of legislation? The law, says a modern writer on jurisprudence, is the expression of a social want, the declaration of a fact. The legislator does not make it, he declares it. This definition is not exact. The law is a method by which social wants must be satisfied. The people do not vote it. The legislator does not express it. The savant discovers and formulates it. But in fact, the law, according to Comte, who has devoted half a volume to its definition, was in the beginning only the expression of a want and the indication of the means of supplying it and up to this time it has been nothing else. The legists, with mechanical fidelity, full of obstinacy, enemies of philosophy buried in literalities, have always mistaken for the last word of science that which only the inconsiderate aspiration of men who, to be sure, were well-meaning but wanting in foresight. They did not foresee, these old founders of the domain of property, that the perpetual and absolute right to retain one's estate, a right which seemed to them equitable because it was common, involves the right to transfer, sell, give, gain, and lose it, that it tends, consequently, to nothing less than the destruction of that equality to which they established it to maintain. Though they should have foreseen it, they disregarded it. The present want occupied their whole attention, and, as ordinarily happens in such cases, the disadvantages were at first scarcely perceptible, and they passed unnoticed. They did not foresee, these ingenious legislators, that if property is retainable by intent alone, nudo animo, it carries with it the right to let, to lease, to loan, at interest, to profit by exchange, to settle annuities, and to levy a tax on a field which intent reserves. 
while the body is busy elsewhere. They did not foresee, these fathers of our jurisprudence, that if the right of inheritance is anything other than nature's method of preserving a quality of wealth, families will soon become victims of the most disastrous exclusions, and society, pierced to the heart by one of the most sacred principles, will come to its death through opulence and misery. Under whatever form of government we live, it can always be said that le mort sacit les vif, that is, that inheritance and succession will last forever, whoever may be the recognized heir. But the St. Simonians wish their heir to be designated by the magistrate. Others wish him to be chosen by the deceased, or assumed by the law to be so chosen. The essential point is that nature's wish to be satisfied so far as the law of equity allows. Today, the real controller of inheritance is chance or caprice. Now, in matters of legislation, chance and caprice cannot be accepted as guides. It is for the purpose of avoiding the manifold disturbances which follow in the wake of chance that nature, after having created us equal, suggests to us the principle of heredity which serves as a voice by which society asks us to choose from among all our brothers him whom we judge best fitted to complete our unfinished work. They did not foresee, but why need I go farther? The consequences are plain enough, and this is not the time to criticize the whole code. The history of property among the ancient nations is then, simply a matter of research and curiosity. It is a rule of jurisprudence that the fact does not substantiate the right. Now, property is no exception to this rule. Then, the universal recognition of the right of property does not legitimate the right of property. Man is mistaken as to the constitution of society, the nature of right, and the application of justice just as he was mistaken regarding the cause of meteors and the movement of the heavenly bodies. His old opinions cannot be taken for articles of faith. Of what consequence is it to us that the Indian race was divided into four classes, that on the banks of the Nile and the Ganges, blood and position formerly determined the distribution of the land, that the Greeks and Romans placed property under the protection of the gods, that they accompanied with religious ceremonies the work of partitioning the land and appraising their goods. The variety of the forms of privilege does not sanction injustice. The faith of Jupiter, the proprietor, proves no more against the equality of citizens than do the mysteries of Venus the wanton against conjugal chastity. The authority of the human race is of no effect as evidence in favor of the right of property, because this right, resting of necessity upon equality, contradicts its principle. The decision of the religions which have sanctioned it is of no effect, because in all ages the priest has submitted to the prince and the gods have always spoken to the politicians desired. The social advantages attributed to a property cannot be cited in its behalf, because they all spring from the principle of equality of possession. What means, then, this dithram on property? The right of property is the most important of human institutions. Yes, as monarchy is most glorious, the original cause of man's prosperity upon earth, because justice was supposed to be its principle. Property became the legitimate end of his ambition, the hope of his existence, the shelter of his family, in a word, the cornerstone of the domestic dwelling, of communities, and of the political state. Possession alone produced all that. 
eternal principle. Property is eternal, like every negation of all social and civil institutions. For that reason, every institution and every law based on property will perish. It is a boon as precious as liberty for the rich proprietor. In fact, the cause of the cultivation of the habitable earth. If the cultivator ceased to be a tenant, would the land be worse cared for? The guarantee and the morality of labor. Under the regime of property, labor is not a condition, but a privilege. The application of justice. What is justice without equality of fortunes? A balance with false weights. All morality. A famished stomach knows no morality. All public order. Certainly, the preservation of property rest on the right of property. Cornerstone of all which is, stumbling block of all which ought to be, such is property. To sum up and conclude, not only does occupation lead to equality, it prevents property. For since every man, from the fact of his existence, has the right of occupation, and in order to live, must have material for cultivation on which he may labor, and since, on the other hand, the number of occupants varies continually with the births and deaths, it follows that the quantity of material which each laborer may claim varies with the number of occupants. Consequently, that occupation is always subordinate to population. Finally that, inasmuch as possession, in right, can never remain fixed, it is impossible, in fact, that it can ever become property. Every occupant is, then, necessarily a possessor, or usufructuary, a function which excludes proprietorship. Now, this is the right of the usufructuary, he is responsible for the thing entrusted to him. He must use it in conformity with general utility. With a view to its preservation and development, he has no power to transform it, to diminish it, or to change its nature. He cannot so divide the usufruct that another shall perform the labor while he receives the product. In a word, the usufructuary is under the supervision of society, submitted to the condition of labor and the law of equality. Thus is annihilated the Roman definition of property, the right of use and abuse, an immorality born of violence, the most monstrous pretension that the civil laws ever sanctioned. Man receives his usufruct from the hands of society, which alone is the permanent possessor. The individual passes away, society is deathless. What a profound disgust fills my soul while discussing such simple truths. Do we doubt these things today? Will it be necessary to again take arms for their triumph? And can force, in default of reason, alone introduce them into our laws? All have an equivalent right of occupancy. The amount occupied being measured, not by the will, but by the variable conditions of space and number, property cannot exist. This no code has ever expressed. This no constitution can admit. These are axioms which the civil law and the law of nations deny. But I hear the exclamations of the partisans of another system. Labor, labor, that is the basis of property. Reader, do not be deceived. This new basis of property is worse than the first. And I shall soon have to ask your pardon 
for having demonstrated things clearer and refuted pretensions more unjust than any which we have yet considered. End of chapter 2 Section 9 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker Chapter 3, Part 1 Labor as the Efficient Cause of the Domain of Property Nearly all the modern writers on jurisprudence, taking their cue from the economists, have abandoned the theory of first occupancy as a too dangerous one, and have adopted that which regards property as born of labor. In this they are deluded, they reason in a circle. To labor it is necessary to occupy, says Mr. Cousin. Consequently, I have added in my turn, all having an equal right of occupancy, to labor it is necessary to submit to equality. The rich, exclaims Jean-Jacques, have the arrogance to say, I built this wall, I earned this land by my labor. Who sets you the tasks, we may reply, and by what right do you demand payment from us for labor which we did not impose upon you? All sophistry falls to the ground in the presence of this argument. But the partisans of labor do not see that their system is an absolute contradiction of the code, all the articles and provisions of which suppose property to be based upon the fact of first occupancy. If labor, through the appropriation which results from it, alone gives birth to property, the civil code lies, the charter is a falsehood, our whole social system is a violation of right. To this conclusion shall we come, at the end of the discussion which is to occupy our attention in this chapter and the following one, both as to the right of labor and the fact of property. We shall see, on the one hand, our legislation in opposition to itself, and on the other hand, our new jurisprudence in opposition both to its own principle and to our legislation. I have asserted that the system which bases property upon labor implies, no less than that which bases it upon occupation, the equality of fortunes, and the reader must be impatient to learn how I propose to deduce this law of equality from the inequality of skill and faculties, directly his curiosity shall be satisfied. But it is proper that I should call his attention for a moment to this remarkable feature of the process, to wit, the substitution of labor for occupation as the principle of property, and that I should pass rapidly in review some of the prejudices to which proprietors are accustomed to appeal, which legislation has sanctioned, and which the system of labor completely overthrows. Reader, were you ever present at the examination of a criminal? Have you watched his tricks, his turns, his evasions, his distinctions, his equivocations? Beaten, all his assertions overthrown, pursued like a fallow deer by the inexorable judge, tracked from hypothesis to hypothesis, he makes a statement, he corrects it, retracts it, contradicts it, he exhausts all the tricks of dialectics, more subtle, more ingenious, a thousand times than he who invented the seventy-two forms of the syllogism. So acts the proprietor when called upon to defend his right. At first he refuses to reply. He exclaims, he threatens, he defies. Then, forced to accept the discussion, he arms himself with chicanery. He surrounds himself with formidable artillery, crossing his fire, opposing one by one and altogether occupation, possession, limitation, covenants, immemorial custom, and universal consent. Conquered on this ground, the proprietor, like a wounded boar, turns on his pursuers. Quote, I have done more than occupy, he cries with terrible emotion. I have labored, produced, improved, transformed, created. This house, these fields, these trees are the work of my hands. I changed these brambles into a vineyard, and this bush into a fig tree. And today I reap the harvest of my labors. I have enriched the soil with my sweat. I have paid those men, who, had they not had the work which I gave them, would have died of hunger. No one shared with me the trouble and expense, 
no one shall share with me the benefits. End quote. You have labored, proprietor. Why then do you speak of original occupancy? What, were you not sure of your right, or did you hope to deceive men and make justice an illusion? Make haste, then, to acquaint us with your mode of defense, for the judgment will be final, and you know it to be a question of restitution. You have labored, but what is there in common between the labor which duty compels you to perform and the appropriation of things in which there is a common interest? Do you not know that domain over the soil, like that over air and light, cannot be lost by prescription? You have labored. Have you never made others labor? Why, then, have they lost in laboring for you what you have gained in not laboring for them? You have labored. Very well. But let us see the results of your labor. We will count, weigh, and measure them. It will be the judgment of Balthazar, for I swear by balance, level, and square, that if you have appropriated another's labor in any way whatsoever, you shall restore it every stroke. Thus the principle of occupation is abandoned. No longer is it said, the land belongs to him who first gets possession of it. Property forced into its first entrenchment repudiates its old adage, justice ashamed retracts her maxims, and sorrow lowers her bandage over her blushing cheeks. And it was but yesterday that this progress in social philosophy began, fifty centuries required for the extirpation of a lie. During this lamentable period, how many usurpations have been sanctioned, how many invasions glorified, how many conquests celebrated, the absent dispossessed, the poor banished, the hungry excluded by wealth, which is so ready and bold in action, jealousies and wars, incendiarism, and bloodshed among the nations. But henceforth, thanks to the age and its spirit, it is to be admitted that the earth is not a prize to be won in a race. In the absence of any other obstacle, there is a place for everybody under the sun. Each one may harness his goat to the bairn, drive his cattle to pasture, sow a corner of a field, and bake his bread by his own fireside. But no, each one cannot do these things. I hear it proclaimed on all sides, quote, Glory to labor and industry, to each according to his capacity, to each capacity according to its results. End quote. And I see three-fourths of the human race again despoiled, the labor of a few being a scourge to the labor of the rest. Quote, the problem is solved, exclaims Mr. Hennigan. Property, the daughter of labor, can be enjoyed at present and in the future only under the protection of laws. It has its origin in natural law. It derives its power from civil law and from the union of these two ideas, labor and protection, positive legislation results. End quote. Ah, the problem is solved. Property is the daughter of labor. What, then, is the right of accession and the right of succession and the right of donation, etc.? if not the right to become a proprietor by simple occupancy? What are your laws concerning the age of majority, emancipation, guardianship, and interdiction, if not the various conditions by which he who is already a laborer gains or loses the right of occupancy, that is, property? Being unable at this time to enter into a detailed discussion of the code, I shall content myself with examining the three arguments oftenest resorted to in support of property. 1. Appropriation, or the formation of property by possession. 2. The consent of mankind. 3. Prescription. I shall then inquire into the effects of labor upon the relative condition of the laborers and upon property. 1. The land cannot be appropriated. Quote, it would seem that lands capable of cultivation ought to be regarded as natural wealth, since they are not of human creation, but nature's gratuitous gift to man, but inasmuch as this wealth is not fugitive, like the air and water, inasmuch as a field is a fixed and limited space, which certain men have been able to appropriate, to the exclusion of all others who in their turn have consented to this appropriation. The land, which was a natural and gratuitous gift, has become social wealth for the use of which we ought to pay, end quote. say, political economy. Was I wrong in saying, at the beginning of this chapter, 
that the economists are the very worst authorities in matters of legislation and philosophy, it is the father of this class of men who clearly states the question, how can the supplies of nature, the wealth created by providence, become private property? And who replies by so gross an equivocation that we scarcely know which the author lacks, sense or honesty? What, I ask, has the fixed and solid nature of the earth to do with the right of appropriation? I can understand that a thing limited and stationary, like the land, offers greater chances for appropriation than the water or the sunshine, that it is easier to exercise the right of domain over the soil than over the atmosphere. But we are not dealing with the difficulty of the thing, and say confounds the right with the possibility. We do not ask why the earth has been appropriated to a greater extent than the sea and the air. We want to know by which right man has appropriated wealth, which he did not create, and which nature gave to him gratuitously. Say, then, did not solve the question which he asked. But if he had solved it, if the explanation which he has given us were as satisfactory as it is illogical, we should know no better than before who has a right to exact payment for the use of the soil, of this wealth which is not man's handiwork. Who is entitled to the rent of the land? The producer of the land, without doubt. Who made the land? God. Then proprietor, retire. But the creator of the land does not sell it. He gives it. And in giving it, he is no respecter of persons. Why, then, are some of his children regarded as legitimate, while others are treated as bastards? If the equality of shares was an original right, why is the inequality of conditions a posthumous right? Say gives us to understand that if the air and the water were not of a fugitive nature, they would have been appropriated. Let me observe in passing that this is more than an hypothesis. It is a reality. Men have appropriated the air and the water. I will not say as often as they could, but as often as they have been allowed to. The Portuguese, having discovered the route to India by the Cape of Good Hope, pretended to have the sole right to that route. And Grotius, consulted in regard to this matter by the Dutch, who refused to recognize this right, wrote expressly for this occasion his treatise on the freedom of the seas, to prove that the sea is not liable to appropriation. The right to hunt and fish used always to be confined to lords and proprietors. Today it is leased by the government and communes to whoever can pay the license fee and the rent. To regulate hunting and fishing is an excellent idea, but to make it a subject of sale is to create a monopoly of air and water. What is a passport? A universal recommendation of the traveler's person, a certificate of security for himself and his property. The treasury, whose nature it is to spoil the best things, has made the passport a means of espionage and a tax. Is not this a sale of the right to travel? Finally, it is permissible neither to draw water from a spring situated in another's grounds without the permission of the proprietor, because by the right of accession the spring belongs to the possessor of the soil if there is no other claim, nor to pass a day on his premises without paying a tax, nor to look at a court, a garden, or an orchard without the consent of the proprietor, nor to stroll in a park or an enclosure against the owner's will. Every one is allowed to shut himself up and to fence himself in. All of these prohibitions are so many positive interdictions, not only of the land, but of the air and water. We who belong to the proletaire class, property excommunicates us. Terra, et agua, et aire, et igne, interdicti, sumus. Men could not appropriate the most fixed of all the elements without appropriating the three others, since, by French and Roman law, property in this surface carries with it property from zenith to nadir. Cujus est solum, ejus est usque ad salum. Now, if the use of water, air, and fire excludes property, so does the use of the soil. This chain of reasoning seems to have been presented by M. Comte in his Treatise on Property, Chapter 5. Quote, if a man should be deprived of air for a few moments only, he would cease to exist, and a partial deprivation would cause him severe suffering. A partial or complete deprivation of food 
would produce like effects upon him, though less suddenly. It would be the same, at least in certain climates, were he deprived of all clothing and shelter. To sustain life, then, man needs continually to appropriate many different things, but these things do not exist in like proportions. Some, such as the light of the stars, the atmosphere of the earth, the water composing the seas and oceans, exist in such large quantities that men cannot perceive any sensible increase or diminution. Each one can appropriate as much as his needs require, without detracting from the enjoyment of others, without causing them the least harm. Things of this sort are, so to speak, the common property of the human race. The only duty imposed upon each individual in this regard is that of infringing not at all upon the rights of others. End quote. Let us complete the argument of Monsieur Comte, a man who should be prohibited from walking in the highways, from resting in the fields, from taking shelter in caves, from lighting fires, from picking berries, from gathering herbs and boiling them in a bit of baked clay. Such a man could not live. Consequently, the earth, like water, air, and light, is a primary object of necessity, which each has a right to use freely, without infringing another's right. Why, then, is the earth appropriated? Monsieur Comte's reply is a curious one. Say pretends that it is because it is not fugitive. Monsieur Comte assures us that it is because it is not infinite. The land is limited in amount. Then, according to Monsieur Comte, it ought to be appropriated. It would seem, on the contrary, that he ought to say, then it ought not to be appropriated, because no matter how large a quantity of air or light any one appropriates, no one is damaged thereby. There always remains enough for all. With the soil it is very different. Lay hold who will or who can of the sun rays, the passing breeze, or the sea billows. He has my consent, and my pardon for his bad intentions. But let any man dare to change his right of territorial possession into the right of property, and I will declare war upon him, and wage it to the death. Monsieur Comte's argument disproves his position. Quote, among the things necessary to the preservation of life, he says, there are some which exist in such large quantities that they are inexhaustible, others which exist in lesser quantities and can satisfy the wants of only a certain number of persons. The former are called common, the latter private. End quote. The reasoning is not strictly logical. Water, air, and light are common things, not because they are inexhaustible, but because they are indispensable, and so indispensable that for that very reason nature has created them in quantities almost infinite, in order that their plentifulness might prevent their appropriation. Likewise, the land is indispensable to our existence, consequently a common thing, consequently insusceptible of appropriation. But land is much scarcer than the other elements, therefore its use must be regulated, not for the profit of a few, but in the interest and for the security of all. In a word, equality of rights is proved by equality of needs. Now equality of rights, in the case of a commodity, which is limited in amount, can be realized only by equality of possession. An agrarian law underlies M. Comte's arguments. From whatever point we view the question of property, provided we go to the bottom of it, we reach equality. I will not insist farther on the distinction between things which can and things which cannot be appropriated. On this point, economists and legists talk worse than nonsense. The civil code, after having defined property, says nothing about susceptibility of appropriation, and if it speaks of things which are in the market, it always does so without enumerating or describing them. However, light is not wanting. There are some few maxims such as these, ad regis potestas, omnium pertinet, ad singulos proprietas, omnia rex, imperio possidet, singula dominio. Social sovereignty opposed to private property. Might not that be called a prophecy of equality, a republican oracle? Examples crowd upon us. Once the possessions of the church, the estates of the crown, the fiefs of the nobility, were inalienable and imperceptible. 
if instead of abolishing this privilege the constituent had extended to it every individual if it had declared the right of labor like liberty can never be forfeited at that moment the revolution would have been consummated and we could now devote ourselves to improvement in other directions two universal consent no justification of property in the extract from say quoted above it is not clear whether the author means to base the right of property on the stationary character of the soil or on the consent which he thinks all men have granted to this appropriation his language is such that it may mean either of these things or both at once which entitles us to assume that the author intended to say quote, the right of property resulting originally from the exercise of the will the stability of the soil permitted it to be applied to the land and universal consent has since sanctioned this application End quote. however that may be can men legitimate property by mutual consent i say no such a contract though drafted by grotius montesquieu and j j rousseau though signed by the whole human race would be null in the eyes of justice and an act to enforce it would be illegal man can no more give up labor than liberty now to recognize the right of territorial property is to give up labor since it is to relinquish the means of labor it is to traffic in a natural right and divest ourselves of manhood but i wish that this consent of which so much is made had been given either tacitly or formally what would have been the result evidently the surrenders would have been reciprocal no right would have been abandoned without the receipt of an equivalent in exchange we thus come back to equality again the sine qua non of appropriation so that after having justified property by universal consent that is by equality we are obliged to justify the inequality of conditions by property never shall we extricate ourselves from this dilemma indeed if in the terms of the social compact property has equality for its condition at the moment when equality ceases to exist the compact is broken and all property becomes usurpation we gain nothing then by this pretended consent of mankind end of section nine section ten of what is property this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by mary schneider what is property an inquiry into the principle of right and government by pierre joseph proudhon translated by benjamin r tucker chapter three part two labor as the efficient cause of the domain of property prescription gives no title to property the right of property was the origin of evil on the earth the first link in the long chain of crimes and misfortunes which the human race has endured since its birth the delusion of prescription is the fatal charm thrown over the intellect the death sentence breathed into the conscience to arrest man's progress towards truth and bolster up the worship of error the code defines prescription thus Quote, the process of gaining and losing through the lapse of time End quote. in applying this definition to ideas and beliefs we may use the word prescription to denote the everlasting prejudice in favor of old superstitions whatever be their object the opposition often furious and bloody with which new light has always been received and which makes the sage a martyr not a principle not a discovery not a generous thought but has met at its entrance into the world with a formidable barrier of preconceived opinions seeming like a conspiracy of old prejudices prescriptions against reason prescriptions against facts prescriptions against every truth hitherto unknown that is the sum and substance of the statu quo philosophy the watchword of conservatives throughout the century when the evangelical reform was broached to the world there was prescription in favor of violence debauchery and selfishness when galileo descartes pascal and their disciples reconstructed philosophy in the sciences there was prescription in favor of the aristotelian philosophy when our fathers of eighty nine demanded liberty and equality 
there was prescription in favor of tyranny and privilege there always have been proprietors and there always will be it is with this profound utterance the final effort of selfishness dying in its last ditch that the friends of social inequality hope to repel the attacks of their adversaries thinking undoubtedly that ideas like property can be lost by prescription enlightened to-day by the triumphal march of science taught by the most glorious successes to question our own opinions we receive with favor and applause the observer of nature who by a thousand experiments based upon the most profound analysis pursues a new principle a law hitherto undiscovered we take care to repel no idea no fact under the pretext that abler men than ourselves lived in former days who did not notice the same phenomena nor grasp the same analogies why do we not preserve a like attitude toward political and philosophical questions why this ridiculous mania for affirming that everything has been said which means that we know all about mental and moral science why is the proverb there is nothing new under the sun applied exclusively to metaphysical investigations because we still study philosophy with the imagination instead of by observation and method because fancy and will are universally regarded as judges in the place of arguments and facts it has been impossible to this day to distinguish the charlatan from the philosopher the savant from the impostor since the days of solomon and pythagoras imagination has been exhausted in guessing out social and psychological laws all systems have been proposed looked at in this light it is probably true that everything has been said but it is no less true that everything remains to be proved in politics to take only this branch of philosophy in politics every one is governed in his choice of party by his passion and his interests the mind is submitted to the impositions of the will there is no knowledge there is not even a shadow of certainty in this way general ignorance produces general tyranny and while liberty of thought is written in the charter slavery of thought under the name of majority rule is decreed by the charter in order to confine myself to the civil prescription of which the code speaks i shall refrain from beginning a discussion upon this worn-out objection brought forward by proprietors it would be too tiresome and declamatory everybody knows that there are rights which cannot be prescribed and as for those things which can be gained through the lapse of time no one is ignorant of the fact that prescription requires certain conditions the omission of one of which renders it null if it is true for example that the proprietor's possession has been civil public peaceable and uninterrupted it is none the less true that it is not based on a just title since the only titles which it can show occupation and labor prove as much for the proletaire who demands as for the proprietor who defends further this possession is dishonest since it is founded on a violation of right which prevents prescription according to the saying of st paul nunquam in usa capionibus juris error possessori protest the violation of right lies either in the fact that the holder possesses as proprietor while he should possess only as usufructuary or in the fact that he has purchased a thing which no one had a right to transfer or sell another reason why prescription cannot be adduced in favor of property a reason borrowed from jurisprudence is that the right to possess real estate is a part of the universal right which has never been totally destroyed even at the most critical periods and the proletaire in order to gain the power to exercise it fully has only to prove that he has exercised it in part he for example who has the universal right to possess give exchange loan let sell transform or destroy a thing preserves the integrity of this right by the sole act of loaning though he has never shown his authority in any other manner likewise we shall see that equality of possessions equality of rights liberty will personality 
are so many identical expressions of one and the same idea, the right of preservation and development. In a word, the right of life, against which there can be no prescription until the human race has vanished from the face of the earth. Finally, as to the time required for prescription, it would be superfluous to show that the right of property in general cannot be acquired by simple possession for ten, twenty, a hundred, a thousand, or a hundred thousand years, that so long as there exists a human head capable of understanding and combating the right of property, this right will not be prescribed. For principles of jurisprudence and axioms of reason are different from accidental and contingent facts. One man's possession can prescribe against another man's possession, but just as the possessor cannot prescribe against himself, so reason has always the faculty of change and reformation. Past error is not binding on the future. Reason is always the same eternal force. The institution of property, the work of ignorant reason, may be abrogated by a more enlightened reason. Consequently, property cannot be established by prescription. This is so certain and so true that on it rests the maxim that in the matter of prescription a violation of right goes for nothing. But I should be recreant to my method, and the reader would have the right to accuse me of charlatanism and bad faith if I had nothing further to advance concerning prescription. I showed in the first place that appropriation of land is illegal, and that supposing it to be legal, it must be accompanied by a quality of property. I have shown in the second place that universal consent proves nothing in favor of property, and that if it proves anything, it proves equality of property. I have yet to show that prescription, if admissible at all, presupposes equality of property. The demonstration will be neither long nor difficult. I need only to call attention to the reasons why prescription was introduced. Prescription, says Dunod, seems repugnant to natural equity, which permits no one either to deprive another of his possessions without his knowledge and consent, or to enrich himself at another's expense. But as it might often happen in the absence of prescription, the one who had honestly earned would be ousted after long possession, and even that he who had received a thing from its rightful owner, or who had been legitimately relieved from all obligations, would on losing his title be liable to be dispossessed or subjected again. The public welfare demanded that a term should be fixed, after the expiration of which no one should be allowed to disturb actual possessors, or reassert rights too long neglected. The civil law, in regulating prescription, has aimed then only to perfect natural law and to supplement the law of nations, and it is founded on the public good which should always be considered before individual welfare, bono publico usucapio introducta est. It should be regarded with favor, provided the conditions required by the law are fulfilled. End quote. Tullier, in his Civil Law, says, In order that the question of proprietorship may not remain too long unsettled, and thereby injure the public welfare, disturbing the peace of families and the stability of social transactions, the law has fixed a time when all claims shall be cancelled, and possession shall regain its ancient prerogative through its transformation into property. End quote. Cassiodorus said of property that it was the only safe harbor in which to seek shelter from the tempests of chicanery and the gales of avarice. Hic unus unter humanus procellus portis, quem si homines fervida voluntate praeterit in unidosis semper jurgis erabunt. Thus, in the opinion of the authors, prescription is a means of preserving public order a restoration, in certain cases, of the original mode of acquiring property, a fiction of the civil law, which derives all its force from the necessity of settling differences, which otherwise would never end. For, as Grotius says, time has no power to produce effects. All things happen in time, but nothing is done by time. Prescription, or the right of acquisition through the lapse of time, is therefore a fiction of the law, 
conventionally adopted but all property necessarily originated in prescription or as the latins say in usucapion that is in continued possession i ask then in the first place how possession can become property by the lapse of time continue possession as long as you wish continue it for years and for centuries you never can give duration which of itself creates nothing changes nothing modifies nothing the power to change the usufructuary into a proprietor let the civil law secure against chance comers the honest possessor who has held his position for many years that only confirms a right already respected and prescription applied in this way simply means that possession which has continued for twenty thirty or a hundred years shall be retained by the occupant but when the law declares that the lapse of time changes possessor into proprietor it supposes that a right can be created without a producing cause it unwarrantably alters the character of the subject it legislates on a matter not open to legislation it exceeds its own powers public order and private security ask only that possession shall be protected why has the law created property prescription was simply security for the future why has the law made it a matter of privilege thus the origin of prescription is identical with that of property itself and since the latter can legitimate itself only when accompanied by equality prescription is but another of the thousand forms which the necessity of maintaining this precious equality has taken and this is no vain induction no far-fetched inference the proof is written in all the codes and indeed if all nations through their instinct of justice and their conservative nature have recognized the utility and the necessity of prescription and if their design has been to guard thereby the interests of the possessor could they not do something for the absent citizen separated from his family and his country by commerce war or captivity and in no position to exercise his right of possession no also at the same time that prescription was introduced into the laws it was admitted that property is preserved by intent alone nudo animo now if property is preserved by intent alone if it can be lost only by the action of the proprietor what can be the use of prescription how does the law dare to presume that the proprietor who preserves by intent alone intended to abandon that which he has allowed to be prescribed what lapse of time can warrant such a conjecture and by what right does the law punish the absence of the proprietor by depriving him of his goods what then we found but a moment since that prescription and property were identical and now we find that they are mutually destructive grotius who perceived this difficulty replied so singularly that his words deserve to be quoted bene sperandum de hominibus ac propteria non putandum eos hoc esse animo ut rei caduce causa hominem alterum valent in perpetuo peccato versari quo de evitari sepe non potent sine tali derelictone where is the man he says with so unchristian a soul that for a trifle he would perpetuate the trespass of a possessor which would inevitably be the result if he did not consent to abandon his right by the eternal i am that man though a million proprietors should burn for it in hell i lay the blame on them for depriving me of my portion of the world's goods to this powerful consideration grotius rejoins that it is better to abandon a disputed right than to go to a law disturb the peace of nations and stir up the flames of civil war i accept if you wish this argument provided you indemnify me but if this indemnity is refused me what do i a proletaire care for the tranquillity and security of the rich i care as little for public order as for the proprietor's safety i ask to live a laborer otherwise i will die a warrior whichever way we turn we shall come to the conclusion that prescription is a contradiction of property or rather that prescription and property are two forms of the same principle 
but two forms which served to correct each other and ancient and modern jurisprudence did not make the least of its blunders in pretending to reconcile them indeed if we see in the institution of property only a desire to secure to each individual his share of the soil and his right to labor in the distinction between naked property and possession only an asylum for absentees orphans and all who do not know or cannot maintain their rights in prescription only a means either of defense against unjust pretensions and encroachments or of the settlement of the differences caused by the removal of possessors we shall recognize in these various forms of human justice the spontaneous efforts of the mind to come to the aid of the social instinct we shall see in, in this protection of all rights the sentiment of equality a constant leveling tendency and looking deeper we shall find in the very exaggeration of these principles the confirmation of our doctrine because if equality of conditions and universal association are not realized it will be owing to the obstacle thrown for the time in the way of the common sense of the people by the stupidity of legislators and judges and also to the fact that while society in its original state was illuminated with a flash of truth the early speculations of its leaders could bring forth nothing but darkness after the first covenants after the first drafts of laws and constitutions which were the expression of man's primary needs the legislator's duty was to reform the errors of legislation to complete that which was defective to harmonize by superior definitions those things which seemed to conflict instead of that they halted at the literal meaning of laws content to play the subordinate part of commentators and scholiasts taking the inspirations of the human mind at that time necessarily weak and faulty for axioms of eternal and unquestionable truth influenced by public opinion enslaved by the popular religion they have invariably started with the principle following in this respect the example of the theologians that that is infallibly true which has been admitted by all persons in all places and at all times quod ab omnibus quod ubique quod semper as if a general but spontaneous opinion was anything more than an indication of the truth let us not be deceived the opinion of all nations may serve to authenticate the principle of a fact the vague sentiment of a law it can teach us nothing about either fact or law the consent of mankind is an indication of nature not as cicero says a law of nature under the indication is hidden the truth which faith can believe but only thought can know such has been the constant progress of the human mind in regard to physical phenomena and the creations of genius how can it be otherwise with the facts of conscience and the rules of human conduct labor that labor has no inherent power to appropriate natural wealth we shall show by the maxims of political economy and law that is by the authorities recognized by property one that labor has no inherent power to appropriate natural wealth two that if we admit that labor has this power we are led directly to equality of property whatever the kind of labor however scarce the product or unequal the ability of the laborers three that in the order of justice labor destroys property following the example of our opponents and that we may leave no obstacles in the path let us examine the question in the strongest possible light monsieur charles comte says in his treatise on property Quote, France, considered as a nation, has a territory which is her own. End quote. France, as an individuality, possesses a territory which she cultivates. It is not her property. Nations are related to each other as individuals are. They are commoners and workers. It is an abuse of language to call them proprietors. The right of use and abuse belongs no more to nations than to men and the time will come when a war waged for the purpose of checking a nation in its abuse of the soil will be regarded as a holy war 
thus m charles comte who undertakes to explain how property comes into existence and who starts with the supposition that a nation is a proprietor falls into that error known as begging the question a mistake which vitiates his whole argument if the reader thinks it is pushing logic too far to question a nation's right or property in the territory which it possesses i will simply remind him of the fact that at all ages the results of the fictitious right of national property have been pretensions of suzerainty tributes monarchical privileges statute labor quotas of men and money supplies and merchandise etc ending finally in refusals to pay taxes insurrections wars and depopulations Quote, scattered through this territory are extended tracts of land which have not been converted into individual property these lands which consist mainly of forests belong to the whole population and the government which receives the revenues uses or ought to use them in the interest of all End quote ought to use is well said a lie is avoided thereby why offered for sale who has a right to sell them even were the nation proprietor can the generation of to-day dispossess the generation of to-morrow the nation in its function of usufructuary possesses them the government rules superintends and protects them if it also granted lands it could grant only their use it has no right to sell them or transfer them in any way whatever not being a proprietor how can it transmit property Quote, suppose some industrious man buys a portion a large swamp for example that would be no usurpation since the public would receive the exact value through the hands of the government and would be as rich after the sale as before End quote. how ridiculous what because a prodigal imprudent incompetent official sells the state's possessions while i a ward of the state i who have neither an advisory nor a deliberative voice in the state councils while i am allowed to make no opposition to the sale this sale is right and legal the guardians of the nation waste its substance and it has no redress i have received you tell me through the hands of the government my share of the proceeds of the sale but in the first place i did not wish to sell and had i wished to i could not have sold i had not the right and then i do not see that i am benefited by the sale my guardians have dressed up some soldiers repaired an old fortress erected in their pride some costly but worthless monument then they have exploded some fireworks and set up a greased pole what does all that amount to in comparison to my loss the purchaser draws boundaries fences himself in and says this is mine each one by himself each one for himself here then is a piece of land upon which henceforth no one has a right to step save the proprietor and his friends which can benefit nobody save the proprietor and his servants let these sales multiply and soon the people who have been neither able nor willing to sell and who have received none of the proceeds of the sale will have nowhere to rest no place of shelter no ground to till they will die of hunger at the proprietor's door on the edge of that property which was their birthright and the proprietor watching them die will exclaim so perish idlers and vagrants to reconcile us to the proprietor's usurpation m charles comte assumes the lands to be of little value at the time of the sale Quote, the importance of these usurpations should not be exaggerated they should be measured by the number of men which the occupied land would support and by the means which it would furnish them it is evident for instance that if a piece of land which is worth to-day one thousand francs was worth only five centimes when it was usurped we really lose only the value of the five centimes a square league of earth would be hardly sufficient to support a savage in distress to-day it supplies one thousand persons with the means of existence nine hundred and ninety-nine parts of this land is the legitimate property of the possessors 
only one thousandth of the value has been usurped. End quote. A peasant admitted one day at confession that he had destroyed a document which declared him a debtor to the amount of three hundred francs. Said the father confessor, you must return these three hundred francs. No, replied the peasant, I will return a penny to pay for the paper. Monsieur Charles Comte's logic resembles this peasant's honesty. The soil has not only an integrant and actual value, it has also a potential value, a value of the future, which depends on our ability to make it valuable and to employ it in our work. Destroy a bill of exchange, a promissory note, an annuity deed. As a paper you destroy almost no value at all. But with this paper you destroy your title, and in losing your title you deprive yourself of your goods. Destroy the land, or what is the same thing, sell it, and you not only transfer one, two, or several crops, but you annihilate all the products that you could derive from it, you and your children, and your children's children. When M. Charles Comte, the apostle of property and the eulogist of labor, supposes an alienation of the soil on the part of the government, we must not think that he does so without reason and for no purpose. It is a necessary part of his position, as he rejected the theory of occupancy, and as he knew, moreover, that labor could not constitute the right in the absence of a previous permission to occupy, he was obliged to connect this permission with the authority of the government, which means that property is based upon the sovereignty of the people, in other words, upon universal consent. This theory we have already considered. To say that property is the daughter of labor and then to give labor material on which to exercise itself is, if I am not mistaken, to reason in a circle. Contradictions will result from it. Quote, a piece of land of a certain size produces food enough to supply a man for one day. If the possessor, through his labor, discovers some method of making it produce enough for two days, he doubles its value. This new value is his work, his creation. It is taken from nobody. It is his property. End quote. I maintain that the possessor is paid for his trouble and industry in his doubled crop, but that he acquires no right to the land. Quote, Let the laborer have the fruits of his labor. End quote. Very good, but I do not understand that property in products carries with it property in raw material. Does the skill of the fisherman, who on the same coast can catch more fish than his fellows, make him proprietor of the fishing grounds? Can the expertness of a hunter ever be regarded as a property title to a game forest? The analogy is perfect. The industrious cultivator finds the rewards of his industry in the abundancy and superiority of his crop. If he has made improvements in the soil, he has the possessor's right of preference. Never, under any circumstances, can he be allowed to claim a property title to the soil which he cultivates, on the ground of his skill as a cultivator. To change possession into property, something is needed besides labor, without which a man would cease to be proprietor as soon as he ceased to be a laborer. Now, the law bases property upon immemorial, unquestionable possession, that is, prescription. Labor is only the sensible sign, the physical act, by which occupation is manifested. If then the cultivator remains proprietor after he has ceased to labor and produce, if his possession, first conceded, then tolerated, finally becomes inalienable, it happens by permission of the civil law, and by virtue of the principle of occupancy. So true is this that there is not a bill of sale, not a farm lease, not an annuity, but implies it. I will quote only one example. How do we measure the value of land by its product? If a piece of land yields 1,000 francs, we say that at 5% it is worth 20,000 francs, at 4% 25,000 francs, etc., which means, in other words, that in 20 or 25 years' time, the purchaser would recover in full the amount originally paid for the land. If then, after a certain length of time, the price of a piece of land has been wholly recovered, 
why does the purchaser continue to be proprietor because of the right of occupancy in the absence of which every sale would be a redemption theory of appropriation by labor is then a contradiction of the code and when the partisans of this theory pretend to explain the laws thereby they contradict themselves Quote, if men succeed in fertilizing land hitherto unproductive or even death producing like certain swamps they create thereby property in all its completeness End quote. what good does it do to magnify an expression and play with equivocations as if we expected to change the reality thereby they create property in all its completeness you mean that they create a productive capacity which formerly did not exist but this capacity cannot be created without the material to support it the substance of the soil remains the same only its qualities and modifications are changed man has created everything everything save the material itself now i maintain that this material he can only possess and use in condition of permanent labor granting for the time being his right of property in things which he has produced this then is the first point settled property in product if we grant so much does not carry with it property in the means of production this seems to me to need no further demonstration there is no difference between the soldier who possesses his arms the mason who possesses the materials committed to his care the fisherman who possesses the water the hunter who possesses the field and the forests and the cultivator who possesses the lands all if you say so are proprietors of their products not one is proprietor of the means of production the right to product is exclusive jus in re the right to means is common jus ad rem end of section ten chapter three part two section eleven of what is property this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Chapter 3, Part 3 Labor as the Efficient Cause of the Domain of Property. That Labor Leads to Equality of Property admit however that labor gives a right of property in material why is not this principle universal why is the benefit of this pretended law confined to a few and denied to the mass of laborers a philosopher arguing that all animals sprang up formerly out of the earth warmed by the rays of the sun almost like mushrooms on being asked why the earth no longer yielded crops of that nature replied because it is old and has lost its fertility has labor once so fecund likewise become sterile why does the tenant no longer acquire through his labor the land which was formerly acquired by the labor of the proprietor because they say it is already appropriated that is no answer a farm yields fifty bushels per hectare the skill and labor of the tenant double this product the increase is created by the tenant suppose the owner in a spirit of moderation rarely met with does not go to the extent of absorbing this product by raising the rent but allows the cultivator to enjoy the results of his labor even then justice is not satisfied the tenant by improving the land has imparted a new value to the property he therefore has a right to a part of the property if the farm was originally worth one hundred thousand francs and if by the labor of the tenant its value has risen to one hundred and fifty thousand francs the tenant who produced that extra value is the legitimate proprietor of one-third of the farm m charles comte could not have pronounced the doctrine false for it is he who said quote, men who increase the fertility of the earth are no less useful to their fellow men than if they should create new land End quote. why then is not this rule applicable to the man who improves the land as well as to him who clears it 
the labor of the former makes the land worth one that of the latter makes it worth two both create equal values why not accord to both equal property i defy any one to refute this argument without again falling back on the right of first occupancy but it will be said even if your wish should be granted property would not be distributed much more evenly than now land does not go on increasing in value forever after two or three seasons it attains its maximum fertility that which is added by the agricultural art results rather from the progress of science and the diffusion of knowledge than from the skill of the cultivator consequently the addition of a few laborers to the mass of proprietors would be no argument against property this discussion would indeed prove a well-nigh useless one if our labors culminated in simply extending land privilege and industrial monopoly in emancipating only a few hundred laborers out of the millions of proletaires but this also is a misconception of our real thought and does but prove the general lack of intelligence and logic if the laborer who adds to the value of a thing has a right of property in it he who maintains this value acquires the same right for what is maintenance it is incessant addition continuous creation what is it to cultivate it is to give the soil its value every year it is by annually renewed creation to prevent the diminution or destruction of the value of a piece of land admitting then that property is rational and legitimate admitting that rent is equitable and just i say that he who cultivates acquires property by as good a title as he who clears or he who improves and that every time a tenant pays his rent he obtains a fraction of property in the land entrusted to his care the denominator of which is equal to the proportion of rent paid unless you admit this you fall into absolutism and tyranny you recognize class privileges you sanction slavery whoever labors becomes a proprietor this is an inevitable deduction from the acknowledged principles of political economy and jurisprudence and when i say proprietor i do not mean simply as do our hypocritical economists proprietor of his allowance his salary his wages i mean proprietor of the value which he creates and by which the master alone profits as all this relates to the theory of wages and the distribution of products and as this matter never has been even partially cleared up i ask permission to insist on it this discussion will not be useless to the work in hand many persons talk of admitting working people to share in the products and profits but in their minds this participation is pure benevolence they have never shown perhaps never suspected that it was a natural necessary right inherent in labor and inseparable from the function of producer even in the lowest forms of his work this is my proposition the laborer retains even after he has received his wages a natural right of property in the thing which he has produced i again quote m charles comte some laborers are employed in draining marshes in cutting down trees and brushwood in a word in cleaning up the soil they increase the value they make the amount of property larger they are paid for the value which they add in the form of food and daily wages it then becomes the property of the capitalist End quote. the price is not sufficient the labor of the workers has created a value now this value is their property but they have neither sold nor exchanged it and you capitalist you have not earned it that you should have a partial right to the whole in return for the materials that you have furnished and the provisions that you have supplied is perfectly just you contributed to the production you ought to share in the enjoyment but your right does not annihilate that of the laborers who in spite of you have been your colleagues in the work of production why do you talk of wages the money with which you pay the wages of the laborers remunerates them for only a few years of the perpetual possession which they have abandoned to you 
wages is the cost of the daily maintenance and refreshment of the laborer you are wrong in calling it the price of a sale the working man has sold nothing he knows neither his right nor the extent of the concession which he has made to you nor the meaning of the contract which you pretend to have made with him on his side utter ignorance on yours error and surprise not to say deceit and fraud let us make this clearer by another and more striking example. No one is ignorant of the difficulties that are met with the conversion of untilled land into arable and productive land. These difficulties are so great that usually an isolated man would perish before he could put the soil in a condition to yield him even the most meager living. To that end are needed the united and combined efforts of society and all the resources of industry. M. Charles Comte quotes on this subject numerous and well-authenticated facts, little thinking that he is amassing testimony against his own system. Let us suppose that a colony of twenty or thirty families establishes itself in a wild district, covered with underbrush and forests, and from which by agreement the natives consent to withdraw. Each one of these families possesses a moderate but sufficient amount of capital, of such a nature as a colonist would be apt to choose, animals, seeds, tools, and a little money and food. The land having been divided, each one settles himself as comfortably as possible and begins to clear away the portion allotted to him. But after a few weeks of fatigue, such as they never before have known, of inconceivable suffering, of ruinous and almost useless labor, our colonists begin to complain of their trade. Their condition seems hard to them. They curse their sad existence. Suddenly one of the shrewdest among them kills a pig, cures a part of the meat, and resolves to sacrifice the rest of his provisions, goes to find his companions in misery. Friends, he begins in a very benevolent tone, how much trouble it costs you to do a little work and live uncomfortably. A fortnight of labor has reduced you to your last extremity. Let us make an arrangement by which you shall all profit. I offer you provisions and wine. You shall get so much every day. We will work together and zounds, my friends, we will be happy and contented. Would it be possible for empty stomachs to resist such an invitation? The hungriest of them follow the treacherous tempter. They go to work. The charm of society, emulation, joy, and mutual assistance double their strength. The work can be seen to advance. Singing and laughing, they subdue nature. In a short time, the soil is thoroughly changed. The mellowed earth waits only for the seed. That done, the proprietor pays his laborers, who, in going away, return him their thanks, and grieve that the happy days which they have spent with him are over. Others follow this example, always with the same success. Then these installed, the rest disperse. Each one returns to his grubbing, but while grubbing it is necessary to live. While they have been clearing away for their neighbor, they have done no clearing for themselves. One year's seed time and harvest is already gone. They had calculated that in lending their labor they could not but gain, since they would save their own provisions, and while living better would get still more money. False calculation. They have created for another the means wherewith to produce, and have created nothing for themselves. The difficulties of clearing remain the same. Their clothing wears out, their provisions give out, Soon their purse becomes empty for the profit of the individual for whom they have worked, and who alone can furnish the provisions which they need, since he alone is in a position to produce them. Then when the poor grubber has exhausted his resources, the man with the provisions, like the wolf in the fable who scents his victim from afar, again comes forward. One he offers to employ again by the day, from another, he offers to buy at a favorable price a piece of his bad land, which is not and never can be of any use to him. That is, he uses the labor of one man to cultivate the field of another for his own benefit. So that at the end of twenty years, 
Of the thirty individuals originally equal in point of wealth, five or six have become proprietors of the whole district, while the rest have been philanthropically dispossessed. In this century of bourgeoisie morality, in which I have had the honor to be born, the moral sense is so debased that I should not be at all surprised if I were asked by many a worthy proprietor what I see in this that is unjust and illegitimate. Debased creature, galvanized corpse, how can I expect to convince you if you cannot tell robbery when I show it to you? A man, by soft and insinuating words, discovers the secret of taxing others that he may establish himself. Then, once enriched by their united efforts, he refuses, on the very conditions which he himself dictated, to advance the well-being of those who made his fortune for him. And you ask how such conduct is fraudulent? Under the pretext that he has paid his laborers, that he owes them nothing more, that he has nothing to gain by putting himself at the service of others, while his own occupations claim his attention, he refuses, I say, to aid others in getting a foothold, as he was aided in getting his own. And when in the impotence of their isolation these poor laborers are compelled to sell their birthright, he, this ungrateful proprietor, this knavish upstart, stands ready to put the finishing touch to their deprivation and their ruin. And you think that just? Take care. I read in your startled countenance the reproach of a guilty conscience, much more clearly than the innocent astonishment of involuntary ignorance. The capitalist, they say, has paid the laborers their daily wages. To be accurate, it must be said that the capitalist has paid as many times one day's wage as he has employed laborers each day, which is not at all the same thing. For he has paid nothing for that immense power which results from the union and harmony of laborers and the convergence and simultaneousness of their efforts. Two hundred grenadiers stood the obelisk of Luxor upon its base in a few hours. Do you suppose that one man could have accomplished the same task in two hundred days? Nevertheless, on the books of the capitalist, the amount of wages paid would have been the same. Well, a desert to prepare for cultivation, a house to build, factory to run, all these are obelisks to erect, mountains to move. The smallest fortune, the most insignificant establishment, the setting in motion of the lowest industry, demand the concurrence of so many different kinds of labor and skill that one man could not possibly execute the whole of them. It is astonishing that the economists never have called attention to this fact. Strike a balance, then, between the capitalists' receipts and his payments. The laborer needs a salary which will enable him to live while he works, for unless he consumes, he cannot produce. Whoever employs a man owes him maintenance and support, or wages enough to procure the same. That is the first thing to be done in all production, I admit, for the moment, that in this respect the capitalist has discharged his duty. It is necessary that the laborer should find in his production, in addition to his present support, a guarantee of his future support. Otherwise, the source of production would dry up, and his productive capacity would become exhausted. In other words, the labor accomplished must give birth perpetually to new labor. Such is the universal law of reproduction. In this way, the proprietor of a farm finds one in his crops means not only to support himself and his family, but of maintaining and improving his capital, of feeding his livestock, in a word means of new labor and continual reproduction. Two, in his ownership of a productive agency, a permanent basis of cultivation and labor. But he who lends his services, what is his basis of cultivation? The proprietor's presumed need of him, 
and the unwarranted supposition that he wishes to employ him just as the commoner once held his land by the munificence and condescension of the lord so today the working man holds his labor by the condescension and necessities of the master and proprietor that is what is called possession by a precarious title footnote precarious from precor i pray because the act of concession expressly signified that the lord in answer to the prayers of his men or slaves has granted them permission to labor End of footnote. but this precarious condition is an injustice for it implies an inequality in the bargain the laborer's wages exceed but little his running expenses and do not assure him wages for tomorrow while the capitalist finds in the instrument produced by the laborer a pledge of independence and security for the future now this reproductive leaven this eternal germ of life this preparation of the land and manufacture of implements for production constitutes the debt of the capitalist to the producer which he never pays and it is this fraudulent denial which causes the poverty of the laborer the luxury of idleness and the inequality of conditions this it is above all other things which has been so fitly named the exploitation of man by man one of three things must be done either the laborer must be given a portion of the product in addition to his wages or the employer must render the laborer an equivalent in productive service or else he must pledge himself to employ him forever. Division of the product, reciprocity of service, or guarantee of perpetual labor, from the adoption of one of these courses, the capitalist cannot escape. But it is evident that he cannot satisfy the second and third of these conditions. He can neither put himself at the service of the thousands of working men who directly or indirectly have aided him in establishing himself, nor employ them all for ever he has no other course left him then but a division of the property but if the property is divided all conditions will be equal there will be no more large capitalists or large proprietors consequently when m charles comte following out his hypothesis shows us his capitalist acquiring one after another the products of his employees labor he sinks deeper and deeper into the mire and as his argument does not change our reply of course remains the same Quote, other laborers are employed in building some quarry the stone others transport it others cut it and still others put it in place each of them adds a certain value to the material which passes through his hands and this value the product of his labor is his property he sells it as fast as he creates it to the proprietor of the building who pays him for it in food and wages divide et impera divide and you shall command divide and you shall grow rich divide and you shall deceive men you shall daze their minds you shall mock at justice separate laborers from each other perhaps each one's daily wage exceeds the value of each individual's product but that is not the question under consideration a force of one thousand men working twenty days has been paid the same wages that one would be paid for working fifty-five years but this force of one thousand has done in twenty days what a single man could not have accomplished though he had labored for a million centuries is the exchange an equitable one once more no when you have paid all the individual forces the collective force still remains to be paid Consequently, there remains always a right of collective property which you have not acquired and which you enjoy unjustly. Admit that twenty days' wages suffice to feed, lodge, and clothe this multitude for twenty days. 
thrown out of employment at the end of that time, what will become of them? If as fast as they create, they abandon their creations to the proprietors who will soon discharge them. While the proprietor, firm in his position, thanks to the aid of all the laborers, dwells in security and fears no lack of labor or bread, the laborer's only dependence is upon the benevolence of this same proprietor to whom he has sold and surrendered his liberty. If then the proprietor, shielding himself behind his comfort and his rights, refuses to employ the laborer, how can the laborer live? He has plowed an excellent field and cannot sow it. He has built an elegant and commodious house and cannot live in it. He has produced all and can enjoy nothing. Labor leads us to equality. Every step that we take brings us nearer to it, and if laborers had equal strength, diligence, and industry, clearly their fortunes would be equal also. Indeed, if as is pretended, and as we have admitted, the laborer is proprietor of the value which he creates, it follows, one, that the laborer acquires at the expense of the idle proprietor. Two, that all production being necessarily collective, the laborer is entitled to a share of the products and profits commensurate with his labor. Three, that all accumulated capital being social property, no one can be its exclusive proprietor. These inferences are unavoidable. These alone would suffice to revolutionize our whole economical system and change our institutions and our laws. Why do the very persons who laid down this principle now refuse to be guided by it? Why do the Says, the Contes, the Hennekins, and others, after having said that property is born of labor, seek to fix it by occupation and prescription? But let us leave these sophists to their contradictions and blindness. The good sense of the people will do justice to their equivocations. Let us make haste to enlighten it and show it the true path. Equality approaches. Already between it and us, but a short distance intervenes. Tomorrow even this distance will have been traversed. That in society all wages are equal. When the St. Simonians and the Fourierists, and in general all who in our day are connected with social economy and reform, inscribe upon their banner, to each according to his capacity, to each according to its results, St. Simon, to each according to his capital, his labor, and his skill, Fourier. They mean, although they do not say it in so many words, that products of nature, procured by labor and industry, are a reward, a palm, a crown, offered to all kinds of preeminence and superiority. They regard the land as an immense arena in which prizes are contended for. No longer is it true with lances and swords, by force and by treachery, but by acquired wealth, by knowledge, talent, and by virtue itself. In a word, they mean, and everybody agrees with them, that the greatest capacity is entitled to the greatest reward, and to use the mercantile phraseology, which has at least the merit of being straightforward, that salaries must be governed by capacity and its results. The disciples of these two self-styled reformers cannot deny that such is their thought, for in doing so they would contradict their official interpretations and would destroy the unity of their systems. Furthermore, such denial on their part is not to be feared, the two sects glory in laying down as a principle in equality of conditions, reasoning from nature who, they say, intended the inequality of capacities. They boast only of one thing, namely that their political system is so perfect that the social inequalities always correspond with the natural inequalities. They no more trouble themselves to inquire whether inequality of conditions, I mean of salaries, is possible than they do to fix a measure of capacity. In St. Simon's system, the St. Simonian priest determines the capacity of each by virtue of his pontifical infallibility in imitation of the Roman Church. 
in four days the ranks and merits are decided by vote an imitation of the constitutional regime clearly the great man is an object of ridicule to the reader he did not mean to tell his secret to each according to his capacity to each capacity according to its results to each according to his capital his labor and his skill since the death of saint simon and fourier not one among their numerous disciples has attempted to give to the public a scientific demonstration of this grand maxim and i would wager a hundred to one that no fourierist even suspects that this biform aphorism is susceptible to two interpretations to each according to his capacity to each capacity according to its results to each according to his capital his labor and his skill this proposition taken as they say in sensu obvio in the sense usually attributed to it is false absurd unjust contradictory hostile to liberty friendly to tyranny antisocial and was unluckily framed under the express influence of the property idea and first capital must be crossed off the list of elements which are entitled to a reward the fourierists as far as i have been able to learn from a few of their pamphlets deny the right of occupancy and recognize no basis of property save labor starting with a like premise they would have seen had they reasoned upon the matter that capital is a source of production to its proprietor only by virtue of the right of occupancy and that this production is therefore legitimate indeed if labor is the sole basis of property i cease to be proprietor of my field as soon as i receive rent for it from another this we have shown beyond all cavil it is the same with all capital so that to put capital in an enterprise is by the law's decision to exchange it for an equivalent sum in products i will not enter again upon this now useless discussion since i propose in the following chapter to exhaust the subject of production by capital thus capital can be exchanged but cannot be a source of income labor and skill remain or as st simon puts it results and capacities i will examine them successively should wages be governed by labor in other words is it just that he who does the most should get the most i beg the reader to pay the closest attention to this point to solve the problem with one stroke we have only to ask ourselves the following question is labor a condition or a struggle the reply seems plain god said to man in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread that is thou shalt produce thy own bread with more or less ease according to thy skill in directing and combining the efforts thou shalt labor god did not say thou shalt quarrel with thy neighbor for thy bread but thou shalt labor by the side of thy neighbor and ye shall dwell together in harmony let us develop the meaning of this law the extreme simplicity of which renders it liable to misconstruction in labor two things must be noticed and distinguished association and available material in so far as laborers are associated they are equal and it involves a contradiction to say that one should be paid more than another for as the product of one laborer can be paid for only in the product of another laborer if the two products are unequal the remainder or the difference between the greater and the smaller will not be acquired by society and therefore not being exchanged will not affect the equality of wages there will result it is true in favor of the stronger laborer a natural inequality but not a social inequality no one having suffered by his strength and productive energy in a word society exchanges only equal products that is rewards no labor save that performed for her benefit consequently she pays all laborers equally with what they produce outside of her sphere she has no more to do than with the difference in their voices and their hair i seem to be positing the principle of inequality the reverse of this is the truth 
the total amount of labor which can be performed for society, that is, of labor susceptible of exchange, being within a given space, as much greater as the laborers are more numerous. And as the task assigned to each is less in magnitude, it follows that natural inequality neutralizes itself in proportion as association extends, and as the quantity of consumable values produced thereby increases. So in society, the only thing which could bring back the inequality of labor would be the right of occupancy, the right of property. Now suppose that this social task consists in the plowing, hoeing, or reaping of two square decameters, and that the average time required to accomplish it is seven hours. One laborer will finish it in six hours, another will require eight. The majority, however, will work seven. But provided each one furnishes the quantity of labor demanded of him, whatever be the time he employs, they are entitled to equal wages. Shall the laborer who is capable of finishing his task in six hours have the right, on the ground of superior strength and activity, to usurp the task of the less skillful laborer, and thus rob him of his labor and bread? Who dares maintain such a proposition? He who finishes before the others may rest if he chooses. He may devote himself to useful exercise and labors for the maintenance of his strength and the culture of his mind and the pleasure of his life. This he can do without injury to anyone, but let him confine himself to services which affect him solely, vigor, genius, diligence, and all the personal advantages which result therefrom are the work of nature, and to a certain extent of the individual. Society awards them the esteem which they merit, but the wages which it pays them is measured not by their power, but by their production. Now the product of each is limited by the right of all. If the soil were infinite in extent and the amount of available material were exhaustless, even then we could not accept this maxim to each according to his labor. And why? Because society, I repeat, whatever be the number of its subjects, is forced to pay them all the same wages since she pays them only in their own products only on the hypothesis just made, inasmuch as the strong cannot be prevented from using all their advantages. The inconveniences of natural inequality would reappear in the very bosom of social equality. But the land, considering the reproductive power of its inhabitants and their ability to multiply, is very limited. Further, by the immense variety of products in the extreme division of labor, the social task is made easy of accomplishment. Now, through this limitation of things producible, and through the ease of producing them, the law of absolute equality takes effect. Yes, life is a struggle, but this struggle is not between man and man, it is between man and nature, and it is each one's duty to take his share in it. If in the struggle the strong come to the aid of the weak, their kindness deserves praise and love, but their aid must be accepted as a free gift, not imposed by force, nor offered at a price. All have the same career before them, neither too long nor too difficult. Whoever finishes it finds his reward at the end. It is not necessary to get there first. In printing offices, where the laborers usually work by the job, the compositor receives so much per thousand letters set, the pressman so much per thousand sheets printed. There, as elsewhere, inequalities of talent and skill are to be found. When there is no prospect of dull times, for printing and typesetting, like other trades, sometimes come to a standstill, everyone is free to work his hardest and exert his faculties to the utmost. He who does more gets more. He who does less gets less. When business slackens, compositors and pressmen divide up their labor. All monopolists are detested as no better than robbers or traitors. There is a philosophy in the action of these printers to which neither economists nor legists have ever risen. 
if our legislators had introduced into their codes the principle of distributive justice which governs printing offices if they had observed the popular instincts not for the sake of servile imitation but in order to reform and generalize them long ere this liberty and equality would have been established on an immovable basis and we should not now be disputing about the right of property and the necessity of social distinctions it has been calculated that if labor were equally shared by the whole number of able-bodied individuals the average working day of each individual in france would not exceed five hours this being so how can we presume to talk of the inequality of laborers it is the labor of robert mccare that causes inequality the principle to each according to his labor interpreted to mean who works most should receive most is based therefore on two palpable errors one an error in economy that in the labor of society tasks must necessarily be unequal the other an error in physics that there is no limit to the amount of producible things but it will be said suppose there are some people who wish to perform only half of their task is that very embarrassing probably they are satisfied with half of their salary paid according to the labor they had performed of what could they complain and what injury would they do to others in this sense it is fair to apply the maxim to each according to his results it is the law of equality itself further numerous difficulties relative to the police system and the organization of industry might be raised here i will reply to them all with this one sentence that they must all be solved by the principle of equality thus some one must observe here is a task which cannot be postponed without detriment to production ought society to suffer from the negligence of a few and will she not venture out of respect for the right of labor to assure with her own hands the product which they refuse her in such a case to whom will the salary belong to society who will be allowed to perform the labor either herself or through her representatives but always in such a way that the general equality shall never be violated and that only the idler shall be punished for his idleness further if society may not use excessive severity toward her lazy members she has a right in self-defense to guard against abuses but even industry needs they will add leaders instructors superintendents etc will these be engaged in the general task no since their task is to lead instruct and superintend but they must be chosen from the laborers by the laborers themselves and must fulfill the conditions of eligibility it is the same with all public functions whether of administration or instruction then article first of the universal constitution will be the limited quantity of available material proves the necessity of dividing the labor among the whole number of laborers the capacity given to all of accomplishing a social task that is an equal task and the impossibility of paying one laborer save in the products of another justify the equality of wages end of section eleven chapter three part three recording by mary schneider section twelve of what is property this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson what is property an inquiry into the principle of right and of government by pierre joseph proudhon translated by benjamin r tucker chapter three part four labor as the efficient course of the domain of property that inequality of powers is the necessary condition of equality of fortunes it is objected and this objection constitutes the second part of the st simonian and the third part of the fourieristic maxim that all kinds of labor cannot be executed with equal ease some require great superiority of skill and intelligence 
and on this superiority is based the price the artist the savant the poet the statesman are esteemed only because of their excellence and this excellence destroys all similitude between them and other men in the presence of these heights of science and genius the law of equality disappears now if equality is not absolute there is no equality from the poet we descend to the novelist from the sculptor to the stonecutter from the architect to the mason and from the chemist to the cook etc capacities are classified and subdivided into orders genera and species the extremes of talent are connected by intermediate talents Humanity is a vast hierarchy in which the individual estimates himself by comparison and fixes his price by the value placed upon his product by the public. The objection always has seemed a formidable one. It is the stumbling block of the economists as well as of the defenders of equality. It has led the former into egregious blunders and has caused the latter to utter incredible platitudes. Gracchus Babeuf wished all superiority to be stringently repressed and even persecuted as a social calamity. To establish his communistic edifice, he lowered all citizens to the stature of the smallest. Ignorant eclectics have been known to object to the inequality of knowledge, and I should not be surprised if someone should yet rebel against the inequality of virtue. Aristotle was banished. Socrates drank the hemlock. Epaminondas was called to account for having proved superior in intelligence and virtue to some dissolute and foolish demagogues. Such follies will be reenacted so long as the inequality of fortunes justifies a populace, blinded and oppressed by the wealthy, in fearing the elevation of new tyrants to power. Nothing seems more unnatural than that which we examine too closely, and often nothing seems less like the truth than the truth itself. On the other hand, according to J. J. Rousseau, it takes a great deal of philosophy to enable us to observe once what we see every day. And according to D'Alembert, the ordinary truths of life make but little impression on men, unless their attention is especially called to them. The father of the school of economists, say, from whom I borrow these two quotations, might have profited by them. But he who laughs at the blind should wear spectacles, and he who notices him is near-sighted. Strange, that which has frightened so many minds is not, after all, an objection to equality. It is the very condition on which equality exists. Natural inequality, the condition of equality of fortunes, what a paradox i repeat my assertion that no one may think i have blundered inequality of powers is the sine qua non of equality of fortunes there are two things to be considered in society functions and relations one functions every laborer is supposed to be capable of performing the task assigned to him or to use a common expression Every workman must know his trade. The workman equal to his work, there is an equation between functionary and function. In society, functions are not alike. There must be, then, different capacities. Further, certain functions demand greater intelligence and powers, and there are people of superior mind and talent. For the performance of work necessarily involves a workman, from the need springs the idea, and the idea makes the producer. We only know what our senses long for and our intelligence demands. We have no keen desire for things of which we cannot conceive, and the greater our powers of conception, the greater our capabilities of production. Thus functions arriving from needs, needs from desires, and desires from spontaneous perception and imagination the same intelligence which imagines can also produce consequently no labor is superior to the laborer in a word if the function calls out the functionary it is because the functionary exists before the function 
Let us admire nature's economy. With regard to these various needs which she has given us, and which the isolated man cannot satisfy unaided, nature has granted to the race a power refused to the individual. She gives rise to the principle of the division of labor, a principle founded on the speciality of vocations. The satisfaction of some needs demands of man continual creation, while others can, by the labor of a single individual, be satisfied for millions of men through thousands of centuries. For example, the need of clothing and food requires perpetual reproduction, while a knowledge of the system of the universe may be acquired for ever by two or three highly gifted men. The perpetual current of rivers supports our commerce and runs our machinery, but the sun, alone in the midst of space, gives light to the trade world. Nature, who might create Platos and Virgils, Newtons and Cuviers, as she creates husbandmen and shepherds, does not see fit to do so, choosing, rather, to proportion the rarity of genius to the duration of its products and to balance the number of capacities by the competency of each one of them. I do not inquire here whether the distance which separates one man from another, in point of talent and intelligence, arises from the deplorable condition of civilization, nor whether that which is now called the inequality of powers would be in an ideal society anything more than a diversity of powers. I take the worst view of the matter, and that I may not be accused of tergiversation and evasion of difficulties, I acknowledge all the inequalities that any one can desire. Footnote. I cannot conceive how any one dares to justify the inequality of conditions by pointing to the base inclinations and propensities of certain men. Whence comes this shameful degradation of heart and mind to which so many fall victims, if not from the misery and abjection into which property plunges them. End of footnote. Certain philosophers, in love with the levelling idea, maintain that all minds are equal, and that all differences are the result of education. I am no believer, I confess, in this doctrine, which, even if it were true, would lead to a result directly opposite to that desired. For, if capacities are equal, Whatever be the degree of their power, as no one can be coerced, there are functions deemed coarse, low, and degrading, which deserve higher pay, a result no less repugnant to equality than to the principle, to each capacity according to its results. Give me, on the contrary, a society in which every kind of talent bears a proper numerical relation to the needs of the society, and which demands from each producer only that which his special function requires him to produce, and, without impairing in the least the hierarchy of functions, I will deduce the equality of fortunes. This is my second point. 2. Relations. In considering the element of labour, I have shown that in the same class of productive services, the capacity to perform a social task being possessed by all, no inequality of reward can be based upon an inequality of individual powers. However, it is but fair to say that certain capacities seem quite incapable of certain services, so that, if human industry were entirely confined to one class of products, numerous incapacities would arise, and consequently the greatest social inequality. But everybody sees, without any hint from me, that the variety of industries avoids this difficulties. So clear is this, that I shall not stop to discuss it. We have only to prove, then, that functions are equal to each other, just as labourers who perform the same function are equal to each other. Property makes man a eunuch, and then reproaches him for being nothing but dry wood, a decaying tree. Are you astonished that I refuse to genius, to knowledge, to courage, in a word, to all the excellencies admired by the world, the homage of dignities, the distinctions of power and wealth. It is not I who refuse it, it is economy, it is justice, it is liberty. Liberty, 
For the first time in this discussion, I appeal to her. Let her rise in her own defense and achieve her victory. Every transaction ending in an exchange of products or services may be designed as a commercial operation. Whoever says commerce says exchange of equal values, for if the values are not equal and the injured party perceives it, he will not consent to the exchange and there will be no commerce. Commerce exists only among free men. Transactions may be effected between other people by violence or fraud, but there is no commerce. A free man is one who enjoys the use of his reason and his faculties, who is neither blinded by passion, nor hindered or driven by oppression, nor deceived by erroneous opinions. So, in every exchange, there is a moral obligation that neither of the contradicting parties shall gain at the expense of the other. That is, that to be legitimate and true, commerce must be exempt from all inequality. This is the first condition of commerce. Its second condition is that it be voluntary, that is, that the parties act freely and openly. I define, then, commerce or exchange as an act of society. The negro who sells his wife for a knife, his children for some bits of glass, and finally himself for a bottle of brandy, is not free. The dealer in human flesh with whom he negotiates is not his associate. He is his enemy. The civilized laborer who bakes a loaf that he may eat a slice of bread, who builds a palace that he may sleep in a stable, who weaves rich fabrics that he may dress in rags, who produces everything that he may dispense with everything, is not free. His employer, not becoming his associate in the exchange of salaries or services which takes place between them, is his enemy. The soldier who serves his country through fear instead of through love is not free. His comrades and his officers, the ministers or organs of military justice, are all his enemies. The peasant who hires land, the manufacturer who borrows capital, the taxpayer who pays tolls, duties, patent and license fees, personal and property taxes, etc., and the deputy who votes for them, all act neither intelligently nor freely. Their enemies are the proprietors, the capitalists, the government. Give men liberty, enlighten their minds, that they may know the meaning of their contracts, and you will see the most perfect equality in exchanges, without regard to superiority of talent and knowledge. And you will admit that in commercial affairs, that is, in the sphere of society, the word superiority is void of sense. Let Homer sing his verse. I listen to this sublime genius in comparison with whom I, a simple herdsman, a humble farmer, am as nothing. What indeed, if product is to be compared with product, are my cheeses and my beans in the presence of this Iliad? But if Homer wishes to take from me all that I possess, and make me his slave in return for his inimitable poem, I will give up the pleasure of his lays, and dismiss him, I can do without his Iliad, and wait, if necessary, for the Aeneid. Homer cannot live twenty-four hours without my products. Let him accept, then, the little that I have to offer, and when his muse may instruct, encourage and console him. What do you say that such should be the condition of one who sings of gods and men, arms with the humiliation and suffering which they bring to them? What barbarous generosity! Do not get excited, I beg of you. Property makes of a poet either a Croesus or a beggar. Only equality knows how to honour and praise him. What is his duty? To regulate the right of the singer and the duty of the listener. To notice this point, which is a very important one to the solution of the question. Both are free, and one to sell, the other to buy. Henceforth their respective pretensions go for nothing, and the estimate, whether fair or unfair, that they place, the one upon his verse, the other upon his liberality, 
can have no influence upon the conditions of the contract. We must no longer, in making our bargains, weigh talent. We must consider products only. In order that the bard of Achilles may get his due reward, he must first make himself wanted. That done, the exchange of his verse for a fee of any kind, being a free act, must be at the same time a just act. That is, the poet's fee must be equal to his product. Now, what is the value of this product? Let us suppose, in the first place, that his Iliad, this chef d'oeuvre, that is to be equitably rewarded, is really above price, that we do not know how to appraise it, etc. If the public, who are free to purchase it, refuse to do so, it is clear that, the poem being unexchangeable, its intrinsic value will not be diminished but that its exchangeable value or its productive utility will be reduced to zero, will be nothing at all. Then we must seek the amount of wages to be paid between infinity on the one hand and nothing on the other, at an equal distance from each other. Since all rights and liberties are entitled to equal respect, in other words, it is not the intrinsic value, but the relative value, of the thing sold that needs to be fixed, the question grows simpler. What is this relative value? To what reward does a poem like the Iliad entitle its author? The first business of political economy, after fixing its definitions, was the solution of this problem. Now, not only has it not been solved, but it has been declared insoluble. According to the economists, the relative or exchangeable value of things cannot be absolutely determined. It necessarily varies. The value of a thing, says Say, is a positive quantity, but only for a given moment. It is its nature to perpetually vary, to change from one point to another. Nothing can fix it absolutely, because it is based on needs and means of production which vary with every moment. These variations complicate economical phenomena and often render them very difficult of observation and solution. I know no remedy for this. It is not in our power to change the nature of things. Elsewhere, Say says, and repeats, that value being based on utility, and utility depending entirely on our needs, whims, customs, etc., value is as variable as opinion. Now, political economy being the science of values, of their production, distribution, exchange, and consumption, if exchangeable value cannot be absolutely determined, how is political economy possible? And how can it be a science? How can two economists look at each other in the face without laughing? How dare they insult metaphysicians and psychologists? What? That fool of a Descartes imagined that philosophy needed an immovable base, an aliquid inconcusum, on which the edifice of science might be built, and he was simple enough to search for it. And the Hermes of economy, Trismegistus say, devoting half a volume to the amplification of that solemn text, Political Economy is a Science, has the courage to affirm immediately afterwards that this science cannot determine its object, which is equivalent to saying that it is without a principle or foundation. He does not know, then, this the illustrious say, the nature of a science, or rather, he knows nothing of the subject which he discusses. Say's example has borne its fruits. Political economy, as it exists at present, resembles ontology, discussing effects and causes. It knows nothing, explains nothing, decides nothing. The ideas honoured with the name of economic laws are nothing more than a few trifling generalities to which the economists thought to give an appearance of depth by clothing them in high-sounding words. As for the attempts that have been made by the economists to solve social problems, all that can be said of them is that, if a glimmer of sense occasionally appears in their lucubrations, they immediately fall back into absurdity. For twenty-five years political economy, like a heavy fog, was weighed upon France, checking the efforts of the mind and seeking limits to liberty.
has every creation of industry a venal absolute unchangeable and consequently legitimate and true value yes can every product of man be exchanged for some other product of man yes again and how many nails is a pair of shoes worth if we can solve this appalling problem we shall have the key of the social system for which humanity has been searching for six thousand years in the presence of this problem the economist recoils confused the peasant who can neither read nor write replies without hesitation as many as can be made in the same time and with the same expense the absolute value of a thing then is its cost in time and expense how much is a diamond worth which costs only the labor of picking it up nothing it is not a product of man how much will it be worth when cut and mounted the time and expense which it has cost the laborer why then is it sold at so high a price because men are not free society must regulate the exchange and distribution of the rarest things as it does that of the most common ones in such a way that each may share in the enjoyment of them what then is the value which is based upon opinion delusion injustice and robbery by this rule it is easy to reconcile everybody if the mean term which we are searching for between an infinite value and no value at all is expressed in the case of every product by the amount of time and expense which the product cost a poem which has cost its author thirty years of labor and an outlay of ten thousand francs in journeys books etc must be paid for by the ordinary wages received by a laborer during thirty years plus ten thousand francs indemnity for expense incurred suppose the whole amount to be fifty thousand francs if the society which gets the benefit of the production include a million of men my share of the debt is five centimes that gives rise to a few observations one the same product at different times and in different places may cost more or less of time and outlay in this view it is true that value is a variable quantity but this variation is not that of the economists who place in their list of the causes of the variation of values not only the means of production but taste caprice fashion and opinion in short the true value of a thing is invariable in its algebraic expression although it may vary in its monetary expression two the price of every product in demand should be its cost in time and outlay neither more nor less every product not in demand is a loss to the producer a commercial non-value three the ignorance of the principle of evaluation and the difficulty under any circumstances of applying it is the source of commercial fraud and one of the most potent causes of the inequality of fortunes four to reward certain industries and pay for certain products a society is needed which corresponds in size with the rarity of talents the costliness of the products and the variety of the arts and sciences if for example a society of fifty farmers can support a schoolmaster it requires one hundred for a shoemaker 150 for a blacksmith 200 for a tailor etc if the number of farmers rises to a thousand ten thousand one hundred thousand etc as fast as their numbers increase that of the functionaries which are earliest required must increase in the same proportion so that the highest functions become possible only in the most powerful societies footnote how many citizens are needed to support a professor of philosophy? 35 millions. How many for an economist? 2 billions. And for a literary man who is neither a savant, nor an artist, nor a philosopher, nor an economist, and who writes newspaper novels? None. End of footnote. That is the peculiar feature of capacities, the character of genius, the seal of its glory cannot arise and develop itself except in the bosom of a great nation but this physiological condition necessary to the existence of genius adds nothing to its social rights 
Far from that, the delay in its appearance proves that, in economical and civil affairs, the loftiest intelligence must submit to the equality of possessions, an equality which is anterior to it, and of which it constitutes the crown. This is severe on our pride, but it is an inexorable truth. And here psychology comes to the aid of social economy, giving us to understand that talent and material recompense have no common measure, that in this respect the condition of all producers is equal. Consequently, that all comparison between them and all distinction in fortunes is impossible. In fact, every work coming from the hands of man compared with the raw material of which it is composed, is beyond price. In this respect, the distance is as great between a pair of wooden shoes and the trunk of a walnut tree as between a statue of Iscopas and a block of marble. The genius of the simplest mechanic exerts as much influence over the materials which he uses as does the mind of a Newton over the inert spheres whose distances, volumes, and revolutions he calculates. You ask for talent and genius a corresponding degree of honour and reward. Fix for me the value of a woodcutter's talent, and I will fix that of Homer. If anything can reward intelligence, it is intelligence itself. That is what happens when various classes of producers pay to each other a reciprocal tribute of admiration. And praise but if they contemplate an exchange of products with a view to satisfying mutual needs this exchange must be effected in accordance with a system of economy which is indifferent to considerations of talent and genius and whose laws are deduced not from vague and meaningless admiration but from a just balance between debit and credit in short from commercial accounts now that no one may imagine that the liberty of buying and selling is the sole basis of the equality of wages and that society's sole protection against superiority of talent lies in a certain force of inertia which has nothing in common with right i shall proceed to explain why all capacities are entitled to the same reward and why a corresponding difference in wages would be an injustice I shall prove that the obligation to stoop to the social level is inherent in talent, and on this very superiority of genius I will found the equality of fortunes. I have just given the negative argument in favour of rewarding all capacities alike. I will now give the direct and positive argument. Listen first to the economist. It is always pleasant to see how he reasons, and how he understands justice. Without him, moreover, without his amusing blunders and his wonderful arguments, we should learn nothing. Equality, so odious to the economist, owes everything to political economy. When the parents of a physician, the text says a lawyer, which is not so good an example, have expended on his education 40,000 francs, this sum may be regarded as so much capital invested in his head. It is therefore permissible to consider it as yielding an annual income of 4,000 francs. If the physician earns 30,000, there remains an income of 26,000 francs due to the personal talents given him by nature. This natural capital, then, if we assume 10% as the rate of interest, amounts to 260,000 francs, and the capital given him by his parents in defraying the expenses of his education to forty thousand francs the union of these two kinds of capital constitutes his fortune say complete course etc say divides the fortune of the physician into two parts one is composed of the capital which went to pay for his education the other represents his personal talents the division is just it is in conformity with the nature of things it is universally admitted it serves as the major premise of that grand argument which establishes the inequality of capacities i accept this premise without gratification let us look at the consequences one say credits the physician with forty thousand francs the cost of his education this amount should be entered upon the debit side of the account for although this expense was incurred for him it was not incurred by him 
Then, instead of appropriating these 40,000 francs, the physician should add them to the price of his product and repay them to those who are entitled to them. Notice further that Say speaks of income instead of reimbursement, reasoning on the false principle of the productivity of capital. The expense of educating a talent is a debt contracted by this talent. From the very fact of its existence, it becomes a debtor to an amount equal to the cost of its production. This is so true and simple that, if the education of some one child in a family has cost double or triple that of his brothers, the latter are entitled to a proportional amount of the property previous to its division. There is no difficulty about this in the case of guardianship where the estate is administered in the name of the minors. 2. That which I have just said of the obligation incurred by talent of repaying the cost of its education does not embarrass the economist. The man of talent, he says, inheriting from his family, inherits, among other things, a claim to the 40,000 francs which his education costs, and he becomes, in consequence, its proprietor. But this is to abandon the right of talent, and to fall back upon the right of occupancy, which again calls up all the questions asked in Chapter 2. What is the right of occupancy? What is inheritance? Is the right of succession a right of accumulation, or only a right of choice? How did the physician's father get his fortune? Was he a proprietor, or only a usufructuary? If he was rich, let him account for his wealth. If he was poor, how could he incur so large an expense? If he received aid, what right had he to use that aid to the disadvantage of his benefactors, etc.? 3. There remains an income of 26,000 francs due to the personal talents given him by nature, say, as quoted above. Reasoning from this premise, Say concludes that our physician's talent is equivalent to a capital of 260,000 francs. This skilful calculator mistakes a consequence for a principle. The talent must not be measured by the gain, but rather the gain by the talent. For it may happen that, notwithstanding his merit, the physician in question will gain nothing at all. In which case will it be necessary to conclude that his talent or fortune is equivalent to zero? To such a result, however, would Say's reasoning lead, a result which is clearly absurd. Now it is impossible to place a money value on any talent whatsoever, since talent and money have no common measure. On what plausible ground can it be maintained that a physician should be paid two, three, or a hundred times as much as a peasant? An unavoidable difficulty, which has never been solved save by avarice, necessity and oppression. Is it not thus that the right of talent should be determined? But how is it to be determined? I say first that the physician must be treated with as much favour as any other producer, that he must not be placed below the level of others. This I will not stop to prove but I add that neither must he be lifted above that level because his talent is collective property for which he did not pay and for which he is ever in debt, just as the creation of every instrument of production is the result of collective force, so also are a man's talent and knowledge the product of universal intelligence and of general knowledge slowly accumulated by a number of masters, and through the aid of many inferior industries when the physician has paid for his teachers, his books, his diplomas, and all the other items of his educational expenses, he has no more paid for his talent than the capitalist pays for his house and land when he gives his employees their wages. The man of talent has contributed to the production of himself of a useful instrument. He has then a share in its possession, but he is not its proprietor. There exists side by side in him a free labourer and an accumulated social capital. As a labourer, he is charged with the use of an instrument, with the superintendence of a machine, namely his capacity. As capital, he is not his own master. He uses himself not for his own benefit, but for that of others. 
even if talent did not find in its own excellence a reward for the sacrifices which it costs still would it be easier to find reasons for lowering its reward than for raising it above the common level every producer receives an education every laborer is a talent a capacity that is a piece of collective property but all talents are not equally costly it takes but a few teachers but a few years and but little study to make a farmer or a mechanic the generative effort and if i may venture to use such language the period of social gestation are proportional to the loftiness of the capacity but while the physician the poet the artist and the savant produce but little and that slowly the productions of the farmer are much less uncertain and do not require so long a time whatever be then the capacity of a man whether his capacity is once created it does not belong to him like the material fashioned by an industrious hand it had the power of becoming and society has given it being shall the vase say to the potter i am that i am and i owe you nothing the artist the savant and the poet find their just recompense in the permission that society gives them to devote themselves exclusively to science and to art so that in reality they do not labor for themselves but for society which creates them and requires them to do no other duty society can if need be do without prose and verse music and painting and the knowledge of the movements of the moon and stars but it cannot live a single day without food and shelter undoubtedly man does not live by bread alone he must also according to the gospel live by the word of god that is he must love the good and do it know and admire the beautiful and study the marvels of nature but in order to cultivate his mind he must first take care of his body the latter duty is as necessary as the former is noble if it is glorious to charm and instruct men it is honorable as well to feed them when then society faithful to the principle of the division of labor entrusts a work of art or a science to one of its members allowing him to abandon ordinary labor it owes him an indemnity for all which it prevents him from producing industrially but it owes him nothing more if he should demand more society should by refusing his services annihilate his pretensions forced then in order to live to devote himself to labor repugnant to his nature the man of genius would feel his weakness and would live the most distasteful of lives they tell of a celebrated singer who demanded of the empress of russia catherine the second twenty thousand roubles for his services that is more than i give my field marshals said catherine your majesty replied the other has only to make singers of her field marshals if france more powerful than catherine the second should say to mademoiselle rachel you must act for one hundred louis or else spin cotton to monsieur dupre you must sing for two thousand four hundred francs or else work in the vineyard do you think that the actress rachel and the singer dupre would abandon the stage if they did they would be the first to repent it mademoiselle rachel receives they say sixty thousand francs annually from the comedie francaise for a talent like hers it is a slight fee why not one hundred thousand francs two hundred thousand francs why not a civil list what meanness are we really guilty of chaffering with an artist like mademoiselle rachel it is said in reply that the managers of the theatre cannot give more without incurring a loss that they admit the superior talent of their young associate but that in fixing her salary they have been compelled to take account of the company's receipts and expenses into consideration also that is just but it only confirms what i have said namely that an artist's talent may be infinite but that its mercenary claims are necessarily limited on the one hand by its usefulness to the society which rewards it on the other by the resources of this society in other words that the demand of the seller is balanced by the right of the buyer mademoiselle rachel they say brings to the treasury of the theatre francais 
more than sixty thousand francs i admit it but then i blame the theatre from whom does the theatre francais take this money from some curious people who are perfectly free yes but the working men the lessees the tenants those who borrow by pawning their possessions from whom these curious people recover all that they pay to the theatre are they free and when the better part of their products are consumed by others at the play do you assure me that their families are not in want until the french people reflecting on the salaries paid to all artists savants and public functionaries have plainly expressed their wish and judgment as to the matter the salaries of mademoiselle rachel and all her fellow artists will be a compulsory tax extorted by violence to reward pride and support libertinism it is because we are neither free nor sufficiently enlightened that we submit to be cheated in our bargains and the laborer pays the duties levied by the prestige of power and the selfishness of talent upon the curiosity of the idle and that we are perpetually scandalized by these monstrous inequalities which are encouraged and applauded by public opinion the whole nation and the nation only pays its authors its savants its artists its officials whatever be the hands through which their salaries pass on what basis should it pay them on the basis of equality i have proved it by estimating the value of talent i shall confirm it in the following chapter by proving the impossibility of all social inequality what have we shown so far things so simple that really they seem silly that as the traveller does not appropriate the route which he traverses so the farmer does not appropriate the field which he sows that if nevertheless by reason of his industry a labourer may appropriate the material which he employs every employer of material becomes by the same title a proprietor that all capital whether material or mental being the result of collective labour is in consequence collective property that the strong have no right to encroach upon the labour of the weak nor the shrewd to take advantage of the credulity of the simple finally that no one can be forced to buy that which he does not want still less to pay for that which he has not bought and consequently that the exchangeable value of a product be measured neither by the opinion of the buyer nor that of the seller but by the amount of time and outlay which it has cost the property of each always remains the same are these not very simple truths well as simple as they appear to you reader you shall see yet others which surpass them in dullness and simplicity for our course is the reverse of that of the geometricians with them the further they advance the more difficult their problems become we on the contrary after having commenced with the most abstruse propositions shall end with the axioms but i must close this chapter with an exposition of one of those startling truths which never have been dreamed of by legists or economists that from the standpoint of justice labor destroys property this proposition is the logical result of the two preceding sections which we have just summed up the isolated man can supply but a very small portion of his wants all his power lies in association and in the intelligent combination of universal effort the division and cooperation of labor multiply the quantity and the variety of products the individuality of functions improves their equality there is not a man then but lives upon the products of several thousand different industries not a laborer but receives from society at large the things which he consumes and with these the power to reproduce who indeed would venture the assertion i produce by my own effort all that i consume i need the aid of no one else the farmer whom the early economists regarded as the only real producer the farmer housed furnished clothed fed and assisted by the mason the carpenter the tailor the miller the baker the butcher the grocer the blacksmith etc the farmer i say can he boast that he produces by his own unaided effort the various articles of consumption are given to each by all consequently the production of each involves the production of all 
one product cannot exist without another an isolated industry is an impossible thing what would be the harvest of the farmer if others did not manufacture for him barns wagons plows clothes etc where would be the savant without the publisher the printer without the typecaster and the machinist and these in their turn without a multitude of other industries let us not prolong this catalogue so easy to extend lest we be accused of uttering commonplaces all industries are united by mutual relations in a single group all productions do reciprocal service as means and end all varieties of talent are but a series of changes from the inferior to the superior now this undisputed and indisputable fact of the general participation in every species of product makes all individual productions common so that every product coming from the hands of the producer is mortgaged in advance by society the producer himself is entitled to only that portion of his product which is expressed by a fraction whose denominator is equal to the number of individuals of which society is composed it is true that in return this same producer has a share in all the products of others so that he has a claim upon all just as all have a claim upon him but is it not clear that this reciprocity of mortgages far from authorizing property destroys every possession the laborer is not even possessor of his product scarcely has he finished it when society claims it but it will be answered even if that is so even if the product does not belong to the producer still society gives each laborer an equivalent for his product and this equivalent this salary this reward this allowance becomes his property do you deny that this property is legitimate and if the laborer instead of consuming his entire wages chooses to economize who dare question his right to do so the laborer is not even proprietor of the price of his labor and cannot absolutely control its disposition let us not be blinded by a spurious justice that which is given the laborer in exchange for his product is not given him as a reward for past labor but to provide for and secure future labor we consume before we produce the laborer may say at the end of the day i have paid yesterday's expenses tomorrow i shall pay those of today and every moment of his life the member of society is in debt he dies with the debt unpaid how is it possible for him to accumulate they talk of economy it is the proprietor's hobby under a system of equality all economy which does not aim at subsequent reproduction or enjoyment is impossible why because the thing saved since it cannot be converted into capital has no object and is without a final cause this will be explained more fully in the next chapter to conclude the laborer in his relation to society is a debtor who of necessity dies insolvent the proprietor is an unfaithful guardian who denies the receipt of the deposit committed to his care and wishes to be paid for his guardianship down to the last day lest the principles just set forth may appear to certain readers too metaphysical i shall reproduce them in a more concrete form intelligible to the dullest brains and pregnant with the most important consequences hitherto i have considered property as a power of exclusion hereafter i shall examine it as a power of invasion end of section 12 chapter 3 part 4 Section 13 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Chapter 4 part one that property is impossible the last resort of proprietors the overwhelming argument whose invincible potency reassures them is that in their opinion equality of conditions is impossible equality of conditions is a chimera they cry with a knowing air 
Distribute wealth equally today. Tomorrow this equality will have vanished. To this hackneyed objection, which they repeat everywhere with the most marvellous assurance, they never fail to add the following comment, as a sort of glory be to the Father. If all men were equal, nobody would work. This anthem is sung with variations. If all were masters, nobody would obey. If nobody were rich, who would employ the poor? And if nobody were poor, who would labour for the rich? But let us have done with the invective. We have better arguments at our command. If I show that property itself is impossible, that it is property which is a contradiction, a chimera, a utopia, and if I show it no longer by metaphysics and jurisprudence, but by figures, equations, and calculations, imagine the fright of the astounded proprietor. And you, reader, what do you think of the retort? Numbers govern the world. Mundum regunt numeri. This proverb applies as aptly to the moral and political as to the sidereal and molecular world. The elements of justice are identical with those of algebra. Legislation and government are simply the arts of classifying and balancing powers. All jurisprudence falls within the rules of arithmetic. This chapter and the next will serve to lay the foundations of this extraordinary doctrine. Then will be unfolded to the reader's vision an immense and novel career. Then shall we commence to see in numerical relations the synthetic unity of philosophy and the sciences, and, filled with admiration and enthusiasm for this profound and majestic simplicity of nature, we shall shout with the apostle, Yes, the Eternal has made all things by number, weight, and measure. We shall understand not only that equality of conditions is impossible, but that all else is impossible, that this seeming impossibility which we charge upon it arises from the fact that we always think of it in connection either with the proprietary or the communistic regime. Political systems equally irreconcilable with human nature. We shall see finally that inequality is constantly being realized without our knowledge, even at the very moment when we are pronouncing it incapable of realization. That the time draws near when, without any effort or even wish of ours, we shall have it universally established, that with it, in it, and by it, the natural and true political order must make itself manifest. It has been said, in speaking of the blindness and obstinacy of the passions, that if man had anything to gain by denying the truths of arithmetic, he would find some means of unsettling their certainty. Here is an opportunity to try this curious experiment. I attack property no longer with its own maxims, but with arithmetic. Let the proprietors prepare to verify my figures, for, if unfortunately for them, the figures prove accurate, the proprietors are lost. In proving the impossibility of property, I complete the proof of its injustice. In fact, that which is just must be useful. That which is useful must be true. That which is true must be possible. Therefore, everything which is impossible is untrue, useless, unjust. Then, a priori, we may judge of the justice of anything by its possibility, so that if the thing were absolutely impossible, it would be absolutely unjust. Property is physically and mathematically impossible. Demonstration. Axiom. Property is the right of increase claimed by the proprietor over anything which he has stamped as his own. This proposition is purely an axiom because, one, it is not a definition, since it does not express all that is included in the right of property, the right of sale, of exchange, of gift, the right to transform, to alter, to consume, to destroy, to use and abuse, etc. All these rights are so many different powers of property, which we may consider separately, but which we disregard here, that we may devote all our attention to this single one, the right of increase. Two. It is universally admitted. No one can deny it without denying the facts, without being instantly belied by universal custom. 3. It is self-evident, since property is always accompanied, either actually or potentially, 
by the fact which this axiom expresses and through this fact mainly property manifests establishes and asserts itself four finally its negation involves a contradiction the right of increase is really an inherent right so essential a part of property that in its absence property is null and void observations increase receives different names according to the thing by which it is yielded if by land farm rent if by houses and furniture rent if by life investments revenue if by money interest if by exchange advantage gain profit three things which must not be confounded with the wages or legitimate price of labor increase a sort of royal prerogative of tangible and consumable homage is due to the proprietor on account of his nominal and metaphysical occupancy his seal is set upon the thing that is enough to prevent anyone else from occupying it without his permission this permission to use his things the proprietor may if he chooses freely grant commonly he sells it this sale is really a stellionate and an extortion but by the legal fiction of the right of property this same sale severely punished we know not why in other cases is a source of profit and value to the proprietor the amount demanded by the proprietor in payment for this permission is expressed in monetary terms by the dividend which the supposed product yields in nature so that by the right of increase the proprietor reaps and does not plough gleans and does not till consumes and does not produce enjoys and does not labor very different from the idols of the psalmist are the gods of property the former had hands and felt not the latter on the contrary manus habent et palpabunt the right of increase is conferred in a very mysterious and supernatural manner the inauguration of a proprietor is accompanied by the awful ceremonies of an ancient initiation first comes the consecration of the article a consecration which makes known to all that they must offer up a suitable sacrifice to the proprietor whenever they wish by his permission obtained and signed to use his article second comes the anathema which prohibits except on the conditions aforesaid all persons from touching the article even in the proprietor's absence and pronounces every violator of property sacrilegious infamous amenable to the secular power and deserving of being handed over to it finally the dedication which enables the proprietor or patron saint the god chosen to watch over the article to inhabit it mentally like a divinity in his sanctuary by means of this dedication the substance of the article so to speak becomes converted into the person of the proprietor who is regarded as ever present in its form this is exactly the doctrine of the writers on jurisprudence property says Toulier, is a moral quality inherent in a thing an actual bond which fastens it to the proprietor and which cannot be broken save by his act locke humbly doubted whether god could make matter intelligent Toulier asserts that the proprietor renders it moral how much does he lack of being a god these are by no means exaggerations property is the right of increase that is the power to produce without labor now to produce without labor is to make something from nothing in short to create surely it is no more difficult to do this than to moralize matter the jurists are right then in applying to proprietors this passage from the scriptures ego dixi dii estis et filii excelsi omnes i have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the most high property is the right of increase to us this axiom shall be like the name of the beast in the apocalypse a name in which is hidden the complete explanation of the whole mystery of the beast it was known that he should solve the mystery of this name would obtain a knowledge of the whole prophecy and would succeed in mastering the beast well by the most careful interpretation of our axiom we shall kill the sphinx of property starting from this eminently characteristic fact the right of increase we shall pursue the old serpent through his coils 
we shall count the murderous entwinings of this frightful tenure whose head with its thousand suckers is always hidden from the sword of its most violent enemies though abandoning to them immense fragments of its body it requires something more than courage to subdue this monster it was written that it should not die until a proletaire armed with a magic wand had fought with it corollaries one the amount of increase is proportional to the thing increased whatever be the rate of interest whether it rise to three five or ten per cent or fall to one half one fourth one tenth it does not matter the law of increase remains the same the law is as follows all capital the cash value of which can be estimated may be considered as a term in an arithmetical series which progresses in the ratio of one hundred and the revenue yielded by this capital as the corresponding term of another arithmetical series which progresses equal to the rate of interest thus a capital of five hundred francs being the fifth term of the arithmetical progression whose ratio is one hundred its revenue at three per cent will be indicated by the fifth term of the arithmetical progression whose ratio is three one hundred three two hundred six three hundred nine four hundred twelve five hundred fifteen an acquaintance with this sort of logarithms tables of which calculated to a very high degree are possessed by proprietors will give us the key to the most puzzling problems and cause us to experience a series of surprises by this logarithmic theory of the right of increase a piece of property together with its income may be defined as a number whose logarithm is equal to the sum of its units divided by one hundred and multiplied by the rate of interest for instance a house valued at one hundred thousand francs and leased at five per cent yields a revenue of five thousand francs according to the formula one hundred thousand times five divided by a hundred equals five thousand vice versa a piece of land which yields at two and a half per cent a revenue of three thousand francs is worth one hundred and twenty thousand francs according to this other formula three thousand times one hundred divided by two and a half equals one hundred and twenty thousand in the first case the ratio of the progression which marks the increase of interest is five in the second it is two and a half observation the forms of increase known as farm rent income and interest are paid annually rent is paid by the week the month or the year profits and gains are paid at the time of exchange thus the amount of increase is proportional both to the thing increased and the time during which it increases in other words usury grows like a cancer foenus serpit sicu cancer two the increase paid to the proprietor by the occupant is a dead loss to the latter for if the proprietor owed in exchange for the increase which he receives something more than the permission which he grants his right of property would not be perfect he would not possess jure optimo jure perfecto that is he would not be in reality a proprietor then all which passes from the hands of the occupant into those of the proprietor in the name of the increase and as the price of the permission to occupy is a permanent gain for the latter and a dead loss and an annihilation for the former to whom none of it will return save in the form of gift arms wages paid for his services or the price of merchandise which he has delivered in a word increase perishes so far as the borrower is concerned or to use the more energetic latin phrase res perit solventi three the right of increase oppresses the proprietor as well as the stranger the master of a thing as its proprietor levies a tax for the use of his property upon himself as its possessor equal to that which he would receive from a third party so that the capital bears interest in the hands of the capitalist as well as in those of the borrower and the commandite if indeed rather than accept a rent of five hundred francs for my apartment i prefer to occupy and enjoy it it is clear that i shall become my own debtor for a rent equal to that which i deny myself 
This principle is universally practiced in business and is regarded as an axiom by economists. Manufacturers also, who have the advantage of being proprietors of their floating capital, although they owe no interest to anyone, in calculating their profits subtract from them not only their running expenses and the wages of their employees, but also the interest on their capital. For the same reason, money lenders retain in their own possession as little money as possible. For since all capital necessarily bears interest, if this interest is supplied by no one, it comes out of the capital, which is to that extent diminished. Thus, by the right of increase, capital eats itself up. This is, doubtless, the idea that Papinius intended to convey in the phrase as elegant as it is forcible, Ferenis mordet solidam. I beg pardon for using Latin so frequently in discussing this subject. It is an homage which I pay to the most usurious nation that ever existed. First proposition. Property is impossible because it demands something for nothing. The discussion of this proposition covers the same ground as that of the origin of farm rent, which is so much debated by the economists. When I read the writings of the greater part of these men, I cannot avoid a feeling of contempt mingled with anger in view of this mass of nonsense in which the detestable vies with the absurd. It would be a repetition of the story of the elephant in the moon, were it not for the atrocity of the consequences. To seek a rational and legitimate origin of that which is and ever must be only robbery, extortion and plunder, that must be the height of the proprietor's folly, the last degree of bedevilment, into which minds, otherwise judicious, can be thrown by the perversity of selfishness. A farmer, says Say, is a wheat manufacturer who, among other tools which serve him in modifying the material from which he makes the wheat, employs one large tool, which we call a field. If he is not the proprietor of the field, if he is only a tenant, he pays the proprietor for the productive service of this tool. The tenant is reimbursed by the purchaser, the latter by another, until the product reaches the consumer, who redeems the first payment, plus all the others, by means of which the product has at last come into his hands. Let us lay aside the subsequent payments by which the product reaches the consumer, and for the present pay attention only to the first one of all, the rent paid to the proprietor by the tenant. On what ground, we ask, is the proprietor entitled to this rent? According to Ricardo McCulloch and Mill, farm rent, properly speaking, is simply the excess of product of the most fertile land over that of lands of an inferior quality, so that farm rent is not demanded for the former until the increase of population renders necessary the cultivation of the latter. It is difficult to see any sense in this. How can a right to the land be based upon a difference in the quality of the land? How can varieties of soil engender a principle of legislation and politics? The reasoning is either so subtle or so stupid that the more I think of it, the more bewildered I become. Suppose two pieces of land of equal area, the one, A, capable of supporting 10,000 inhabitants, the other, B, capable of supporting 9,000 only. When, owing to an increase in their number, the inhabitants of A shall be forced to cultivate B, the landed proprietors of A will exact from their tenants in A a rent proportional to the difference between 10 and 9. So say, I think, Ricardo, McCulloch and Mill. But if A supports as many inhabitants as it can, that is, if the inhabitants of A, by our hypothesis, have only just enough land to keep them alive, how can they pay farm rent? If they had gone no farther than to say that the difference in land has occasioned farm rent, instead of caused it, this observation would have taught us a valuable lesson, namely, that farm rent grew out of a desire for equality. Indeed, if all men have an equal right to the possession of good land, no one can be forced to cultivate bad land without indemnification. Farm rent, according to Ricardo, McCulloch and Mill, would then have been a compensation for loss and hardship. This system of practical equality is a bad one, no doubt, but it sprang from good intentions. What argument can Ricardo, McCulloch and Mill develop therefrom 
in favour of property. Their theory turns against themselves and strangles them. Malthus thinks that farm rent has its source in the power possessed by land of producing more than is necessary to supply the wants of the men who cultivate it. I would ask Malthus why successful labour should entitle the idle to a portion of the products. But the worthy Malthus is mistaken in regard to the fact. Yes, land has the power of producing more than is needed by those who cultivate it, if by cultivators is meant tenants only. The tailor also makes more clothes than he wears, and the cabinet maker more furniture than he uses. But since the various professions imply and sustain one another, not only the farmer, but the followers of all arts and trades, even to the doctor and the school teacher, are and ought to be regarded as cultivators of the land. Malthus bases farm rent upon the principle of commerce. Now, the fundamental law of commerce being equivalence of the products exchanged, anything which destroys this equivalence violates the law. There is an error in the estimate which needs to be corrected. Buchanan, a commentator on Smith, regarded farm rent as the result of a monopoly and maintained that labour alone is productive. Consequently, he thought that, without this monopoly, products would rise in price, and he found no basis for farm rent save in the civil law. This opinion is a corollary of that which makes the civil law the basis of property. And why has the civil law, which ought to be the written expression of justice, authorised this monopoly? Whoever says monopoly necessarily excludes justice. Now, to say that farm rent is a monopoly sanctioned by the law is to say that injustice is based on justice, a contradiction in terms. Say, answers Buchanan, that the proprietor is not a monopolist, because a monopolist is one who does not increase the utility of the merchandise which passes through his hands. How much does the proprietor increase the utility of his tenant's products? Has he ploughed, sowed, reaped, mowed, winnowed, weeded? These are the processes by which the tenant and his employees increase the utility of the material which they consume for the purpose of reproduction. The landed proprietor increases the utility of products by means of his implement, the land. This implement receives in one state and returns in another the materials of which wheat is composed. The action of the land is a chemical process, which so modifies the material that it multiplies it by destroying it. The soil is then a producer of utility, and when it, the soil, asks its pay in the form of profit, or farm rent, for its proprietor, it at the same time gives something to the consumer in exchange for the amount which the consumer pays it. It gives him a produced utility, and it is the production of this utility which warrants us in calling land productive as well as labour. Let us clear up this matter. The blacksmith who manufactures for the farmer implements of husbandry, the wheelwright who makes him a cart, the mason who builds his barn, the carpenter, the basket maker, etc., all of whom contribute to agricultural production by the tools which they provide, are producers of utility. Consequently, they are entitled to a part of the products. Undoubtedly, says Say, but the land also is an implement whose service must be paid for, then... I admit that the land is an implement, but who made it? Did the proprietor? Did he, by the efficacious virtue of the right of property, by this moral quality infused into the soil, endow it with vigour and fertility? Exactly there lies the monopoly of the proprietor, in the fact that, though he did not make the implement, he asks pay for its use. When the creator shall present himself and claim farm rent, we will consider the matter with him. Or even when the proprietor, his pretended representative, shall exhibit his power of attorney. The proprietor's service, I'd say, is easy, I admit. It is a frank confession. But we cannot disregard it. Without property, one farmer would contend with another for the possession of a field without a proprietor, and the field would remain uncultivated. Then the proprietor's business is to reconcile farmers by robbing them. O oh, logic! O oh, justice! O oh, the marvellous wisdom of economists! The proprietor, 
if they are right, is like Perrin Dandin, who, when summoned by two travellers to settle a dispute about an oyster, opened it, gobbled it, and said to them, The court awards you each a shell. Could anything worse be said of property? Will Say tell us why the same farmers who, if there were no proprietors, would contend with each other for possession of the soil, do not contend today with the proprietors for this possession? Obviously because they think them legitimate possessors, and because their respect for even an imaginary right exceeds their avarice. I proved in Chapter 2 that possession is sufficient without property to maintain social order. Would it be more difficult, then, to reconcile possessors without masters than tenants controlled by proprietors? Would labouring men, who respect, much to their own detriment, the pretended rights of the idler, violate the natural rights of the producer and the manufacturer? What if the husbandman forfeited his right to the land as soon as he ceased to occupy it, would he become more covetous? And would the impossibility of demanding increase of taxing another's labour be a source of quarrels and lawsuits the economists use singular logic but we are not yet through admit that the proprietor is the legitimate master of the land the land is an instrument of production they say that is true but when changing the noun into an adjective they alter the phrase thus the land is a productive instrument they make a wicked blunder According to Quesnay and the early economists, all production comes from the land. Smith, Ricardo, and de Tracy, on the contrary, say that labor is the sole agent of production. Say, and most of his successors, teach that both land and labor and capital are productive. The latter constitute the eclectic school of political economy. The truth is that neither land nor labor nor capital is productive. Production results from the cooperation of these three equally necessary elements, which, taken separately, are equally sterile. Political economy, indeed, treats of the production, distribution, and consumption of wealth or values. But of what values? Of the values produced by human industry. That is, of the changes made in matter by man, that he may appropriate it to his own use, and not at all of nature's spontaneous productions. Man's labor consists in a simple laying on of hands. When he has taken that trouble, he has produced a value. Until then, the salt of the sea, the water of the springs, the grass of the fields, and the trees of the forests are to him as if they were not. The sea, without the fisherman and his line, supplies no fish. The forest, without the woodcutter and his axe, furnishes neither fuel nor timber the meadow without the mower yields neither hay nor aftermath nature is a vast mass of material to be cultivated and converted into products but nature produces nothing for herself in the economical sense her products in their relation to man are not yet products capital tools and machinery are likewise unproductive the hammer and the anvil without the blacksmith and the iron do not forge the mill without the miller and the grain does not grind etc bring tools and raw material together place a plough and some seed on fertile soil enter a smithy light the fire and shut up the shop you will produce nothing the following remark was made by an economist who possessed more good sense than most of his fellows Say credits capital with an active part unwarranted by its nature. Left to itself, it is an idle tool. J. Jos, Political Economy Finally, labor and capital together, when unfortunately combined, produce nothing. Plough a sandy desert, beat the water of the rivers, pass type through a sieve. You will get neither wheat, nor fish, nor books. Your trouble will be as fruitless as was the immense labor of the army of Xerxes, who, as Herodotus says, with his three million soldiers, scourged the Hellespont for twenty-four hours as a punishment for having broken and scattered the pontoon bridge which the great king had thrown across it. Tools and capital, land and labor, considered individually and abstractly, are not, literally speaking, productive. 
the proprietor who asks to be rewarded for the use of a tool or the productive power of his land takes for granted then that which is radically false namely that capital produces by its own effort and in taking pay for this imaginary product he literally receives something for nothing objection but if the blacksmith the wheelwright all manufacturers in short have a right to the products in return for the implements which they furnish and if land is an implement of production why does not this implement entitle its proprietor be his claim real or imaginary to a portion of the products as in the case of the manufacturers of ploughs and wagons reply here we touch the heart of the question the mystery of property which we must clear up if we would understand anything of the strange effects of the right of increase he who manufactures or repairs the farmer's tools receives the price once either at the time of delivery or in several payments and when this price is once paid to the manufacturer the tools which he has delivered belong to him no more never does he claim double payment for the same tool or the same job of repairs if he annually shares in the products of the farmer it is owing to the fact that he annually makes something for the farmer the proprietor on the contrary does not yield his implement eternally he is paid for it eternally he keeps it in fact the rent received by the proprietor is not intended to defray the expense of maintaining and repairing the implement this expense is charged to the borrower and does not concern the proprietor except as he is interested in the preservation of the article if he takes it upon himself to attend to the repairs he takes care that the money which he expends for this purpose is repaid this rent does not represent the product of the implement since of itself the implement produces nothing we have just proved this and we shall prove it more clearly still by its consequences finally this rent does not represent the participation of the proprietor in the production since this participation could consist like that of the blacksmith and the wheelwright only in the surrender of the whole or a part of his implement in which case he would cease to be its proprietor which would involve a contradiction in the idea of property then between the proprietor and his tenant there is no exchange either of values or services then as our axiom says farm rent is a real increase an extortion based solely upon fraud and violence on the one hand and weakness and ignorance upon the other products say the economists are bought only by products the maxim is property's condemnation the proprietor producing neither by his own labor nor by his implement and receiving products in exchange for nothing is either a parasite or a thief then if property can exist only as a right property is impossible corollaries one the republican constitution of seventeen ninety three which defined property as the right to enjoy the fruit of one's labor was grossly mistaken it should have said property is the right to enjoy and dispose at will of another's goods the fruit of another's industry and labor two every possessor of lands houses furniture machinery tools money etc who lends a thing for a price exceeding the cost of repairs the repairs being charged to the lender and representing products which he exchanges for other products is guilty of swindling and extortion in short all rent received nominally as damages but really as payment for a loan is an act of property a robbery historical comment the tax which a victorious nation levies upon a conquered nation is genuine farm rent the seigneurial rights abolished by the revolution of 1789 tithes mortmain statute labor etc were different forms of the rights of property and they who under the titles of nobles seigneurs prebendaries etc enjoyed these rights were neither more nor less than proprietors to defend property today is to condemn the revolution second proposition property is impossible because wherever it exists production costs more than it is worth the preceding proposition was legislative in its nature this one is economical it serves to prove that property which originates in violence results in waste production says say 
is exchange on a large scale to render the exchange productive the value of the whole amount of service must be balanced by the value of the product if this condition is not complied with the exchange is unequal the producer gives more than he receives now value being necessarily based upon utility it follows that every useless product is necessarily valueless that it cannot be exchanged and consequently that it cannot be given in payment for productive services then though production may equal consumption it never can exceed it for there is no real production save where there is a production of utility and there is no utility save where there is a possibility of consumption thus so much of every product as is rendered by excessive abundance inconsumable becomes useless valueless unexchangeable consequently unfit to be given in payment for anything whatever and so is no longer a product consumption on the other hand to be legitimate to be true consumption must be reproductive of utility for if it is unproductive the products which it destroys are cancelled values things produced at a pure loss a state of things which causes products to depreciate in value man has the power to destroy but he consumes only that which he reproduces under a right system of economy there is then an equation between production and consumption these points established let us suppose a community of one thousand families enclosed in a territory of a given circumference and deprived of foreign intercourse let this community represent the human race which scattered over the face of the earth is really isolated in fact the difference between a community and the human race being only a numerical one the economical results will be absolutely the same in each case suppose then that these thousand families devoting themselves exclusively to wheat culture are obliged to pay to one hundred individuals chosen from the mass an annual revenue of ten per cent on their product is it clear that in such a case the right of increase is equivalent to a tax levied in advance upon social production of what use is this tax it cannot be levied to supply the community with provisions for between that and farm rent there is nothing in common nor to pay for services and products for the proprietors laboring like the others have labored only for themselves finally this tax is of no use to its recipients who having harvested wheat enough for their own consumption and not being able in a society without commerce and manufactures to procure anything else in exchange for it thereby lose the advantage of their income in such a society one-tenth of the product being inconsumable one-tenth of the labor goes unpaid production costs more than it is worth now change three hundred of our wheat producers into artisans of all kinds one hundred gardeners and wine growers sixty shoemakers and tailors fifty carpenters and blacksmiths eighty of various professions and that nothing may be lacking seven schoolmasters one mayor one judge one priest each industry furnishes the whole community with its special product now the total production being one thousand each laborer's consumption is one namely wheat meat and grain 0 0.7 wine and vegetables 0 0.1 shoes and clothing 0 0.06 ironwork and furniture 0 0.05 sundries 0 0.08 instruction 0 0.007 administration 0 0.002 mass 0 0.001 total one but the community owes a revenue of ten per cent and it matters little whether the farmers alone pay it or all the laborers are responsible for it the result is the same the farmer raises the price of his products in proportion to his share of the debt and other laborers follow his example then after some fluctuations equilibrium is established and all pay nearly the same amount of the revenue it would be a grave error to assume that in a nation none but farmers pay farm rent the whole nation pays it i say then that by this tax of ten per cent each laborer's consumption is reduced as follows wheat zero point six three wine and vegetables zero point zero nine clothing and shoes zero point zero five four 
furniture and ironwork 0 0.045 other products 0 0.072 schooling 0 0.0063 administration 0 0.0018 mass 0 0.0009 total 0 0.9 the laborer has produced one he consumes only 0 0.9 he loses then one tenth of the price of his labor. His production still costs more than it is worth. On the other hand, the tenth received by the proprietors is no less a waste, for, being laborers themselves, they, like the others, possess in the nine tenths of their product the wherewithal to live. They want for nothing. Why should they wish their proportion of bread, wine, meat, clothes, shelter, etc., to be doubted, if they can neither consume nor exchange them? Then farm rent, with them as with the rest of the labourers, is a waste, and perishes in their hands. Extend the hypothesis, increase the number and variety of the products, you still have the same result. Hitherto we have considered the proprietor as taking part in the production, not only, as Say says, by the use of his instrument, but in an effective manner and by the labour of his hands now it is easy to see that under such circumstances property will never exist what happens the proprietor an essentially libidinous animal without virtue or shame is not satisfied with an orderly and disciplined life he loves property because it enables him to do at leisure what he pleases and when he pleases having obtained the means of life he gives himself up to trivialities and indolence he enjoys, he fritters away his time, he goes in quest of curiosities and novel sensations. Property, to enjoy itself, has to abandon ordinary life and busy itself in luxurious occupations and unclean enjoyments. Instead of giving up a farm rent, which is perishing in their hands and thus lightening the labour of the community, 100 proprietors prefer to rest. In consequence of this withdrawal, the absolute production being diminished by 100, while the consumption remains the same, production and consumption seem to balance. But, in the first place, since the proprietors no longer labour, their consumption is, according to economical principles, unproductive. Consequently, the previous condition of the community, when the labour of 100 was rewarded by no products, is superseded by one in which the products of 100 are consumed without labor. The deficit is always the same, whichever the column of the account in which it is expressed. Either the maxims of political economy are false, or else property, which contradicts them, is impossible. The economists, regarding all unproductive consumption as an evil, as a robbery of the human race, never fail to exhort proprietors to moderation, labor, and economy. They preach to them the necessity of making themselves useful, of remunerating production for that which they receive from it. They launch the most terrible curses against luxury and laziness. Very beautiful morality, surely. It is a pity that it lacks common sense. The proprietor who labours, or, as the economists say, who makes himself useful, is paid for his labour and utility. Is he, therefore, any the less idle as concerns the property which he does not use, and from which he receives an income? His condition, whatever he may do, is an unproductive and felonious one. He cannot cease to waste and destroy without ceasing to be a proprietor. But this is only the least of the evils which property engenders. Society has to maintain some idle people, whether or no. It will always have the blind, the maimed, the insane and the idiotic it can easily support a few sluggards at this point the impossibilities thicken and become complicated end of section 13 chapter 4 part 1 section 14 of what is property this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Lynn Thompson What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker Chapter 4, Part 2 That Property is Impossible Third Proposition 
Property is impossible because, with a given capital, production is proportional to labor, not to property. To pay a farm rent of 100 at the rate of 10% of the product, the product must be 1,000. That the product may be 1,000, a force of 1,000 laborers is needed. It follows that in granting a furlough, as we have just done, to our 100 labor proprietors, all of them, had equal right to lead the life of men of income. We have placed ourselves in a position where we are unable to pay their revenues. In fact, the productive power, which at first was 1,000, being now but 900, the production is also reduced to 900, one-tenth of which is 90. Either, then, 10 proprietors out of the 100 cannot be paid, provided the remaining 90 are to get the whole amount of their farm rent, or else all must consent to a decrease of 10%. For it is not for the labourer, who has been wanting in no particular, who has produced as in the past, to suffer by the withdrawal of the proprietor. The latter must take the consequences of his own idleness. But then, the proprietor becomes poorer for the very reason that he wishes to enjoy. By exercising his right, he loses it so that property seems to decrease and vanish in proportions as we try to lay hold of it. The more we pursue it, the more it eludes our grasp. What sort of a right is that which is governed by numerical relations, and which an arithmetical calculation can destroy? The labourer proprietor received first as labourer 0.9 in wages, second as proprietor 1 in farm rent. He said to himself, my farm rent is sufficient, I have enough and to spare without my labour, and thus it is that the income upon which he calculated gets diminished by one-tenth. He, at the same time, not even suspecting the cause of this diminution, by taking part in the production, he was himself the creator of this tenth which has vanished. And while he thought to labour only for himself, he unwittingly suffered a loss in exchanging his products, by which he was made to pay to himself one-tenth of his own farm rent. Like everyone else, he produced one and received but 0 0.9. If, instead of 900 labourers, there had been but 500, the whole amount of farm rent would have been reduced to 50. If there had been but 100, it would have fallen to 10. We may posit, then, the following axiom as a law of proprietary economy. Increase must diminish as the number of idlers augments. This first result will lead us to another more surprising still. Its effect is to deliver us at one blow from all the evils of property, without abolishing it, without wronging proprietors, and by a highly conservative process. We have just proved that, if the farm rent in a community of 1,000 labourers is 100, that of 900 would be 90, that of 800, 80, that of 100, 10, etc., so that in a community where there was but one labourer, the farm rent would be but 0 0.1, no matter how great the extent and value of the land appropriated. Therefore, with a given landed capital, production is proportional to labour, not to property. Guided by this principle, let us try to ascertain the maximum increase of all property whatever. What is essentially a farm lease? It is a contract by which the proprietor yields to a tenant possession of his land, in consideration of a portion of that which it yields him, the proprietor. If, in consequence of an increase in his household, the tenant becomes ten times as strong as the proprietor, he will produce ten times as much. Would the proprietor, in such a case, be justified in raising the farm rent tenfold? His right is not, the more you produce, the more I demand. It is, the more I sacrifice, the more I demand. The increase in the tenant's household, the number of hands at his disposal, the resources of his industry, all these serve to increase production, but bear no relation to the proprietor. His claims are to be measured by his own productive capacity, not that of others. Property is the right of increase, not a poll tax. How could a man, hardly capable of cultivating even a few acres by himself, demand of a community, on the ground of its use of 10,000 acres of his property, 
ten thousand times as much as he is incapable of producing from one acre. Why should the price of a loan be governed by the skill and strength of the borrower, rather than the utility sacrificed by the proprietor? We must recognize, then, this second economical law. Increase is measured by a fraction of the proprietor's production. Now, this production, what is it? In other words, what can the lord and master of a piece of land justly claim to have sacrificed in lending it to a tenant? The productive capacity of a proprietor, like that of any labourer, being one, the product which he sacrifices in surrendering his land is also one. If, then, the rate of increase is 10%, the maximum increase is 0 0.1. But we have seen that, whenever a proprietor withdraws from production, the amount of products is lessened by 1. Then the increase which accrues to him, being equal to 0 0.1, while he remains among the labourers, will be equal after his withdrawal, by the law of the decrease of farm rent to 0 0.9. Thus we are led to this final formula. The maximum income of a proprietor is equal to the square root of the product of one labourer, some number being agreed upon to express this product. The diminution which this income suffers, if the proprietor is idle, is equal to a fraction whose numerator is 1 and whose denominator is the number which expresses the product. Thus the maximum income of an idle proprietor, or of one who labours in his own behalf outside of the community, figured at 10%, on an average production of 1,000 francs per labourer, would be 90 francs. If, then, there are in France 1 million proprietors with an income of 1,000 francs each, which they consume unproductively, instead of the 1,000 millions which are paid them annually, they are entitled in strict justice, and by the most accurate calculation, to 90 millions only. It is something of a reduction to take 910 millions from the burdens which weigh so heavily upon the labouring class. Nevertheless, the account is not finished, and the labourer is still ignorant of the full extent of his rights. What is the right of increase when confined within just limits? A recognition of the right of occupancy. But since all have an equal right of occupancy, every man is by the same title a proprietor. Every man has a right to an income equal to a fraction of his product. If, then, the labourer is obliged by the right of property to pay a rent to the proprietor, the proprietor is obliged by the same right to pay the same amount of rent to the labourer and, since their rights balance each other, the difference between them is zero. Scolium. If farm rent is only a fraction of the supposed product of the proprietor, whatever the amount and value of the property, the same is true in the case of a large number of small and distinct proprietors. For, although one man may use the property of each separately, he cannot use the property of all at the same time. To sum up, the right of increase, which can exist only within very narrow limits defined by the laws of production, is annihilated by the right of occupancy. Now, without the right of increase, there is no property. Then property is impossible. Fourth proposition. Property is impossible, because it is homicide. If the right of increase should be subjected to the laws of reason and justice, it would be reduced to an indemnity or reward whose maximum could never exceed, for a single labourer, a certain fraction of that which he is capable of producing. This we have just shown. But why should the right of increase, let us not fear to call it by its right name, the right of robbery, be governed by reason, with which it has nothing in common? The proprietor is not content with the increase allotted him by good sense and the nature of things, he demands ten times, a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times as much. By his own labour, his property would yield him a product equal only to one, and he demands of society no longer a right proportional to his productive capacity, but a per capita tax. He taxes his fellows in proportion to their strength, their number, and their industry. A son is born to a farmer. Good, says the proprietor, one more chance for increase. By what process has farm rent been thus changed into a poll tax? 
Why have our jurists and our theologians failed with all their shrewdness to check the extension of the right of increase? The proprietor, having estimated from his own productive capacity the number of laborers which his property will accommodate, divides it into as many portions and says, Each one shall yield me revenue. To increase his income, he has only to divide his property. Instead of reckoning the interest due him on his labor, he reckons it on his capital, and by this substitution, the same property, which in the hands of its owner is capable of yielding only one, is worth to him ten, a hundred, a thousand, a million. Consequently, he has only to hold himself in readiness to register the names of the laborers who apply to him. His task consists in drafting leases and receipts. Not satisfied with the lightness of his duty, the proprietor does not intend to bear even the deficit resulting from his idleness. He throws it upon the shoulders of the producer, of whom he always demands the same reward. When the farm rent of a piece of land is once raised to its highest point, the proprietor never lowers it. High prices, the scarcity of labor, the disadvantages of the season, even pestilence itself, have no effect upon him. Why should he suffer from hard times when he does not labor? Here commences a new series of phenomena. Say, who reasons with marvelous clearness whenever he assails taxation, but who is blind to the fact that the proprietor, as well as the tax-gatherer, steals from the tenant, and in the same manner, says in his second letter to Maltus, If the collector of taxes and those who employ him consume one-sixth of the products, they thereby compel the producers to feed, clothe, and support themselves on five-sixths of what they produce. They admit this, but say at the same time that it is possible for each one to live on five-sixths of what he produces. I admit that if they insist upon it, but I ask if they believe that the producer would live as well, in case they demanded of him, instead of one-sixth, two-sixths, or one-third of their products. No but he would still live. Then I ask whether he would still live in case they should rob him of two-thirds, then three-quarters, but I hear no reply. If the master of the French economists has been less blinded by his propriety prejudices, he would have seen that farm rent has precisely the same effect. Take a family of peasants composed of six persons, father, mother, and four children, living in the country and cultivating a small piece of ground. Let us suppose that by hard labour they manage, as the saying is, to make both ends meet, that, having lodged, warmed, clothed, and fed themselves, they are clear of debt, but have laid up nothing. Taking the years together, they contrive to live. If the year is prosperous, the father drinks a little more wine, the daughters buy themselves a dress, the sons a hat, they eat a little cheese and occasionally some meat. I say that these people are on the road to wreck and ruin. For, by the third corollary of our axiom, they owe to themselves the interest of their own capital. Estimating this capital at only 8,000 francs at 2.5%, there is an annual interest of 200 francs to be paid. If, then, these 200 francs, instead of being subtracted from the gross product to be saved and capitalized, are consumed there is an annual deficit of 200 francs in the family assets so that at the end of 40 years these good people without suspecting it will have eaten up their property and become bankrupt this result seems ridiculous it is a sad reality the conscription comes what is the conscription an act of property exercised over families by government without warning a robbery of men and money the peasants do not like to part with their sons. In that I do not think them wrong. It is hard for a young man of twenty to gain anything by life in the barracks. Unless he is depraved, he detests it. You can generally judge of a soldier's morality by his hatred of his uniform. Unfortunate wretches or worthless scamps, such is the make-up of the French army. This ought not to be the case, but so it is. Question a hundred thousand men, and not one will contradict my assertion. Our peasant, in redeeming his two conscripted sons, expends four thousand francs, which he borrows for that purpose, 
the interest on this at five per cent is two hundred francs a sum equal to that referred to above if up to this time the production of the family constantly balanced by its consumption has been one thousand two hundred francs or two hundred francs per person in order to pay this interest either the six laborers must produce as much as seven or must consume as little as five curtail consumption they cannot how can they curtail necessity to produce more is impossible they can work neither harder nor longer shall they take the middle course and consume five and a half while producing six and a half they would soon find that with the stomach there is no compromise that beyond a certain degree of abstinence it is impossible to go that strict necessity can be curtailed but little without injury to health and as for increasing the product there comes a storm a drought an epizootic and all the hopes of the farmer are dashed in short the rent will not be paid the interest will accumulate the farm will be seized and the possessor ejected thus a family which lived in prosperity while it abstained from exercising the right of property falls into misery as soon as the exercise of this right becomes a necessity property requires of the husbandman the double power of enlarging his land and fertilizing it by a simple command while a man is simply possessor of the land he finds in it means of subsistence as soon as he pretends to proprietorship it suffices him no longer being able to produce only that which he consumes the fruit of his labor is his recompense for his trouble nothing is left for the instrument required to pay what he cannot produce such is the condition of the tenant after the proprietor has retired from social production in order to speculate upon the labor of others by new methods let us now return to our first hypothesis the nine hundred laborers sure that their future production will equal that of the past are quite surprised after paying their farm rent to find themselves poorer by one tenth than they were the previous year in fact this tenth which was formerly produced and paid by the proprietor laborer who then took part in the production and paid part of the public expenses now has not been produced and has been paid it must then have been taken from the producer's consumption to choke this inexplicable deficit the laborer borrows confident of his intention and ability to return a confidence which is shaken the following year by a new loan plus the interest on the first from whom does he borrow from the proprietor the proprietor lends his surplus to the laborer and this surplus which he ought to return becomes being lent at interest a new source of profit to him then debts increase indefinitely the proprietor makes advances to the producer who never returns them and the latter constantly robbed and constantly borrowing from the robbers ends in bankruptcy defrauded of all that he had suppose that the proprietor who needs his tenant to furnish him with an income then releases him from his debt he will thus do a very benevolent deed which will procure for him a recommendation in the curate's prayers while the poor tenant overwhelmed by his unstinted charity and taught by his catechism to pray for his benefactors will promise to redouble his energy and suffer new hardships that he may discharge his debt to so kind a master this time he takes precautionary measures he raises the price of grains the manufacturer does the same with his products the reaction comes and after some fluctuation the farm rent which the tenant thought to put upon the manufacturer's shoulders becomes nearly balanced so that while he is congratulating himself upon his success he finds himself again impoverished but to an extent somewhat smaller than before for the rise having been general the proprietor suffers with the rest so that the laborers instead of being poorer by one-tenth lose only nine hundredths but always it is a debt which it necessitates a loan the payment of interest economy and fasting fasting for the nine hundredths which ought not to be paid and are paid fasting for the redemption of debts fasting to pay the interest on them let the crop fail and the fasting become starvation they say it is necessary to work more that means obviously that it is necessary to produce more 
by what conditions is production affected by the combined action of labor capital and land as for the labor the tenant undertakes to furnish it but capital is formed only by economy now if the tenant could accumulate anything he would pay his debts but granting that he has plenty of capital and what use would it be to him if the extent of the land which he cultivates always remained the same he needs to enlarge his farm will it be said finally that he must work harder and to better advantage but in our estimation of farm rent we have assumed the highest possible average of production were it not the highest the proprietor would increase the farm rent is not this the way in which the large landed proprietors have gradually raised their rents as fast as they have ascertained by the increase in population and the development of industry how much society can produce from their property the proprietor is a foreigner to society but like the vulture his eyes fixed upon his prey he holds himself ready to pounce upon and devour it the facts to which we have called attention in a community of one thousand persons are reproduced on a large scale in every nation and wherever human beings live but with infinite variations and in innumerable forms which it is no part of my intention to describe in fine property after having robbed the laborer by usury murders him slowly by starvation now without robbery and murder property cannot exist with robbery and murder it soon dies for want of support therefore it is impossible End of section 14 chapter 4 part 2 section 15 of what is property this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org what is property an inquiry into the principle of right and of government by pierre joseph proudhon translated by benjamin r tucker chapter 4 part 3 that property is impossible fifth proposition property is impossible because if it exists society devours itself when the ass is too heavily loaded he lies down man always moves on upon this indomitable courage the proprietor well knowing that it exists bases his hopes of speculation the free laborer produces ten for me thinks the proprietor he will produce twelve indeed before consenting to the confiscation of his field before bidding farewell to the paternal roof the peasant whose story we have just told makes a desperate effort he leases new land he will sow one-third more and taking half of this new product for himself he will harvest an additional sixth and thereby pay his rent what an evil to add one sixth to his production the farmer must add not one sixth but two sixths to his labor at such a price he pays a farm rent which in god's eyes he does not owe the tenant's example is followed by the manufacturer the former tills more land and dispossesses his neighbors the latter lowers the price of his merchandise and endeavors to monopolize its manufacture and sale and to crush out his competitors to satisfy property the laborer must first produce beyond his needs then he must produce beyond his strength for by the withdrawal of laborers who become proprietors the one always follows from the other but to produce beyond his strength and needs he must invade the production of another and consequently diminish the number of producers thus the proprietor after having lessened production by stepping outside lessens it still further by encouraging the monopoly of labor let us calculate it the laborer's deficit after paying his rent being as we have seen one-tenth he tries to increase his production by this amount he sees no way of accomplishing this save by increasing his labor this also he does the discontent of the proprietors who have not received the full amount of their rent 
the advantageous offers and promises made them by other farmers, whom they suppose more diligent, more industrious, and more reliable, the secret plots and intrigues, all these give rise to a movement for the redivision of labour, and the elimination of a certain number of producers. Out of nine hundred, ninety will be ejected, that the production of others may be increased one-tenth. But will the total product be increased? Not in the least. There will be eight hundred and ten labourers producing as nine hundred, while, to accomplish their purpose, they would have to produce as one thousand. Now, it having been proved that farm rent is proportional to the landed capital instead of to labour, and that it never diminishes, the debts must continue as in the past while the labour has increased. Here, then, we have a society which is continually decimating itself, and which would destroy itself, did not the periodical occurrence of failures, bankruptcies, and political and economical catastrophes re-establish equilibrium, and distract attention from the real causes of the universal distress. The monopoly of land and capital is followed by economical processes which also result in throwing labourers out of employment. Interest being a constant burden upon the shoulders of the farmer and the manufacturer, they exclaim, each speaking for himself, I should have the means wherewith to pay my rent and interest, had I not to pay so many hands. Then those admirable inventions, intended to assure the easy and speedy performance of labour, become so many infernal machines which kill labourers by thousands. A few years ago the Countess of Strafford ejected fifteen thousand persons from her estate who, as tenants, added to its value. This act of private administration was repeated in 1820 by another large Scotch proprietor towards six hundred tenants and their families. Tissot on Suicide and Revolt The author whom I quote, and who has written eloquent words concerning the revolutionary spirit which prevails in modern society, does not say whether he would have disapproved of a revolt on the part of these exiles. For myself, I avow boldly that in my eyes it would have been the first of rights, and the holiest of duties, and all that I desire today is that my profession of faith be understood. Society devours itself, one, by the violent and periodical sacrifice of labourers, this we have just seen, and shall see again, two, by the stoppage of the producer's consumption caused by property. These two modes of suicide are at first simultaneous, but soon the first is given additional force by the second, Famine uniting with usury to render labour at once more necessary and more scarce. By the principles of commerce and political economy, that an industrial enterprise may be successful, its product must furnish 1. the interest of the capital employed, 2. means for the preservation of this capital, 3. the wages of all the employees and contractors, further, as large a profit as possible must be realised. The financial shrewdness and rapacity of property is worthy of admiration. Each different name which increase takes affords the proprietor an opportunity to receive it. 1. In the form of interest. 2. In the form of profit. For, it says, a part of the income derived from manufacturers consists of interest on the capital employed. If 100,000 francs have been invested in a manufacturing enterprise, and in a year's time 5,000 francs have been received therefrom in addition to the expenses, there has been no profit, but only interest on the capital. Now the proprietor is not a man to labour for nothing. Like the lion in the fable, he gets paid in each of his capacities, so that, after he has been served, nothing is left for his associates. Ego primam tolo nominor quia leo, secundam quia sum fortis tributis mihi, tum quia plus valeo, me sequetur tertia, malo ad ficietur, 
si quis quartam te tigerit. I know nothing prettier than this fable. I am the contractor, I take the first chair. I am the labourer, I take the second. I am the capitalist, I take the third. I am the proprietor, I take the whole. In four lines, Phaedrus has summed up all the forms of property. I say that this interest, all the more than this profit, is impossible. What are labourers in relation to each other? So many members of a large industrial society, to each of whom is assigned a certain portion of the general production, by the principle of the division of labour and functions. Suppose, first, that this society is composed of but three individuals, a cattle raiser, a tanner, and a shoemaker. The social industry, then, is that of shoemaking. If I should ask what ought to be each producer's shares of the social product, the first schoolboy whom I should meet would answer, by a rule of commerce and association, that it should be one-third. But it is not our duty here to balance the rights of labourers conventionally associated. We have to prove that, whether associated or not, our three workers are obliged to act as if they were, that, whether they will or no, they are associated by the force of things, by mathematical necessity. Three processes are required in the manufacture of shoes, the rearing of cattle, the preparation of their hides, and the cutting and sewing. If the hide, on leaving the farmer's stable, is worth one, it is worth two on leaving the tanner's pit, and three on leaving the shoemaker's shop. Each labourer has produced a portion of the utility, so that, by adding all these portions together, we get the value of the article. To obtain any quantity whatever of this article, each producer must pay, then, first for his own labour, and second for the labour of the other producers. Thus, to obtain as many shoes as can be made from ten hides, the farmer will give thirty raw hides, and the tanner twenty tanned hides. For, the shoes that are made from ten hides are worth thirty raw hides, in consequence of the extra labour bestowed upon them, just as twenty tan hides are worth thirty raw hides, on account of the tanner's labour. But if the shoemaker demands thirty-three in the farmer's product, or twenty-two in the tanner's, for ten in his own, there will be no exchange. For, if there were, the farmer and the tanner, after having paid the shoemaker ten for his labour, would have to pay eleven for that which they had themselves sold for ten, which, of course, would be impossible. Footnote. There is an error in the author's calculation here. But the translator, feeling sure that the reader will understand Proudhon's meaning, prefers not to alter his figures. Translator. And a footnote. Well, this is precisely what happens whenever an emolument of any kind is received, be it called revenue, farm rent, interest, or profit. In the little community of which we are speaking, if the shoemaker, in order to procure tools, buy a stock of leather, and support himself until he receives something from his investment, borrows money at interest, it is clear that to pay this interest he will have to make a profit off the tanner and the farmer. But as this profit is impossible unless fraud is used, the interest will fall back upon the shoulders of the unfortunate shoemaker and ruin him. I have imagined a case of natural simplicity. There is no human society but sustains more than three vocations. The most uncivilized society supports numerous industries. Today, the number of industrial functions, I mean by industrial functions, all useful functions, exceeds, perhaps, a thousand. However numerous the occupations, the economic law remains the same. That the producer may live, his wages must repurchase his product. The economists cannot be ignorant of this rudimentary principle of their pretended science. Why, then, do they so obstinately defend property and inequality of wages and the legitimacy of usury and the honesty of profit, all of which contradict the economic law and make exchange impossible? A contractor pays 100,000 francs for raw material. 
fifty thousand francs in wages, and then expects to receive a product of two hundred thousand francs, that is, expects to make a profit on the material and on the labour of his employees. But if the labourers and the purveyor of the material cannot, with their combined wages, repurchase that which they have produced for the contractor, how can they live? I will develop my question. Here details become necessary. If the working man receives for his labour an average of three francs per day, his employer, in order to gain anything beyond his own salary, if only interest on his capital, must sell the day's labour of his employee, in the form of merchandise, for more than three francs. The working man cannot, then, repurchase that which he has produced for his master. It is thus with all trades whatsoever. The tailor, the hatter, the cabinet-maker, the blacksmith, the tanner, the mason, the jeweller, the printer, the clerk, etc., even to the farmer and wine-grower, cannot repurchase their products, since, producing for a master who in one form or another makes a profit, they are obliged to pay more for their own labour than they get for it. In France, twenty millions of labourers, engaged in all the branches of science, art, and industry, produce everything which is useful to man. Their annual wages amount, it is estimated, to twenty thousand millions. But, in consequence of the right of property, and the multifarious forms of increase, premiums, tithes, interests, fines, profits, farm rents, house rents, revenues, emoluments of every nature and description, their products are estimated by their proprietors and employers at twenty-five thousand millions. What does that signify? That the labourers, who are obliged to repurchase these products in order to live, must either pay five for that which they produced for four, or fast one day in five. If there is an economist in France able to show that this calculation is false, I summon him to appear, and I promise to retract all that I have wrongfully and wickedly uttered in my attacks upon property. Let us now look at the results of this profit. If the wages of the working men were the same in all pursuits, the deficit caused by the proprietor's tax would be felt equally everywhere, but also the cause of the evil would be so apparent that it would soon be discovered and suppressed. But, as there is the same inequality of wages, from that of the scavenger up to that of the minister of state, as of property, robbery continually rebounds from the stronger to the weaker, so that, since the labourer finds his hardships increase as he descends in a social scale, the lowest class of people are literally stripped naked and eaten alive by the others. The labouring people can buy neither the cloth which they weave, nor the furniture which they manufacture, nor the metal which they forge, nor the jewels which they cut, nor the prints which they engrave. They can procure neither the wheat which they plant, nor the wine which they grow, nor the flesh of the animals which they raise. They are allowed neither to dwell in the houses which they build, nor to attend the place which their labour supports, nor to enjoy the rest which their body requires. And why? Because the right of increase does not permit these things to be sold at the cost price, which is all that labourers can afford to pay. On the signs of those magnificent warehouses which he in his poverty admires, the labourer reads in large letters, This is thy work, and thou shalt not have it. Sic was non vobis. Every manufacturer who employs one thousand labourers, and gains from them daily one sou each, is slowly pushing them into a state of misery. Every man who makes a profit has entered into a conspiracy with famine. But the whole nation has not even this labour, by means of which property starves it. And why? Because the workers are forced by the insufficiency of their wages to monopolise labour, and because, before being destroyed by dearth, they destroy each other by competition. 
let us pursue this truth no further. If the laborer's wages will not purchase his product, it follows that the product is not made for the producer. For whom, then, is it intended? For the richer consumer, that is, for only a fraction of society. But when the whole society labors, it produces for the whole society. If, then, only a part of society consumes, sooner or later a part of society will be idle. Now, idleness is death, as well for the laborer as for the proprietor. This conclusion is inevitable. The most distressing spectacle imaginable is the sight of producers resisting and struggling against this mathematical necessity, this power of figures to which their prejudices blind them. If one hundred thousand printers can furnish reading matter enough for thirty-four millions of men, and if the price of books is so high that only one-third of that number can afford to buy them, it is clear that these one hundred thousand printers will produce three times as much as the booksellers can sell, that the products of the laborers may never exceed the demands of the consumers, the laborers must either rest two days out of three, or separating into three groups, relieve each other three times a week, month, or quarter. That is, during two-thirds of their life they must not live. But industry, under the influence of property, does not proceed with such regularity. It endeavors to produce a great deal in a short time, because the greater the amount of products, and the shorter the time of production, the less each product costs. As soon as a demand begins to be felt, the factories fill up, and everybody goes to work. Then business is lively, and both governors and governed rejoice. But the more they work today, the more idle will they be hereafter. The more they laugh, the more they shall weep. Under the rule of property, the flowers of industry are woven into none but funeral wreaths. The laborer digs his own grave. If the factory stops running, the manufacturer has to pay interest on his capital the same as before. He naturally tries, then, to continue production by lessening expenses. Then comes the lowering of wages, the introduction of machinery, the employment of women and children to do the work of men, bad workmen and wretched work. They still produce because the decreased cost creates a larger market but they do not produce long, because the cheapness being due to the quantity and rapidity of production, the productive power tends more than ever to outstrip consumption. It is when laborers, whose wages are scarcely sufficient to support them from one day to another, are thrown out of work, that the consequences of the principle of property becomes most frightful. They have not been able to economize, they have made no savings, they have accumulated no capital whatever to support them even one day more. Today the factory is closed. Tomorrow the people starve in the streets. Day after tomorrow they will either die in the hospital or eat in the jail. And still new misfortunes come to complicate this terrible situation. In consequence of the cessation of business and the extreme cheapness of merchandise, the manufacturer finds it impossible to pay the interest on his borrowed capital, whereupon his frightened creditors hasten to withdraw their funds. Production is suspended, and labor comes to a standstill. Then people are astonished to see capital desert commerce and throw itself upon the stock exchange, and I once heard Mr. Blanky bitterly lamenting the blind ignorance of capitalists. The cause of this movement of capital is very simple, but for that very reason an economist could not understand it, or rather must not explain it. The cause lies solely in competition. I mean by competition not only the rivalry between two parties engaged in the same business, but the general and simultaneous effort of all kinds of business to get ahead of each other. This effort is today so strong that the price of merchandise scarcely covers the cost of production and distribution, so that the wages of all laborers being lessened, nothing remains, not even interest, for the capitalists. 
The primary cause of commercial and industrial stagnations is, then, interest on capital. That interest which the ancients, with one accord, branded with the name of usury, whenever it was paid for the use of money, but which they did not dare to condemn in the forms of house rent, farm rent, or profit, as if the nature of the thing lent could ever warrant a charge for the lending, that is, robbery. In proportion to the increase received by the capitalists will be the frequency and intensity of commercial crises. The first being given, we always can determine the two others, and vice versa. Do you wish to know the regulator of a society? Ascertain the amount of active capital, that is, the capital-bearing interest, and the legal rate of this interest. The course of events will be a series of overturns, whose number and violence will be proportional to the activity of capital. In 1839, the number of failures in Paris alone was 1,064. This proportion was kept up in the early months of 1840, and, as I write these lines, the crisis is not yet ended. It is said, further, that the number of houses which have wound up their business is greater than the number of declared failures. By this flood, we may judge the water-spout's power of suction. The decimation of society is now imperceptible and permanent, now periodical and violent. It depends upon the course which property takes. In a country where the property is pretty evenly distributed, and where little business is done, the rights and claim of each being balanced by those of others, the power of invasion is destroyed. There, it may be truly said, Property does not exist, since the right of increase is scarcely exercised at all. The condition of the labourers, as regards security of life, is almost the same as if absolute equality prevailed among them. They are deprived of all the advantages of full and free association, but their existence is not endangered in the least. With the exception of a few isolated victims of the right of property, of this misfortune whose primary cause no one perceives, the society appears to rest calmly in the bosom of this sort of equality. But have a care, it is balanced on the edge of a sword. At the slightest shock, it will fall and meet with death. Ordinarily, the whirlpool of property localizes itself. On the one hand, farm rent stops at a certain point. On the other, in consequence of competition and overproduction, the price of manufactured goods does not rise, so that the condition of the peasant varies but little, and depends mainly on the seasons. The devouring action of property bears, then, principally upon business. We commonly say commercial crisis, not agricultural crisis, because while the farmer is eaten up slowly by the right of increase, the manufacturer is swallowed at a single mouthful. This leads to the cessation of business, the destruction of fortunes, and the inactivity of the working people, who die one after another on the highways and in the hospitals, prisons, and gullies. To sum up this proposition, property sells products to the labourer for more than it pays him for them. Therefore, it is impossible. End of chapter 4 Fifth proposition. Recording by Sylvie Brown, Verdun, France. Section 16 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Chapter 4, Part 4. That Property is Impossible. Appendix to the fifth proposition. 1. Certain reformers, and even the most of the publicists, who, though belonging to no particular school, busy themselves in devising means for the amelioration of the lot of the poorer and more numerous class, lay much stress nowadays on a better organization of labor. The disciples of Fourier, especially, never stop shouting, On to the phalanx, declaiming in the same breath against the foolishness and absurdity of other sects. They consist of half a dozen incomparable geniuses who have discovered that five and four make nine, take two away, and nine remain, and who weep over the blindness of France, 
who refuses to believe in this astonishing arithmetic fourier having to multiply a whole number by a fraction never failed they say to obtain a product much greater than the multiplicand he affirmed that under his system of harmony the mercury would solidify when the temperature was above zero he might as well have said that harmonians would make burning eyes i once asked an intelligent phalansterian what he thought of such physics i do not know he answered but i believe and yet the same man disbelieved in the doctrine of the real presence in fact the fourierists proclaim themselves on the one hand defenders of property of the right of increase which they have thus formulated to each according to his capital his labor and his skill on the other hand they wish the working man to come into the enjoyment of all the wealth of society that is abridging the expression into the undivided enjoyment of his own product is not this like saying to the working man labor you shall have three francs per day you shall live on fifty-five sous you shall give the rest to the proprietor and thus you will consume three francs if the above speech is not an exact epitome of charles fourier's system i will subscribe to the whole phalansterian folly with a pen dipped in my own blood of what use is it to reform industry and agriculture of what use indeed to labor at all if property is maintained and labor can never meet its expenses without the abolition of property the organization of labor is neither more nor less than a delusion if protection should be quadrupled a thing which does not seem to me at all impossible it would be labor lost if the additional product was not consumed it would be of no value and the proprietor would decline to receive it as interest if it was consumed all the disadvantages of property would reappear it must be confessed that the theory of passionate attraction is greatly at fault in this particular and that fourier when he tried to harmonize the passion for property a bad passion whatever he may say to the contrary blocked his own chariot wheels the absurdity of the phalansterian economy is so gross that many people suspect fourier in spite of all the homage paid by him to proprietors of having been a secret enemy of property this opinion might be supported by plausible arguments still it is not mine charlatanism was too important a part for such a man to play and sincerity too insignificant a one i would rather think fourier ignorant which is generally admitted than disingenuous as for his disciples before they can formulate any opinion of their own they must declare once for all unequivocally and with no mental reservation whether they mean to maintain property or not and what they mean by their famous motto to each according to his capital his labor and his skill two but some half-converted proprietor will observe would it not be possible by suppressing the bank incomes farm rent house rent usury of all kinds and finally property itself to proportion products to capacities that was saint simon's idea it was also fourier's it is the desire of human conscience and no decent person would dare maintain that a minister of state should live no better than a peasant o oh, meters your ears are long what will you never understand that disparity of wages and the right of increase are one and the same certainly st thomas fourier and their respective flocks committed a serious blunder in attempting to unite the one inequality and communism the other inequality and property but you a man of figures a man of economy you who know by heart your logarithmic tables how can you make so stupid a mistake does not political economy itself teach you that the product of a man whatever be his individual capacity is never worth more than his labor and that a man's labor is worth no more than his consumption you remind me of that great constitution framer poor pinero ferreira the sayers of the nineteenth century who dividing the citizens of a nation into twelve classes or if you prefer into twelve grades assigned to some a salary of one hundred thousand francs each to others eighty thousand then twenty five thousand fifteen thousand ten thousand etc down to one thousand five hundred and one thousand francs the minimum allowance of a citizen pinero loved distinctions and could no more conceive of a state without great dignitaries than of an army without drum majors and as he also loved or thought he loved liberty equality and fraternity he combined the good and the evil of our old society in an eclectic philosophy which he embodied in a constitution excellent pinero liberty even to passive submission fraternity even to identity of language equality even in the jury-box and the guillotine 
such was his ideal republic unappreciated genius of whom the present century was unworthy but whom the future will avenge listen proprietor inequality of talent exists in fact in right it is not admissible it goes for nothing it is not thought of one newton in a century is equal to thirty millions of men the psychologist admires the rarity of so fine a genius the legislator sees only the rarity of the function now rarity of function bestows no privilege upon the functionary and that for several reasons all equally forcible first rarity of genius was not in the creator's design a motive to compel society to go down on its knees before the man of superior talents but a providential means for the performance of all functions to the greatest advantage of all second talent is a creation of society rather than a gift of nature it is an accumulated capital of which the receiver is only the guardian without society without the education and powerful assistance which it furnishes the finest nature would be inferior to the most ordinary capacities in the very respect in which it ought to shine the more extensive a man's knowledge the more luxuriant his imagination the more versatile his talent the more costly his education been the more remarkable and numerous were his teachers and his models and the greater is his debt the farm produces from the time that he leaves his cradle until he enters his grave the fruits of art and science are late and scarce frequently the tree dies before the fruit ripens society in cultivating talent makes a sacrifice to hope third capacities have no common standard of comparison the conditions of development being equal inequality of talent is simply speciality of talent fourth inequality of wages like the right of increase is economically impossible take the most favorable case that where each labor has furnished its maximum production that there may be an equitable distribution of products the share of each must be equal to the quotient of the total production divided by the number of laborers this done what remains wherewith to pay the higher wages nothing whatever would it be said that all laborers should be taxed but then their consumption will not be equal to their production their wages will not pay for the productive service they will not be able to repurchase the product and we shall once more be afflicted with all the calamities of property i do not speak of the injustice done to the defrauded laborer of rivalry of excited ambition and burning hatred these may all be important considerations but they do not hit the point on the one hand each laborer's task being short and easy and the means for its successful accomplishment being equal in all cases how could there be large and small producers on the other hand all functions being equal either on account of the actual equivalence of talents and capacities on account of social cooperation how could a functionary claim a salary proportional to the worth of his genius but what do i say in equality wages are always proportional to talents what is the economical meaning of wages the reproductive consumption of the laborer the very act by which the labor produces constitutes then this consumption exactly equal to his production of which we are speaking when the astronomer produces observations the poet verses or the seven experiments they consume instruments books travels etc etc now if society supplies this consumption what more can the astronomer the servant or the poet demand we must conclude then that in equality and only in equality st simon's adage to each according to his capacity to each capacity according to its results finds its full and complete application three the great evil the horrible and ever-present evil arising from property is that while property exists population however reduced is and always must be overabundant complaints have been made in all ages of the excess of population in all ages property has been embarrassed by the presence of pauperism not perceiving that it caused it further nothing is more curious than the diversity of the plans proposed for its extermination their atrocity is equalled only by their absurdity the ancients made a practice of abandoning their children the wholesale and retail slaughter of slaves civil and foreign wars also lent their aid in rome where property held full sway these three means were employed so effectively and for so long a time that finally the empire found itself without inhabitants when the barbarians arrived nobody was to be found the fields were no longer cultivated grass grew in the streets of the italian cities 
in china from time immemorial upon famine alone has devolved the task of sweeping away the poor the people living almost exclusively upon rice if an accident causes the crop to fail in a few days hunger kills the inhabitants by myriads and the chinese historian records in the annals of the empire that in such a year of such an emperor twenty thirty fifty one hundred thousand inhabitants died of starvation then they bury the dead and recommence the production of children until another famine leads to the same result such appears to have been in all ages the confucian economy i borrow the following facts from a modern economist since the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries england has been preyed upon by pauperism at that time beggars were punished by law nevertheless she had not one-fourth as large a population as she has to-day edward prohibits almsgiving on pain of imprisonment the laws of fifteen forty seven and sixteen fifty six prescribe a like punishment in case of a second offence elizabeth orders that each parish shall support its own paupers but what is a pauper charles the second decides that an undisputed residence of forty days constitutes a settlement in a parish but if disputed the newcomer is forced to pack off james the second modifies this decision which is again modified by william in the midst of trials reports and modifications pauperism increases and the working man languishes and dies the poor tax in seventeen seventy four exceeded forty millions of francs in seventeen eighty three four and five it averaged fifty three millions eighteen thirteen more than a hundred and eighty seven millions five hundred thousand francs eighteen sixteen two hundred and fifty millions in eighteen seventeen it is estimated at three hundred and seventeen millions in eighteen twenty one the number of paupers enrolled upon the parish lists was estimated at four millions nearly one-third of the population france in fifteen forty four francis i establishes a compulsory tax in behalf of the poor in fifteen sixty six and fifteen eighty six the same principle is applied to the whole kingdom under louis the fourteenth forty thousand paupers infested the capital as many in proportion as to-day mendicity was punished severely in seventeen forty parliament of paris re-establishes within its own jurisdiction the compulsory assessment the constituent assembly frightened at the extent of the evil and the difficulty of curing it ordains the status quo the convention proclaims assistance of the poor to be national debt its law remains unexecuted napoleon also wishes to remedy the evil he said a year is imprisonment in that way said he i shall protect the rich from the importunity of beggars and shall relieve them of the disgusting sight of abject poverty o oh, wonderful man from these facts which i might multiply still farther two things are to be inferred the one that pauperism is independent of population the other that all attempts hitherto made at its extermination have proved abortive catholicism founds hospitals and convents and commands charity that is she encourages mendicity that is the extent of her insights as voiced by her priests the secular power of christian nations now orders taxes on the rich now banishment and imprisonment for the poor that is on the one hand violation of the right of property and on the other civil death and murder the modern economists thinking that pauperism is caused by the excess of population exclusively have devoted themselves to devising checks some wish to prohibit the poor from marrying thus having denounced religious celibacy they propose compulsory celibacy which will inevitably become licentious celibacy others do not approve this method which they deem too violent and which they say deprives the poor man of the only pleasure which he knows in this world they would simply recommend him to be prudent this opinion is held by malthus sismondi say Dro, duchatel etc but if the poor are to be prudent the rich must set the example why should the marriageable age of the latter be fixed at eighteen years while that of the former is postponed until thirty again they would do well to explain clearly what they mean by this matrimonial prudence which they so urgently recommend to the labourer for here equivocation is especially dangerous and i suspect that the economists are not thoroughly understood some half enlightened ecclesiastics are alarmed when they hear prudence in marriage advised they fear that the divine injunction increase and multiply is to be set aside to be logical they must anathematize bachelors J. Drault, Political Economy. Monsieur Drault is too honest a man and too little of a theologian to see why these casuists are so alarmed, and his chaste ignorance is the very best evidence of the purity of his heart. 
Religion never has encouraged early marriages, and the kind of prudence which it condemns is that described in this Latin sentence from Sanchez. An liset ob metum liberorum semen extra was eiitere. This du de tracy seems to dislike prudence in either form. He says, I confess that I no more share the desire of the moralists to diminish and restrain our pleasures than that of the politicians to increase our procreative powers and accelerate reproduction. He believes then that we should love and marry when and as we please. Widespread misery results from love and marriage, but this our philosopher does not heed. True to the dogma of the necessity of evil, to evil he looks for the solution of all problems. He adds, the multiplication of men continuing in all classes of society, the surplus members of the upper classes are supported by the lower classes, and those of the latter are destroyed by poverty. This philosophy has few avowed partisans, but it has over every other the indisputable advantage of demonstration in practice. Not long since France heard it advocated in the Chamber of Deputies in the course of the discussion on the electoral reform. Poverty will always exist. That is the political aphorism with which the Minister of State ground to powder the arguments of Monsieur Arago. Poverty will always exist, yes, so long as property does. The Fourierists, inventors of so many marvellous contrivances, could not in this field belie their character. They invented four methods of checking increase of population at will. First, the vigour of women. On this point they are contradicted by experience, for, although vigorous women may be less likely to conceive, nevertheless they give birth to the healthiest children, so that the advantage of maternity is on their side. Second, integral exercise or the equal development of all the physical powers. If this development is equal, how is the power of reproduction lessened? Third, the gastronomic regime, or, in plain English, the philosophy of the belly. The Fourierists say that abundance of rich food renders women sterile, just as too much sap, while enhancing the beauty of flowers, destroys their reproductive capacity. But the analogy is a false one. Flowers become sterile when the stamens, or male organs, are changed into petals, as may be seen by inspecting a rose, and then through excessive dampness the pollen loses its fertilizing power. Then, in order that the gastronomic regime may produce the results claimed for it, not only must the females be fattened, but the males must be rendered impotent. Fourth, phanerogamic morality, or public concubinage. I know not why the phalansterians use Greek words to convey ideas which can be expressed so clearly in French. This method, like the preceding one, is copied from civilized customs. Fourier himself cites the example of prostitutes as a proof. Now we have no certain knowledge yet of the facts which he quotes. So states Perron du Châtelet in his work on prostitution. From all the information which I have been able to gather, I find that all the remedies for pauperism and fecundity, sanctioned by universal practice, philosophy, political economy, and the latest reformers, may be summed up in the following list. Masturbation, onanism, footnote, hoc inter se differunt onanismus, et manus pratio, nempe quot, hec a solitario exercetur, ille autem a duobus reciprocatur, Masulo silicet et femina. Poro födam hanc onanismi venerem ludentes uxoria mariti habent nunc omnigam sovissimam. End of footnote. Sodomy, tribadi, polyandry, footnote, polyandry, plurality of husbands. End of footnote. Prostitution, castration, continence, abortion, and infanticide. Footnote. Infanticide has just been publicly advocated in England in a pamphlet written by a disciple of Malthus. He proposes an annual massacre of the innocents, in all families containing more children than the law allows. And he asks that a magnificent cemetery adorned with statues, groves, fountains and flowers be set apart as a special burying place for the superfluous children. Mothers would resort to this delightful spot to dream of the happiness of these little angels, and would return, quite comforted, to give birth to others, to be buried in their turn. And a footnote. All these methods being proved inadequate, there remains proscription. Unfortunately, proscription, while decreasing the number of the poor, increases their proportion. If the interest charged by the proprietor upon the product is equal only to one-twentieth of the product, by law it is equal to one-twentieth of the capital. 
it follows that twenty laborers produce for nineteen only because there is one among them called proprietor who eats a share of two suppose that the twentieth laborer the poor one is killed the production of the following year will be diminished one twentieth consequently the nineteenth will have to yield his portion and perish for since it is not one twentieth of the production of nineteen which must be paid to the proprietor but one twentieth of the product of twenty see third proposition each surviving laborer must sacrifice one twentieth plus one four hundredth of his product in other words one man out of nineteen must be killed therefore while property exists the more poor people we kill the more they are born in proportion malthus who proved so clearly that population increases in geometrical progression while production increases only in arithmetical progression did not notice this pauperizing power of property had he observed this he would have understood that before trying to check reproduction the right of increase should be abolished because wherever that right is tolerated there are always too many inhabitants whatever the extent of fertility of the soul it will be asked perhaps how i would maintain a balance between population and production for sooner or later this problem must be solved the reader will pardon me if i do not give my method here for in my opinion it is useless to say a thing unless we prove it now to explain my method fully would require no less than a formal treatise it is the thing so simple and so vast so common and so extraordinary so true and so misunderstood so sacred and so profane that to name it without developing and proving it would serve only to excite contempt in incredulity one thing at a time let us establish equality and this remedy will soon appear for truths follow each other just as crimes and errors do End of section sixteen, chapter four, part four. Recorded by Julie Niedermeyer. Section seventeen of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Chapter 4, Part 5. That property is impossible. Sixth Proposition. Property is impossible because it is the mother of tyranny. What is government? Government is public economy, the supreme administrative power over public works and national possessions. Now the nation is like a vast society in which all the citizens are stockholders. Each one has a deliberative voice in the assembly, and if the shares are equal, has one vote at his disposal. But under the regime of property, there is great inequality between the shares of stockholders. Therefore, one may have several hundred votes, while another has only one. If, for example, I enjoy an income of one million, that is, if I am the proprietor of a fortune of thirty or forty millions well invested, and if this fortune constitutes one thirty thousandth of the national capital, it is clear that the public administration of my property would form one thirty thousandth of the duties of the government, and if the nation had a population of thirty-four millions, that I should have as many votes as one thousand one hundred and thirty-three simple stockholders. Thus, when Mr. Arago demands the right of suffrage for all members of the National Guard, he is perfectly right since every citizen is enrolled for at least one national share which entitles him to one vote but the illustrious orator ought at the same time to demand that each elector shall have as many votes as he has shares as is the case in commercial associations for to do otherwise is to pretend that the nation has a right to dispose of the property of individuals without consulting them which is contrary to the right of property in a country where property exists, equality of electoral rights is a violation of property. Now, if each citizen's sovereignty must and ought to be proportional to his property, it follows that the small stockholders are at the mercy of the larger ones, who will, as soon as they choose, make slaves of the former, marry them at pleasure, take from them their wives, castrate their sons, prostitute their daughters, throw the aged to the sharks, and finally will be forced to serve themselves in the same way, unless they prefer to tax themselves for the support of their servants. In such a condition is Great Britain today. 
John Bull, caring little for liberty, equality, or dignity, prefers to serve and beg. But you, Bonhomme Jacques? Property is incompatible with political and civil equality. Then property is impossible. Historical Comments 1. When the vote of the Third Estate was doubled by the States General of 1789, property was grossly violated. The nobility and the clergy possessed three-fourths of the soil of France. They should have controlled three-fourths of the vote in the national representation. To double the vote of the Third Estate was just, it is said, since the people paid nearly all the taxes. This argument would be sound if there were nothing to be voted upon but taxes. But it was a question at that time of reforming the government and the constitution. Consequently, the doubling of the vote of the Third Estate was a usurpation and an attack on property. 2. If the present representatives of the radical opposition should come into power, they would work a reform by which every National Guard should be an elector and every elector eligible for office an attack on property. They would lower the rate of interest on public funds, an attack on property. They would, in the interest of the public, pass laws to regulate the exportation of capital and wheat, an attack on property. They would alter the assessment of taxes, an attack on property. They would educate the people gratuitously, a conspiracy against property. They would organize labor, that is, they would guarantee labor to the working man, and give him a share in the profits, the abolition of property. Now these same radicals are zealous defenders of property, a radical proof that they know not what they do nor what they wish. 3. Since property is the grand cause of privilege and despotism, the form of the Republican oath should be changed. Instead of, I swear hatred to royalty, henceforth the new member of a secret society should say, I swear hatred to property. Seventh proposition. Property is impossible because in consuming its receipts it loses them. In hoarding them it nullifies them, and in using them as capital it turns them against production. 1. If, with the economists, we consider the labourers as a living machine, we must regard the wages paid to him as the amount necessary to support this machine and keep it in repair. The head of a manufacturing establishment who employs labourers at three, five, ten, and fifteen francs per day, and who charges twenty francs for his superintendence, does not regard his disbursements as losses, because he knows they will return to him in the form of products. Consequently, labour and reproductive consumption are identical. What is the proprietor? He is a machine which does not work, or which working for its own pleasure, and only when it sees fit, produces nothing. What is it to consume as a proprietor? It is to consume without working, to consume without reproducing. For, once more, that which the proprietor consumes as a labourer comes back to him. He does not give his labour in exchange for his property, since if he did, he would thereby cease to be a proprietor. In consuming as a labourer, the proprietor gains, or at least does not lose, since he recovers that which he consumes. In consuming as a proprietor, he impoverishes himself. To enjoy property, then, it is necessary to destroy it. To be a real proprietor, one must cease to be a proprietor. The labourer who consumes his wages is a machine which destroys and reproduces. The proprietor who consumes his income is a bottomless gulf, sand which we water, a stone which we sow. So true is this that the proprietor, neither wishing nor knowing how to produce, and perceiving that as fast as he uses his property, he destroys it for ever, has taken the precaution to make someone produce in his place. That is what political economy, speaking in the name of eternal justice, calls producing by his capital, producing by his tools. And that is what ought to be called producing by a slave, producing as a thief and as a tyrant. He, the proprietor, produce. The robber might say as well, I produce. The consumption of the proprietor has been styled luxury, in opposition to useful consumption. From what has just been said, we see that great luxury can prevail in a nation which is not rich, 
that poverty even increases with luxury and vice versa the economists so much credit must be given to them at least have caused such a horror of luxury that today a very large number of proprietors not to say almost all ashamed of their idleness labor economize and capitalize they have jumped from the frying pan into the fire i cannot repeat it too often the proprietor who thinks to deserve his income by working and who receives wages for his labor is a functionary who gets paid twice that is the only difference between the idle proprietor and a laboring proprietor by his labor the proprietor produces his wages only not his income and since his condition enables him to engage in the most lucrative pursuits it may be said that the proprietor's labor harms society more than it helps it whatever the proprietor does the consumption of his income is an actual loss which his salaried functions neither repair nor justify and which would annihilate property were it not continually replenished by outside production two then the proprietor who consumes annihilates the product he does much worse if he lays it up the things which he lays by pass into another world nothing more is seen of them not even the caput mortuum the smoke if we had some means of transportation by which to travel to the moon and if the proprietors should be seized with a sudden fancy to carry their savings thither at the end of a certain time our terraqueous planet would be transported by them to its satellite the proprietor who lays up products will neither allow others to enjoy them nor enjoy them himself for him there is neither possession nor property like the miser he broods over his treasures he does not use them he may feast his eyes upon them he may lie down with them he may sleep with them in his arms all very fine but coins do not breed coins no real property without enjoyment no enjoyment without consumption no consumption without loss of property such is the inflexible necessity to which god's judgment compels the proprietor to bend a curse upon property three the proprietor who instead of consuming his income uses it as capital turns it against production and thereby makes it impossible for him to exercise his right for the more he increases the amount of interest to be paid upon it the more he is compelled to diminish wages now the more he diminishes wages that is the less he devotes to the maintenance and repair of the machines the more he diminishes the quantity of labor and with the quantity of labor the quantity of product and with the quantity of product the very source of his income this is clearly shown by the following example take an estate consisting of arable land meadows and vineyards containing the dwellings of the owner and the tenant the worth together with the farming implements one hundred thousand francs the rate of increase being three per cent if instead of consuming his revenue the proprietor uses it not in enlarging but in beautifying his estate can he annually demand of his tenant an additional ninety francs on account of the three thousand francs which he has thus added to his capital certainly not for on such conditions the tenant though producing no more than before would soon be obliged to labor for nothing what do i say to actually suffer loss in order to hold his lease in fact revenue can increase only as productive soil increases it is useless to build walls of marble and work with plows of gold but since it is impossible to go on acquiring for ever to add estate to estate to continue one's possessions as the latins said and since moreover the proprietor always has means wherewith to capitalize it follows that the exercise of his right finally becomes impossible well in spite of this impossibility property capitalizes and in capitalizing increases its revenue and without stopping to look at the particular cases which occur in commerce manufacturing operations and banking i will cite a graver fact one which directly affects all citizens i mean the indefinite increase of the budget the taxes increase every year it would be difficult to tell in which department of the government the expenses increase for who can boast of any knowledge as to the budget on this point the ablest financiers continually disagree what is to be thought i ask of the science of government 
when its professors cannot understand one another's figures Whatever be the immediate causes of this growth of the budget It is certain that taxation increases at a rate which causes everybody to despair Everybody sees it everybody acknowledges it, but nobody seems to understand the primary cause footnote the financial situation of the English government was shown up in the House of Lords during the session of January 23rd. It is not an encouraging one. For several years the expenses have exceeded the receipts, and the minister has been able to re-establish the balance only by loans renewed annually. The combined deficits of the years 1838 to 1839 amount to 47,500,000 francs. In 1840, the excess of expenses over receipts is expected to be 22,500,000 francs. Attention was called to these figures by Lord Ripon. Lord Melbourne replied, quote, The noble Earl unhappily was right in declaring that the public expenses continually increase, and with him, I must say, there is no room for hope that they can be diminished or met in any way. Unquote. National January twenty sixth, eighteen forty. End of footnote. Now I say that it cannot be otherwise, that it is necessary and inevitable. A nation is the tenant of a rich proprietor called the government, to whom it pays for the use of the soil a farm rent called a tax. Whenever the government makes war, loses or gains a battle, changes the outfit of its army, erects a monument, digs a canal, opens a road or builds a railway it borrows money on which the taxpayers pay interest that is the government without adding to its productive capacity increases its active capital in a word capitalizes after the manner of the proprietor of whom i have just spoken now when a government loan is once contracted and the interest is once stipulated the budget cannot be reduced for to accomplish that, either the capitalists must relinquish their interest, which would involve an abandonment of property, or the government must go into bankruptcy, which would be a fraudulent denial of the political principle, or it must pay the debt, which would require another loan, or it must reduce expenses, which is impossible, since the loan was contracted for the sole reason that the ordinary receipts were insufficient or the money expended by the government must be reproductive, which requires an increase in productive capacity, a condition excluded by our hypothesis. Or, finally, the taxpayers must submit to a new tax in order to pay the debt. An impossible thing. For if this new tax were levied upon all citizens alike, half, or even more, of the citizens would be unable to pay it. If the rich had to bear the whole, it would be a forced contribution, an invasion of property. Long financial experience has shown that the method of loans, though exceedingly dangerous, is much surer, more convenient, and less costly than any other method. Consequently, the government borrows, that is, goes on capitalizing, and increases the budget. Then, a budget, instead of ever diminishing, must necessarily and continually increase. It is astonishing that the economists, with all their learning, have failed to perceive a fact so simple and so evident. If they have perceived it, why have they neglected to condemn it? Historical comment. Much interest is felt at present in the financial operation which is expected to result in a reduction of the budget. It is proposed to change the present rate of increase 5%. Laying aside the politico-legal question to deal only with the financial question, is it not true that, when 5% is changed to 4%, it will then be necessary, for the same reasons, to change 4 to 3, then 3 to 2, then 2 to 1, and finally to sweep away any increase altogether? But that would be the advent of equality of conditions and the abolition of property. Now it seems to me that an intelligent nation should voluntarily meet an inevitable revolution halfway, instead of suffering itself to be dragged after the car of inflexible necessity eighth proposition property is impossible because its power of accumulation is infinite and is exercised only over finite quantities if men living in equality should grant to one of their number the exclusive right of property and this sole proprietor should lend one hundred 
francs to the human race at compound interest payable to his descendants twenty-four generations hence at the end of six hundred years this sum of one hundred francs at five per cent would amount to one hundred and seven trillion eight hundred and fifty four billion ten million seven hundred and seventy seven thousand six hundred francs two thousand six hundred and ninety six and one third times the capital of france supposing her capital to be forty billion or more than twenty times the value of the terrestrial globe suppose that a man in the reign of st louis had borrowed one hundred francs and had refused he and his heirs after him to return it even though it were known that the said heirs were not the rightful possessors and the prescription had been interrupted always at the right moment nevertheless by our laws the last heir would be obliged to return the one hundred francs with interest and interest on the interest which in all would amount as we have seen to nearly one hundred and eight thousand billions every day fortunes are growing in our midst much more rapidly than this the preceding example supposed the interest equal to one twentieth of the capital it often equals one tenth one fifth one half of the capital and sometimes the capital itself the fourierists irreconcilable enemies of equality whose partisans they regard as sharks intend by quadrupling production to satisfy all the demands of capital labor and skill but should production be multiplied by four ten or even one hundred property would soon absorb by its own power of accumulation and the effects of its capitalization both products and capital and the land and even the laborers is the phalanstery to be prohibited from capitalizing and lending at interest let it explain then what it means by property i will carry these calculations no farther they are capable of infinite variation upon which it would be puerile for me to insist i only ask by what standard judges called upon to decide a suit for possession fix the interest and developing the question i ask did the legislator in introducing into the republic the principle of property weigh all the consequences did he know the law of the possible if he knew it why is it not in the code why is so much latitude allowed to the proprietor in accumulating property and charging interest to the judge in recognizing and fixing the domain of property to the state in its power to levy new taxes continually at what point is the nation justified in repudiating the budget the tenant his farm rent and the manufacturer the interest on his capital how far may the idler take advantage of the laborer where does the right of spoliation begin and where does it end when may the producer say to the proprietor i owe you nothing more when is property satisfied when must it cease to steal if the legislator did know the law of the possible and disregarded it what must be thought of his justice if he did not know it what must be thought of his wisdom either wicked or foolish how can we recognize his authority if our charters and our codes are based upon an absurd hypothesis what is taught in the law schools what does a judgment of the court of appeal amount to about what do our chambers deliberate what is politics what is our definition of a statesman what is the meaning of jurisprudence should we not rather say juris ignorance if all our institutions are based upon an error in calculation does it not follow that these institutions are so many shams and if the entire social structure is built upon this absolute impossibility of property is it not true that the government under which we live is a chimera and our present society a utopia ninth proposition property is impossible because it is powerless against property one by the third corollary of our axiom interest tells against the proprietor as well as the stranger this economical principle is universally admitted nothing simpler at first blush yet nothing more absurd more contradictory in terms or more absolutely impossible the manufacturer it is said pays himself the rent on his house and capital he pays himself that is he gets paid by the public who buy his products for suppose the manufacturer who seems to make this profit on his property wishes also to make it on his merchandise 
can he then pay himself one franc for that which cost him ninety centimes and make money by the operation no such a transaction would transfer the merchant's money from his right hand to his left but without any profit whatever now that which is true of a single individual trading with himself is also true of the whole business world form a chain of ten fifteen twenty producers as many as you wish if the producer a makes a profit out of the producer b b's loss must according to economical principles be made up by c c's by d and so on through z but by whom will z be paid for the loss caused him by the profit charged by a in the beginning by the consumer replies say contemptible equivocation is this consumer any other than a b c d etc or z by whom will z be paid if he is paid by a no one makes a profit consequently there is no property if on the contrary z bears the burden himself he ceases to be a member of the society since it refuses him the right of property and profit which it grants to the other associates since then a nation like universal humanity is a vast industrial association which cannot act outside of itself it is clear that no man can enrich himself without impoverishing another for in order that the right of property the right of increase may be respected in the case of a it must be denied to z thus we see how equality of rights separated from equality of conditions may be a truth the iniquity of political economy in this respect is flagrant when i a manufacturer purchase the labor of a working man i do not include his wages in the net product of my business on the contrary i deduct them but the working man includes them in his net product say political economy that means that all which the working man gains is net product but only that part of the manufacturer's gains is net product which remains after deducting his wages but why is the right of profit confined to the manufacturer why is this right which is at bottom the right of property itself denied to the working man in the terms of economical science the working man is capital now all capital beyond the cost of its maintenance and repair must bear interest thus the proprietor takes care to get both for his capital and for himself why is the working man prohibited from charging a like interest for his capital which is himself property then is inequality of rights for if it were not inequality of rights it would be equality of goods in other words it would not exist now the charter guarantees to all equality of rights then by the charter property is impossible two is a the proprietor of an estate entitled to by the fact of his proprietorship to take possession of the field belonging to b his neighbor no reply the proprietors but what has that to do with the right of property that i shall show you by a series of similar propositions has c a hatter the right to force d his neighbor and also a hatter to close his shop and cease his business not the least in the world but c wishes to make a profit of one franc on every hat while d is content with fifty centimes it is evident that d's moderation is injurious to c's extravagant claims has the latter a right to prevent d from selling certainly not since d is at liberty to sell his hats fifty centimes cheaper than c if he chooses c in his turn is free to reduce his price one franc now d is poor while c is rich so that at the end of two or three years d is ruined by this intolerable competition and c has complete control of the market can the proprietor d get any redress from the proprietor c can he bring a suit against him to recover his business and property no for d could have done the same thing had he been the richer of the two on the same ground the large proprietor a may say to the small proprietor b sell me your field otherwise you shall not sell your wheat and that without doing him the least wrong or giving him ground for complaint so that a can devour b if he likes for the very reason that a is stronger than b consequently 
It is not the right of property which enables A and C to rob B and D, but the right of might. By the right of property, neither the two neighbours A and B, nor the two merchants C and D, could harm each other. They could neither dispossess, nor destroy one another, nor gain at one another's expense. The power of invasion lies in superior strength. But it is superior strength, also, which enables the manufacturer to reduce the wages of his employees, and the rich merchant and well-stocked proprietor to set their products for what they please. The manufacturer says to the labourer, You are as free to go elsewhere with your services as I am to receive them. I offer you so much. The merchant says to the customer, Take it or leave it. You are master of your money, as I am of my goods. I want so much. Who will yield? The weaker. Therefore, without force, property is powerless against property, since without force it has no power to increase. Therefore, without force, property is null and void. Historical Comment The struggle between colonial and native sugars furnishes us a striking example of this impossibility of property. Leave these two industries to themselves, and the native manufacturer will be ruined by the colonist. To maintain the beetroot, the cane must be taxed. To protect the property of the one, it is necessary to injure the property of the other. The most remarkable feature of this business is precisely that to which the least attention is paid, namely, that, in one way or another, property has to be violated. Impose on each industry a proportional tax, so as to preserve a balance in the market, and you create a maximum price. You attack property in two ways. On the one hand, your tax interferes with the property of trade. On the other, it does not recognize equality of proprietors. Indemnify the beetroot. You violate the property of the taxpayer. Cultivate the two varieties of sugar at the nation's expense. Just as different varieties of tobacco are cultivated, you abolish one species of property. This last course would be the simpler and better one, but to induce the nations to adopt it requires such a cooperation of able minds and generous hearts as is at present out of the question. Competition, sometimes called liberty of trade, in a word, property in exchange, will be for a long time the basis of our commercial legislation, which, from the economical point of view, embraces all civil laws and all government. Now what is competition? A duel in a closed field where arms are the test of right. Who is the liar? The accused or the accuser, said our barbarous ancestors. Let them fight it out, replied the still more barbarous judge. The stronger is right. Which of us two shall sell spices to our neighbour? Let each offer them for sale, cries the economist. The sharper or the more cunning is the more honest man, and the better merchant. Such is the exact spirit of the Code Napoleon. Tenth Proposition Property is impossible because it is the negation of equality. The development of this proposition will be the resume of the preceding ones. 1. It is a principle of economical justice that products are bought only by products, Property, being capable of defence only on the ground that it produces utility, is, since it produces nothing, forever condemned. 2. It is an economical law that labour must be balanced by product. It is a fact that, with property, production costs more than it is worth. 3. Another economical law. The capital being given, production is measured, not by the amount of capital, but by productive capacity. Property requiring income to be always proportional to capital without regard to labour does not recognise this relation of equality between effect and cause. 4 and 5. Like the insect which spins its silk, the labourer never produces for himself alone. Property demanding a double product and unable to obtain it robs the labourer and kills him. 6. Nature has given to every man but one mind, one heart, one will. Property, granting to one individual a plurality of votes, supposes him to have a plurality of minds. 7. All consumption which is not reproductive of utility is destruction. Property, whether it consumes or hoards or capitalizes, is productive of inutility, the cause of sterility and death. 
8. The satisfaction of a natural right always gives rise to an equation. In other words, the right to a thing is necessarily balanced by the possession of the thing. Thus, between the right to liberty and the condition of a free man, there is a balance, an equation. Between the right to be a father and paternity, an equation. Between the right to security and the social guarantee, an equation. But between the right of increase and the receipt of this increase, there is never an equation. For every new increase carries with it the right to another, the latter to a third, and so on for ever. Property never being able to accomplish this object, is a right against nature and against reason. 9. Finally, property is not self-existent. An extraneous cause, either force or fraud, is necessary to its life and action. In other words, property is not equal to property. It is a negation, a delusion, nothing. End of section 17, chapter 4, part 5. Section 18 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Meilinger. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Chapter 5, Part 1. Psychological Exposition of the Idea of Justice Psychological Exposition of the Idea of Justice and Injustice and the Determination of the Principle of Government and of Right Property is impossible. Equality does not exist. We hate the former, and yet wish to possess it. The latter rules all our thoughts, yet we know not how to reach it. Who will explain this profound antagonism between our conscience and our will? Who will point out the causes of this pernicious error, which has become the most sacred principle of justice and society? I am bold enough to undertake the task, and I hope to succeed. But before explaining why man has violated justice, it is necessary to determine what justice is. Part first, Of the Moral Sense in Man and the Animals the philosophers have endeavoured often to locate the line which separates man's intelligence from that of the brutes, and, according to their general custom, they gave utterance to much foolishness, before resolving upon the only course possible for them to take, observation. It was reserved for an unpretending savant, who perhaps did not pride himself on his philosophy, to put an end to the interminable controversy by a simple distinction but one of those luminous distinctions which are worth more than systems. Frédéric Cuvier separated instinct from intelligence. But, as yet, no one has proposed this question. Is the difference between man's moral sense and that of the brute a difference in kind or only in degree? If, hitherto, any one had dared to maintain the latter alternative, his arguments would have seemed scandalous, blasphemous, and offensive to morality and religion. The ecclesiastical and seculiar tribunals would have condemned him with one voice, and marked the style in which they would have branded the immoral paradox. Conscience, they would have cried, conscience, man's chief glory, was given to him exclusively. The notion of justice and injustice, of merit and demerit, is his noble privilege. To man alone, the lord of creation, belongs the sublime power to resist his worldly propensities, to choose between good and evil, and to bring himself more and more into the resemblance of God through liberty and justice. No, the holy image of virtue was never graven save on the heart of man. Words full of feeling, but void of sense. Man is a rational and social animal, said Aristotle. This definition is worth more than all which have been given since. I do not accept even M. de Bonald's celebrated definition, man is an intellect served by organs, a definition which has the double fault of explaining the known by the unknown, that is, the living being by the intellect, and of neglecting man's essential quality, animality. Man, then, is an animal living in society. Society means the sum total of relationships, in short, system. Now all systems exist only on certain conditions. 
What then are the conditions, the laws of human society? What are the rights of men with respect to each other? What is justice? It amounts to nothing to say, with the philosophers of various schools. It is a divine instinct, an immortal and heavenly voice, a guide given us by nature, a light revealed unto every man on coming into the world, a law engraved upon our hearts. It is the voice of conscience, the dictum of reason, the inspiration of sentiment, the penchant of feeling. It is the love of self in others. It is enlightened self-interest, or else it is an innate idea, the imperative command of applied reason, which has its source in the concepts of pure reason. It is a passional attraction, etc., etc. This may be as true as it seems beautiful, but it is utterly meaningless. Though we should prolong this litany through ten pages, it has been filtered through a thousand volumes, we should be no nearer to the solution of the question. Justice is public utility, says Aristotle. That is true, but it is a tautology. The principle that the public welfare ought to be the object of the legislator, says Monsieur Comte in his Treatise on Legislation, cannot be overthrown. But legislation is advanced no farther by its announcement and demonstration than is medicine when it is said that it is the business of physicians to cure the sick. Let us take another course. Right is the sum total of the principles which govern society. Justice, in man, is the respect and observation of those principles. To practice justice is to obey the social instinct. To do an act of justice is to do a social act. If, then, we watch the conduct of men towards each other under different circumstances, it will be easy for us to distinguish between the presence and absence of society. From the result, we may inductively infer the law. Let us commence with the simplest and least doubtful cases. The mother, who protects her son at the peril of her life, and sacrifices everything to his support, is in society with him. She is a good mother. She, on the contrary, who abandons her child, is unfaithful to the social instinct, Maternal love being one of its many features, she is an unnatural mother. If I plunge into the water to rescue a drowning man, I am his brother, his associate. If, instead of aiding him, I sink him, I am his enemy, his murderer. Whoever bestows alms treats the poor man as his associate, not thoroughly, it is true, but only in respect to the amount which he shares with him. Whoever takes by force or stratagem that which is not the product of his labor destroys his social character. He is a brigand. The Samaritarian who relieves the traveler lying by the wayside, dresses his wounds, comforts him, and supplies him with money, thereby declares himself his associate, his neighbor. The priest who passes by on the other side remains unassociated and is his enemy. In all these cases, man is moved by an internal attraction towards his fellow, by a secret sympathy which causes him to love, congratulate, and condole, so that, to resist this attraction, his will must struggle against his nature. But in these respects there is no decided difference between man and the animals. With them, as long as the weakness of their young endears them to their mothers, in a word, associates them with their mothers, the latter protect the former, at the peril of their lives, with a courage which reminds us of our heroes dying for their country. Certain species unite for hunting purposes, seek each other, call each other, a poet would say invite each other, to share their prey, in danger they aid, protect, and warn each other. The elephant knows how to help his companion out of the ditch into which the latter has fallen. Cows form a circle, with their horns outward and their calves in the center, in order to repel the attacks of wolves. Horses and pigs, on hearing a cry of distress from one of their number, rush to the spot whence it comes. What descriptions I might give of their marriages, the tenderness of the males towards the females, and the fidelity of their loves. Let us add, however, to be entirely just, that these touching demonstrations of society, fraternity, and love of neighbor do not prevent the animals from quarreling, fighting, and outrageously abusing one another while gaining their livelihood and showing their gallantry. The resemblance between them and ourselves is perfect. 
the social instinct, in man and beast, exists to a greater or less degree. Its nature is the same. Man has the greater need of association, and employs it more. The animal seems better able to endure isolation. In man, social needs are more imperative and complex. In the beast, they seem less intense, less diversified, less regretted. Society, in a word, aims, in the case of man, at the preservation of the race and the individual. With the animals, its object is more exclusively the preservation of the race. As yet, we have met with no claim which man can make for himself alone. The social instinct and the moral sense he shares with the brutes, and when he thinks to become godlike by a few acts of charity, justice, and devotion, he does not perceive that in so acting, he simply obeys an instinct wholly animal in its nature. As we are good, loving, tender, just, so we are passionate, greedy, lewd, and vindictive. That is, we are like the beasts. Our highest virtues appear, in the last analysis, as blind impulsive instincts. What subjects for canonization and apotheosis? There is, however, a difference between us two-handed bipeds and other living creatures. What is it? A student of philosophy would hasten to reply, This difference lies in the fact that we are conscious of our social faculty, while the animals are unconscious of theirs. In the fact that while we reflect and reason upon the operation of our social instinct, the animals do nothing of the kind. I will go farther. It is by our reflective and reasoning powers, with which we seem to be exclusively endowed, that we know that it is injurious, first to others and then to ourselves, to resist the social instinct which governs us, and which we call justice. It is our reason which teaches us that the selfish man, the robber, the murderer, in a word, the traitor to society, sins against nature, and is guilty with respect to others and himself, when he does wrong willfully. Finally, it is our social sentiment on the one hand, and our reason on the other, which cause us to think that beings such as we should take the responsibility of their acts. Such is the principle of remorse, revenge, and penal justice. But this proves only an intellectual diversity between the animals and man, not at all an affectional one. For, although we reason upon our relations with our fellows, we likewise reason upon our most trivial actions, such as drinking, eating, choosing a wife, or selecting a dwelling place. We reason upon things earthly and things heavenly. There is nothing to which our reasoning powers are not applicable. Now, just as the knowledge of external phenomena which we acquire has no influence upon their causes and laws, so reflection, by illuminating our instinct, enlightens us as to our sentient nature, but does not alter its character. It tells us what our morality is, but neither changes nor modifies it. Our dissatisfaction with ourselves after doing wrong, the indignation which we feel at the sight of injustice, the idea of deserved punishment and due remuneration, are effects of reflection and are not immediate effects of instinct and emotion. Our appreciation, I do not say exclusive appreciation, for the animals also realize that they have done wrong, and are indignant when one of their number is attacked, but our infinitely superior appreciation of our social duties our knowledge of good and evil, does not establish, as regards morality, any vital difference between man and the beasts. Of the first and second degrees of sociability I insist upon the fact, which I have just pointed out, as one of the most important facts of anthropology. The sympathetic attraction which causes us to associate is, by reason of its blind, unruly nature, always governed by temporary impulse, without regard to higher rights, and without distinction of merit or priority. The bastard dog follows indifferently all who call it. The suckling child regards every man as its father, and every woman as its nurse. Every living creature, when deprived of the society of animals of its species, seeks companionship in its solitude. This fundamental characteristic of the social instinct renders intolerable and even hateful the friendship of frivolous persons, liable to be infatuated with every new face, accommodating to all whether good or bad, and ready to sacrifice, for a passing liaison, 
the oldest and most honorable affections. The fault of such beings is not in the heart, it is in the judgment. Sociability, in this degree, is a sort of magnetism awakened in us by the contemplation of a being similar to ourselves, but which never goes beyond the person who feels it. It may be reciprocated, but not communicated. Love, benevolence, pity, sympathy, call it what you will, there is nothing in it which deserves esteem, nothing which lifts man above the beast. The second degree of sociability is justice, which may be defined as the recognition of the equality between another's personality and our own. The sentiment of justice we share with the animals. We alone can form an exact idea of it, but our idea, as has been said already, does not change its nature. We shall soon see how man rises to a third degree of sociability, which the animals are incapable of reaching. But I must first prove by metaphysics that society, justice, and equality are three equivalent terms, three expressions meaning the same thing, whose mutual conversion is always allowable. If, amid the confusion of a shipwreck, having escaped in a boat with some provisions, I see a man struggling with the waves, am I bound to go to his assistance? Yes, I am bound under penalty of being adjudged guilty of murder and treason against society. But am I also bound to share with him my provisions? To settle this question, we must change the phraseology. If society is binding on the boat, is it also binding on the provisions? Undoubtedly. The duty of an associate is absolute. Man's occupancy succeeds his social nature, and is subordinate to it. Possession can become exclusive only when permission to occupy is granted to all alike. That which in this instance obscures our duty is our power of foresight, which, causing us to fear an eventual danger, impels us to usurpation, and makes us robbers and murderers. Animals do not calculate the duty of instinct any more than the disadvantages resulting to those who exercise it. It would be strange if the intellect of man, the most sociable of animals, should lead him to disobey the law. He betrays a society who attempts to use it only for his own advantage. Better that God should deprive us of prudence, if it is to serve as the tool of our selfishness. What, you will say, must I share my bread, the bread which I have earned and which belongs to me, with the stranger whom I do not know, whom I may never see again, and who perhaps will reward me with ingratitude? If we had earned this bread together, if this man had done something to obtain it, he might demand his share, since his cooperation would entitle him to it. But as it is, what claim has he on me? We have not produced together, we shall not eat together. The fallacy in this argument lies in the false supposition that each producer is not necessarily associated with every other producer. When two or more individuals have regularly organized a society, when the contracts have been agreed upon, drafted and signed, there is no difficulty about the future. Everybody knows that when two men associate, for instance, in order to fish, if one of them catches no fish, he is nonetheless entitled to those caught by his associate. If two merchants form a partnership, while the partnership lasts, the profits and losses are divided between them. Since each produces, not for himself, but for the society, when the time of distribution arrives, it is not the producer who is considered, but the associate. That is why the slave, to whom the planter gives straw and rice, and the civilized laborer, to whom the capitalist pays a salary which is always too small, not being associated with their employers, although producing with them, are disregarded when the product is divided. Thus, the horse who draws our coaches, and the ox that draws our carts, produce with us, but are not associated with us. We take their product, but do not share it with them. The animals and laborers whom we employ hold the same relation to us. Whatever we do for them, we do not from a sense of justice, but out of pure benevolence. Footnote. To perform an act of benevolence towards one's neighbor is called in Hebrew to do justice, in Greek to take compassion or pity, from which is derived the French omom, in Latin to perform an act of love or charity, in French give alms. 
we can trace the degradation of this principle through these various expressions. The first signifies duty, the second only sympathy, the third affection, a matter of choice, not an obligation, the fourth caprice. End of footnote. But is it possible that we are not all associated? Let us call to mind what was said in the last two chapters, that even though we do not want to be associated, the force of things, the necessity of consumption, the laws of production, and the mathematical principle of exchange combine to associate us. There is but a single exception to this rule, that of the proprietor, who, producing by his right of increase, is not associated with anyone, and consequently is not obliged to share his product with anyone, just as no one else is bound to share with him. With the exception of the proprietor, we labor for each other, we can do nothing by ourselves unaided by others, and we continually exchange products and services with each other. If these are not social acts, what are they? Now, neither a commercial, nor an industrial, nor an agricultural association can be conceived of in the absence of equality. Equality is its sine qua non. That is, in all matters which concern this association, to violate society is to violate justice and equality. Apply this principle to humanity at large. After what has been said, I assume that the reader has sufficient insight to enable him to dispense with any aid of mine. By this principle, the man who takes possession of a field and says, This field is mine, will not be unjust so long as everyone else has an equal right of possession, nor will he be unjust if, wishing to change his location, he exchanges this field for an equivalent. But if, putting another in his place, he says to him, Work for me while I rest, then he becomes unjust, unassociated, unequal. He is a proprietor. Reciprocally, the sluggard, or the rake, who, without performing any social task, enjoys like others, and often more than others, the products of society, should be proceeded against as a thief and a parasite. We owe it to ourselves to give him nothing, but, since he must live, to put him under supervision and compel him to labor. Sociability is the attraction felt by sentient beings for each other. Justice is the same attraction, accompanied by thought and knowledge. But under what general concept, in what category of the understanding is justice placed? In the category of equal quantities. Hence, the ancient definition of justice. Justum aquale est, in justum inaquale. What is it, then, to practice justice? It is to give equal wealth to each, on condition of equal labor. It is to act socially. Our selfishness may complain. There is no escape from evidence and necessity. What is the right of occupancy? It is a natural method of dividing the earth, by reducing each laborer's share as fast as new laborers present themselves. This right disappears if the public interest requires it, which, being the social interest, is also that of the occupant. What is the right of labor? It is the right to obtain one's share of wealth by fulfilling the required conditions. It is the right of society, the right of equality. Justice, which is the product of the combination of an idea and an instinct, manifests itself in man as soon as he is capable of feeling and of forming ideas. Consequently, it has been regarded as an innate and original sentiment. But this opinion is logically and chronologically false. But justice, by its composition hybrid, if I may use the term, justice, born of emotion and intellect combined, seems to me one of the strongest proofs of unity and simplicity of the ego. The organism being no more capable of producing such a mixture by itself than are the combined senses of hearing and sight of forming a binary sense half auditory and half visual. This double nature of justice gives us the definite basis of all the demonstrations in chapters 2, 3 and 4. On one hand, the idea of justice being identical with that of society, and society necessarily implying equality, equality must underlie all the sophisms invented in defense of property. For, since property can be defended only as a just and social institution, and property being inequality, 
in order to prove that property is in harmony with society, it must be shown that injustice is justice, and that inequality is equality, a contradiction in terms. On the other hand, since the idea of equality, the second element of justice, has its source in the mathematical proportions of things, and since property, or the unequal distribution of wealth among laborers, destroys the necessary balance between labor, production and consumption, property must be impossible. All men, then, are associated. All are entitled to the same justice. All are equal. Does it follow that the preferences of love and friendship are unjust? This requires explanation. I have already supposed the case of a man in peril, I being in a position to help him. Now, I suppose myself appealed to at the same time by two men exposed to danger. Am I not allowed, am I not condemned even, to rush first to the aid of him who is endeared to me by ties of blood, friendship, acquaintance, or esteem, at the risk of leaving the other to perish? Yes. And why? Because within universal society there exist for each of us as many special societies as there are individuals. And we are bound, by the principle of sociability itself, to fulfill the obligations which these impose upon us, according to the intimacy of our relations with them. Therefore we must give our father, mother, children, friends, relatives, etc., the preference over all others. But in what consists this preference? A judge has a case to decide, in which one of the parties is his friend, and the other his enemy. Should he, in this instance, prefer his intimate associate to his distant associate, and decide the case in favor of his friend, in spite of evidence to the contrary. No, for if he should favor his friend's injustice, he would become his accomplice in this violation of the social compact. He would form with him a sort of conspiracy against the social body. Preference should be shown only in personal matters, such as love, esteem, confidence or intimacy when all cannot be considered at once. Thus, in case of fire, a father would save his own child before thinking of his neighbors, but the recognition of a right not being an optimal matter with a judge, he is not at liberty to favor one person to the detriment of another. The theory of these special societies, which are formed concentrically, so to speak, by each of us inside of the main body, gives the key to all the problems which arise from the opposition and conflict of the different varieties of social duty, problems upon which the ancient tragedies are based. The justice practiced among animals is, in a certain degree, negative. With the exception of protecting their young, hunting and plundering in troops, uniting for common defense and sometimes for individual assistance, it consists more in prevention than in action. A sick animal who cannot arise from the ground, or an imprudent one who has fallen over the precipice, receives neither medicine nor nourishment. If he cannot cure himself, nor relieve himself of his trouble, his life is in danger. He will neither be cared for in bed, nor fed in a prison. Their neglect of their fellows arises as much from the weakness of their intellect as from their lack of resources. Still, the degrees of intimacy common among men are not unknown to the animals. They have friendships of habit and of choice, friendships neighborly, and friendships parental. In comparison with us, they have feeble memories, sluggish feelings, and are almost destitute of intelligence. But the identity of these faculties is preserved to some extent, and our superiority in this respect arises entirely from our understanding. It is our strength of memory and penetration of judgment which enable us to multiply and combine the acts which our social instinct impels us to perform, and which teaches us how to render them more effective, and how to distribute them justly. The beasts who live in society practice justice, but are ignorant of its nature, and do not reason upon it. They obey their instinct without thought or philosophy. They know not how to unite the social sentiment with the idea of equality, which they do not possess, this idea being an abstract one. We, on the contrary, starting with the principle that society implies equality, can, by our reasoning faculty, understand and agree with each other in settling our rights. We have even used our judgment to a great extent. 
but in all this our conscience plays a small part, as is proved by the fact that the idea of right, of which we can catch a glimpse in certain animals who approach nearer than any others to our standard of intelligence, seems to grow, from the low level at which it stands in savages, to the lofty height which it reaches in a plateau or a franklin. If we trace the development of the moral sense in individuals, and the progress of laws in nations, we shall be convinced that the ideas of justice and legislative perfection are always proportional to intelligence. The notion of justice, which has been regarded by some philosophers as simple, is then in reality complex. It springs from the social instinct on the one hand, and the idea of equality on the other. Just as the notion of guilt arises from the feeling that justice has been violated, and from the idea of free will. In conclusion, instinct is not modified by acquaintance with its nature, and the facts of society, which we have thus far observed, occur among beasts as well as men. We know the meaning of justice, in other words, of sociability viewed from the standpoint of equality. We have met with nothing which separates us from the animals. End of section 18, chapter 5, part 1. Section 19 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by E. Ellen. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Chapter 5, Part 2. Psychological Exposition of the Idea of Justice. Of the Third Degree of Sociability. The reader, perhaps, has not forgotten what was said in the third chapter concerning the division of labor and the specialty of talents. The sum total of the talents and capabilities of the race is always the same, and their nature is always similar. We are all born poets, mathematicians, philosophers, artists, artisans or farmers, but we are not born equally endowed. And between one man and another in society, or between one faculty and another in the same individual, there is an infinite difference. This difference of degree in the same faculties, this predominance of talent in certain directions, is, we have said, the very foundation of our society. Intelligence and natural genius have been distributed by nature so economically, and yet so liberally, that in society there is no danger of either a surplus or a scarcity of special talents, and that each laborer, by devoting himself to his function, may always attain to the degree of proficiency necessary to enable him to benefit by the labors and discoveries of his fellows. Owing to this simple and wise precaution of nature, the laborer is not isolated by his task. He communicates with his fellows through the mind, before he is united with them in heart, so that with him love is born of intelligence. It is not so with societies of animals. In each species, the aptitudes of all the individuals though very limited, are equal in number and, when they are not the result of instinct, in intensity. Each one does as well as the others what all the others do, provides his food, avoids the enemy, burrows in the earth, builds a nest, etc. No animal, when free and healthy, expects or requires the aid of his neighbor, who, in his turn, is equally independent. Associated animals live side by side without any intellectual intercourse or intimate communication, all doing the same things, having nothing to learn or to remember. They see, feel, and come in contact with each other, but never penetrate each other. Man continually exchanges with man ideas and feelings, products and services. Every discovery and act in society is necessary to him. But of this immense quantity of products and ideas, that which each one has to produce and acquire for himself is but an atom in the sun. Man would not be man were not for society, and society is supported by the balance and harmony of the powers which compose it. Society, among the animals, is simple. With man it is complex. Man is associated with man by the same instinct which associates animal with animal, but man is associated differently from the animal and it is this difference in association which constitutes the difference in morality. I have proved, at too great length, perhaps, both by the spirit of the laws which regard property as the basis of society, 
and by political economy, that inequality of conditions is justified neither by priority of occupation nor superiority of talent, service, industry, and capacity. But, although equality of conditions is a necessary consequence of natural right, of liberty, of the loss of production, of the capacity of physical nature, and of the principle of society itself, it does not prevent the social sentiment from stepping over the boundaries of debt and credit. The fields of benevolence and love extend far beyond, and when economy has adjusted its balance, the mind begins to benefit by its own justice, and the heart expands in the boundlessness of its affection. The social sentiment then takes on a new character, which varies with different persons. In the strong, it becomes the pleasure of generosity. Among equals, frank and cordial friendship. In the weak, the pleasure of admiration and gratitude. The man who is superior in strength, skill, or courage knows that he owes all that he is to society, without which he could not exist. He knows that, in treating him precisely as it does the lowest of its members, society discharges its whole duty towards him. But he does not underrate his faculties, he is no less conscious of his power and greatness, and it is this voluntary reverence which he pays to humanity, this avowal that he is but an instrument of nature, who is alone worthy of glory and worship. It is, I say, this simultaneous confession of the heart and the mind, this genuine adoration of the great being, that distinguishes and elevates man, and lifts him to a degree of social morality to which the beast is powerless to attain. Hercules destroying the monsters, and punishing brigands for the safety of Greece, Orpheus teaching the rough and wild Pelasgians, neither of them putting a price upon their services. There we see the noblest creations of poetry, the loftiest expression of justice and virtue. The joys of self-sacrifice are ineffable. If I were to compare human society to the old Greek tragedies, I should say that the phalanx of noble minds and lofty souls dances the strophe, and the humble multitude the antistrophe. Burdened with painful and disagreeable tasks, but rendered omnipotent by their number and the harmonic arrangement of their functions, the latter execute with the other's plan. Guided by them, they owe them nothing. They honor them, however, and lavish upon them praise and approbation. Gratitude fills people with adoration and enthusiasm. But equality delights my heart. Benevolence degenerates into tyranny, and admiration into servility. Friendship is the daughter of equality. O oh, my friends, may I live in your midst without emulation, and without glory. Let equality bring us together, and fate assign us our places. May I die without knowing to whom among you I owe the most esteem. Friendship is precious to the hearts of the children of men. Generosity, gratitude, I mean here only that gratitude which is born of admiration of a superior power, and friendship are three distinct shades of a single sentiment which I will call ekit, or social proportionality. Footnote. I mean here by ikit what the Latins called humanitas, that is, the kind of sociability which is peculiar to man. Humanity, gentle and courteous to all, knows how to distinguish ranks, virtues, and capabilities without injury to any. End of footnote. Ikit does not change justice, but, always taking ikit for the base, it superadds esteem, and thereby forms in man a third degree of sociability. Ikit makes it at once our duty and our pleasure to aid the weak who have need of us, and to make them our equals, to pay to the strong a just tribute of gratitude and honor, without enslaving ourselves to them, to cherish our neighbors, friends, and equals, for that which we receive from them, even by right of exchange. Ikit is sociability raised to its ideal by reason and justice. Its commonest manifestation is urbanity, or politeness, which, among certain nations, sums up in a single word nearly all the social duties. It is the just distribution of social sympathy and universal love. Now this feeling is unknown among the beasts, who love and cling to each other, and show their preferences, but who cannot conceive of esteem, and who are incapable of generosity, admiration, or politeness. This feeling does not spring from intelligence, which calculates, computes, and balances, but does not love. 
which sees but does not feel. As justice is the product of social instinct and reflection combined, so Ikit is a product of justice and taste combined, that is, of our powers of judging and of idealizing. This product, the third and last degree of human sociability, is determined by our complex mode of association, in which equality, or rather the divergence of faculties and the specialty of functions, tending of themselves to isolate laborers, demand a more active sociability. That is why the force which oppresses while protecting is execrable, why the silly ignorance which views with the same eye the marvels of art and the products of the rudest industry excites unutterable contempt, why proud mediocrity, which glories in saying, I have paid you, I owe you nothing, is especially odious. Sociability, justice, ekit, such, in its triplicity, is the exact definition of the instinctive faculty which leads us into communication with our fellows, and whose physical manifestation is expressed by the formula, equality in natural wealth and the products of labor. These three degrees of sociability support and imply each other. Ikit cannot exist without justice. Society without justice is a solecism. If, in order to reward talent, I take from one to give to another, in unjustly stripping the first, I do not esteem his talent as I ought. If, in society, I award more to myself than to my associate, we are not really associated. Justice is sociability as manifested in the division of material things, susceptible of weight and measure. Ekit is justice accompanied by admiration and esteem, things which cannot be measured. From this, several inferences may be drawn. 1. Though we are free to grant our esteem to one more than to another, and in all possible degrees, yet we should give no one more than his proportion of the common wealth because the duty of justice, being imposed upon us before that of Ikit, must always take precedence of it. The woman honoured by the ancients, who, when forced by a tyrant to choose between the death of her brother and that of her husband, sacrificed the latter on the ground that she could find another husband but not another brother. That woman, I say, in obeying her sense of Ikit, failed in point of justice and did a bad deed because conjugal association is a closer relation than fraternal association, and because the life of our neighbor is not our property. By the same principle, inequality of wages cannot be admitted by law on the ground of inequality of talents, because the just distribution of wealth is the function of economy, not of enthusiasm. Finally, as regards donations, wills, and inheritance, society, careful both of the personal affections and its own rights, must never permit love and partiality to destroy justice. And though it is pleasant to think that the son, who has been long associated with his father in business, is more capable than any one else of carrying it on, and that the citizen, who is surprised in the midst of his task by death, is best fitted, in consequence of his natural taste for his occupation, to designate his successor, and though the heir should be allowed the right of choice in case of more than one inheritance, nevertheless, Society can tolerate no concentration of capital and industry for the benefit of a single man, no monopoly of labor, no encroachment. Footnote. Justice and Akit never have been understood. End of footnote. Quote. Suppose that some spoils, taken from the enemy and equal to twelve, are to be divided between Achilles and Ajax. If the two persons were equal, their respective shares would be arithmetically equal. Achilles would have six, Ajax six. And if we should carry out this arithmetical equality, Thersites would be entitled to as much as Achilles, which would be unjust in the extreme. To avoid this injustice, the worth of the persons should be estimated, and the spoils divided accordingly. Suppose that the worth of Achilles is double that of Ajax. The former's share is eight, the latter four. There is no arithmetical equality, but a proportional equality. It is this comparison of merits, rationem, that Aristotle calls distributive justice. It is a geometrical proportion. End of quote. From Toulier's French Law According to the Code Are Achilles and Ajax associated, or are they not? Settle that, and you settle the whole question. 
if achilles and ajax instead of being associated are themselves in the service of agamemnon who pays them there is no objection to aristotle's method the slave owner who controls his slaves may give a double allowance of brandy to him who does double work that is the law of despotism the right of slavery but if achilles and ajax are associated they are equals what matters it that achilles has a strength of four while that of ajax is only two the latter may always answer that he is free that if achilles has a strength of four five could kill him finally that in doing personal service he incurs as great a risk as achilles the same argument applies to thersites if he is unable to fight let him be cook purveyor or butler if he is good for nothing put him in the hospital in no case wrong him or impose upon him laws man must live in one of two states either in society or out of it in society conditions are necessarily equal except in the degree of esteem and consideration which each one may receive out of society man is so much raw material a capitalized tool and often an incommodious and useless piece of furniture two equite justice and society can exist only between individuals of the same species they form no part of the relations of different races to each other for instance of the wolf to the goat of the goat to man of man to god much less of god to man the attribution of justice equality and love to the supreme being is pure anthropomorphism and the adjectives just merciful pitiful and the like should be stricken from our litanies god can be regarded as just equitable and good only to another god now god has no associate consequently he cannot experience social affections such as goodness equite and justice is the shepherd said to be just to his sheep and his dogs no and if he saw fit to share as much wool from a lamb six months old as from a ram of two years or if he required as much work from a young dog as from an old one they would say not that he was unjust but that he was foolish between man and beast there is no society though there may be affection man loves the animals as things as sentient things if you will but not as persons philosophy after having eliminated from the idea of god the passions ascribed to him by superstition will then be obliged to eliminate also the virtues which our liberal piety awards to him footnote between woman and man there may exist love passion ties of custom and the like but there is no real society man and woman are not companions the difference of the sexes places a barrier between them like that placed between animals by a difference of race consequently far from advocating what is now called the emancipation of woman i should incline rather if there were no other alternative to exclude her from society End of footnote. the rights of woman and her relations with man are yet to be determined matrimonial legislation like civil legislation is a matter for the future to settle if god should come down to earth and dwell among us we could not love him unless he became like us nor give him anything unless he produced something nor listen to him unless he proved us mistaken nor worship him unless he manifested his power all the laws of our nature affectional economical and intellectual would prevent us from treating him as we treat our fellow men that is according to reason justice and equite i infer from this that if god should ever wish to put himself into immediate communication with man he would have to become a man now if kings are images of god and executors of his will they cannot receive love wealth obedience and glory from us unless they consent to labor and associate with us produce as much as they consume reason with their subjects and do wonderful things still more if as some pretend kings are public functionaries the love which is due them is measured by their personal amiability our obligation to obey them by the wisdom of their commands and their civil list by the total social production divided by the number of citizens thus jurisprudence political economy and psychology agree in admitting the law of equality right and duty the due reward of talent and labor the outbursts of love and enthusiasm all are regulated in advance by an invariable standard 
all depend upon number and balance. Equality of conditions is the law of society, and universal solidarity is the ratification of this law. But our opposition to this law has made it all the more a necessity. To that fact history bears perpetual testimony, and the course of events reveals it to us. Society advances from equation to equation. To the eyes of the economist, the revolutions of empire seem now like the reduction of algebraical quantities, which are interdeducible, now like the discovery of unknown quantities induced by the inevitable influence of time. Figures are the providence of history. Undoubtedly there are other elements in human progress, but in the multitude of hidden causes which agitate nations, there is none more powerful or constant, none less obscure, than the periodical explosions of the proletariat against property. Property, acting by exclusion and encroachment, while population was increasing, has been the life principle and definitive cause of all revolutions. Religious wars and wars of conquest, when they have stopped short of the extermination of races, have been only accidental disturbances, soon repaired by the mathematical progression of the life of nations. The downfall and death of societies are due to the power of accumulation possessed by property. In the Middle Ages, take Florence, a republic of merchants and brokers, always rent by its well-known factions, the Guelphs and Ghibellines, who were, after all, only the people and the proprietors fighting against each other. Florence, ruled by bankers and borne down at last by the weight of her debts. Footnote. The strong box of Cosmo de' Medici was the grave of Florentine liberty, said M. Michelet to the College of France. End of footnote. In ancient times, take Rome, preyed upon from its birth by usury, flourishing nevertheless, as long as the known world furnished its terrible proletaires with labor stained with blood by civil war at every interval of rest, and dying of exhaustion when the people lost, together with their former energy, their last spark of moral sense. Carthage, a commercial and financial city, continually divided by internal competition. Tyre, Sidon, Jerusalem, Nineveh, Babylon, ruined in turn by commercial rivalry and, as we now express it, by panics in the market. Do not these famous examples show clearly enough the fate which awaits modern nations, unless the people, unless France, with a sudden burst of her powerful voice, proclaims in thunder tones the abolition of the regime of property. Here my task should end. I have proved the right of the poor. I have shown the usurpation of the rich. I demand justice. It is not my business to execute the sentence. If it should be argued, in order to prolong for a few years an illegitimate privilege, that it is not enough to demonstrate equality, that it is necessary also to organize it, and above all to establish it peacefully, I might reply, the welfare of the oppressed is of more importance than official composure. Equality of conditions is a natural law upon which public economy and jurisprudence are based. The right to labor and the principle of equal distribution of wealth cannot give way to the anxieties of power. It is not for the proletaire to reconcile the contradictions of the codes, still less to suffer for the errors of the government. On the contrary, it is the duty of the civil and administrative power to reconstruct itself on the basis of political equality. An evil, when known, should be condemned and destroyed. The legislator cannot plead ignorance as an excuse for upholding a glaring iniquity. Restitution should not be delayed. Justice, justice, recognition of right, reinstatement of the proletaire. When these results are accomplished, then, judges and consuls, you may attend to your police and provide a government for the republic. For the rest, I do not think that a single one of my readers accuses me of knowing how to destroy, but of not knowing how to construct. In demonstrating the principle of equality, I have laid the foundation of the social structure. I have done more. I have given an example of the true method of solving political and legislative problems. Of the science itself, I confess that I know nothing more than its principle, and I know of no one at present who can boast of having penetrated deeper. Many people cry, Come to me and I will teach you the truth. These people mistake for the truth their cherished opinion and ardent conviction, which is usually anything but the truth. 
the science of society, like all human sciences, will be forever incomplete. The depth and variety of the questions which it embraces are infinite. We hardly know the ABC of this science, as is proved by the fact that we had not yet emerged from the period of systems, and have not ceased to put the authority of the majority in the place of facts. A certain philological society decided linguistic questions by a plurality of votes. Our parliamentary debates, were the results less pernicious, would be even more ridiculous. The task of the true publicist, in the age in which we live, is to close the mouths of quacks and charlatans, and to teach the public to demand demonstrations, instead of being contented with symbols and programs. Before talking of the science itself, it is necessary to ascertain its object, and discover its method and principle. The ground must be cleared of the prejudices which encumber it. Such is the mission of the nineteenth century. For my part, I have sworn fidelity to my work of demolition, and I will not cease to pursue the truth through the ruins and rubbish. I hate to see a thing half done, and it will be believed without any assurance of mine, that, having dared to raise my hand against the holy ark, I shall not rest contented with the removal of the cover. The mysteries of the sanctuary of iniquity must be unveiled, the tables of the old alliance broken, and all the objects of the ancient faith thrown in a heap to the swine. A charter has been given us, a resume of political science, the monument of twenty legislatures. A code has been written, the pride of a conqueror, and the summary of ancient wisdom. Well, of this charter and this code not one article shall be left standing upon another. The time has come for the wise to choose their course, and prepare for reconstruction. But since a destroyed error necessarily implies a counter-truth, I will not finish this treatise without solving the first problem of political science, that which receives the attention of all minds. When property is abolished, what will be the form of society? Will it be communism? End of chapter 5, part 2. Section 20 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Clark. What is Property? An Enquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Chapter 5, Part 3. Psychological Exposition of the Idea of Justice. Part 2nd. Of the Causes of Our Mistakes. The Origin of Property. The true form of human society cannot be determined until the following question has been solved. Property not being our natural condition, how did it gain a foothold? Why has the social instinct so trustworthy among the animals erred in the case of man? Why is man, who was born for society, not yet associated? I have said that human society is complex in its nature. Though this expression is inaccurate, the fact to which it refers is nonetheless true, namely the classification of talents and capacities. But who does not see that these talents and capacities, owing to their infinite variety, give rise to an infinite variety of wills? and that the character, the inclinations, and, if I may venture to use the expression, the form of the ego are necessarily changed, so that in the order of liberty as in the order of intelligence, there are as many types as individuals, as many characters as heads, whose tastes, fancies, and propensities being modified by dissimilar ideas must necessarily conflict. Man by his nature and his instinct is predestined to society, but his personality, ever varying, is adverse to it. In societies of animals, all the members do exactly the same things. The same genius directs them, the same will animates them. A society of beasts is a collection of atoms, round, hooked, cubical, or triangular, but always perfectly identical. These personalities do not vary, and we might say that a single ego governs them all. The labors which animals perform, whether alone or in society, are exact reproductions of their character. Just as the swarm of bees is composed of individual bees, alike in nature and equal in value, so the honeycomb is formed of individual cells, constantly and invariably repeated. But man's intelligence, fitted for his social destiny and his personal needs, is of a very different composition and therefore gives rise to a wonderful variety of human wills. In the bee the will is constant and uniform because the instinct which guides it is invariable and constitutes the animal's whole life and nature. In man, talent varies and the mind wavers, consequently his will is multiform and vague. 
He seeks society but dislikes constraint and monotony. He is an imitator but fond of his own ideas and passionately in love with his works. If, like the bees, every man were born possessed of talent, perfect knowledge of certain kinds, and, in a word, an innate acquaintance with the functions he has to perform, but destitute of reflective and reasoning faculties, society would organize itself. We should see one man plowing a field, another building houses, this one forging metals, that one cutting clothes, and still others storing the products and superintending their distribution. Each one, without inquiring as to the object of his labor, and without troubling himself about the extent of his task, would obey orders, bring his product, receive his salary, and would then rest for a time, keeping meanwhile no accounts, envious of nobody, and satisfied with the distributor, who never would be unjust to anyone. Kings would govern but would not reign, for to reign is to be a proprietor à l'anglais, as Bonaparte said, and having no commands to give, since all would be at their posts, they would serve rather as rallying centers than as authorities or counselors. It would be a state of ordered communism, but not a state entered into deliberately and freely. But man acquires skill only by observation and experiment. He reflects, then, since to observe and experiment is to reflect— he reasons, since he cannot help reasoning. In reflecting, he becomes deluded. In reasoning, he makes mistakes, and, thinking himself right, persists in them. He is wedded to his opinions. He esteems himself and despises others. Consequently, he isolates himself, for he could not submit to the majority without renouncing his will and his reason, that is, without disowning himself, which is impossible. And this isolation, this intellectual egotism, this individuality of opinion— lasts until the truth is demonstrated to him by observation and experience. A final illustration will make these facts still clearer. If to the blind but convergent and harmonious instincts of a swarm of bees should be suddenly added reflection and judgment, the little society could not long exist. In the first place, the bees would not fail to try some new industrial process, for instance that of making their cells round or square. All sorts of systems and inventions would be tried, until long experience, aided by geometry, should show them that the hexagonal shape is the best. Then insurrections would occur. The drones would be told to provide for themselves and the queen to labor. Jealousy would spread among the laborers. Discords would burst forth. Soon each one would want to produce on his own accord. And finally the hive would be abandoned, and the bees would perish. Evil would be introduced into the honey-producing republic by the power of reflection, the very faculty which ought to constitute its glory. Thus, moral evil, or in this case disorder in society, is naturally explained by our power of reflection. The mother of poverty, crime, insurrection, and war was inequality of conditions, which was the daughter of property, which was born of selfishness, which was engendered by private opinion, which descended in a direct line from the autocracy of reason." Man, in his infancy, is neither criminal nor barbarous, but ignorant and inexperienced. Endowed with imperious instincts which are under the control of his reasoning faculty, at first he reflects but little and reasons inaccurately. Then, benefiting by his mistakes, he rectifies his ideas and perfects his reason. In the first place, it is the savage sacrificing all his possessions for a trinket and then repenting and weeping. It is Isso selling his birthright for a mess of pottage and afterwards wishing to cancel the bargain. It is the civilized workman laboring in insecurity and continually demanding that his wages be increased, neither he nor his employer understanding that, in the absence of equality, any salary, however large, is always insufficient. Then it is Naboth dying to defend his inheritance, Cato tearing out his entrails that he might not be enslaved, Socrates drinking the fatal cup in defense of liberty of thought, it is the third estate of 89 claiming its liberty. Soon it will be the people demanding equality of wages and an equal division of the means of production. Man is born a social being, that is, he seeks equality and justice in all his relations, but he loves independence and praise. The difficulty of satisfying these various desires at the same time is the primary cause of the despotism of the will and the appropriation which results from it. On the other hand, man always needs a market for his product— Unable to compare values of different kinds, he is satisfied to judge approximately according to his passion and caprice, and he engages in dishonest commerce, which always results in wealth and poverty. Thus the greatest evils which man suffers arise from the misuse of his social nature, of this same justice of which he is so proud and which he applies with such deplorable ignorance. 
The practice of justice is a science which, when once discovered and diffused, will sooner or later put an end to social disorder by teaching us our rights and duties. This progressive and painful education of our instinct, this slow and imperceptible transformation of our spontaneous perceptions into deliberate knowledge, does not take place among the animals, whose instincts remain fixed and never become enlightened. According to Frederick Cuvier, who has so clearly distinguished between instinct and intelligence in animals, quote, "...instinct is a natural and inherent faculty, like feeling, irritability, or intelligence." the wolf and the fox who recognize the traps in which they have been caught and who avoid them, the dog and the horse who understand the meaning of several of our words and who obey us, thereby show intelligence, the dog who hides the remains of his dinner, the bee who constructs his cell, the bird who builds his nest act only from instinct. Even man has instincts. It is a special instinct which leads the newborn child to suck. But in man almost everything is accomplished by intelligence, and intelligence supplements instinct. The opposite is true of animals. Their instinct is given them as a supplement to their intelligence. End quote. A. Florence, Analytical Summary of the Observations of F. Cuvier. Quote, we can form a clear idea of instinct only by admitting that animals have in their sensorium images or innate and constant sensations, which influence their actions in the same manner that ordinary and accidental sensations commonly do. It is a sort of dream or vision which always follows them, and in all which relates to instinct, they may be regarded as somnambulists. End quote. F. Covier, Introduction to the Animal Kingdom. Intelligence and instinct being common, then, though in different degrees to animals and man, what is the distinguishing characteristic of the latter? According to F. Covier, it is reflection or the power of intellectually considering our own modifications by a survey of ourselves. This lacks clearness and requires an explanation. If we grant intelligence to animals, we must also grant them, in some degree, reflection. For the first cannot exist without the second, as F. Cuvier himself has proved by numerous examples. But notice that the learned observer defines the kind of reflection which distinguishes us from the animals as the power of considering our own modifications. This I shall endeavor to interpret by developing to the best of my ability the laconism of the philosophical naturalist. The intelligence acquired by animals never modifies the operations which they perform by instinct. It is given them only as a provision against unexpected accidents which might disturb these operations. In man, on the contrary, instinctive action is constantly changing into deliberate action. Thus, man is social by instinct and is every day becoming social by reflection and choice. At first, he formed his words by instinct. Footnote. The problem of the origin of language is solved by the distinction made by Frederick Cuvier between instinct and intelligence. Language is not a premeditated, arbitrary, or conventional device, nor is it communicated or revealed to us by God. Language is an instinctive and unpremeditated creation of man, as the hive is of the bee. In this sense, it may be said that language is not the work of man, since it is not the work of his mind. Further, the mechanism of language seems more wonderful and ingenious when it is not regarded as the result of reflection. This fact is one of the most curious and indisputable which philology has observed. See, among other works, a Latin essay by F. G. Bergman, Strasbourg, 1839, in which the learned author explains how the phonetic germ is born of sensation, how language passes through three successive stages of development, why man, endowed at birth with the instinctive faculty of creating a language, loses this faculty as fast as his mind develops, and that the study of languages is real and natural history, in fact a science. France possesses today several philologists of the first rank endowed with rare talents and deep philosophic insight, modest savants developing a science almost without the knowledge of the public, devoting themselves to studies which are scornfully looked down upon and seeming to shun applause as much as others seek it. End footnote. At first he formed his words by instinct. He was a poet by inspiration. Today he makes grammar a science and poetry an art. His conception of God and a future life is spontaneous and instinctive, and his expressions of this conception have been, by turns, monstrous, eccentric, beautiful, comforting, and terrible. All these different creeds, at which the frivolous irreligion of the 18th century mocked, are modes of expression of the religious sentiment. Some day, man will explain himself to the character of the God whom he believes in, and the nature of that other world to which his soul aspires. All that he does from instinct, man despises. 
or if he admires it, it is as nature's work, not as his own. This explains the obscurity which surrounds the names of early inventors. It explains also the indifference to religious matters and the ridicule heaped upon religious customs. Man esteems only the products of reflection and of reason. The most wonderful works of instinct are, in his eyes, only lucky godsends. He reserves the name discovery, I had almost said creation, for the works of intelligence. Instinct is the source of passion and enthusiasm. It is intelligence which causes crime and virtue. In developing his intelligence, man makes use of not only his own observations, but also those of others. He keeps an account of his experience and preserves the record so that the race, as well as the individual, becomes more and more intelligent. The animals do not transmit their knowledge. That which each individual accumulates dies with him. It is not enough, then, to say that we are distinguished from the animals by reflection, unless we mean thereby the constant tendency of our instinct to become intelligence. While man is governed by instinct, he is unconscious of his acts. He never would deceive himself, and never would be troubled by errors, evils, and disorder if, like the animals, instinct were his only guide. But the Creator has endowed us with reflection, to the end that our instinct might become intelligence, and since this reflection and resulting knowledge pass through various stages, it happens that in the beginning our instinct is opposed, rather than guided, by reflection. Consequently, that our power of thought leads us to act in opposition to our nature and our end, that, deceiving ourselves, we do and suffer evil, until instinct which points us toward good and reflection which makes us stumble into evil are replaced by the science of good and evil, which invariably causes us to seek the one and avoid the other. Thus, evil, or error and its consequences, is the firstborn son of the union of two opposing faculties, instinct and reflection. Good or truth must inevitably be the second child. Or to again employ the figure, evil is the product of incest between adverse powers. Good will sooner or later be the legitimate child of their holy and mysterious union. Property, born of the reasoning faculty, entrenches itself behind comparisons. But just as reflection and reason are subsequent to spontaneity, observation to sensation, and experience to instinct, so property is subsequent to communism. Communism, or association in a simple form, is the necessary object and original aspiration of the social nature, the spontaneous movement by which it manifests and establishes itself. It is the first phase of human civilization. In this state of society, which the jurists have called negative communism, man draws near to man and shares with him the fruits of the field and the milk and the flesh of animals. Little by little, this communism, negative as long as man does not produce, tends to become positive and organic through the development of labor and industry. But it is then that the sovereignty of thought and the terrible faculty of reasoning logically or illogically teach man that if equality is the sine qua non of society, communism is the first species of slavery. To express this idea by a Hegelian formula, I will say, communism, the first expression of the social nature, is the first term of social development, the thesis. Property, the reverse of communism, is the second term, the antithesis. When we have discovered the third term, the synthesis, we shall have the required solution. Now this synthesis necessarily results from the correction of the thesis by the antithesis. Therefore it is necessary, by a final examination of their characteristics, to eliminate those features which are hostile to sociability. The union of the two remainders will give us the true form of human association. End of section 20, chapter 5, part 3. Recording by Chris Clark. Section 21 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Clark. What is Property? An Enquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker Chapter 5, Part 4, Psychological Exposition of the Idea of Justice Characteristics of Communism and of Property Section 1 I ought not to conceal the fact that property and communism have been considered always the only possible forms of society. This deplorable error has been the life of property. The disadvantages of communism are so obvious that its critics never have needed to employ much eloquence to thoroughly disgust men with it. 
the irreparability of the injustice which it causes, the violence which it does to attractions and repulsions, the yoke of iron which it fastens upon the will, the moral torture to which it subjects the conscience, the debilitating effect which it has upon society, and, to sum it all up, the pious and stupid uniformity which it enforces upon the free, active, reasoning, unsubmissive personality of man, have shocked common sense and condemned communism by an irrevocable decree. The authorities and examples cited in its favor disprove it. The communistic republic of Plato involved slavery. That of Lycurgus employed helots, whose duty it was to produce for their masters, thus enabling the latter to devote themselves exclusively to athletic sports and to war. Even J. J. Rousseau, confounding communism and equality, has said somewhere that, without slavery, he did not think equality of conditions possible. The communities of the early church did not last the first century out, and soon degenerated into monasteries. In those of the Jesuits of Paraguay, the condition of the blacks is said by all travelers to be as miserable as that of slaves, and it is a fact that the good fathers were obliged to surround themselves with ditches and walls to prevent their new converts from escaping. The followers of Babeuf, guided by a lofty horror of property rather than by any definite belief, were ruined by exaggeration of their principles. The St. Simonians, lumping communism and inequality, passed away like a masquerade. The greatest danger to which society is exposed today is that of another shipwreck on this rock. Singularly enough, systemic communism, the deliberate negation of property, is conceived under the direct influence of the proprietary prejudice, and property is the basis of all communistic theories. The members of a community, it is true, have no private property, but the community is proprietor, and proprietor not only of the goods, but of the persons and wills. In consequence of this principle of absolute property, labor, which should be only a condition imposed upon man by nature, becomes in all communities a human commandment, and therefore odious. Passive obedience, irreconcilable with a reflecting will, is strictly enforced. Fidelity to regulations, which are always defective, however wise they may be thought, allows of no complaint. Life, talent, and all the human faculties are the property of the state, which has the right to use them as it pleases for the common good. Private associations are sternly prohibited, in spite of the likes and dislikes of different natures, because to tolerate them would be to introduce small communities within the large one, and consequently private property. The strong work for the weak, although this ought to be left to benevolence and not enforced, advised, or enjoined. The industrious work for the lazy, although this is unjust. The clever work for the foolish, although this is absurd. And finally, man, casting aside his personality, his spontaneity, his genius, and his affections, humbly annihilates himself at the feet of the majestic and inflexible commune. Communism is inequality, but not as property is. Property is the exploitation of the weak by the strong. Communism is the exploitation of the strong by the weak. In property, inequality of conditions is the result of force under whatever name it be disguised. Physical and mental force, force of events, chance, fortune, force of accumulated property, etc. In communism, inequality springs from placing mediocrity on a level with excellence. This damaging equation is repellent to the conscience and causes merit to complain, for although it may be the duty of the strong to aid the weak, they prefer to do it out of generosity. They never will endure a comparison. Give them equal opportunities of labor and equal wages, but never allow their jealousy to be awakened by mutual suspicion of unfaithfulness in the performance of the common task. Communism is oppression and slavery. Man is very willing to obey the law of duty, serve his country, and oblige his friends, but he wishes to labor when he pleases, where he pleases, and as much as he pleases. He wishes to dispose of his own time, to be governed only by necessity, to choose his friendships, his recreation, and his discipline, to act from judgment, not by command, to sacrifice himself through selfishness, not through servile obligation. Communism is essentially opposed to the free exercise of our faculties, to our noblest desires, to our deepest feelings. Any plan which could be devised for reconciling it with the demands of the individual reason and will would end only in changing the thing while preserving the name. 
Now, if we are honest truth-seekers, we shall avoid disputes about words. Thus, communism violates the sovereignty of the conscience and equality, the first by restricting spontaneity of mind and heart and freedom of thought and action, the second by placing labor and laziness, skill and stupidity, and even vice and virtue on an equality in point of comfort. For the rest, if property is impossible on account of the desire to accumulate, communism would soon become so through the desire to shirk. Section 2. Property, in its turn, violates equality by the rights of exclusion and increase and freedom by despotism. The former effect of property having been sufficiently developed in the last three chapters, I will content myself here with establishing by a final comparison its perfect identity with robbery. The Latin words for robber are fur and elatro, the former taken from the Greek for, or fero, Latin fero, I carry away, the latter from lathro, I play the part of a brigand, which is derived from litho, Latin leteo, I conceal myself. The Greeks also have kleptis from klepto, I filch, whose radical consonants are the same as those of kalipto, I cover, I conceal. Thus, in these languages, the idea of a robber is that of a man who conceals, carries away, or diverts, in any manner whatever, a thing which does not belong to him. The Hebrews expressed the same idea by the word ganab, robber, from the verb ganab, which means to put away, to turn aside. Lothi gnab, Decalogue Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal. That is, thou shalt not hold back, thou shalt not put away anything for thyself. That is the act of a man who, on entering into a society into which he agrees to bring all that he has, secretly reserves a portion, as did the celebrated disciple Ananias. The etymology of the French verb voler is still more significant. Voler, or faire le vol, from the Latin vola, palm of the hand, means to take all the tricks in a game of ombre so that le valeur, the robber, is the capitalist who takes all, who gets the lion's share. Probably this verb voler had its origin in the professional slang of thieves, whence it has passed into common use, and consequently into the phraseology of the law. Robbery is committed in a variety of ways, which have been very cleverly distinguished and classified by legislators according to their heinousness or merit, to the end that some robbers may be honored while others are punished. We rob, one, by murder on the highway, two, alone or in a band, three, by breaking into buildings or scaling walls, four, by abstraction, five, by fraudulent bankruptcy, six, by forgery of the handwriting of public officials or private individuals, seven, by manufacture of counterfeit money. This species includes all robbers who practice their profession with no other aid than force and open fraud. Bandits, brigands, pirates, rovers, by land and sea, these names were gloried in by the ancient heroes who thought their profession as noble as it was lucrative. Nimrod, Theseus, Jason and his Argonauts, Jephthah, David, Cacus, Romulus, Clovis and all his Merovingian descendants, Robert Giscard, Tancred de Hauville, Bohemond, and most of the Norman heroes were brigands and robbers. The heroic character of the robber is expressed in this line from Horace in reference to Achilles. Jura neget sibi nata nihil non arrogate armis. Footnote. My right is my lance and my buckler, General de Brassard said, like Achilles. I get wine, gold, and women with my lance and my buckler. End of footnote. And by this sentence from the dying words of Jacob, Genesis 48, which the Jews apply to David and the Christians to their Christ, manus aegis contra omnes. In our day, the robber, the warrior of the ancients, is pursued with the utmost vigor. His profession in the language of the code entails ignominious and corporal penalties from imprisonment to the scaffold. A sad change in opinions here below. We rob, eight, by cheating, nine, by swindling, ten, by abuse of trust, eleven, by games and lotteries. This second species was encouraged by the laws of Lycurgus in order to sharpen the wits of the young. It is the kind practiced by Ulysses, Solon, and Sinon, by the ancient and modern Jews from Jacob down to Deutz, and by the Bohemians, the Arabs, and all savage tribes. 
Under Louis the Thirteenth and Louis the Fourteenth, it was not considered dishonorable to cheat at play. To do so was a part of the game, and many worthy people did not scruple to correct the caprice of fortune by dexterous jugglery. Today, and even in all countries, it is thought a mark of merit among peasants, merchants, and shopkeepers to know how to make a bargain, that is, to deceive one's man. This is so universally accepted that the cheated party takes no offense. It is known with what reluctance our government resolved upon the abolition of lotteries. It felt that it was dealing a stab thereby at property. The pickpocket, the blackleg, and the charlatan make a special use of their dexterity of hand, their subtlety of mind, the magic power of their eloquence, and their great fertility of invention. Sometimes they offer bait to cupidity. Therefore the penal code, which much prefers intelligence to muscular vigor, has made of the four varieties mentioned above a second category liable only to correctional, not to ignominious punishments. Let them now accuse the law of being materialistic and atheistic. We rob, 12, by usury. This species of robbery, so odious and so severely punished since the publication of the gospel, is the connecting link between forbidden and authorized robbery. Owing to its ambiguous nature, it has given rise to a multitude of contradictions in the laws and in morals, contradictions which have been very cleverly turned to account by lawyers, financiers, and merchants. Thus, the usurer who lends on mortgage at 10, 12, and 15 percent is heavily fined when detected, while the banker who receives the same interest, not, it is true, upon a loan, but in the way of exchange or discount, that is, of sale, is protected by royal privilege. But the distinction between the banker and the usurer is a purely nominal one. Like the usurer who lends on property, real or personal, the banker lends on business paper. Like the usurer, he takes his interest in advance. Like the usurer, he can recover from the borrower if the property is destroyed, that is, if the note is not redeemed, a circumstance which makes him a money lender, not a money seller. But the banker lends for a short time only, while the usurer's loan may be for one, two, three, or more years. Now a difference in the duration of the loan, or form of the act, does not alter the nature of the transaction. As for the capitalists who invest their money either with the state or in commercial operations at 3, 4, and 5 percent, that is, who lend on usury at a little lower rate than the bankers and usurers, they are the flower of society, the cream of honesty. Moderation in robbery is the height of virtue. Footnote. It would be interesting and profitable to review the authors who have written on usury, or, to use the gentler expression which some prefer, lending at interest. The theologians always have opposed usury, but since they have admitted always the legitimacy of rent, and since rent is evidently identical with interest, they have lost themselves in a labyrinth of subtle distinctions, and have finally reached a pass where they do not know what to think of usury. The church, the teacher of morality, so jealous and so proud of the purity of her doctrine, has always been ignorant of the real nature of property and usury. She even has proclaimed through her pontiffs the most deplorable errors, non potest mutum, said Benedict the Fourteenth, locationi ulo pacto comprari. Rent, says Bossuet, is as far from usury as heaven is from the earth. How, on such a doctrine, condemn lending at interest? How justify the gospel which expressly forbids usury? The difficulty of theologians is a very serious one. Unable to refute the economical demonstrations which rightly assimilate interest to rent, they no longer dare to condemn interest, and they can say only that there must be such a thing as usury since the gospel forbids it. End of footnote. But what, then, is usury? Nothing is more amusing than to see these instructors of nations hesitate between the authority of the gospel, which, they say, never can have spoken in vain, and the authority of economical demonstrations. Nothing to my mind is more creditable to the gospel than this old infidelity of its pretended teachers. Salmasius, having assimilated interest to rent, was refuted by Grotius, Puffendorf, Barlamaqui, Wolf, and Henicus, and, what is more curious still, Salmasius admitted his error. Instead of inferring from this doctrine of Salmasius that all increases illegitimate and proceeding straight on to the demonstration of gospel equality, they arrive at just the opposite conclusion, namely that since everybody acknowledges that rent is permissible, if we allow that interest does not differ from rent, there is nothing left which can be called usury, and consequently that the commandment of Jesus Christ is an illusion and amounts to nothing which is an impious conclusion. 
If this memoir had appeared in the time of Bousset, that great theologian would have proved by scripture the fathers, traditions, councils, and popes that property exists by divine right, while usury is an invention of the devil, and the heretical work would have been burned and the author imprisoned. We rob, 13, by farm rent, house rent, and leases of all kinds. The author of the Provincial Letters entertained the honest Christians of the 17th century at the expense of Escobar the Jesuit and the contract Mahatra. The contract Mahatra, said Escobar, is a contract by which goods are bought at a high price and on credit, to be again sold at the same moment to the same person cash down and at a lower price. Escobar found a way to justify this kind of usury. Pascal and all the Jansenists laughed at him. But what would the satirical Pascal, the learned Nicolet, and the invincible Arnaud have said if Father Antoine Escobar de Valladolid had answered them thus? A lease is a contract by which real estate is bought at a high price and on credit to be sold again at the expiration of a certain time to the same person at a lower price. Only to simplify the transaction, the buyer is content to pay the difference between the first sale and the second. Either deny the identity of the lease and the contract Mohatra, and then I will annihilate you in a moment, or, if you admit the similarity, admit also the soundness of my doctrine. Otherwise you prescribe both interest and rent at one blow. In reply to this overwhelming argument of the Jesuit, the sire of Montalt would have sounded the tocsin and would have shouted that society was in peril, that the Jesuits were sapping its very foundations. We rob, 14, by commerce, when the profit of the merchant exceeds his legitimate salary. Everybody knows the definition of commerce, the art of buying for three francs that which is worth six and of selling for six that which is worth three. Between commerce thus defined and a vol American, the only difference is the relative proportion of the values exchanged, in short, the amount of the profit. We rob, 15, by making profit on our product, by accepting sinecures and by exacting exorbitant wages. The farmer who sells a certain amount of corn to the consumer and who, during the measurement, thrusts his hand into the bushel and takes out a handful of grains, robs. The professor, whose lectures are paid for by the state, and who, through the intervention of a bookseller, sells them to the public a second time, robs. The sinecurist, who receives an enormous product in exchange for his vanity, robs. The functionary, the laborer, whatever he may be, who produces only one and gets paid four, one hundred, or one thousand, robs. The publisher of this book and I, its author, we rob by charging for it twice as much as it is worth. In recapitulation... Justice, after passing through the state of negative communism, called by the ancient poets the Age of Gold, commences as the right of the strongest. In a society which is trying to organize itself, inequality of faculties calls up the idea of merit. Equité suggests the plan of proportioning not only esteem, but also material comforts to personal merit. And since the highest and almost the only merit then recognized is physical strength, the strongest, Aristos, and consequently the best, Aristos, is entitled to the largest share, and if it is refused him, he very naturally takes it by force. From this to the assumption of the right of property in all things, it is but one step. Such was justice in the heroic age, preserved, at least by tradition, among the Greeks and Romans down to the last days of the republics. Plato in the Gorgias introduces a character named Callicles, who spiritedly defends the right of the strongest, which Socrates, the advocate of equality, Tonison, seriously refutes. It is related of the great Pompey that he blushed easily, and nevertheless these words once escaped his lips. Why should I respect the laws when I have arms in my hand? This shows him to have been a man in whom the moral sense and ambition were struggling for the mastery, and who sought to justify his violence by the motto of the hero and the brigand. From the right of the strongest springs the exploitation of man by man, or bondage. Usury, or the tribute levied upon the conquered by the conqueror, and the whole numerous family of taxes, duties, monarchical prerogatives, house rents, farm rents, etc., in one word, property. Force was followed by artifice, the second manifestation of justice, which was detested by the ancient heroes who, not excelling in that direction, were heavy losers by it. Force was still employed, but mental force instead of physical. Skill in deceiving an enemy by treacherous propositions seemed deserving of reward. 
Nevertheless, the strong always prided themselves upon their honesty. In those days, oaths were observed and promises kept according to the letter rather than the spirit. Uti lingua non capacit ita just esto. As the tongue has spoken, so must the right be, says the law of the Twelve Tables. Artifice, or rather perfidy, was the main element in the politics of ancient Rome. Among other examples, Vico cites the following, also quoted by Montesquieu. The Romans had guaranteed to the Carthaginians the preservation of their goods and their city, intentionally using the word civitas, that is, the society, the state. The Carthaginians, on the contrary, understood them to mean the material city, herbs, and accordingly began to rebuild their walls. They were immediately attacked on account of their violation of the treaty by the Romans, who, acting upon the old heroic idea of right, did not imagine that, in taking advantage of an equivocation to surprise their enemies, they were waging unjust war. From artifice sprang the profits of manufacturers, commerce and banking, mercantile frauds, and the pretensions which are honored with the beautiful names of talent and genius, but which ought to be regarded as the last degree of knavery and deception, and finally all sorts of social inequalities. In those forms of robbery which are prohibited by law, force and artifice are employed alone and undisguised. In the authorized forms, they conceal themselves within a useful product, which they use as a tool to plunder their victim. The direct use of violence and stratagem was early and universally condemned, but no nation has yet got rid of that kind of robbery which acts through talent, labor, and possession, which is the source of all the dilemmas of casuistry and the innumerable contradictions of jurisprudence. The right of force and the right of artifice, glorified by the rhapsodists in the poems of the Iliad and the Odyssey, inspired the legislation of the Greeks and the Romans, from which they passed into our morals and codes. Christianity has not changed at all. The gospel should not be blamed, because the priests, as stupid as the legists, have been unable either to expound or to understand it. The ignorance of councils and popes upon all questions of morality is equal to that of the marketplace and the money-changers. And it is this utter ignorance of right, justice, and society which is killing the church and discrediting its teachings forever. The infidelity of the Roman Church and other Christian churches is flagrant. All have disregarded the precept of Jesus. All have erred in moral and doctrinal points. All are guilty of teaching false and absurd dogmas which lead straight to wickedness and murder. Let it ask pardon of God and men, this church which called itself infallible, and which has grown so corrupt in morals. Let its reformed sisters humble themselves, and the people, undeceived but still religious and merciful, will begin to think. Footnote. I preach the gospel, I live the gospel, said the apostle, meaning thereby that he lived by his labor. The Catholic clergy prefer to live by property. The struggles in the communes of the Middle Ages between the priests and bishops and the large proprietors and seigneurs are famous. The papal excommunications fulminated in defense of ecclesiastical revenues are no less so. Even today the official organs of the Gallican clergy still maintain that the pay received by the clergy is not a salary, but an indemnity for goods of which they were once proprietors, and which were taken from them in 89 by the Third Estate. The clergy prefer to live by the right of increase, rather than by labor. End of footnote. One of the main causes of Ireland's poverty today is the immense revenues of the English clergy. So heretics and orthodox, Protestants and papists, cannot reproach each other. All have strayed from the path of justice. All have disobeyed the Eighth Commandment of the Decalogue, Thou shalt not steal. The development of right has followed the same order, in its various expressions, that property has in its forms. Everywhere we see justice driving robbery before it and confining it within narrower and narrower limits. Hitherto the victories of justice over injustice and of equality over inequality have been won by instinct and the simple force of things. But the final triumph of our social nature will be due to our reason, or else we shall fall back into feudal chaos. Either this inglorious height is reserved for our intelligence or this miserable depth for our baseness. The second effect of property is despotism. Now since despotism is inseparably connected with the idea of legitimate authority, in explaining the natural causes of the first, the principle of the second will appear. What is to be the form of government in the future? Here some of my young readers reply, Why, how do you ask such a question? You are a Republican. A Republican, yes, but that word specifies nothing. Res publica, that is, the public thing. 
Now, whoever is interested in public affairs, no matter under what form of government, may call himself a Republican. Even kings are Republicans. Well, you are a Democrat. No. What? You would have a monarchy? No. A constitutionalist. God forbid. You are then an aristocrat. Not at all. You want a mixed government. Still less. What are you then? I am an anarchist. Oh, I understand you. You speak satirically. and This is a hit at the government. By no means. I have just given you my serious and well-considered profession of faith. Although a firm friend of order, I am, in the full force of the term, an anarchist. Listen to me. In all species of sociable animals, the weakness of the young is the principle of their obedience to the old, who are strong, and from habit, which is a kind of conscience with them, the power remains with the oldest, although he finally becomes the weakest. Whenever the society is under the control of a chief, this chief is almost always the oldest of the troop. I say almost always because the established order may be disturbed by violent outbreaks. Then the authority passes to another, and having been re-established by force, it is again maintained by habit. Wild horses go in herds. They have a chief who marches at their head, whom they confidently follow, and who gives the signal for flight or battle. The sheep which we have raised follows us, but it follows in company with the flock in the midst of which it was born. It regards man as the chief of its flock. Man is regarded by domestic animals as a member of their society. All that he has to do is to get himself accepted by them as an associate. He soon becomes their chief in consequence of his superior intelligence. He does not then change the natural condition of these animals, as Buffon has said. On the contrary, he uses his natural condition to his own advantage. In other words, he finds sociable animals and renders them domestic by becoming their associate and chief. Thus, the domesticity of animals is only a special condition, a simple modification, a definitive consequence of their sociability. All domestic animals are by nature sociable animals. Florence, Summary of the Observations of F. Cuvier Sociable animals follow their chief by instinct, but take notice of the fact, which F. Cuvier omitted to state, that the function of the chief is altogether one of intelligence. The chief does not teach the others to associate, to unite under his lead, to reproduce their kind, to take flight, or to defend themselves. Concerning each of these particulars, his subordinates are as well informed as he. But it is the chief who, by his accumulated experience, provides against accidents, he it is whose private intelligence supplements in difficult situations the general instinct. He it is who deliberates, decides, and leads. He it is, in short, whose enlightened prudence regulates the public routine for the greatest good of all. Man, naturally a sociable being, naturally follows a chief. Originally the chief is the father, the patriarch, the elder, in other words, the good and wise man, whose functions, consequently, are exclusively of a reflective and intellectual nature. The human race, like all other races of sociable animals, has its instincts, its innate faculties, its general ideas, and its categories of sentiment and reason. Its chiefs, legislators, or kings have devised nothing, supposed nothing, imagined nothing. They have only guided society by their accumulated experience, always, however, in conformity with opinions and beliefs. Those philosophers who, carrying into morals and into history their gloomy and factious whims, affirm that the human race had originally neither chiefs nor kings, know nothing of the nature of man. Royalty and absolute royalty is, as truly and more truly than democracy, a primitive form of government. Perceiving that, in the remotest ages, crowns and kingships were worn by heroes, brigands, and knight-errants, they confound the two things, royalty and despotism. But royalty dates from the creation of man. It existed in the age of negative communism. Ancient heroism and the despotism which it engendered commenced only with the first manifestation of the idea of justice, that is, with the reign of force. As soon as the strongest, in the comparison of merits, was decided to be the best, the oldest had to abandon his position, and royalty became despotic. The spontaneous, instinctive, and, so to speak, physiological origin of royalty gives it, in the beginning, a superhuman character— the nations connected it with the gods, from whom they said the first kings descended. This notion was the origin of the divine genealogies of royal families, the incarnations of gods and the messianic fables. From it sprang the doctrine of divine right, which is still championed by a few singular characters. Royalty was at first elective, because, at a time when man produced but little and possessed nothing, property was too weak to establish the principle of heredity, 
and secure to the son the throne of his father, but as soon as fields were cleared and the cities built, each function was, like everything else, appropriated, and hereditary kingships and priesthoods were the result. The principle of heredity was carried into even the most ordinary professions, a circumstance which led to class distinctions, pride of station, and the abjection of the common people, and by which confirms my assertion concerning the principle of patrimonial succession. That is, it is a method suggested by nature of filling vacancies in business and completing unfinished tasks. From time to time ambition caused usurpers, or supplanters, of kings to start up. And in consequence, some were called kings by right, or legitimate kings, and others tyrants. But we must not let these names deceive us. There have been execrable kings and very tolerable tyrants. Royalty may always be good when it is the only possible form of government. Legitimate, it is never. Neither heredity, nor election, nor universal suffrage, nor the excellence of the sovereign, nor the consecration of religion and of time can make royalty legitimate. Whatever form it takes, monarchic, oligarchic, or democratic, royalty, or the government of man by man, is illegitimate and absurd. Man, in order to procure as speedily as possible the most thorough satisfaction of his wants, seeks rule. In the beginning this rule is to him living, visible, and tangible. It is his father, his master, his king. The more ignorant man is, the more obedient he is, and the more absolute is his confidence in his guide. But it being a law of man's nature to conform to rule, that is, to discover it by his powers of reflection and reason, man reasons upon the commands of his chiefs. Now such reasoning as that is a protest against authority, a beginning of disobedience. At the moment that man inquires into the motives which will govern the will of his sovereign, at that moment man revolts. If he obeys no longer because the king commands, but because the king demonstrates the wisdom of his commands, it may be said that henceforth he will recognize no authority, and that he has become his own king. Unhappy he who shall dare to command him, and shall offer as his authority only the vote of the majority, for sooner or later the minority will become the majority, and this impudent despot will be overthrown and all his laws annihilated. In proportion as society becomes enlightened, royal authority diminishes. That is a fact to which all history bears witness. At the birth of nations men reflect and reason in vain. Without methods, without principles, not knowing how to use their reason, they cannot judge the justice of their conclusions. When the authority of kings is immense, no knowledge having been acquired with which to contradict it. But, little by little, experience produces habits, which develop into customs, then the customs are formulated in maxims laid down as principles, in short transformed into laws, to which the king, the living law, has to bow. There comes a time when customs and laws are so numerous that the will of the prince is, so to speak, entwined by the public will, and that, on taking the crown, he is obliged to swear that he will govern in conformity with established customs and usages, and that he is but the executive power of a society whose laws are made independently of him. Up to this point all is done instinctively and, as it were, unconsciously, but we see where this movement must end. By means of self-instruction and the acquisition of ideas, man finally acquires the idea of science, that is, of a system of knowledge in harmony with the reality of things and inferred from observation. He searches for the science or the system of inanimate bodies, the system of organic bodies, the system of the human mind, and the system of the universe. Why should he not also search for the system of society? But having reached this height, he comprehends that political truth or the science of politics exists quite independently of the will of sovereigns, the opinion of majorities, and popular beliefs. That kings, ministers, magistrates, and nations, as wills, have no connection with the science and are worthy of no consideration. He comprehends at the same time that if man is born a sociable being, the authority of his father over him ceases on the day when, his mind being formed and his education finished, he becomes the associate of his father that his true chief and his king is the demonstrated truth, that politics is a science, not a stratagem, and that the function of the legislator is reduced, in the last analysis, to the methodical search for truth. Thus, in a given society, the authority of man over man is inversely proportional to the stage of intellectual development which that society has reached, and the probable duration of that authority can be calculated from the more or less general desire for a true government, that is, for a scientific government. And just as the right of force and the right of artifice retreat before the steady advance of justice and must finally be extinguished in equality, so the sovereignty of the will yields to the sovereignty of the reason and must at last be lost in scientific socialism. 
property and royalty have been crumbling to pieces ever since the world began. As man seeks justice in equality, so society seeks order in anarchy. Footnote. The meaning ordinarily attached to the word anarchy is absence of principle, absence of rule. Consequently, it has been regarded as synonymous with disorder. End of footnote. Anarchy, the absence of a master, of a sovereign, such is the form of government to which we are every day approximating, and which our accustomed habit of taking man for our rule and his will for law leads us to regard as the height of disorder and the expression of chaos. The story is told that a citizen of Paris in the 17th century, having heard it said that in Venice there was no king, the good man could not recover from his astonishment, and nearly died from laughter at the mere mention of so ridiculous a thing. So strong is our prejudice. As long as we live, we want a chief or chiefs, and at this very moment I hold in my hand a brochure, whose author, a zealous communist, dreams, like a second Marat, of the dictatorship. The most advanced among us are those who wish the greatest possible number of sovereigns. Their most ardent wish is for the royalty of the National Guard. Soon, undoubtedly, someone, jealous of the citizen militia, will say, Everybody is king! But when he has spoken, I will say in my turn, Nobody is king. We are, whether we will or no, associated. Every question of domestic politics must be decided by departmental statistics. Every question of foreign politics is an affair of international statistics. The science of government rightly belongs to one of the sections of the Academy of Sciences, whose permanent secretary is necessarily prime minister. And since every citizen may address a memoir to the Academy, every citizen is a legislator. But as the opinion of no one is of any value until its truth has been proven, no one can substitute his will for reason. Nobody is king. All questions of legislation and politics are matters of science, not of opinion. The legislative power belongs only to the reason, methodically recognized and demonstrated. To attribute to any power whatever the right of veto or of sanction is the last degree of tyranny. Justice and legality are two things as independent of our approval as is mathematical truth. To compel, they need only to be known. To be known, they need only to be considered and studied. What, then, is the nation if it is not the sovereign, if it is not the source of the legislative power? The nation is the guardian of the law. The nation is the executive power. Every citizen may assert, this is true, that is just, but his opinion controls no one but himself. That the truth which he proclaims may become a law, it must be recognized. Now what is it to recognize a law? It is to verify a mathematical or a metaphysical calculation. It is to repeat an experiment, to observe a phenomenon, to establish a fact. Only the nation has the right to say, be it known and decreed. I confess that this is an overturning of received ideas and that I seem to be attempting to revolutionize our political system. But I beg the reader to consider that, having begun with a paradox, I must, if I reason correctly, meet with paradoxes at every step and must end with paradoxes. For the rest, I do not see how the liberty of citizens would be endangered by entrusting to their hands, instead of the pen of the legislator, the sword of the law. The executive power, belonging properly to the will, cannot be confided to too many proxies. That is the true sovereignty of the nation. Footnote. If such ideas are ever forced into the minds of the people, it will be by representative government and the tyranny of talkers. Once science, thought, and speech were characterized by the same expression. To designate a thoughtful and a learned man, they said, a quick man to speak and powerful in discourse. For a long time, speech has been abstractly distinguished from science and reason. Gradually, this abstraction is becoming realized, as the logicians say, in society, so that we have today savants of many kinds who talk but little, and talkers who are not even savants in the science of speech. Thus, a philosopher is no longer a savant, he is a talker. Legislators and poets were once profound and sublime characters, now they are talkers. A talker is a sonorous bell, whom the least shock suffices to set in perpetual motion. With the talker, the flow of speech is always directly proportional to the poverty of thought. Talkers govern the world. They stun us. They bore us. They worry us. They suck our blood and laugh at us. As for the savants, they keep silence. If they wish to say a word, they are cut short. Let them write. End of footnote. The proprietor, the robber, the hero, the sovereign— for all these titles are synonymous, imposes his will as law and suffers neither contradiction nor control. That is, he pretends to be the legislative and the executive power at once. 
Accordingly, the substitution of the scientific and true law for the royal will is accomplished only by a terrible struggle, and this constant substitution is, after property, the most potent element in history, the most prolific source of political disturbances. Examples are too numerous and too striking to require enumeration. Now, property necessarily engenders despotism, the government of caprice, the reign of libidinous pleasure. That is so clearly the essence of property, that to be convinced of it one need but remember what it is and observe what happens around him. Property is the right to use and abuse. If, then, government is economy, if its object is production and consumption and the distribution of labor and products, how is the government possible while property exists? And if goods are property, why should not the proprietors be kings and despotic kings, kings in proportion to their facultés bonitaire? If each proprietor is sovereign lord within the sphere of his property, absolute king throughout his own domain, how could a government of proprietors be anything but chaos and confusion? End of section 21, chapter 5, part 4. Recording by Chris Clark. Section 22 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Meulinger. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Chapter 5, Part 5 Psychological Exposition of the Idea of Justice. Determination of the Third Form of Society. Conclusion. Then, no government, no public economy, no administration is possible which is based upon property. Communism seeks equality and law. Property, born of the sovereignty of the reason, and the sense of personal merit, wishes above all things independence and proportionality. But communism, mistaking uniformity for law, and levelism for equality, becomes tyrannical and unjust. Property, by its despotism and encroachments, soon proves itself oppressive and antisocial. The objects of communism and property are good, their results are bad. And why? Because both are exclusive, and each disregards two elements of society. Communism rejects independence and proportionality. Property does not satisfy equality and law. Now, if we imagine a society based upon these four principles, equality, law, independence and proportionality, we find 1. That equality, consisting only in equality of conditions, that is, of means, and not in equality of comfort, which is the business of the laborers to achieve for themselves when provided with equal means, in no way violates justice and equity. 2. That law, resulting from the knowledge of facts, and consequently based upon necessity itself, never clashes with independence. 3. That individual independence, or the autonomy of the private reason, originating in the difference in talents and capacities, can exist without danger within the limits of the law. 4. That proportionality, being admitted only in the sphere of intelligence and sentiment, and not as regards material objects, may be observed without violating justice or social equality. This third form of society, the synthesis of communism and property, we will call liberty. Footnote. Libertas, librare, libratio, libra, liberty to liberate, liberation, balance, pound. Words which have a common derivation. Liberty is the balance of rights and duties. To make a man free is to balance him with others, that is, to put him on their level. End of footnote. In determining the nature of liberty, we do not unite communism and property indiscriminately. Such a process would be absurd eclecticism. We search by analysis for those elements in each which are true, and in harmony with the laws of nature and society, disregarding the rest altogether and the result gives us an adequate expression of the natural form of human society. In one word, liberty. Liberty is equality, because liberty exists only in society. 
and in the absence of equality there is no society. Liberty is anarchy, because it does not admit the government of the will, but only the authority of the law, that is, of necessity. Liberty is infinite variety, because it respects all wills within the limits of the law. Liberty is proportionality, because it allows the utmost latitude to the ambition for merit and the emulation of glory. We can now say, in the words of Monsieur Cousin, Our principle is true. It is good. It is social. Let us not fear to push it to its ultimate. Man's social nature becoming justice through reflection, equity through the classification of capacities, and having liberty for its formula, is the true basis of morality, the principles and regulator of all our actions. This is the universal motor, which philosophy is searching for, which religion strengthens, which egotism supplants, and whose place pure reason never can fill. Duty and right are born of need, which, when considered in connection with others, is a right, and when considered in connection with ourselves, a duty. We need to eat and sleep. It is our right to produce those things which are necessary to rest and nourishment. It is our duty to use them when nature requires it. We need to labor in order to live. To do so is both our right and our duty. We need to love our wives and children. It is our duty to protect and support them. It is our right to be loved in preference to all others. Conjugal fidelity is justice. Adultery is high treason against society. We need to exchange our products for other products. It is our right that this exchange should be one of equivalence. And since we consume before we produce, it would be our duty, if we could control the matter, to see to it that our last product shall follow our last consumption. Suicide is fraudulent bankruptcy. We need to live our lives according to the dictates of our reason. It is our right to maintain our freedom. It is our duty to respect that of others. We need to be appreciated by our fellows. It is our duty to deserve their praise. It is our right to be judged by our works. Liberty is not opposed to the rights of succession and bequest. It contends itself with preventing violations of equality. Choose, it tells us, between two legacies, but do not take them both. All our legislation concerning transmissions, entailments, adoptions, and, if I may venture to use such a word, coadjutoraries, requires remodeling. Liberty favors emulation, instead of destroying it. In social equality, emulation consists in accomplishing under like conditions. It is its own reward. No one suffers by the victory. Liberty applauds self-sacrifice and honors it with its votes, but it can dispense with it. Justice alone suffices to maintain the social equilibrium. Self-sacrifice is an act of supererogation. Happy, however, the man who can say, I sacrifice myself. Footnote. In a monthly publication, the first number of which has just appeared under the name of Legliter, self-sacrifice is laid down as a principle of equality. This is a confusion of ideas. Self-sacrifice, taken alone, is the last degree of inequality. To seek equality in self-sacrifice is to confess that equality is against nature. Equality must be based upon justice, upon strict right, upon the principles invoked by the proprietor himself. Otherwise, it will never exist. Self-sacrifice is superior to justice but it cannot be imposed as law, because it is of such a nature as to admit of no reward. It is, indeed, desirable that everybody shall recognize the necessity of self-sacrifice, and the idea of legliter is an excellent example. Unfortunately, it can have no effect. What would you reply, indeed, to a man who should say to you, I do not want to sacrifice myself? Is he to be compelled to do so? When self-sacrifice is forced, it becomes oppression, slavery, the exploitation of man by man. Thus have the proletaires sacrificed themselves to property. End of footnote. Liberty is essentially an organizing force. 
to ensure equality between men and peace among nations, agriculture and industry, and the centers of education, business and storage, must be distributed according to the climate and the geographical position of the country, the nature of the products, the character and natural talents of the inhabitants, etc., in proportions so just, so wise, so harmonious, that in no place shall there ever be either an excess or a lack of population, consumption, and products. There commences the science of public and private right, the true political economy. It is for the writers on jurisprudence, henceforth unembarrassed by the false principle of property, to describe the new laws and bring peace upon earth. Knowledge and genius they do not lack. The foundation is now laid for them. Footnote. The disciples of Fourier have long seemed to me the most advanced of all modern socialists, and almost the only ones worthy of the name. If they had understood the nature of their task, spoken to the people, awakened their sympathies, and kept silence when they did not understand, if they had made less extravagant pretensions, and had shown more respect for public intelligence, perhaps the reform would now, thanks to them, be in progress. But why are these earnest reformers continually bowing to power and wealth, that is, to all that is anti-reformatory? How, in a thinking age, can they fail to see that the world must be converted by demonstration, not by myths and allegories? Why do they, the deadly enemies of civilization, borrow from it nevertheless its most pernicious fruits, property, inequality of fortune and rank, gluttony, concubinage, prostitution, what do I know, theurgy, magic, and sorcery? Why these endless denunciations of morality, metaphysics, and psychology, when the abuse of these sciences, which they do not understand, constitutes their whole system? Why this mania for deifying a man whose principal merit consisted in talking nonsense about things whose names even he did not know, in the strongest language ever put upon paper? Whoever admits the infallibility of a man becomes thereby incapable of instructing others. Whoever denies his own reason will soon prescribe free thought. The phalansterians would not fail to do it if they had the power. Let them condescend to reason. Let them proceed systematically. Let them give us demonstrations instead of revelations, and we will listen willingly. Then let them organize manufactures, agriculture, and commerce. Let them make labor attractive, and the most humble functions honorable, and our praise shall be theirs. Above all, let them throw off that illuminism which gives them the appearance of impostors or dupes, rather than believers and apostles. End of footnote. I have accomplished my task. Property is conquered, never again to arise. Wherever this work is read and discussed, there will be deposited the germ of death to property. There, sooner or later, privilege and servitude will disappear, and the despotism of will will give place to the reign of reason. What sophisms, indeed, what prejudices, however obstinate, can stand before the simplicity of the following propositions? 1. Individual Possession Footnote. Individual possession is no obstacle to extensive cultivation and unity of exploitation. If I have not spoken of the drawbacks arising from small estates, it is because I thought it useless to repeat what so many others have said, and what by this time all the world must know. But I am surprised that the economists, who have so clearly shown the disadvantages of spade husbandry, have failed to see that it is caused entirely by property. Above all, that they have not perceived that their plan for mobilizing the soil is a first step towards the abolition of property. And a footnote. Individual possession is the condition of social life. Five thousand years of property demonstrate it. Property is the suicide of society. Possession is a right. Property is against right. Suppress property while maintaining possession, and by this simple modification of the principle, you will revolutionize law, government, economy, and institutions. You will drive evil from the face of the earth. 2. All having an equal right of occupancy, possession varies with the number of possessors. Property cannot establish itself. 
3. The effect of labor being the same for all, property is lost in the common prosperity. 4. All human labor being the result of collective force, all property becomes, in consequence, collective and unitary. To speak more exactly, labor destroys property. 5. Every capacity for labor being, like every instrument of labor, an accumulated capital, and a collective property, inequality of wages and fortunes, on the ground of inequality of capacities, is therefore injustice and robbery. 6. The necessary conditions of commerce are the liberty of the contracting parties and the equivalence of the products exchanged. Now, value being expressed by the amount of time and outlay which each product costs, and liberty being inviolable, the wages of laborers, like their rights and duties, should be equal. 7. Products are bought only by products. Now, the condition of all exchange being equivalence of products, profit is impossible and unjust. Observe this elementary principle of economy, and pauperism, luxury, oppression, vice, crime, and hunger will disappear from our midst. 8. Men are associated by the physical and mathematical law of production, before they are voluntarily associated by choice. Therefore, equality of conditions is demanded by justice, that is, by strict social law. Esteem, friendship, gratitude, admiration, all fall within the domain of equitable or proportional law only. 9. Free association, liberty, whose sole function is to maintain equality in the means of production and equivalence in exchanges, is the only possible, the only just, the only true form of society. 10. Politics is the science of liberty. The government of man by man, under whatever name it be disguised, is oppression. Society finds its highest perfection in the union of order with anarchy. The old civilization has run its race. A new sun is rising, and will soon renew the face of the earth. Let the present generation perish, let the old prevaricators die in the desert, the holy earth shall not cover their bones. Young men, exasperated by the corruption of the age, and absorbed in your zeal for justice, if your country is dear to you, and if you have the interests of humanity at heart, have the courage to espouse the cause of liberty. Cast off your old selfishness, and plunge into the rising flood of popular equality. There your regenerate soul will acquire new life and vigor. Your enervated genius will recover unconquerable energy. And your heart, perhaps already withered, will be rejuvenated. Everything will wear a different look to your illuminated vision. New sentiments will engender new ideas within you. Religion, morality, poetry, art, language will appear before you in nobler and fairer forms. And henceforth, sure of your faith, and thoughtfully enthusiastic, you will hail the dawn of universal regeneration. And you, sad victims of an odious law, you whom a jesting world despoils and outrages, you whose labor has always been fruitless, and whose rest has been without hope, take courage, your tears are numbered, the fathers have sown in affliction, the children shall reap its rejoicings. O God of liberty! God of equality, thou who didst place in my heart the sentiment of justice, before my reason could comprehend it, hear my ardent prayer. Thou hast dictated all that I have written, thou hast shaped my thought, thou hast directed my studies, thou hast weaned my mind from curiosity and my heart from attachment, that I might publish thy truth to the master and the slave. I have spoken with what force and talent thou hast given me. It is thine to finish the work. Thou knowest whether I seek my welfare or thy glory, O God of liberty. O oh, perish my memory, and let humanity be free. Let me see from my obscurity the people at last instructed. Let noble teachers enlighten them. Let generous spirits guide them. Abridge, if possible, the time of our trial. 
stifle pride and avarice in equality, annihilate this love of glory which enslaves us, teach these poor children that in the bosom of liberty there are neither heroes nor great men, inspire the powerful man, the rich man, him whose name my lips shall never pronounce in thy presence, with the horror of his crimes. Let him be the first to apply for admission to the redeemed society. Let the promptness of his repentance be the ground of his forgiveness. Then, great and small, wise and foolish, rich and poor, will unite in an ineffable fraternity, and, singing in unison a new hymn, will rebuild thy altar, O God of liberty and equality. End of First Memoir End of section 22, chapter 5, part 5